The situation is dire, as a lunar fairy has killed all the warriors and is about to finish off the sword emperor who is the last man alive. She acknowledges his strength as she said to him, You are worthy of your title but all that reputation of yours ends today. The emperor recognizes his mistake, for he has let his guard down but he isn't afraid to die because he was able to accomplish his mission. She launched a powerful attack, but the emperor wasn't phased because he was ready to die, and shouted, Kill me. There was a huge blast from the attack. With a grin smile on her face she looked down at the explosion caused by her attack but she was surprised to see that the sword emperor was still alive and a strange man was standing in front of him. The man apologizes to the emperor for being late. He then rushes to attack the fairy. She sees him closing in to strike and she asks, Who are you? And he replies I am the moon splitting swords man and I am here to cut you, Luna Fairy. Then he used his family's special sword technique to cut her down with one move, thus finishing her off. And it was said that on that day, the heavens rained down nine strands of sword energy. Six years has passed, and we see a young boy being brutally abused by his stepmom who has hit him. Until he falls, she yelled at him for being so weak and asks him to get up. She asks him if he's ignoring the instructions she gave him to clean up the backyard thoroughly and make sure there is no leaves. The young boy with a bruised body replied, You did tell me. She asks him if he is ignoring her because she is not his real mother, and he replies, I am not. She asks him if he would have ignored if the instruction came from his mother who abandoned him after birth, and he replied, No. This infuriates her, so she asks him if he would have ignored if the instruction came from his father who has locked himself up in his room for six years and refused to come out and he also replied saying no. This gets her more angry, so she asks him if that's all he has to say. She thinks he's trying to disrespect her. Then, she kicks him to the ground and starts beating him up, while her children watched from behind, laughing at him and mocking him saying, he's so scared he can't even lift his head like a turtle. Only the oldest didn't seem happy about this. The sword emperor and his family, on their way to wear young manor, he notices that nothing had changed even after six years and is amazed by this. The emperor's son is excited to finally meet his father's only sworn brother, whose name is Yon. The emperor's daughter is also named Yon. The empress inquiries from her husband, where her daughter, Nangong Yon is. The emperor replied that she was feeling a bit stuffy and went on top of the carriage. The empress was frightened and quickly rushes to ask her to come down and tells her husband that he is the one spoiling her. Let her be says the emperor, it's nothing new for her. The emperor's son also assures his mother not to worry about Nangong Yon, because, with the level of martial arts that Nangong Yon knows, she will be perfectly okay. The emperor's son excitedly asks his father, is Yon so strong, that even you, the sword emperor acknowledges his strength. The emperor replies that six years ago, the martial arts Yon used were certainly the most perfect sword arts under the heaven. The emperor also said to his son, if it weren't for Yon, I wouldn't be alive here today also stating that Yon's heaven sword technique is certainly able to match up to their Nangong clan's advanced techniques. The emperor's son is astounded and wonders, if he is that strong, why haven't his martial arts been known to the world? The emperor tells his son that it is because Yon is retired and didn't pass it down to anyone and that it's best not to say anything that offends him. The emperor continues and tells his son that Yon had two wives, the first and the second but he was especially fond of the second wife. But unfortunately the second wife died after giving birth six years ago, and after that, he lost all meaning to live, and locked himself up in his second wife's room. The emperor then tells his son that it is also why they are there. He wants to look for a way to get Yon out of that room somehow. He also tells his son that once they get to the manor, to act like he don't know anything about it and not mention anything about Yon's second wife. Do you understand? The emperor's son replies yes I'll bear that in mind. Back at the manor, a warrior shouts at the stepmother of the kid being beaten, Madam. Madam, sir has stepped out of his room. The stepmother is envious that her husband left that room after hearing about the Nangong carriage horse entering town. The warrior also says that he is on his way to receive the sword emperor. The stepmother then cleans the blood stains on her hand as a result of beating her stepson. The woman becomes even more envious, thinking that her husband came out of the room at the mention of his sworn brother arrival. After all these years, but no matter how much she had pleaded with him to come out, he always refused, despite abandoning his own flesh and blood for six years, and now he's making the effort to receive his sworn brother. The wicked stepmother then tells her stepson that he will finally be able to see what his father looks like, while also warning him not to appear in front of anyone with his filthy looks, and threatens him before leaving saying, you know what will happen if you feel too comfortable thinking that I'm not watching you. 
He replied while shaking, yes I know. She left with her children, saying, come on children are you excited to meet your uncle? While the boy barely standing also left. The wicked stepmother calmly pulls her oldest son face and said, My treasure Mubik which he replies, Yes mother. She proceeds to tell him that he has a very important task to do today. She tells him that he'll be meeting the sword emperor's daughter today and he's to make sure to be friendly and treat her kindly. You understand what I am saying, right? In a cunning manner, making sure he understands the true meaning of what she asked. Yes mother, I'll bear that in mind, Mubik replied. They all head outside to receive the emperor and his family. The emperor upon seeing his sworn brother Yon, shares his concern about how he looks. Are you all right? He asked. Yon tells him that he is too ashamed to meet him, and apologizes for not looking for him after all these while. The emperor stops him and said I can't believe you are saying something like that. I was so surprised when I heard about you. Yon says it seems I've worried you because of my incompetence. The emperor tells him that it's all right now that they've met. He proceeds to introduce his family to Yon but is surprised to see that his daughter has disappeared again without anyone notice. He apologizes to Yon, and Yon smiles and says, it's okay, she's at her playful age after all. The stepmother puts on a fake smile and says, that's right our fourth child hides from time to time and does not appear. Also darling, aren't you going to introduce me and our children? Yon suspiciously looks at her and introduces his first wife Beek Miju and children. She then invites the guests to come inside the manor as they would have been tired from their journey. Before going in she instructs Mubik to go look around the manor and search for Nangong Yon. Make sure he leaves a deep impression on her. With a cunning smile on her face, Juka is at the backyard kneeling with his hands up and wonders to himself when the guests are going to leave. With a hungry stomach, starts to feel dizzy. He tries not to sleep but eventually, he dozed off and fall to the ground. Few minutes later he heard some footsteps while sleeping and slowly opens his eye and sees a woman figure approaching him. He quickly kneels and begins to beg, shouting I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I dozed up without realizing, I'm sorry. Then he thought to himself, I'm an idiot, I did something stupid and made first mother angry again, she won't forgive me this time. He raised his head up and was shocked to see someone strange. Surprised, he said, no, that's not her. It's Nangong Yon staring at him. Inside the manor, the Sword Emperor proposed a marriage between the Waryong Manor and the Nangong clan. Beek Miju was excited to hear this, so she asked the Sword Emperor, do you mean it? And he happily replied saying, of course, the Waryong Manor is more than worthy of becoming our in-laws. Beek Miju still very excited, says, oh my wow what a joyous occasion this is. This is great news for our children as well. The emperor then asks Yon what he thinks. Yon is really thankful for the offer, but thinks it'd be better if the children had a say in their marriage, and parents shouldn't have all the say in their children's marriage. The emperor was satisfied with Yon's response. Beek Miju isn't happy hearing this, and thinks her husband doesn't help at all, while she has always worked hard for the family. You might as well just tell them that you regret marrying me out of convenience. So she asked the emperor, don't you think our children will like each other? The emperor still joyful, says, yes, we would be meeting each other more so they will have many chance to get to know each other. Happy Beek Miju then asks if she could request one last favor. The emperor asks her to speak freely, which she then asks, if the Nangong clan could give guidance to her son Mubik. The emperor and his wife were both stunned by this request. The empress asked what she meant by that. Laughing, the emperor expresses his thought on the request saying, doesn't the Yon clan have their own advanced techniques? Besides, this isn't something I can decide on. Yon suddenly speaks and asks for the same thing as well. If that's not too inconvenient for you in the Nangong clan, I would like some help as well. The emperor was stunned by this request from Yon, but accepts and says, but is this really okay? For your eldest son not to inherit your nine heaven sword technique. Yon proceeds to tell him that their family martial arts aren't as difficult as the Nangong clans, and he's sure Mubik already mastered the Nine Heavens Sword technique. The Emperor asks if he's lying and says, I saw you using the Nine Heavens Sword technique move six years ago. Yon replies, Actually, I'm unable to pass down that martial art in my current state. I'll tell you the details later in Prevate. So when you go back to Wooting Mountain, as he was about to talk further, he started to cough blood and fell to the ground. The Emperor shouts Yon. Get a physician. Hey, Yon wake up, he exclaims, at Waryong Manor's backyard. Mubik is seen walking around in search of the emperor's dog there, and wondering where she could be, when he heard a voice coming from behind a building and recognized that it's his younger sister's voice. So he ran towards the where the voice was coming from, and saw that his sister was with the emperor's son. So he bows his head to apologize to the emperor's son for his sister having bothered him. 
The emperor's son told him not to worry, that she's no bother and asks his name. Mubik calmly replied, I'm Mubik. His sister then pulls the cloth asking him if he knows her name. Before he could answer, she quickly said, I'm Sialju. You mustn't forget that, okay. Mubik tried to stop his sister and tells her to stop being rude. That it's impolite to ask someone that you just met whether they kill their enemies. Sialju replies, I'm being very polite here, and this isn't my first time meeting him. Besides, we are already friends. They both continued arguing. The emperor's son looks at them and wishes his sister was also a cheerful girl. Suddenly, Mubik realizes that his sister and himself have been arguing in front of the emperor's son. He forcefully bows his sister's head and he's to apologize to the emperor's son. The emperor's son says, it's okay and it's a good thing that she's cheerful and bright. Mubik proceeds to ask him if he knows where his sister went, because he's looking for her so he can become friends with her. The emperor's son happily says, you want to befriend her. I'd be really grateful for that. I'm actually looking for her too. In that case, I can do the introductions, since the two of you aren't familiar yet. Shall we look for her together? Mubik replied, yes I'd like that. Oh right, I heard that she can't speak, is that true? The emperor's son replies, it's not that she can't speak. Before he could finish his statement, Sialju interrupts him, really. So what's it then? He replies, she's a little ill in her heart. I hope she'll get better after Mubik and you befriend her. Sialju then proceeds to tell him that she'll cure her, and he shouldn't worry. We are taken back to where the young boy was kneeling in front of the strange girl, and wondering who she is, and admiring her beauty. Suddenly he remembers that his stepmother told him that there would be important guests at their manor. He notices that the cloths and accessories the lady in front of him is putting on are so elegant, so she must be one of the guests. The boy starts to tremble in fear, as he also recalls that he was warned to stay out of sight from the guests. He tries to think of what to do, for his stepmother will definitely punish him. He tries to run, but the lady caught him by the shoulder and slammed him to the ground. The boy was terrified and starts to beg. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The lady stares at him and wonders what he is constantly apologizing for. He couldn't even react, even though I only pulled him a little. Did he not learn any martial arts? She realizes that the bruises all over his body don't seem to be the result from martial arts training, and it doesn't seem like he's been getting proper meals either. She notices his red hair, stating that it's identical to that of the moon-splitting swordsman, so he must be his child, and wonders why he's so afraid. As she leans towards him, he apologizes even more, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The boy is scared for his life, as the lady tries to lay her hand on his head. She realizes the moment she touched him, thaw, that the boy has never once received proper care. The lady who's the daughter of the emperor, Nangong Yon, asks the boy, what's your name? He replies, Jiaka, Yon Jiaka. Nangong Yon rubs his head and softly calls out his name, Jiaka. She proceeds to tell him that she'll protect him from now onwards. Tears starts to roll down the boy's eyes. Nangong wonders what she did to cause that. With joy in his heart, he began to cry profusely. Nangong now understands, so she tries to comfort him. Jiaka, still crying, Nangong hugs him and says to him, It's okay. For the first time in Jiaka's life, he experiences proper care. They both hugged each other for a while. Then Nangong stood up and stretched her hand towards Jiaka. As he held her hand, she grabbed him and they both ran. To a small exit on the wall, she asks him to follow her as she goes first. He was still hesitant to go, then she offered her hand from the other side of the hole. He took her hand and the both fled the manor. Nangon Yon then took Jiaka to the town where there's lots of foods and people. Jiaka is stunned, for it's his first time in town. He looks at a food stall and Nangon Yon noticed him staring, and decided to get for both of them, which he devoured in an instant. She smiles at him while watching him eat. After eating, they were both walking in town when a warrior appeared behind them and stopped them. Jiaka got scared at the sight of the warrior, but Nangong holds his hand tight in a reassuring manner. Back at the manor, Yon wakes up and sees the emperor sitting besides him. I must have worried you, he said. The emperor replied, of course. Do you know how shocked I was? How could the moon-splitting swordsman be in this state? Yon feels embarrassed and said, I couldn't even prevent myself from fainting. The emperor stops him from talking and tells him to only focus on recovering, that he needs to get better for the sake of his clan and children. Yon proceeds to tell the emperor that his clan's advanced technique was passed down by a spirit. However, he can no longer see anything from the spirit and it is probably disappointed by how he has now and left him. Yon then tells the emperor that the day his wife died, he also died as well. 
and that she left a child who resembles him greatly. However, he never met the child, because he thinks he'll grow to hate him, even though he knows it's not the child's fault that his wife passed away, and says, I'm truly pathetic of a man. The emperor cuts him off saying, cut that out. I'm not used to seeing such a weak you. Yon tries to sit upright and asks the emperor for one last favor. I know I don't have the right to say this, but I hope you could take care of my children. They are all pitiful children, they grew up without their father. This is my last and final request. The emperor tells him to stop saying things like that, and asks him to lie down and not strain himself, but accepts his request saying, all right, outside the manor. The empress is concerned about her daughter's whereabouts, for it has gotten late already and Nangong Yon is still nowhere to be found. A few minutes later some warriors arrive at the manor, escorting Nangong Yon and Joka whose hand she held tight. The empress was relieved that her daughter is back safe and unharmed. She sees the young boy beside her and asks who he was. Suddenly, Jiaka's stepmother who have been standing there the whole time, shouts Jiaka, and rushes to meet Jiaka pretending to have been worried sick about him asking him why he looked so filthy. She said, Oh my goodness, why are you in this state? Are you hurt anywhere? Do you know how much it breaks my heart to see you like this? She then turns to Nangong Yon and said, You must be Yon. I've been worried sick as I haven't seen him the whole day. Thank you for finding him. Nangong Yon gives a deadly look to Jiaka's stepmother in response. Yon, the emperor's son shouts upon arriving the scene alongside Mubik and his younger sister. Where have you been? I looked for you the whole day and playfully says, I thought you climbed onto the roof again, and he's surprised to see his sister holding Jaka's hand, because she barely relates with anyone and she's already holding this boy's hand, a boy she barely just met. Nangong Yon turns to Mubik. He blushes, but... He then notices that she's holding Jaka's hand which makes him jealous. The empress sees that the children all seem tired and suggests that they all head inside. Jiaka and Nangong Yun get separated at this point, leaving Jiaka alone with his stepmother and he starts to tremble in fear again. The stepmother then begins to scold Jiaka. I'm sure I told you to keep yourself hidden. Do you want the whole world to know that I'm not your real mother? Jiaka replies, I am sorry. The stepmother begins to wonder what is wrong with Nangong Yun and why she continuously gave her the stink eye. On the seventh month of that year, Yon Moryong passed away in his sleep. As soon as he died, Beak Miju summoned twenty-odd warriors of her clan to fill up his absence. The Beak clan's warriors became known as the White Tiger Squad of Waryong Manor. Moreover, as Yon Mubik had gone to the Nangong clan for training, Beak Miju had taken over as master of the Waryong Manor. At the Yon Moryong's annex building, Beak Miju is seen searching for any martial arts scroll that her deceased husband might have left behind. Then a warrior comes in to tell her that they've searched every crook and cranny of Waryong Manor, but couldn't find any martial arts manual. She yells out of frustration, that's impossible. I'm sure I heard that man mention something about an advanced technique, and starts throwing different items around. The warrior apologizes. Beak Miju then angrily asks the warrior to move everything related to Yon Moryong into the warehouse, and she never wants to set eyes on them ever again. Yes madam. We'll take care of that right away. He rushes out and orders every warrior in the manor be gathered in front of the building right away. Before he could give them the order to start moving the items, Beak Miju says to him, When you're done taking care of those items, lock that brat away as well. Do you get what I mean? Please spare me. I know I was wrong. Please let me go. Jiaka shouted as he was bane thrown in the warehouse, where all his father's items have been moved to. His body slams the ground. And the warrior tells him, This is your room now, don't blame me for this. I've got to do this if I want to survive. Jiaka pleads for help. But the warrior tells him that there's nothing he could do even if he continues pleading. The warrior says to Jiaka, That aside, your father's keepsakes will be with you. Consider this a way to honor your father's death. And shuts the door as Jiaka continues to beg for help. Jiaka is terrified of Bane all alone in the dark. And wonders how long he has to stay in there. It's the next day. Jiaka is awakened by light from a very small opening in the warehouse. He sees a bowl of water and bread in front of the opening and immediately he takes a bite off the bread. He realizes that it's really hard and doesn't taste good. Then he began to think of when he'll be able to eat good food again. At that moment, he spots a bright light coming from amongst his father's items. So, he drops the bread and as he rushes over to where the light is emanating from, thinking to himself, it's bright outside, so I shouldn't be scared. Upon getting there, he sees a cloth covering the source of light so he removes it and discovers that it's just a dusty old mirror, so he decides to clean it. As he cleans it, the bright light suddenly appears again. He sees a reflection of himself. 
Jiaka says, you have been abandoned too, huh? The reflection frightens him, so he stumbles and falls to the ground, screaming for help. But the warrior in charge of guarding the warehouse didn't mind Jiaka's screaming. It's autumn already, and it's starting to get chilly. Two months have passed and it's freezing with snow everywhere. The two warriors in charge of guarding the warehouse where Jiaka is imprisoned are out in the cold, complaining about the weather getting even colder. One of them seems concerned about Jiaka and asks the other if he thinks Jiaka is still alive, and it wouldn't be strange if he froze to death, which the other replies, he's alive. He's been screaming every now and then, hasn't he? The concerned warrior asks the other if he's sure, and the other replies, yeah, the food we give him always disappears too. The concerned warrior then commends Jiaka for being so strong, wow, I guess he really does have the blood of a martial artist. I think I'd have frozen to death long ago though, he sure is a tough one. The other replies, so what? His life will soon come to an end anyways. Look at how much they've reduced his food portions. Soon we'll have to clear his corpse. Jiaka sits alone in the freezing cold without any blanket or source of heat, while the reflection in the mirror tries to call for his attention. Jiaka tells it to just stay still and stop distracting him. I'm no longer afraid of you, got it. Actually, it's more like I don't have any strength to be scared. I feel like I'm about to die from cold. The reflection in the mirror stops and stares at Jiaka for a while. The mirror reflection picks up a stick and begins to wave at Jiaka to get his attention. After that, it starts to move in a way that caught Jiaka's interest. Jiaka begins to think, why is it suddenly dancing? He looks away and say to himself, well, it's none of my business. I was pretty surprised at first, but it's not like it can get out of the mirror, so I'm not really afraid of it anymore. I'm sure it's acting that way because I'm not giving it any attention. He carefully watched the mirror reflection as it danced. As Jiaka watches, he realizes that those movements look kinda familiar. The Nine Heavens art. I remember now. I always watched my brothers train their martial arts. That's definitely the Nine Heavens arts. How does it know our clan's martial arts? If one uses the Nine Heavens arts properly, they'd be able to circulate their core energy and create Yang energy. Creating and maintaining that energy is the first step of the Nine Heavens arts. That's right. If I remember correctly, my brothers were able to create warm air even in winter. Jiaka also picks up a stick and starts copying the movements of the mirror reflection. The mirror reflection gives Jiaka the stink eye, and Jiaka tells it not to worry about him, that he's not following along costs he wants to. At this rate I'll die anyways, I have no choice but to follow it. Jiaka thinks to himself, if this is truly the movements of the Nine Heavens art, then I'll be able to survive at least the cold. He falls to the ground, and the mirror reflection mocks him for falling. Time has passed, and Jiaka is starting to get a hang of its movements. Finally, Jiaka succeeds in learning the movement and he's proud of the progress he has made. Now he's happy that he is finally going to be able to survive the cold. I don't feel cold anymore. As I follow the movements, warm air is created. And if I maintain this, I'll be able to survive another day without any problems. The mirror reflection calls to his attention and shows Jiaka a new special move. Jiaka still excited from his accomplishment, casually tells the reflection that he doesn't need to do it to that extent. Jiaka tells the reflection, it's not like I want to follow your movement to the dot, I just want it to become warm. He throws the stick away and says, I no longer need to suffer anymore, and I no longer have to watch you acting all obnoxious either. Since that's useless now, should I just flip the mirror around? The mirror reflection then starts performing some really advanced techniques, which caught Jiaka's attention. Jiaka thinks for a second, and wonders, if he wasn't Bane thought the Nine Heavens art this whole time. He yells at the reflection, what are you doing? You think I'd be interested in that? I'm not interested in martial arts. You really think I'd follow those complicated and tough looking movement? The reflection stops, and starts to act cheeky to make fun of Jiaka, just to spite him. Jiaka responds by copying its stance and says, how dare you act cheeky, you think I can't do it now? I'll be able to do something like that in no time. Jiaka tried for days but was still unable to do it after so many attempts. Jiaka realizes that this is so hard, and very much harder than the movements he followed earlier on. And even if he manages to copy the movements somehow, there's no way he'll be able to produce the amount of yang energy that the reflection does. The reflection starts to make fun of Jiaka again, and this infuriates him. He gives up and says, I don't care anymore. How on earth am I supposed to be able to follow something like that? Jiaka thinks about it all and says, it's making him angry, why did I even try? It's useless, it really won't help at all. But he thinks it's really cool and he wants to do it just like the reflection does. And he thinks, why isn't it working for me? 
its movements, even though it's complicated and difficult. When I compare it to the Nine Heavens art that it showed me previously, there are definitely similar parts, but it's way harder. Giaka continues to think to himself, is this a martial art that's even more advanced than the Nine Heavens arts? I've never seen my brothers doing these movements in their training before. But Giaka is sure the movements are similar to his clan's martial arts. But why does it know about our clan's martial arts? Giaka questions the mirror reflection, hey. You're intentionally leaving something out right. I'm doing exactly as you, so why isn't it working for me? The reflection gives Giaka a suspicious look, which confirms to Giaka that it's intentionally leaving something out. Giaka then tells it that it's so petty for doing that and say he just won't learn the movements if that's how the reflection wants to play. Giaka tells the reflection that he just won't look at it anymore and proceeds to cover the mirror with a cloth. The reflection bends to look at Giaka from underneath the cloth. Giaka looks at it and asks, what are you doing? Are you going to teach me? The reflection responds with a nod. Giaka asks, really, don't you dare lie to me, I'll cover you up again if you do. The reflection points upwards, and symbols starts to appear on the mirror. Giaka wonders, what these symbols could mean. The symbols on the mirror translates to, the true mirror of Jiushin Fairy. At that instant, the 900 words that were within the mirror of Jewish and fairy appeared on top of the mirror. Even though the contents were profound and complicated, Yon Jiaka felt like those words were flowing into his head, and he realized the martial art that he was following was the heavenly inquisitive sword technique. He was abused his whole life in the Yon clan. He led an unfortunate life that was meant to die as he was imprisoned in the warehouse. But that misfortune helped him to gain a life-changing encounter with the Jiyushin Kshuanu mirror. A child that people thought would die for sure began to change in a profound way. The secret manual of the Nine Heavens sword technique that wasn't passed because Yon Moryong had died was passed down slowly but surely. Time is fair to everyone. Ironically, because Yon Jiaka was locked up in a tiny warehouse, he was able to focus on training in the inquisitive sword technique. As time passed, Gyaka grew stronger by practicing the sword technique and meditation. Ten years flew by, and finally Yon Gyaka is able to do the exact same movements. A horse carriage arrives the manor. Nubik steps out, takes a deep breath and says, It's been ten years, ha. Huh? His mother screams out of excitement, Mubik, my son. As she rushes to welcome him, you've come back as such a strange-looking young man. I've missed you so much. His siblings also come out to welcome him. Nubik greets his mother and tells her, Mother, I've come back after finishing my training after 10 years. Beak Miju replies, I'm so proud of you, my son. You did well. You've become so manly and she hugs him out of excitement and says, Now the Wariog Manor will become the strongest clan in Loyang. No, the strongest clan in all of the Henan province. My gosh, I was too focused on you. Aren't they precious guests from the Nangong clan? As she sees the emperor's son and daughter, she politely greets them and asks that they please excuse her manners, for she haven't seen her son in such a long time, and tells the emperor's son that he looks like he has become stronger in the past ten years, and his name is truly known around in the Jianghu. She proceeds to greet the emperor's daughter. Yon, you've really become unrecognizable. Everyone would simply look like a withered flower beside you. She invites them all inside to rest and eat, as they must have been tired from their journey. And she asks how their father was and the emperor's son replies, He is well and healthy. Beak Miju tells him that she is relieved to hear that. Nangong Yon storms off, and Mu Beak's mother asks her what she's looking for. Her brother tries to call her back and asks her how she could be so impolite. Mu Beak's mother tells him that it's okay and she thinks that. It seems like her illness hasn't been cured, though, I'm very worried for her. The emperor's son scratches his head and tells her that his sister has actually gotten better now. Nubik's mother replies, Wow that's great to hear. I guess everyone's really tired. Go in quickly and rest. Nubik's mother rushes to tell one of the guards to alert every other guard and make sure no one lets Nangong Yon anywhere near the warehouse. She suspects that Nangong Yon must be looking for Jiaka and Nangong Yon must be persistent for she to still remembers Jiaka. The warrior then tells her that he was wondering when would be a good time to tell her that the warehouse was too quiet so he checked and couldn't find Jiaka in it. Mubik's moth angrily slams the warrior to the ground and asks him what he's talking about, and demands an explanation. One day ago, Jiaka is practicing the Heavenly Sword Inquisition technique, and finally, he succeeded in mastering the movement. Out of excitement, Jiaka tells the mirror reflection, I finally did it perfectly. This movement was really difficult. You saw that too right. What I just did was the perfect one. The mirror reflection applauds him. Diaka went ahead to tell the mirror reflection that after he practiced the 900 words it showed him, he was able to get past all the parts where he was stuck at. 
and asks it to teach him the next thing. The mirror reflection smiles at him and pointed at the top of the warehouse. It appears that Gyaka's final move from the training was able to break a hole at the top of the warehouse. As Gyaka stares at the opening at the top of the warehouse, his training stick fell from his hand. To Yon Gyaka who spent ten whole years in the dark and shabby warehouse. Gyaka jumped off the ground to a pile of some of his father's belongings. The sky he had seen for the first time in ten years is very beautiful. Gyaka looks out and feels the warm air around but he's scared to go out, and asks the mirror reflection if he could go out. It smiles at him and nods to Gyaka. Gyaka goes out, and he's amazed by everything. His seeing, Gyaka says, it's so pretty. The spirit in the mirror smiles as it watches Gyaka, and finally disappears from the mirror. Gyaka says to the spirit, it's really pretty, come up here and look at it with me. He turns and see that the spirit is no longer in the mirror and it's just an ordinary mirror now. Confused, he looks forward and thinks of what to do. Back at the present, the stepmother rushes to the warehouse to inspect it. She sees the hole in the ceiling and wonders if it was caused by a lightning strike. And still confused on how he got up there, one of the warriors asked her if he should send out a pursuit squad right now. The stepmother asks him why would they have to bother finding an ungrateful boy who ran away from the clan that fed him. She thinks that Gyaka is just a fool if he thinks things would be any different just because he got out because he's just someone with a six-year-old mind in a grown-up body, who don't even know how to earn a living and survive. And soon he'll starve, get sick, and die alone. Back at the manor, in Gyaka's room, Mubik asks his mother if Gyaka really ran away from home. Mubik's mother replies, yes, that's right. I think he left home three days ago. I sent people to search around town for the last few days but they couldn't find him. But Mubik says Gyaka doesn't really have anywhere to go. Mubik's mother replies, Yes, he must have been inspired after hearing that his elder brother was returning after becoming successful. You never really know what someone's thinking. Mubik replies, Is that so? Nangong Yon arrives. Mubik turns and notices her and asks her what she's doing here instead of going to the inn. Nangong Yon gives Mubik's mom a very scary look. Mubik's mom then tries to play it off and says, Who am I, my dear niece? Have you come because you're worried about Jekha? Don't worry too much. They say kids his age often run away from home. Nangong Yon gives her a very suspicious look. Mubik's mother proceeds to say that Jiaka only ran away three days ago. But Nangong Yon notices that the blanket and furniture don't have dust on them as if they have just been bought. Furthermore, contrary to the fact that the room seems to not have been managed well, there is absolutely no sign of human habitation. Mubik's mother then told Nangong Yon not to worry too much that she and everyone at the Crouching Dragon Estate are working hard to find Jukha. But Nangong Yon storms off without uttering a word. Mubik calls her disciple sister, but she walks away without looking back. Mubik's mom is angry and asks him if Nangong Yon has always been so ill mannered. And how much does Nangong Yon look down on the Crouching Dragon Estate for her to act like that? Mubik is quiet for a while, then speaks. Mother, is it really true that our youngest ran away from home? Or did something else happen? I've never seen Disciple Sister act that way without a reason. He proceeds to tell her that, Lovely Mind Reader is the nickname given to his Disciple Sister, who is said to read people's mind with her flower-like face. And there's nothing Disciple Sister can't solve. Once she becomes interested in something, she always solves it. And there is even a saying that goes, even if you fool a ghost, you can't fool the lovely mind reader. He proceeds to tell his mother that if Nangong is in a bad enough mood to cut both of them off, then there must be a reason. His mother then asks him, do you think this mother of yours could have killed that puny kid? Nubik tells her that he doesn't think that. And if she had killed Jiaka, then Nangong Yon wouldn't have left just like that. But if something really bad happened to Jiaka, she interrupts him before he could finish what he has to say and tells him not to think too much about it. That Jiaka didn't live in the manor but it's true that he ran away. Mubik replies, did you just say he didn't live here? Then just where? Mubik's mother responds, he hasn't seen his own father's face even once so I graciously allowed him to stay with his father's belongings. Mubik is shocked to hear this and rushes over to the warehouse. But, he's surprised to see that Nangong Yon is already the. So he asks her how she was able to find the place. Nangong Yon responds, even though it is the most remote place in the Crouching Dragon Estate, there were a lot of people guarding it as if there was something I shouldn't be seeing. But just by looking at this place, I understand her reasoning. A warehouse covered with the smell of filth and mold. The floor, where that child must have slept wearing his old worn-out clothes. It looks as if a vicious little demon was imprisoned here in the Crouching Dragon Estate. She proceeds to tell Mubik that she's going to inform her father about this. As she turns to leave the scene she says, Since you're my father's disciple, there shouldn't be any rumors spread but... 
I don't think the relationship between the Crouching Dragon estate and my family will be the same anymore. Just so you know, I will be returning with my brother. Nubik is not happy. Still standing in front of the warehouse, he thinks of what to do now that the relationship between him and his respected teacher, his disciple sister, has been ruined. But right now his family's estate has no other choice but to live fearing the future action of the Nangong clan. Jiaka roams about in town without any footwear, and is wowed by how much things have changed and is curious to know how long he has been in that warehouse. He thinks of a way out of town but is confused due to all the changes in town. Jiaka thinks, should I have just climbed the mountains and rub away? I just wanted to look around for a bit. While lost in thoughts, Jiaka bumps into a man. Jiaka immediately apologizes to the man and asks if he's alright. The man looks annoyed and calls Jiaka a punk and also tells him to look where he's going. Jiaka looks at the man and instantly identifies him as the warrior from the Crouching Dragon Estate, who locked him up in the warehouse ten years ago. Jiaka stutters, I'll be careful, then I'll get going. The warrior then asks Jiaka to wait, that he has seen his face somewhere before, and now he'll have to check his ID. Jiaka is scared that he might have been found out already and thinks of what to do on the spot. The warrior yells at Jiaka, asking him he didn't hear when he asked him to come. Jiaka regrets ever coming to town to explore and in fear of being locked up in the warehouse. He bolted away from the warrior, and the warrior yells, Hey you punk come back here. While running, Jiaka tries to remember where the gate used to be, and also tells himself that he can't allow himself to get caught again. Finally Jiaka sees the exit gate and continues running towards it. While in his thoughts, I'm gonna run as far away as I can, so far that no one could ever find me. The warrior chased after Jiaka, I've never seen so a disrespectful brat before. He dares to run from a crouching dragon estate swordsman. The warrior yells at Jiaka, hey you brat, you're dead once I catch you. Jiaka looks back and sees that the man is fast and he's going to get caught at this rate, and be dragged in front of first mother again, which terrifies him. The warrior yells from behind, last warning, kid. As Jiaka sprints towards the gate he thinks to himself, I never want to go back to that warehouse again. The gate is about to close but Jiaka thinks he can make it across on time and slip through. The warrior catches up with Jiaka and says, Hey brat, did you really think you could run from me? Seeing you run away like this, I guess you really are guilty of something. As he's about to grab Jiaka, with determination in his heart to not get caught, Jiaka uses martial art to maneuver, and plunges towards the gate. The warrior becomes even more furious that Jiaka escaped his grasp and didn't notice that he was already almost under the heavy gates and shouts, how dare you use such a petty trick? Just as he was about to get hit by the gate, he looks up and shouts, but is surprised to see that Jiaka rushed and held the gate in place, saving the warrior, and asks him if he's alright and not hurt in any way. The warrior tells Jiaka that he's fine and is amazed at Jiaka's strength as because Jiaka is holding the gate with just one hand like it's nothing. Jiaka feels relieved that the warrior didn't get hurt, and tells the warrior that he just didn't want to get caught. The warrior stutters, catch you. Who? Me. Of course not. I was only following behind you. Jiaka is relieved and exited so he asks, Really? You're not trying to catch me? The warrior responds, Of course not. Jiaka then happily saves the warrior and says, Hee hee. I guess I was mistaken. He says his goodbye wishes and runs off. The warrior is still shocked from what just happened and wonders if it was all just a dream. The warrior says, There's a saying in Gangho that goes, Don't underestimate children, women and the elderly. It seems that saying was true. In the mountains, Jiaka is wandering in search of food because he haven't had anything to eat all day. With no idea on how to source for food, he spots a mushroom, and thinks it'll be edible because the color of the mushroom is pretty. So he ate it. Night falls, and Jiaka can no longer stand properly on his two feet. He starts to vomit and feels so much pain from his stomach. Jiaka is confused on what's happening to him. At this point he can no longer see a clear path, and the road started to look more and more wobbly. His head started to spin, and Jiaka is still trying to find a place to stay but with all that's going with him, he worries because it's going to get even harder to see in the dark, as the day gets darker, and thinks of what he'll do if a mountain beast appears. Jiaka feels so dizzy and falls to the ground as his body can no longer move. He tries his best not to fall asleep there but couldn't help it. The next morning while Jiaka is still passed out from the mushroom poisoning, Two men finds him laying half dead on the road and contemplates if they are to leave him there for dead opus or save his life. Eventually, they decide to take him in, as it's their first time coming across someone that's worse than them. One of them thinks it's a good choice, since it's all goodwill and sharing some food with him won't actually make them go bankrupt. And from his observation it looks like the boy previously begged. In Jiaka's dream, 
he saw a strange spirit and shouts, Fairy. The spirit tells him stop blabbing nonsense. Giacca wakes up and finds himself in a strange place. The man is shocked that Giacca is completely fine and was even talking in his sleep. Because when they rescued him, he was half dead. So the man asks him, You, where were you roaming around? Why is it that you were found collapsed in the mountain roads? If it weren't for us, you'd already be in the belly of those mountain beasts. Giacca thanks the man but inquires as to where he is. The man tells Giacca that he is in Mountain Wufeng hideout and himself and the other men present as bandits. You should be able to tell that at least. Giacca apologizes. One of them proceeds to tell Giacca that all six of the are brothers-in-laws and introduces himself as the second. The rest proceeds to in introduce themselves. The patriarch introduces himself as Peng Yiran Cho and tells Giacca that since the saved his life, he would have to repay them little by little from now on. Giacca is confused as to how he's going to repay because he has no money nor means to pay. Tungum tells Giacca, yeah you idiot, I don't know if you've been begging in the outside world but over here you have to sincerely learn and work in other to repay them. It's said that even animals repay you for your grace if you save their lives. You can't be lesser than animals. One of the bandits asks Hyunnam why he's urging Giacca so much. Then tells Hyunnam that it's enough and the boy only just gained consciousness. And offers Giacca a piece of bread. Now you must be hungry, fill your hunger with this first. Giacca hesitantly refused the bread, no I'm good. I'm not hungry at all. Hyunnam tells Giacca that he's lying because his stomach was rumbling even while he was sleeping. Giacca says that's right, but he don't have any money. Hunignam asks him to eat, assuring him that no one will take any money from him. Giacca still hesitantly refused insisting that he really do not have anything to give them. Hunignam starts to wonder why Giacca talks as clumsy as a kid even though he looks about 15 or 16. So he asks the second if he thinks Giacca is an actual idiot. The second assure him that even if that's the case then they can just give Giacca some side chores. Hunnam responds, but after unnecessarily giving him the work and he doesn't do it properly, then we might as well be the ones starving later. The second treplies, he seems like a good kid, so I think he'll do his work well. Hunnam disagrees and say the boy doesn't even know to source food for himself, and the kid is just an idiot. And those who are used to begging have a habit of playing around all day, so they don't like to work, and it can't be helped. He picks Giacca and drags him outside. A second say, here he goes again, our Hyungnam. Hyungnam, since you're doing it anyways, educate him properly. While Giacca yells, why? What are you doing? Wait, let go of me. Hyungnam slams Giacca to the ground. Giacca scared for his life, begs, spare me. I really don't have anything. Hyungnam asks Giacca what he's doing, and tells him that he's not gonna kill him and realizes that Giacca is probably used to getting beat up and asks Giacca how he plans to forage for wild vegetables in his condition. Giacca is confused as it's his first hearing of wild vegetables, and asks why he would need it. Hyunnam responds, what do you mean why? It'll prevent you from becoming food for the beasts. You won't have to think about starving if you join us. But Giacca says he don't think he's cut out to be a bandit, and someone like him can't become a bandit. Hyunnam is him what nonsense is that? Giacca proceeds to tell Hyunnam that he doesn't have the strength, and he don't have anything he's good at. Hyunnam yells at him, I've never seen such a frustrating brat before. Are you going to reject the lifestyle I'm trying to teach you? All because you're scared. Hyunnam raises his voice even higher as he shot to Giacca in this world. There are two kinds of people, the ones who takes from others and the who constantly lose things. Which side do you want to be? Giacca asks, what do you mean? Hyunnam yells even more, I'm asking if you want to continue to live starving like this. Do you really want to continue living being called a retard and live with people ignoring you? Giacca pauses for a while and slowly says, no, I don't want that, I don't want to be ignored anymore. Giacca gets fired up as he continues to talk, I don't want to lose anything to anyone. If I were to choose, I'd rather be someone who takes from others, instead of someone who always loses things. Hyunnam is excited to see Giacca fired up and says, Good. That mindset is enough. Look behind you. From the first peak on the left over there, the fifth peak here in front is part of our land. Vast isn't. Giacca replies, Yes. Hyunnam proceeds to tell Giacca that they are the rulers of Mountain Wufeng, and nobody in the whole of Mountain Wufeng can ignore them, and tells Giacca that if he becomes part of their family, he too will be a ruler as well. Hyunnam asks Giacca, what do you say? Sounds cool right? Giacca replies, yes. Hyunnam shouts, ha, I knew you'd like it. You are now the seventh brother of the mountain Wufeng. What's your name? Giacca replies, Yon Juk Ha, that's my name. Hyunnam replies, Juk Ha, huh, that's a good name. There's something you should keep in mind before joining our family. Listen carefully and memorize it. Hyunnam takes a very deep breath and shouts to the mountains, fuck yeah. 
or the beast. He looks at Jaka and calls him youngest asking his to say the words as well, so Jaka shouted, we're the best. That moment, Yon Juk Ha fells excited for the first time since he was born. The stepmother who always swore at him and his brothers who never cared, as well as the hellish warehouse. The all passed through his head. It had felt like something in his heart that has hardened was cracking. As it fell piece by piece from his heart, it felt as if he was struck by lightning. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet, this new yearning for life woke the sleeping nine heavens Kai. And Juk Ha yells at the top of his voice, full of excitement and life, fuck yeah. We're the best. A shout that sounds like he was releasing everything that was piled up inside of him. Split the clouds and fog and all of Mountain Wufang echoed. It was like the mark of a new beginning in Yon Juk Ha's life. Hyunim is very much happy to have given Jiaka a purpose and says to him, You're a scrawny guy but your voice is excellent. It would be a shame to only give you house chores so I'll pass on my martial arts to you when I have the chance. Juk Ka happily accepts and Hyunim tells him that he'll first have to learn how to do chores inside the house by following the sixth eldest around, and proceeds to tell Juk Ha to at least do the chores properly considering that his body is still very weak right now. Juk Ha responds, Yes, Hyunim, I will give it my all. Hyunim is impressed that Juk Ha called him by his name instead of Sir, and commends him on his fast adaptation. Thank you, Hyunim. Juk Ha replied, Like this, Juk Ha's mountain life had begun. He first learned how to survive. All thought Juk Ha was immature compared to normal people his age due to being locked up for 10 years. Thanks to the bandits of Mountain Wufeng who took him like a little brother, Yon Juk Ha was quickly able to open Hai's mind and adapt to his new life. His daily life was basically perfect. Of course, not every day was smooth. The level of their martial arts was low, since most of the Mountain Wufeng bandits were from common families, so they used to get both small and big injuries whenever they went hiking. However, the satisfaction from the little things in a day-to-day -day life, they lived and enjoyed each and every day. Although he was born to a well-known swordsman family in Luoyang, Yon Juk Ha, who lived a torturous life being abused due to being born to a concubine, ironically, only after becoming a bandit, felt happiness for the first time. Then one day, two men arrived the Wufeng hideout and all the bandit including Juk Ha, came out to greet them bowing their heads. Hyunim mumbles to the second that this is annoying. The looked down on them and told them that he came to find a group of bandits but they all just a group of beggars. Bandit Union. Because it was a name created by the bandits to glorify themselves, it has been nothing but subject of ridicule for many years. Then one day, a monstrous man appeared and referred to himself as the Blade of the Bandit Union. Once his infamy spreads, the experts of the seven sects and two schools proceeded to subjugate him, but not a single person succeeded. His fame and authority grew larger with each passing day, and he was soon called the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, which led to his recognition as one of the ten strongest expects. The experts of the Chaos sects, who were hiding in the shade of the other sects' seven sects and two schools for a long time, fervently praised the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord. As a result, many expacts of the Chaos sect in the martial world had come to visit him in other to join the Bandit Union. After accepting them all and becoming the head hideout leader, he made the Bandit Union unprecedentedly powerful in the history of the Murum. As the status of the Bandit Union grew, it was called Dread of All Bandits and Martial Artist of the Chaos sect. At the Wufeng hideout, Hyunnam is begging the two men who came unannounced to accept them into the Bandit Union. Bandit Union Mountain Davy Hideout Vice Hideout Leader Black Mask Vagabond Yom Sang Chiol Bandit Union Mountain Davy Hideout Vice Hideout Leader Poison Eyed Blood Blade Lee Yung On These two men came as scouts to recruit bandits into the Bandit Union but they don't think the Mountain Wufeng Bandit are worthy to even be called bandits not to even think of letting them carry the Bandit Union flag. Poison Eyed Blood Blade responds to Hunum request to join the Bandit Union. Do you really think bunch of ragtags with only about 10 people have the qualification to carry the Bandit Union flag? Hunum replies and tells him that he can gather the remaining three people within a month. The vice leader yells at him, What do you am when by three people? And points at Juk Ha and proceeds to say, That Brad is just a kid, you'd have to gather at least four. Hunum in the second tried to play it off by saying, He may look like that but be he's quite useful. He does the choirs really well. The vice leader tells them that they are both idiots, that he meant that they would need a minimum of 10 members who can act as combat force. And it's a minimum of 10 people, but that's far too lacking to be truthfully speaking. Are you guys even aware of how big the merchant groups are around this area? Juk Ha wonders who that guy is to be speaking to Hyunnam like that. The vice leader proceeds to tell the Wufeng bandits that even the guards of the merchant groups alone would surpass 10 people, never mind. 
It's fine, I'm the retard for coming all the way here, let's just say that this never happened. The second vice tells him to hold on so they could talk briefly about the decision. They whispered to themselves, poison-eyed, you want me to accept them. Vagabond, yes that's right. Currently we've only mobilized one mountain hideout, and we don't have much time. Half a month later the head hideout leader will be checking. Aren't you aware of what will happen if we don't meet the quota? Pojan-eyed blood blade replies, it didn't make sense to increase the mountain hideout by twofold, to begin with. Vagabond, I know that as well. Poison-eyed, but if the fact that we've accepted these bunch of ragtags gets revealed, then we would be dead regardless. Vagabond replies, there's no need to worry. Didn't you just say the size of the merchant groups around this area is huge? Just as you've said, the reason why there wasn't any mountain hideout around the Henan province is that large merchant groups were dividing power here. Maintaining the mountain hideout here would be difficult even for us, the Mountain Debbie hideout. They'll be devoured and will disappear due to the merchant groups anyway. Where would the evidence of these guys living here be? Poison-eyed blood blade, I see. Vagabond, all we need to do is just fill the quota. The two vice leaders of the Debbie bandits then looks at the Wufeng bandits and accepts them as members of the bandit union, which leave his shock on Hyunnam face, because he wasn't expecting to be accepted into the bandit union. However, Hyunnam must gather ten members before winter. Poison-eyed blood blade proceeds to tell them that they must not tarnish the divinity of the bandit union by running away from nearby merchant groups with your tails tucked between your legs. Hyunnam replies out of excitement, I'll keep that in mind, thank Yao. The mountain Wufeng bandits started to celebrate without knowing anything. It's because most merchant groups paid the passage fee by raising the flags of the bandit union. But the two experts of the Mountain Debbie hideout who know of the strength of the nearby merchant groups had expected the Mountain Wufeng hideout to disappear before two months have passed. However, these expectations were way off. The Mountain Wufeng hideout members prepared to go on their first hiking, operating as the bandits' union. They were all excited as they left. The sixth calls Juk Ha Youngin and tells him that he will have to properly hang the laundry and not to forget to do the dishes. Juk Ha watches as they depart and thinks to himself, I'm tired of doing chores though. I wish I could follow them con their mountain travels too. But remembers Hyunnam telling him, You idiot. Do you know how important it is for household CH pours to be properly done? If we're going around with empty stomach, then all of the heroes and champions of the world will be laughing at us. Juk Ha says to himself, I can't let my Hyunnam be disregarded like that. That's right, I'm doing an important job but Juk Ha still wishes he could go with them. One month of living in the hideout. Two months later. Three months later. Jiaka sits all by himself as all the chores has been instantly, because he's gotten used to doing chaucers. He thinks of what to do with his time as he waits for the group to come back. He remembers that he hasn't practiced any of what he learned in the storage room since he got out. So he decides to practice and prepare in advance for the time when he will be able to join his sworn brothers on their travels, in order to repay their favor, and promises himself that one day, he'll definitely be of help to his sworn brothers. Hyunnam asks everyone to gather and says, These are the people who have volunteered to join the Mountain Wufeng hideout as we accept these three as our new family member. I'd like to make an announcement. Until now, our Mountain hideout had sworn brotherhood with everyone. However, sworn brothers cannot just expand every time. From now on, all members joining will be divided by the odor of recruitment. Now, if you understood what I said, introduce yourselves. One amongst the three steps forward and introduces himself as Chug San, and says that he ran away from the crime of hitting the son of the county magistrate. He followed Gi Duck. Gi Duck then steps forward and introduced himself and that he's friends with Chul San and he joined in order to lessen the burden on his family. The third person is a lady who introduces herself as Han Ki Yon. She says she's 19 years old and her father had sold her to the Palar in Babong County, but she ran away from there. And after returning home, they kept telling her to go back, so she decided that the mountain life would be better than being a courtesan, and asks that the Wufeng clan take good care of her. The second rubs just Ha's head and tells him that now that he has siblings, he won't have to worry about chores anymore. The six eldest tells just Ha that he'll now be able to join them in the mountain travels as well and states that he knows Juk Ha has prancing swordsmanship in the backyards recently. So he asked, You wanted to go on the mountain travels with us right? Juk Ha excitedly replies, Yes, and is excited that he can finally be able to accompany them on their travels. Hyunnam proceeds to tell the new recruit that unless they have exceptional talent, their ranks are determined by the odor of becoming a member of the mountain hideout. Therefore since Chol San is three months older than Go Duk, Chol San is the eight, Giduk is the ninth and Chai Yen is the youngest. 
and asked if anyone has any objections. Chul San wasn't comfortable with being below Jack Ha, so he confirms from Hyunnam if he can move up the ranks by having good fighting talent. Hyunnam replies, Of course, we are the bandit union. Anyone who's stronger becomes the Hyunnam no matter what. Are you somewhat good at fighting? Chul San replies, telling Hyunnam that he has had the opportunity of attending military offices for three years. Hyunnam then asked him to choose who he doesn't want to be below and if he defeats whoever he chooses then he'll be raised to the rank of the person he defeats. Chul San chooses Juk Ha as his opponent and says it's strange for him to consider Juk Ha as his elder. Hyunnam uses Juk Ha if he's going to maintain his rank by fighting Chum San, or just accept to become the younger brother to Chul San. Juk Ha considers the situation and thinks, if I avoid this fight here, I may not be able to join them on the mountain travels. But Juk Ha is determined to go on the mountain trailers so he chooses to fight. Both Hyunnam and the second are shocked that Juk Ha has actually chosen to fight, and ask Juk Ha if he's going to be okay, because it's obvious that Chug San has had some combat experience. Hyunnam then tell the second to leave Juk Ha alone as he thinks this is going to be interesting. So he announces, Now, the two of you will fight, and the loser will become the younger brother unconditionally. Chul San tells Juk Ha that he won't go easy on him in a fight. Juk Ha replies, enough with the nonsense. Two of the sworn brothers heard Juk Ha and smiled because, enough with the nonsense, is a phrase commonly used by the Hyunnam, and they are proud that the boy is not scared at all. Chul San is pissed at Juk Ha acting so cocky but doesn't mind right now because he thinks that if he can just become sworn brothers by defeating Juk Ha then that's a piece of cake. He yells as he plunges forward, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to be defeated with this one strike. Juk Ha easily dodges his attack and with a swift move strikes Chul San as though he was wielding a blade, but didn't land a hit. Chul San is stunned. The movement is so fast, Chul San couldn't see what just happened. Juk Ha quickly realizes that he's fighting without a weapon. Then, he quickly strikes Juk Ha again shouting, You surprised me you little brat. He lands a V-heavy punch to Jiok's face. Juk Ha is on the ground bruised from the punch and thinks of how he's going to fight now that he has no weapon, because he didn't learn anything like that in the storage room. The second is worried and asks Hyunnam if they should stop Juk Ha, because it looks like he hasn't fought a single time. Chul San continues to pound Juk Ha, and Juk Ha gets frustrated and yells, Just why? Why am I getting hit by fists like that? Out of frustration lunches an uppercut to Chul San's nose. With a bleeding nose, Chul San gets mad as it looks like Juk Ha is really trying to embarrass him, and slams Juk Ha to the ground with a heavy punch, telling him to stay down if he doesn't want to be heavily injured. Then he should just stay down. Juk Ha yells back at him, no, I'm going to win. Chul San tells Juk Ha that he's just all talk and a small brat and lands a finishing blow. Chul San feels so proud after knocking Jioka out. While Juk Ha lays down knocked out of the ground, Chul San looks at him and says, I did warn you to just stay down, you brought this onto yourself. And faces Hyunnam, you saw that right, now I'm the seventh. Who said that? Juk Ha says, shocking everyone, it's not over yet, never, I'll never give you that position. Bring it on, he say as he stands back on his feet. Let's do it until the end. Let's see this to the end, come at me. What are you doing, come at me. Chul San is surprised to see Juk Ha standing after taking those hits, because even most well-trained men end up at the doctors after taking his punches, and still wonders how Juk Ha is fine because he took numerous hits directly. While Chul San is just standing still thinking Hyunnam asks him what he's doing. Aren't you going to continue? If you've lost the will to fight, is it okay if I take it as you giving up? Chul San feels humiliated and tells Hyunnam not to regret this cause he might end up just killing the kid. As he runs off with full strength to strike Juk Ha, Juk Ha looks unfazed as he prepares for his counter-attack. He acquired an exceptional martial arts, nine heaven sword concept, but he still had no idea how to utilize that strength properly. Because of that, he hadn't realized that he was strong. His will to travel to the mountains, and his desire to win were enough to unlock the nine heavens Kai Juk Ha had gathered while locked away for ten years. Juk Ha decides to think of his fist as a blade, and this, Chul San can't believe his eyes and wonders if he's seeing things. Juk Ha delivers a very fast and powerful punch to Chul San's gut, which makes him cough out blood and pass out while standing. But Juk Ha didn't realize this and thinks that the hit didn't work how he wanted and it probably isn't working cause it's not a sword, as he is about to hit him the second time. Chul San falls to the ground, passed out cold. This makes Jaka seem confused and happy at the same time. The second was about telling Hyunnam to stop Juk Ha, but everyone just sees Chul San fall to the ground. Everyone is amazed, because Juk Ha's move was so fast, no one was able to see what happened. And when the second asks Hyunnam what happened, 
He says, from what I saw, it looked like he just suddenly collapsed after running and wonders if Cholsan have some sort of chronic illness, because Cholsan is completely out. One of the sworn brothers says, I mean the could have ended up like that because Juk Ha hit him right. Then one of the sworn bro, I don't know man, I couldn't see it because you were talking to me. Hunam smiles and cuts them all from arguing and says, does it matter? And announces that, the victor of the rank match has been decided. Rank 7 of the mountain hideouts is still Yon Juk Ha. After the fight, Juk Ha is then presented with a weapon by the second eldest who tells Juk Ha that Hyunnam wants him to have it, because he was impressed by his fight. The second also informs Juk Ha that he can also join the trips to the mountain starting tomorrow. Juk Ha excitedly thanks him and promises to work hard. The second clears his throat and tells Jiaka to hold his horses and says, It's good to be full of spirit, but fist fights are completely different. If you let your desire consume you, you'll be cut down by a blade before you know it. You were only able to win because it was a fist fight but you would have died over a dozen times if it were a sword fight. But Jakha mutters, I could have won easily if it was a sword fight. The second shouts, silence, I'll teach you my exorcism sword technique. Pay attention. You know I ate the temple food when I was young, right? So even if I do it all, it won't take longer than three seconds each. But still, be hard for you since it's your first time learning a sword technique. Yes older brother, Jakha exclaimed. Hung Hyunnam sees the two practicing and says, It seems Tak has also taken a liking to our youngest. The exorcism technique was something he never taught, even when we begged. One of the other brothers seems a bit worried about Juk Ha going with them on the mountain trip starting tomorrow. Hung Hyunnam tells him that it's going to be fine and things will be over once they take on the name of Bandit Union and it's time to say goodbye to the past when they fought to death and assures him that nothing's going to happen. The next day, we see a merchant and his troops passing by. While being escorted by some warriors and a skilled martial artist, the merchant seems very worried and says, It's ominous, very ominous, I haven't had such a bad sleep in a while. So he called the martial artist, Great Brother Kang. I can't help but worry. My gut feeling is usually spot on. Nothing's going to happen right. Kang laughs and asks, Are you acting that way because of the rumors of some petty thieves having appeared in Mountain Wufeng? Don't worry, even sea dragons from the bottom of the towers won't be able to bother you if you're traveling with me. The merchant still seems worried and says, That should be the case, right? I'm relieved to have you by my side but, before the merchant could finish what he has to say, an arrow is shot at him, which Kang catches without breaking a sweat. Now the merchant is scared to his pants. Kang don't seem impressed and says, They don't have any manners, eh? He walks forward as, Wu Feng bandits appears and shouts, This area belongs to the mountain Wu Feng hideout of the bandit union. Kang doesn't believe that they are from the bandit union having less than 10 members, so he mocks them and laughs saying, it seems our man's merchant group has been greatly underestimated, and now we are being threatened by these petty thieves. He laughs even harder and asks them to say something that makes sense. Pung Hyunnam says, This bastard sound like he wants to taste another arrow. But Tak reminds him that the guy just caught their first arrow with his bare hands. Pung Hyunnam angrily says, Then we can shoot multiple arrows at once. Hey, merchant group bastards, you seem to be acting out just because you have numbers. I'll make sure you understand what happens when you make fun of us in Mountain Wufang. Furious Hyunnam orders his guys to shoot. Kang gives a cheeky smile and says, How pathetic. This is why I despise low-level thief bastards. And single-handedly cuts down all arrows that is being fired at him and the merchant group. The Wufeng hideout members all froze in fear. And wonders how possible it is that all those arrows were deflected by just one sword. At that moment, Pung Hyunnam realizes that they are fucked. And that, Kang is an expert martial artist. Kang gets so furious and calls them bastards who are worse than parasites. You'll all die by my Kang Mudiok's hands, and orders the guards to get rid of them. Pung Hyunnam frightened, tells everyone to snap out of it, that they'll all die anyway if they show the guards their backs. Then what do we do? They asked. Hyunnam informs them to run while he draws the guards' attention. But before he could finish his statement, Juk Ha steps forward, but everyone is scared for his life and tries to call him back, but he ignores them and stands in front of everyone. Kang laughs really hard at the sight of Juk Ha and says, You savage bastards, are you trying to run by using this kid as a shield? And also says, Hey you pathetic bastards, you think that Snot Nose Brat can give you some time? Juk Ha don't seem to care what Kang says and says, Anjasi, you're in trouble now. With a killer look on his face, Kang replies, What? Are you in your right mind? You're the ones in trouble brat. Juk Ha responds, This is what our elder brother said, In Mountain Wufang, no one dare laugh at us. Both Tak and Hunnam thinks Juk Ha has gone mad and are both thinking of stopping him before he provokes Kang further. Kang is flabbergasted, and asks, Young ones, should I say they're fearless, or that they're stupid? So he shouts, Hey, kid, 
I, Kang Mudiak of the Merchant Group will not go easy on you because you're a child. If you repent of your mistakes, I can still let you live. Jukka responds, you're full of crap. You've got quite the mouth for a man about to get beaten to death. Tak begins to blame Hyunam for Juaka's behavior. Look at the mess you've made, teaching the kids strange things. Hyunam responds saying that he had no idea things would turn out this way. Kang gets really angry, and angrily shouts, This brat who's still wet behind the ears, you're the one who asked for it. He runs towards Jukka, and plunges into the air, in a striking position. Lunch is a swift slash, and to everyone present, it seems like Jukha didn't move, so Hyunam shouts, Jukha. But in reality, Jioka movement was so fast. No one could see that he moved away right before the blade could touch him. Kang lands on the ground after his strike. Confused and shocked, Kang sees that his sword has been cut in two. Everyone also sees this and they are all shocked and confused as well. Kang's mind is all over the place as he also wonders what just happened. Didn't the attack follow through? Did he dodge right before the sword touched him? There's no way. It would be a tough feat for even the Zenit of experts. On top of that, he couldn't see Jaka's sword move. What's wrong Ajisi? If you're done, is it my turn now? Jukha says with a killer smile on his face. Kang shouts wait. I'll, I'll go and switch up my weapon, so please wait. With a confused face. Jukha says, you wanna do that? Then bring a tough one this time. The last one was weak, so I almost sliced your neck along with it. After you switch out, I'll just cut your sword. Kang is scared after listening to what Jukha said. Because he thinks Jukha's sword wasn't even close enough to reach him. But notices the little cut on his neck. Kang kneels down immediately. Bow down, begging Jaka for forgiveness. He says, I'm sorry. I committed a sin worthy of death. I will pay the transit fee, so please just spare my life. And mutters to himself, he's a monster. Does it make sense for one so young to reach the level where they can use sword aura? I've never seen or heard anything like this. Jaka stares clueless and smiles as he watches Kang beg. And so he says, fine, I'll take a generous transit fee, not a problem in the slightest. The entire Wufeng bandits are stunned. On their way back to the hideout, Kingdom is still shocked from what happened back there so he asks Jukha how he did what he did back there. Jukha smiles and asks if it's about how he cut the sword. Kingdom affirms, yeah, where did you learn those techniques? Jukha responds and says that it's the exorcism sword technique that the second brother thought him a few days ago. Kingdom is shocked to hear this because his heavenly unwavering sword technique and the second's exorcism sword technique are both just third-rate sword techniques. But Jukha was able to cut the Sword of the Lightning Sword Kang Mudiak with just those sword techniques and wonders if it's actually possible. So he playfully asked Jukha to show him a demonstration of the exorcism sword technique he learned. Jukha replies, of course elder brother. At Mountain Wufeng hideout, everyone watches. As Jukha demonstrates the moves, the lady that joined last watches him and is really amazed by his moves. Step by step, he demonstrates it all. It's all beautiful to watch, and his final swing is powerful enough to cut a tree in two. So he says, that's all. After a moment of glare from everyone, they all starts running towards Jaka and celebrating him. Awesome, you're amazing. Youngest, is this really tax technique? Teach me too. Chul San apologizes for calling Jukha too easy on the day he first met him. The tent, which is the lady, also comes to praise him. That was so cool. How did you do that? You're very very amazing. Can you also teach me later? Shai Jukha tells her that it's not really that amazing. Hyunam asks Tak if the exorcism sword technique was always like that. Tak responds, it just seems that Jukha is the amazing one here brother. Hyunam thinks, what exactly is that guy? Jiaka smiles, five peak mountains. On the next patrol, we see a merchant running to attack Jukha and shouts, how dare a mere bandit block our path? Prepare for your punishment. He strikes but Jukha easily dodges and immediately counterattack by cutting the merchant's sword and placing his sword on his neck. The merchant begs and say that he has lost. Yon Jiaka went on patrols from autumn to winter, but none of the escort's warriors in the merchant union were able to take his attack. The news of Jukha spreads as people start to put up posters about him in the neighboring towns, and rumors about the Five Peak stronghold spread like wildfire. Tak seems surprised, as a lot of people gathered in their hideout, so he asks Hyunam, What on earth is happening here, chief? Hyunam replies, I don't know either. What kind of situation is this? Tak responds, I think it's because rumors of Jaka have spread, and if we indulge these guys that just came, we'll have 25 of us. What should we do, chief? Just give me a moment to think, Hyunam replies. Three months later, the Five Peak stronghold became a large stronghold quickly. They started to gain a name in within Henan province, and morale was on the rise for them. However, as the stronghold became bigger, there appeared others who also had their own plans. An elderly man is seen with his disciple, who had joined the Wufeng hideout with other motives. The old man asks, did you find out? And his disciple answered, yes, we need to take down number seven and we're good to go. 
After that we just need to take out Chief Pong and Vice Chief Tak. The rest until number 6 won't last a single punch. Moreover, Chief and Vice Chief won't be a match for you. The man who just gave this report is number 29, H. Wang Yamiyang. And the old man is number 26, Gimel Northern Sword Shim Yanggak. Shim thinks the report is strange, and wonders how weaklings like them get acknowledged as Green Forest. H. Wang asks, pardon, what's Green Forest? Shim yells at him that how could he not know about Green Forest and he calls himself a mountain bandit, and proceeds to tell him that. Green Forest is the dream of all mountain bandit. Beggars have beggar sect, and mountain bandits have Green Forest. Green Forest's command chief, heaven-destroying demon lord, is famous for being monstrously strong, and he's on par with even the leaders the reputable Miram clans. And that's the reason why I who was from the unorthodox sex came here. If I become a part of the Green Forest, then I don't need to bow my head to the orthodox bastards. H. Wang apologizes and says, I'm sorry, I don't know much about the Miram. But, if it's as you have said, then it would be quite hard to be recognized as part of the Green Forest. Wouldn't that have been impossible for the chief and vice chief's level of martial arts? Could it be that Yong Jaka is more powerful than the rumors say? Shim answers. That doesn't seem to be the case, but I haven't seen him in action because they haven't gone on patrols due to the weather. Another elderly man enters the room and says, Don't worry about that. No matter how powerful Yong Jiaka is, he won't be a match for the Gumul Northern Sword who's able to stand his ground against the five great clan's martial masters. Shim welcomes him and says, Oh, you're here. Do you have any good news for me? The elderly man proceeds to say that the only reason why the Mountain Wufeng hideout is under Green Forest is because Green Forest was expanding because the Orthodox Alliance was also expanding. And because there weren't any notable strongholds in Henan province, it seems they got lucky and became a part of Green Forest. Shim is pleased to hear this and says, That means while they're Green Forest in name, they're actually just ragtag bunch of mountain bandits. The older man responds, Yes, there's no need to look into this any further. They give people their rank based on sequence they join the stronghold. I can't believe these guys could become Green Forest. Shim shouts, That's right, the Green Forest isn't a place for kids to play around. And this is evidence that they are just nobodies. H. Wang and the other disciples then bows and say, We'll be counting on both elders here. Shim replies, Don't worry, after we are done cleaning up this place, we'll make sure you guys get high ranks. Excited, both disciples shouts, Thank you. It's evening already. Number 10 can be seen washing some dishes while Jaka prepares some food. Then number 10 asks Jaka if he's heard about the people that recently joined them are requesting for a rank fight. Jaka reluctantly tells her that he's heard and what's about it. Then she proceeds to tell him to make sure he punishes them during the fight. Gianca asks her why, and also asks her if it's because they look down on her. She then tells him that, that's not the case. She heard them mocking the chief by chance and saying that the chief's technique is learned from the streets. Gianca after hearing this, gets furiously enraged, scaring the tenth sister, and breaks the table he was using to prepare some dishes. So he asked the tenth, who mocked the chief? But she tells him that she don't know because she only heard while passing by. Jiaka angrily storms off saying that he'll get the answers from them directly. But as Jiaka was about going into the room, he's then spotted by the fourth brother Hio and Dao, who calls Jiaka and asks him where he's rushing to at this late hour. Jiaka turns to him and tells him Dao that he heard that some of the newbies were mocking the chief and if that were true, he was going to rip their tongues out. But Dao asks him if he's going to kill the newbies that they worked so hard to pick out, and proceeds to tell Jiaka that. That's exactly what the chief was worried about. Jiaka is surprised to hear that the chief was worried. Imdal tells him that it's true and says, Looking at you now, I'm also worried. We're worried that you'll turn all the newbies to vegetable at the rank fight. But Jaka angrily shouts that he won't forgive anyone who mocks his sworn brothers. Imdal is relieved to hear this but, walks up to him, holds him by the shoulder and tells him that they need to go back into the mountains once the snow is over and they would also need the newbies to be able to use their hands and legs. He proceeds to tell Jaka to head back inside for now because at this rate he might catch a cold. Jiaka isn't pleased with this, but obeys and heads back inside. The next day at Five Peak Stronghold, also known as Mountain Wufeng Hideout, Kingdom welcomes everyone gathered, and announces the reason for the gathering, which is because some people have requested for a ranked fight. He also urges whoever is interested in moving up the ranks by rank fights to participate in the fight and not miss the opportunity, because the Five Peak Stronghold don't usually accept rank fights. The ninth brother then asks Chul Sen if he's going to try again. Which Chul Sen then replies, Are you crazy? I won't ever try it again. Kingdom then announces that those who wishes to put up a challenge to step forward, the elderly man and their disciples steps forward and begins to mock the chief once again, calling him a nobody with a loud voice. Kingdom is confused, but proceeds to ask if these five people are the only challengers they have. He continues with the announcement and says that they can choose who they want to fight and get their rank. 
but starting from number 7 and above, they must fight each of them according to sequence. He also adds that the duel will proceed fairly and the results will be acknowledged without complaints, and now asks them to tell him who they'd like to fight. With a grin smile on Shim's face he says that they are all aiming for number 1. Hyunam looks at him and asks really. You won't regret it right. Old man Shim smiles in a mocking manner. He then proceeds to ask Hyunam why they'd regret it and says that all five of them are notorious martial masters within the Henan province. He adds that how would any of them be scared of someone who used to be a drug peddler? One of the disciples mocks the chief Hyunam, saying, Gosh that's so scary and laughs while the other says, How could we be defeated by the heaven and earth blade technique? All these mockery and laughs is really getting to Tak who calls them bastards and wants to go hit them, but Hyunam tells him not to do anything. Then, Shim comes forward, standing in front of the chief, gathers up some spits in his mouth, and spits at the chief. He then proceeds to say that the weather is chilly today, and I'm feeling hungry, let's get this over with quickly. Shim's impudent behavior is getting to Jaka and he is running out of patience so he begs the chief Hyunam to please let him make an example out of them. The chief then calmly says that they'll go by sequence that was decided. He then calls Jaka who responds, yes. The two elderly men still acting cheeky tells them that they seem to be putting all their trust in that brat, and the world will soon know that his skills are overly exaggerated. As Jaka steps forward, Shim suspects something ominous as he stares. Jiaka steps forward with massive aura emanating from his entire body. The two elderly men looks like they are seeing death right in front of their eyes, and frightfully asks each other what is happening. Then Jaka filled with rage says that he thought he was going to die of pent anger. He calls at them and asks, which of you fucker wants to get beat up first? Everyone watches as Jiaka walks forward. Jiaka stands in front of them and asks, who wants to go first? They all seem to be afraid at the sight of him and couldn't decide who's going first. One of the disciples then suggests that the elders go first but, Shim scared as fuck, tells him that it doesn't seem right for the elders to go first and it wouldn't look good on them. The other elderly man also agrees with Shim and shakingly says that it's normal for lower ranks to go first. The disciple is really scared and mutters to himself that, that wasn't what the elders said before. So he asks them who's going first. The disciple tells both elders that his stomach has been feeling unwell since. Only by looking at Jaka, his instincts is telling him that Jaka is dangerous and thinks he needs to observe the situation first. While the disciple is still in his thoughts, one of the other disciples pushes him forward, which automatically makes him the first contender. He seems scared but tries to put up a bold face. He sees Jaka as a giant that's ready to devour him as he feels the unbelievable bloodlust from Jaka. He tries to encourage himself and tells himself that there's no need to turn back now because he doesn't want to get a lower priority for the ranking later and tries to think of a way to actually fight Jaka. He comes up with a plan to make Jaka fight with his bare hands because he thinks that Jaka is only good with a sword. So he tells Jaka that since they are not enemies, then they should determine the victor with just bare hands. Jaka accepts. H. Wang looks at this as an opportunity and plunges to strike Jaka, but was instantly defeated with a single uppercut by Jaka which sends him flying and crashing into the walls. The two elders and the disciples are wowed by this. Jiaka with an enormous bloodlust, says who's next. Then the second disciple steps forward and introduces himself as Yom Sweong and requests to also fight with just fists as well. And he is immediately knocked out by a single punch to the gut by Jiaka. The third guy steps forward and introduces himself as H. Wang Yamyang and unlike the previous two, he requests to fight with weapons. Jiaka tells him to make sure he won't regret that and finishes him off with just a single strike. He gives the remaining two a killer look and says, Next, both elders realizes that Jaka is way stronger than they thought, because he just took all three of their disciples out without breaking a sweat. Jaka asks them what they are doing and asks them if they are not willing to fight anymore. Shim tells him to give them a bit of time to decide who's higher in rank between themselves, and Joka tells them to do whatever they like and step up. The second elder thinks Jaka is just a fucking brat who has gotten very arrogant but also acknowledges the fact that the boy is strong and plans to use a secret move against Jaka. As he steps forward, he brings out a hand fan and introduces himself as Beak Jio and says that he won't use a sword against someone who's in the same stronghold as him. And Jaka ignorantly says that he won't use his sword either. Beak Jio seems excited and gives a devilish smile because he thinks he's got Jaka hooked. He rushes to strike Jaka with his fan but Jaka didn't move. He strikes but Jaka was unable to evade his attack and blocks it instead. This makes Beak think he has the upper hand in the fight so he mocks Jaka and asks him how he's unable to keep up with a fan. Shim seems pleased with the fight so far and calls Beak a cunning old fox, and explains how Beak used that fan to become a notorious demon in Henan province, and say that fighting Beak is as good as committing suicide, so he thinks Shim will win and there will be no need for himself to fight. 
Jiaka don't seem to have taken any damage from the multiple hits he took head-on by blocking only. He looks at Beak and says, that wasn't a regular fan, huh? Beak, about to strike Jaka again. Acting almighty, he tells Jaka that it seems like he wants to receive some beating, but stares and reflects on the fact that his fan can crush even boulders. But there seems to have been no impact on Jaka after taking multiple hits from him. Jaka calls him old fart. And from nowhere, Jaka's fist appears in front of Shim's face. Jaka before landing the blow, asks him if he doesn't know what a fair fight means, then proceeds to land a very powerful and damaging blow to Beak's jaw, which sends him flying through the place. Everyone watching, including Hyunnam, are shocked at the mere sight of the strength of that single punch. Jaka pauses and tries to calm down. He picks up his sword and asks Shim if he's going to use a sword. Shim thinks carefully before responding because he has just witnessed Jaka defeat Beak so easily and he's also more stronger than the rumor says. While Shim is still in his thoughts, Jaka drags his sword on the floor and walks slowly towards Shim. Shim shouts begging Jaka to wait and says that he doesn't have any intention to continue. He then proceeds to say that it's hard to determine who is stronger between him and Beak Jile, but however he doesn't think he needs to fight at all. Jaka angrily says, Hey old fart, sear this into your mind. If you dare mess around with my brothers again, you'll die the next time, get that. Shim thinks this is so humiliating and not only that, Jaka is also speaking so informally to him. His thought gets interrupted by Hyunam who laughs at him and tells him that they got what they deserve, and Shim is still in disbelief that he'll have to serve the chief and his vice as his superior, because he thinks they are both idiots. But Jaka interrupts his thought and asks for his answer from the previous question, and Shim shamefully says, Yes, I'll work hard to serve all of you. Hyunam then makes a mockery of Shim's situation and says to Jiaka, Oh, damn, what do we even do if you took care of all of them all alone? Jiaka also plays along and says he's sorry and laughs. Shim bows his head as Jiaka and the rest of Mountain Woofing Bandit walks away. Hyunam then asks Jiaka what he wants to eat because he's sure Jiaka must have been hungry from all that fighting. Jiaka then tells Hyunam that he'll like to have whatever he's having, and they both laugh and walk away. Shim feels so humiliated and promises himself to pay them back for the humiliation. Hijia Village, Nanyang Merchant Union. A messenger is seen running towards a building as he pushes people aside and shouts that he needs to meet with him. And the we see a man sipping hot tea. The messenger arrives and shouts Master, there's big trouble, the rumors we were worried about are true. He then proceeds to tell his master that Shim Yongak and Beak Jio were both seen coming out of the Five Peaks stronghold today. But his master don't seem to be worried. He then proceeds to tell his servant that, if the world finds out that two of three great demons of Henan province join the Five Peak Stronghold, they will experience another spurt of growth they won't be able to stop. The messenger also adds that they were a lot of merchant union that were affected by the growth of the Five Peak Stronghold in the autumn that just passed. The master seems to be having a good time, as he thinks this is all interesting. He then asks the messenger for who among Beak and Shim became the chief. The messenger then tells him that, about that, the chief is still Pung Yoncho who uses the heaven and earth technique. And based on the rumors he heard, both Beak and Shim lost in the rank fight. The master whose name is Lee Muryong says that's impossible and says that he's sure that the information the messenger heard is wrong. The messenger then adds that the five peak stronghold have already grown past 30 men in strength, and now they also have both Shim and Beak in their ranks, then asks for what should be done about the situation. Please if you're enjoying this video, like and subscribe so I can be motivated to do more. Thank you. The master then asks if he has anything else to say because he thinks the situation is very good. He proceeds to say that he's always been bothered by Beak and Shim and he loathed being called one of the Henan province great demon alongside the two of them, because he never saw them as his equal. He then adds that the Nanyang Merchant Union will no longer allow the Five Peak Mountains bandits to wreak havoc anymore, because according to him, the Five Peak Mountains bandits have crossed the line. He then proceeds to say that they'll use this chance to get rid of the bandits and the two old gizzers, as this is a great thing for them. But the messenger adds that they are not people that should be underestimated. Li Muryong assures him that it's alright and asks that he have some trust in the Nanyang Merchant Union. He also adds that since the bandits are 30 men, they themselves at the Nanyang Merchant Union have three times more than the bandits. Five Peak Stronghold. The place is peaceful. Jiaka is seen outside polishing his sword. Then one of the bandits comes before him and offers him some water which he gracefully accepts. As the bandit hands the water to Jaka, he tells Jaka that he was really surprised to see him easily take down one of the Henan province great demons, Beak Jio. But Yon Jaka tells him that it was nothing much and Henan only has weaklings. The warrior then says that aside, and asks him why he's making his broad sword stand up like that. He then proceeds to tell Jaka that in the past, people used to say that martial masters are able to use a mere leaf to cut people and says to Jaka that seeing the way is shaping his sword is what made him remember those words. 
These words catches Jaka's interest and now he's curious to know more because he's never heard of that before. But the warrior thinks he has said something useless, thanks Jaka for his hard work and leaves. But those words didn't leave Jaka's head because he thinks it's incredible that a martial master can cut a person with just a leaf. He also wonders when he can become skilled enough in the martial art to do that, and wonders if someone like that exists. Then he'd like to meet the person. It's a cool evening outside. Some bandits were sleeping while some were on watch duty. One of the guys on watch heard some sounds from outside the stronghold and proceed to go check it out. He gets there so tired and unbothered. But upon getting there, he's surprised with the terrifying sight of fire. He runs back and throws away his flame touch. Lots of flame arrows are being fired at the stronghold, and shouts as he runs back, fire arrows, fire arrows, and continues to shout, it's an enemy ambush, as he runs away from the burning fence. Giaka turns back due to all the noise and shouting, and sees all the commotion. The intruders kept firing fire arrows at the fence. Giaka is confused as to why someone would attack them, and shouts, damn it. Kingdom rushes out as he hears all the noise and commotion. He orders everyone to stay calm and to also prepare for battle. One of the warriors rushes to tell him that at this rate, all their outer walls will be burned down, and proceeds to say that he'll go out to fight the intruders and put out the fire. But the chief pauses and thinks for a while. He remembers that there is only one entrance and exit to the Five Peak Stronghold, and if they go outside, they will become sitting ducks for the enemies waiting outside, and they would be no different from rabbits smoked out of their den by fire running straight into the hands of the hunter. He laughs and calls the enemies idiots, saying he figured that they probably weren't expecting him to be so smart. So he gives the order that no one is allowed to go out and they should all maintain distance so that the fire don't get to them, and also informs them that the plan is to build a new wall. Everyone hurries in building of the new wall. But Jaka isn't going to just sit and let the intruders disrespect them like that, and he's really angry that someone would dare set fire to their stronghold, and promises that whoever it is will pay dearly. All the burning is over and smoke covers the entire place. The leader of the merchant union who lead the attack is impressed with the fact that even though the Five Peak Stronghold are just mere bandits, none of them tried to escape and even after so many fire arrow were fired, although he thinks it doesn't change anything, because according to him, the result would be the same. He orders his men to bring down the burnt fence but, as they bring it down, his two right-hand men were getting excited because they think their leader is truly amazing for coming up with such an idea to attack using fire as that would make them not to lift a single finger to destroy the stronghold. The leader, Lee, gives a proud smile and says that once the outer walls are gone, they'll be able to destroy the bandits easily with numbers. But he's shocked as the burnt wall comes down, and questions when that was done. The smoke clears out, and all of the merchant union members are shocked to see that the Five Peak stronghold have already put up a second wall amidst all the burning and smoke. So they ask the leader, Lee, what the next step would be. Lee is angry at the sight of this while both his right-hand men mutters between themselves. One of them says that the plan has failed and the other one shuns his colleague asking him to shut up unless he wants to die because Lee is a very prideful man. Lee tries to act cool as if he already anticipated what just happened. He orders everyone to stay calm and says that it appears that the bandits have used their brains. He proceeds to tell every of his followers that he will employ other planned strategy. One of the bandits from the Five Peak Stronghold, watching from a small hole in their wall, sees Lee pull out an axe from his cloth and begins walking towards them. With fear on his face he announces to everyone that a guy with an axe is approaching and asks Hingdom for what their next move would be. Hingdom asks him if he's sure the information he passed is correct about the person approaching alone, and he affirms that it's correct and that the person approaching only has an axe in his hands. But Hingdom orders everyone to not yet let their guard down. Shim also peeps from a hole in the wall and wonders what that person approaching is up to because he don't think someone in their right senses would actually strike the wooden wall recklessly with an axe. H. Wang also thinks the same and says that he would have to be a complete idiot to actually do something like that, unless he has something else planned. Jaka is losing his patience and says the entire situation is frustrating. He tells Shim to step aside so he can go take a look for himself. But Shim is against this idea. Shim looks closely at who's with the axe and approaching recklessly. At that moment, he realizes that that man outside is the Heavenly Swords man, Li Muriang. Shim is troubled and announces to everyone that they are up against the Nanyang Merchant Union, and adds that the man approaching is the leader of the Nanyang Merchant Union, and also one of the Henan's three great demons. Jiaka says, is that so? He pauses for a while and says, so the enemy leader is in front of us, huh? Li stands right outside of the fence and stares at it, and as he's about to strike the fence, he angrily shouts, how dare you, how dare you bandits mock me? He strikes the fence with a martial art technique, as he shouts, a stupid wooden wall trying to stand in my way, and says that a single strike from his axe is all he needs to take down the stupid fence. His axe easily penetrates the fence, with a very scary smile on his face. 
He laughs because he was right about being able to bring down the fence with just his axe. But at that moment, Jiaka comes destroying the entire fence and Lee tries to protect himself from the falling wood pieces. Jiaka lands in front of the multiple broken woods and Lee asks him who he is. But Jiaka's response is also a question, so he angrily asks Lee if he's the leader. Lee is surprised to see that the person addressing him is just a kid, and he immediately tries to cut down Jiaka with his axe. But Jiaka blocks his attack with a single swing wielding his sword with just one hand. Lee is astounded by Jiaka's strength, so he retreats temporarily and poses for his next strike as he lands. He tightens his grip on the axe. At that moment he realizes that his body went straight into defense mode just after a single strike from Jaka's blade energy, and thinks Jaka's strength is unbelievable. He then looks at Jaka and says, I see. Jaka filled with rage, walks towards Lee, and Lee asks him if he's the bandit swordmaster of the Five Peak Mountains. But Jaka didn't respond, so Shim says that he didn't expect him to be so young. And the only words that came out of Jaka's mouth are, is that important? Jiaka is ready to kill, and tells Lee that the only thing important now is that he just set their house on fire. Jiaka proceeds to tell him that he's being stupidly petty for using fire arrows despite having an advantage in numbers, and Lee disgracefully tells Jaka that this is known as the fire attack strategy. Jiaka tells Lee that he has no idea of what he's talking about, and asks him how he's going to compensate for all the damage caused. Lee shouts at him, asking him why he'd ever consider doing something like that and calls him an idiot. He points his axe at Jaka and says, You guys established yourselves on five peak mountains, plunder others, and made a notorious name for yourselves, and that's why I'm here to represent Henan province to subjugate all of you. Jiaka responds by telling him that they never stole nor took from others, and that they simply collected toll fees. But Lee insists and tells Jaka that's the same thing, and asks Jaka if he actually thinks that him and his bandit group own the entry of Five Peak Mountains. Jiaka instantly says, yes that's correct, it all belongs to us. Lee tells him that he's being so ridiculous but Jaka cuts his talk and asks him why he's talking so much. Lee is sweating, and tells Jaka that he sure do have lots of confidence. He proceeds to ask Jaka if he thinks he'll survive after provoking him, and also adds that he don't know how Jaka was able to defeat Shim and Beak but he's stronger. Jaka couldn't care less about what Lee has to say and asks him when they are going to start fighting. Lee filled with frustration calls Jaka an impudent brat, throws away his axe, and unsheathes his sword. He tells Jaka that he's going to teach him some lessons on manners, but Jaka reluctantly tells him to do whatever he wants. This infuriates Lee, so he tells Jaka that he won't let his guard down like Beak and Shim, and he won't go easy on him even if he's just a kid. Jiaka smiles and tells him that everyone says that same thing and also urges him to make sure he doesn't let his guard down, because he hopes for an interesting fight. Lee is really mad this time and rushes to strike Jiaka, calls him a brat tells him that it's too late now, even if he begs and cry. They both run towards each other to deliver powerful blows. Lee devises a plan to not go with any variation and use his strongest move to end the fight with just one blow. Jaka looks amazed at the sight of Lee's technique. Lee creates multiple shadow clones and they all attack Jaka at once. Jaka is impressed and says the fight is far more interesting than he thought. He easily blocks Lee's attack, because he's able to tell the real attacker from the shadow clones. Lee is dumbfounded by this and wonders how Jaka is able to block all his attacks that easily. Jaka gathers some momentum and plunges, and delivers his own strike to Lee, which Lee barely managed to block. He could barely stand his ground after blocking the attack. Jaka commends him and tells him that he's got an interesting technique too. Lee is disgusted by the words Jaka used to describe his technique because his unchanging noon sword technique is mountain hua sex martial art, and there is no way a mare bandit could block it. Lee frustrated, yells at Jaka, asking him who the hell he is, where he's from and what martial arts he uses. Jaka smirks in triumph and tells Lee that he doesn't have anything like where he's from. He proceeds to tell Lee that his martial art is the demon slaying blade technique. That second brother Tak thought him personally. Lee is lost for words because the demon slaying blade technique is something that's learned in temples. Jaka tells him he's correct and asks him, isn't that awesome? And tells him that no one has been able to last more than one move so far, and says, you're not bad. Jaka continues and says, I also had quite a bit of fun seeing your technique, can I try it? Lee thinks Jaka is mocking him with that statement. He tells Jaka that he's way too arrogant and he can try to copy the technique if he thinks he can, but also tells him that. The unchanging noon contains thousands of changes and it's not some third-rate blade technique that a common bandit can learn easily. Jaka smiles and proceeds to copy the technique by also making shadow clones of himself, shocking everyone present. Jaka is performing the exact same move. Lee looks so shocked because he didn't think Jaka could ever copy the technique. 
Unchanging Noon is the last move in the mystery of the six combination sword technique of Mount Huasek, the ultimatum of stillness. It might look like a single stab but thousands of changes can be found within it. The six combination sword technique is the foundation of Plum Blossom sword technique. In Mountain Hua sect, the six combination sword technique must be taught to all disciples of the main sect and external disciples. Even disciples of the main sect have a hard time understanding that mystery. But Li Muriang was able to understand it despite being an external disciple and became a martial master who took Henan province by storm. All the effort he prides himself on was destroyed in a single second. Li Muriang still in disbelief shouts that's impossible. That's not a technique one can copy from seeing it once. He tightens his grip on his sword. In preparation to receive Jaka's unchanging noon attack, he tries to calm himself because according to him, he knows the unchanging noon technique better than anyone else. Li looks confident because there can be only one real body amongst all the shadow clones, and points out the one all the way back as the real body. While waiting to only dodge the one he pointed out as real, he is struck by the first clone, and another one, and the next one. At that moment Li Muryang realizes that all the clones were all real. Before Li Muryang bleeds out and pass out, he mutters, This isn't just the level of imitation, he has surpassed my level, and pass out cold. It all seems unclear to Jiaka as to why Li fell. Of the six combination in the technique, Jiaka was only able to perform three combinations before Li passed out. Jiaka is not happy about this and says, What the hell? How can you fall before I'm even done with the technique? Jiaka moves closer to Li, and wonders if he fainted then proceeds to say to Lee's lifeless body that it's such a pity because I'll just have to take your head like this. Lee wakes up for the fear of his life, begging Jaka to wait and that he can't move his body and promises to never again come near the Five Peak Stronghold and pleads really hard for Jaka to spare his life. So Jaka asks, what if you come again? Lee promises Jaka that it'll never happen again and swears on his right arm to keep his promise. Jaka walks away telling Lee Muryong to better keep his promise. The bandits of the Five Peak Stronghold all begin shouting in celebration. Woa, Jaka won, we won. They all gather Jaka and Hyunam asks Jaka if he's injured and congratulates him on his victory in the fight, also asking him if that technique was a clone technique. Lee is being carried by his guys when he fearfully turns back to look at Jaka one last time and says, I can't believe this, he's unbelievable strong. While the bandits celebrate in the merchant group retreats, a man is seen observing the whole situation from a distance. The man appears to be a spy for one of the other merchant groups. Hyunnam jokingly asks Jaka how he could possibly destroy those wooden wall that they all went through so much trouble to build. At the Mansu Merchant Union, a man is giving his report on recent events and says, excluding the smaller merchant union around Henan province, three of the bigger merchant union went down one by one. Even we, the Mansu Merchant Union and the Nanyang Merchant Union that shared the Henan province, were defeated, and you could say that there's been a huge shift in power balance. Another merchant that's also present in the room seems really upset by these brief, and wonders if the Heavenly Swords man was really defeated, and to think that a common bandit that young would be that strong. The merchant giving the report continues his brief, saying that rumors have already been spread to the hooligans of Hegia village, and adds that with this, five peak stronghold numbers will probably grow even stronger. One of the three men in the room then tables a suggestion that it will be best if they strike now, before the Five Peak Mountains members increase in numbers, and also proceeds to state his major concerns, which includes the fact that Jaka might be a disciple of the Green Forest Commander Chief, the Heaven Destroying Demon Lord, and asides that it doesn't make sense that a common bandit that young is that strong. One of the guys in the room agrees with the other and adds that Jaka came during the time when Green Forest was trying to expand. So it could be true that Jaka is a disciple of the Destroying Demon Lord, and if truly that's the case, then it would be best if they stayed away from him. One of them, whose name is Sang Muchun, the leader of Mansu Merchant Union, seems very pissed from hearing that statement, and angrily smashes the table before him, shouting, How can we run from Mare Bandits? With his bleeding arm, he says, Do you know what would happen if we did that? Manso Merchant Union would be the laughing stock of all Henan, and asks his subordinates if they think a merchant union that's a laughing stock has any future. His subordinates then asks him for what could possibly be done, because himself and the leader of the Nanyang Merchant Union, who was recently defeated by Jiaka, are on the same level when it comes to martial art skills, and asks him if he has any other way to deal with Jiaka, saying much and pauses, and thinks for a while. He stood there frustrated because he knows that there's really nothing he could do, because Jaka is on a whole different level. And he's grateful that he looked into Jiaka before going after him, if not himself would have ended up like Li Muriang did. It pains him so much that he can't do anything because Jaka is way too strong, and wonders if Jiaka is really the disciple of the heaven-destroying demon lord. 
He concludes his thoughts and comes up with an idea to go to Huang province, which shocked everyone present. He then asked them to bring him a precious Longjing tea leave that they got from West Lake. But someone amongst the people present questions his idea to go to Huang province at such desperate time and tells him that there would only be more unrest within the merchant union if he leaves. Saying much in size and calls the subordinate who just questioned him a fool and asks him if he's forgotten what's in Huang province. The man pauses and tries to recollect what's in Huang province. He remembers that the Wuding Mountain is located in the Huang province. Sang Muchun smiles because the guy is correct. And he says that him being an external disciple, he's someone who learned the Wuding martial arts. And with a cunning smile, tells everyone present that his master is the Wuding sex elder, Sage Chun Jai. They all seem surprised to hear this because Sage Chun Jai is a famed martial master even in the Wuding sect. Plus he's known for being good at teaching. The leader confirms all they have said, saying yes that's correct, and tells them that they are finally starting to use their brain. He proceeds to tell them that, Wuding sect is one of the ten great sects, and the direct disciples of those places are at a level they themselves can't even begin to imagine, and says that he just needs to ask the master and get one of the disciples to come back with him, and that would be the end for Jaka because he will be as good as dead. He continues talking and say that even if Jaka is the disciple of the heaven-destroying lord, He's too young and inexperienced to be fighting against a direct disciple of the Wuding sect, and adds that if Jiaka falls, then the Five Peak stronghold will also fall immediately. Out in the city, we hear a shout of excitement in a restaurant, which follows up with a talk of appreciation. This really really feels like a dream, all these food, and another voice replies saying she heard that the restaurant is the best in Hegea village, and that the place does look different. It's the tenth sister of the mountain Wufeng hideout, Kion, and a lady. They are both staring at beautiful dishes and discussing about food when the tenth sister says that it has always been her wish to order everything she wants before she die, and her wish has come true today. But the other lady asks her if it's really okay, because it all seems really expensive. Hyun tells her that it's okay and that she doesn't need to worry about it, and says, look who we came with. Then shouts, the strongest in Henan province, Yeon Jiaka. Shai Jiaka scratches his head and says that can't be true while Chief Hyunnam is around. But the ladies tries to convince him to believe it, and tells him that even the children thinks that he's the strongest within the Five Peak stronghold. Jiaka says he knows that but he personally still think the chief is the strongest, and tells them that those comments are exaggerated, then quickly moves his attention somewhere else which is his cloth. He comments that the cloths are all too expensive and asks if it's really okay to buy those, because he thinks since that chief is getting more people joining them now, they should be more thrifty to be able to afford to feed everyone. But the ladies assures him that it's alright and tells him that he's been earning so much money for the stronghold so he earned it. The new lady also adds that everyone at the stronghold is probably thankful to him, and proceeds to tell Jiaka that the reason why they are able to enjoy such luxuries is because second brother Tak gave them a ton of money and asked them to make sure he have a good time, and that brother Tak also told them to make sure he eats until his stomach bursts and dress him in the best clothes. Jiaka is surprised because it doesn't seem like the second brother would actually have said that, but the tenth gets up out of excitement and tells him that it's true, and proceeds to tell him that the second brother said that he wants Jaka to enjoy the whole day today before going back. Jaka excited, says, Shall we eat until our stomach bursts then? He then focuses on the new girl and asks her who she is and what her name is, because he's never seen her before. She blushes and introduces herself as Sobik and tells him that she recently joined a week ago. Kion tries to make her shy and playfully says, She's pretty isn't she? The whole stronghold was in ruckus because of her and says that Sobik is also famous for being pretty in Hegea village. Jiaka is wowed and asks her, really? Because she's shy about saying things like that in front of Jiaka, she tries to deny it all and says that it's not true and she isn't famous. While they eat and discuss, a man seems to be standing at a distant corner watching them. Kion tries even harder to make Sobik more shy and says, don't lie, everyone knows your name though, and adds that she heard that Sobik was only able to get accepted into the Five Peak stronghold because of her popularity. Sobik tries to talk but is lost for words because of how much she was blushing. While still at their table eating and discussing, the creepy man walks towards their direction. Jiaka is curious to know what the tenth means by her previous statement. The tenth answers, telling him that Sobik ran away after some famous hooligan threatened her to marry him. The creepy man is already at their table and interrupts their talk and with a creepy smile says, Whoa, that happened. I already told you to look for me if you ran into any kind of trouble. Standing behind both ladies, he says. So that's why I haven't been seeing you around, huh? Do you know how worried I was? Sobik is scared and the Kion sits confident and couldn't give a shit about what the huge guy with a creepy smile has to say. Full of pride and confidence, she gives him the side eye and asks Sobik if the guy could be the hooligan. Sobik replies and confirms that the man is the hooligan. 
The guy playfully laughs and says, Come on, a hooligan. It saddens me when you say it like that. The tenth sister is getting tired of this guy's nonsense and calls him baldy and tells him that she was thinking of pushing him initially but decided not to and asks him to go on his way, saying that she doesn't want to flip a table full of such delicacies, and tells him that he don't have to lose his life and it would be best for both sides if he just left. With a cocky smile, the guy says, What nonsense is this? Lose my life. He casually lifts his hand to tap Sobeek's shoulder and tells her that he can't believe he's hearing those words from a brat like her and asks Sobeek if she won't tell her new friend what a scary person he is. He presses down on Sobeek's shoulder, asking her to tell her friend that she'll be in big trouble if she keeps getting on his nerves. He gives a killer look and tells her to also stop trying to run away because his patience also has limits. This guy is squeezing her shoulder and telling her that if she keeps testing his limits like that, but get interrupted by Jiaka. Jiaka then asks him to stop right there. The guy seems confused and lost for words. So Jiaka tells him that he's in a good mood today and says, I'll count to ten, and if you're gone by then, I'll spare your life. The guy mockingly laughs at Jiaka and asks Jaka if he's talking to him. Jiaka couldn't care less about anything the guy has to say, and starts counting downwards from ten. The guy gets furious, calls Jaka a fucking brat and tells him to better start running. The tenth sister, unbothered as fuck, takes a bite from her bread and tells the guy that he'll definitely die. The guy furiously looks at her and asks what she's talking about. Sobeek, concerned, looks at her, asks her why she keeps acting cocky and asks her if she haven't heard of Hegia Village Gwak Yungchul. Hyun carelessly responds saying that she's never heard of him and tells both Sobeek and the man that it seems like they themselves are the ones who doesn't know who she and Jaka are. The guy looks at her like a person that's ready to strangle her, and asks her who she is for her to be acting so cocky. And with her nonchalant behavior, she says, Five Peak Stronghold, and tells the man that the bandit sitting over there is the bandit who's good with swords. The guy looks like someone that just saw a ghost. Jiaka gets up, hitting the table hard, as his countdown is now at two and the guy is still around. The guy tries to beg Jaka to wait, but the countdown is already over. The guy couldn't see anything else but a devilish look from Jaka that's ready to kill. With so much bloodlust from Jiaka, he looks at the guy and says, You're not gone yet. Destroying the table and attempt to land a simple kick to the guy. Jiaka destroys the table and lands his kick to the guy's chest, which makes him bleed out instantly from his mouth. After being hit with a single kick, amidst all the ruckus, there seems to be an elderly man, covered in lots of clothing, watching the entire scene closely. As the guy falls, Jiaka's feet seems to have left a footprint on his body. The observing elder stands at a clear distance to avoid being hit by any of the broken woods from the table and plates, and observes cautiously. The observer stands ready to fight, and begins emanating aura from his entire body. Still furious from the other guy's disrespect towards him and the lady, Jaka feels the presence of this observer and turns to look at him. Jaka then steps forward, and stands properly facing this strange observer. Then they both lock on eye contact. The man's hood falls off. While Jaka stares furious, ready to kill anyone and anything in his path, the observer also stands bold and mighty staring at Jaka like someone that wants to fight. We are taken back to moments before the whole clash with Jaka, where we see a man that is following this observer and asking him why he came without notice and also telling him that if he had known in advance, he would have gone to fetch him, because the streets isn't a safe one for him to be walking around without any escorts. The follower is worried and tells the man that he just called for a horse carriage and that if he can just wait a little while, he'll be able to bring him to the merchant union comfortably. This follower appears to be Sang Machun, who is the leader of Mansu Merchant Union and a former student of the man he's currently following around. He pauses and wonders why his master came personally, so he runs after this man whose name is Sage Chun Jai, elder of the Wuding sect, and calling him master. Sang Machun stutters as he follows his master around and asks him where he's going. With no response from his master, Sang stops following his master sage Chun Jai for a while because the whole situation is seems to be driving him nuts, and he wonders why his master sage actually come. Sang gets lost in his thoughts because it's a whole different story when a Wuding sect disciple gets involved, and when an elder like his master, sage Chun Jai, gets involved, and if people hear that a Wuding sect elder was called to subdue a mare bandit, Sang's thought is interrupted by some men in an alley, whispering to themselves and asking each other if sage Chun Jai really got involved. One of three men seen in a Connor gossiping says that he's telling them that it's true that Sage Chun Jai actually got involved and says it's because Sang Muchin got scared after what the Five Peak Stronghold did to Lee Muriang in just one hit. And one of the three is still confused as to why an elder from the Wuding sect would get involved. And all of them seems to come to a conclusion that Sang Muchin must be at loss since he can't even take care of just one bandit. But one of them thinks it's impressive that Sang Muchin managed to get an elder involved because he didn't think the Mansu Merchant Union was that influential. 
One amongst the three laughs at the statement the other guy just made and says, impressive my ass, and tells them that Sang Muchang is an external disciple of the Wuding sect, and Sage Chun Jai is Sang Shi's master. The third guy also laughs because it seems that they've caught on to the fact that Sang Muchang is behind them and listening in on their gossip. So he says, so he got scared of a young bandit and tailed to his master, he always acts so haughty, but look at his pathetic state now. Sang is really pissed after listening in on the gossip and calls those three gossipers bastards, but his master who is just few steps ahead of him could hear him call them bastards, and tells him that he can't believe that someone like him is letting marketplace gossip affect him. Master Sage gives Sang the side eye telling him that he still has lots to learn, which frightens Sang and he apologizes immediately. This also makes Master Sage give Sang an involuntary training order to Sang which is to go into isolated training after the whole incident is over and train his mind and body, which Sage accepts without a single hesitation. We are taken back to the present where Master Sage Chun Jai is observing Jiaka before the kick, in attempt to land a simple kick to the guy. Jiaka destroys the table and lands his kick to the guy's chest, which makes him bleed out instantly from his mouth, just from being hit with a single kick. Amidst all the ruckus, there seems to be an elderly man, covered in lots of clothing, watching the entire scene closely. As the guy falls, Jiaka's feet seems to have left a massive footprint on his body. The master sage Chun Jai stands at a clear distance to avoid being hit by any of the broken woods from the table and plates, and observes cautiously. Master sage Chun Jai stands ready to fight, and begins emanating massive amount of aura from his entire body. Still furious from the other guy's disrespect towards him and the lady, Jiaka feels the presence of master sage Chun Jai and turns to look at him. Jiaka then steps forward and stands properly facing this strange master sage Chun Jai. Then they both lock on eye contact. Sage Chun Jai's hood falls off, while Jaka stares furious, ready to kill anyone and anything in his path. Sage Chun Jai is also standing bold and mighty, staring at Jaka like someone that's ready to kill. Everyone's attention is brought to where Jiaka and Master Sage Chun Jai is, due to the loud noise caused from Jiaka's kick which broke a hole in the wall of the restaurant. Sang Muching quickly rushes to where the loud noise came from, asking his master if he's alright, but is taken aback on observing the scene. He instantly recognizes Jiaka as a member of the Five Peak Stronghold, and wonders why he's there. He stares at Jiaka, and notes that Jiaka's vibe is a little different, and that hair color isn't common around this area. At this point, he realizes that Jaka is the young bandit that has been causing him problems, and rushes to his master shouting, Master, Master, that's him. The master don't seem happy about this and tells Sang Muching to stop making a fuss. Then the master puts his hood back up, turns and walks away, telling Sang Muching that he was thinking of catching a breather here, but the streets don't seem too safe, and tells him that since he already has the horse carriage prepared, he'd like to head back now. But Sang Muching can't believe that his master would want to leave Jiaka and head back without doing anything. As Sage Chun Jai walks away, Jiaka stares wary of him, because he feels an ominous energy around him. Jiaka's attention is taken away from Sage Chun Jai as Kion shouts, Oh my gosh, how could you destroy everything here? And tells him that the chief told them not to create any trouble so they could keep up a good reputation. And adds that he shouldn't have gone this far because the repairs will cost a lot. But Jaka casually tells her that the guy angered him first and reminds her that he also gave the guy 10 seconds to run. Kiyun starts acting suspicious and tells Jaka that it's fine. She starts yelling at Jaka that he should have avoided hitting their dining table. Now she's hungry and asks him what they will all do now. And adds that he also completely destroyed the restaurant. That even if they paid the repair fees, she doubts that the restaurant's owner would want to serve them again. Jaka cracks his fingers in preparation to go beat whoever won't serve them but he's instantly stopped by the tenth sister who reminds him that they need to maintain a good reputation. Jiaka apologizes to her and tells her that the guy was way weaker than he thought and he didn't think the guy would fly off with a single hit. Kion looks at the guy passed out cold on the floor, like a lifeless man, and tells Jaka that it would be stranger if the guy didn't end up like that after taking that kick from him. She then tells Jaka that she doesn't know what to do anymore and shows him all the money they have left and tells him that fortunately they should still have some money left for rice soup after they pay the repair fees. And the unfortunate part is that they won't have any money left to buy clothes for Sobeek. And says that Sobeek was all excited because she could finally dress up like a bandit. But Sobeek tries to tell Jaka that it's not true and that she never said anything like that. It seems like the tenth sister has something planned. So she covers Sobeek's mouth and gives a fake smile, and tries to emotionally blackmail Jaka by telling him that it's okay and that they would buy Sobeek's clothes some other time. Jaka is sad to hear this and doesn't want that to be the case. So he suggests that they skip food and buy Sobeek's clothes instead. Kion definitely has something up her sleeves. She tells Jaka that the money wouldn't still be enough if they did that. So she says, well, if you're really sorry about it, 
Then I think you can start by listening to a request of mine. Jiaka ignorantly shouts, All right, tell me what it is, I'll do it for sure. Then she smiles because she has got Jiaka hook, just as she wanted, and tells him that he mustn't go back on those words of his. She instantly puts up a bright face and tells Jaka that he'll have to teach martial arts herself and Sobi. At the Mansu Merchant Union, Sang is telling his master Sage that the boy from just now is the bandit that he's been telling him about, and the master tells Sang that he knows. But this confuses Sang so he asks his master why he didn't get rid of Jaka back there and adds that if Jaka isn't around anymore, then it'd be so easy to take care of the Five Peak Stronghold. The master responds asking him if it's correct that there are rumors that Jaka is the destroying demon lord disciple. And Sang replies that it's true, and adds that the reason why the Five Peak Stronghold was recognized as Green Forest quickly is because Jaka is exceptionally strong for his age. Master Sage tells him that the rumor is probably not the case. He then proceeds to say that if the destroying demon lord had an exceptionally strong disciple, rumors would have spread long ago. And since the destroying demon lord likes to boast, there's no way he'd keep an exceptional disciple hidden. He grinds his teeth and says that he's starting to think he made a good choice by coming to the Henan province. Staring at a small wood on his hand, he says, to think I'd meet a martial arts genius in a place like this. On this wood that he keeps staring at, great fortune is carved boldly on it. So he makes a final statement, this is auspicious. Three days ago at the Huguang province, Wuding Mountain, we see an elderly man that's being escorted by three young ladies. Carrying a bottle of wine is present to meet someone inside, playing with his beards. The elderly man who seems to be an unwanted guest, then says to a man in front of him that the scenery is always beautiful no matter how many times he sees it, and that even within Wooding Mountain, there are only a handful of scenic views. He then proceeds to say that he has brought some precious longing tea from Westlake as a gift, and says that he only came because he remembered the man enjoys tea. This elderly man's name is Sage Tiho, the leader of Wooding Sect. The other man who is being visited is Sage Chun Jai, an elder in the Wooding sect and a martial master. Sage Chun Jai don't seem impressed with the gift and says, Longjing tea, that's a precious tea that's hard to come by isn't it? This whole time Sage Chun Jai had his back turned at his visitors, now turns his head and says, The fact that you brought something so precious here means that you have something to tell me right. Sage Ti Ho giggles and asks if he was that obvious. They both settle down and pour some tea to drink together. As they drink, Sage Ti Ho begins to explain to him his reasons for coming, which is because the merchants are having a huge headache, and that's because there's too many bandits swarming in a place called Five Peak Stronghold, and that the recent movements from the Green Forest aren't to be taken lightly as well. Sage Chun Jai then says that if Green Forest is involved in this, then it would make things a little too troublesome. Sage Ti Ho then tells him that that's exactly the case, because if they don't have any justifications, they can't do anything. So Sage Tiho tells the elder that, however things may seem, a merchant union leader in that vicinity seems to be his disciple and he's the one who brought this tea as well. Sage Tiho proceeds to tell Sage Chun Jai that they could get justification if he sends one of his disciples to protect the peace of Henan province and his other disciple, the merchant leader who requested for help, then that would be enough justification to interfere. Sage Chun Jai then asks him if he's requesting that they keep Green Forest in check. Sage Tiho responds saying, Yes, and asks him if he remembers how the demonic cult's Luna Fairy was a threat to the Murim in the past. He proceeds to say that after that incident, he felt like there was a need for the Orthodox Alliance to become stronger. He reminds Sage Chun Jai of how the Lunar Fairy tried to use her horrifying martial arts to take over the entire Murin, no the entire Central Plain. Although the Sword Emperor and the Moon Splitting Swordsman protected the Murin by a close shave, we can no longer rely on their strength anymore and proceeds to say that no one can guarantee that the Murim will not face another threat like her, and it makes him feel uneasy, because he doesn't know how long the peace will last. While saying all these, he looks worried and says that the unorthodox sect are also no exception in being a threat to the Murim. So he begins to explain how numerous men have fallen by the hands of the Green Forest Commander Chief, Heaven Destroying Lord, and says that he personally think no one in their current Murim can stand up to him. Sage Chun Jai is starting to understand what Ti Ho is saying and says, before they can become support to the heaven-destroying demon lord, you want me to uproot this new growing stronghold in the Henan province, completely huh? Sage Ti Ho tells him that's right, and says to him that the disciples he teach will always bring about a good reputation to the Wuding sect, and this would also become another chance to improve the Wuding sect reputation. And since Wuding sect influence would expand to Henan province, this would really be killing two birds with one stone. Sage Ti Ho pours Chun Jai a cup of tea. Chun Jai tries to reflect on the issue before giving his response and takes a sip from his tea, and finally accepts to take care of the situation but adds a condition, slams his teacup on the table and takes a deep breath, before asking, 
the leader of the Wuding sect, Sage Tiho, to please allow him be the one to personally handle the subjugation of the Five Peak Stronghold. Sage Tiho is confused and asks him why he would want to do that. Shun Jai begins to narrate to Sage Tiho that as he has managed the Wuding Mountain for the last ten years, he has gone through countless rites and have seen a lot of divinations. But strangely whenever he tries to see his own, he has never seen fortune before, and has also never seen misfortune before and tells him that he thick it's fate for himself to live a life without ups and downs. But, the fortune he had this morning was different. Great fortune, that's the fortune he got. And finally says that he's sure this is an opportunity presented by the great teacher. Back at the present, Master Sage Chun Jai is in his thoughts. The Five Peak Mountain Bandit that's good with swords. Although I don't believe the nonsensical rumor that he's the destroying demon lord disciple, he's definitely got a different energy around him. If I raise him as Wuding Sect Disciple, he could become the world's strongest swordsman. No, he would become Wuding Sword Supreme. If that happens, Wuding Sect influence would pierce through the heavens. At Five Peak Stronghold, new buildings are being constructed, and the workers are taking their job seriously. A bandit then approached Chief Pung Yoncho, the leader of the Five Peak Stronghold, with reports that the construction has been complete. Chief Pong is impressed. Feeling proud of how far he has come, he stares at the newly constructed building and announces, this is the Five Peak Stronghold's Harmony Pavilion. As things in the Five Peak Stronghold grew quickly, Debil's Stronghold helped them construct additional buildings to match their growth. In order to fill up those new buildings, Chief Pung Yoncho recruited new carpenters, advisors and their families. Everyone including the families of the workers are pleased with the newly built Harmony Pavilion, and the kids are excited in rushes to get a closer look at the building. Chief Pung Yoncho observes as the children run past him and gets lost in thoughts. Second brother, Tak, approaches him, calls him chief and asks him why he looks so immense in his emotions. He snaps out of it and greets Tak, and tells Tak that he's just reminded of the past when he sees such lively scenes, and they about to start talking about what past Chief Poon is talking about. Someone runs towards them, shouting chief. Tak calls this person Hyundo, and asks him why him ran towards them so frantically. While Hyundo is trying to catch his breath, he asks them if they've seen Jaka and tells them that he heard that Jaka is teaching Sobi Kintent's sister Kion martial arts, so he wanted to ask him to but didn't see him around at all. Tak with a smug face tells Hyundo that he's a step late, and that Jaka and the girls went into the forest just now. Hyundo yells that how could they leave without him and Tak tells him to hurry up if he wants to catch them. Inside the forest, Jaka tells the girls that what they'll be learning this time would be the breathing method, and tells them they must first memorize 300 words. He closes his eyes and starts his breathing method and says to them, those who want to obtain the Nine Heavens energy, you must first conquer your own heart, and says, the Nine Heavens energy isn't tangible nor is it void. Jaka is interrupted by the Kion who seems to have given up without even starting. Kion and Sobik tells Jaka that it's too hard, and they don't think they can even memorize 100 words. Jaka looks at them confused because he doesn't think it's hard and casually tells them that they'll be able to do it if they practice for 10 years, and they both tell him that it's easy for him to say. Jaka pauses before telling them to just close their eyes and follow him slowly, and promises them that it'll get easier bit by bit. They are both feeling slightly motivated and agree to do as he said, so he instructs them step by step, so he says, close your eyes, focus on your breathing. He then opens one eye to check if they're doing alright, and he's instantly amazed, to see, that both of them are totally focused. This makes Jaka happy because it's his first time seeing others train like this. Kion and Sobik seems very focused with the training. Jaka joins them and says it's the feeling of hearing something that used to be vague clearly now, and dives into the meditation. The breathing method training that they started at noon has lasted till dawn. Kion is finally done, and wakes up, and is about to ask Jaka if they should all head back as she opens her eyes. She is stunned to see Jaka fully immersed in meditation, and her eyes are instantly glued, even when Sobik tries to call her. So she tells Sobik to be quiet, and watch Jaka. So they both sit and watch Jaka as his young energy covers his entire body. His whole body levitates, while he is all up deep in training, in his mind. Jaka stands with a sword in his hand, and begins to train, in the heavenly inquisition technique. But Jaka seems stuck and wonders when he'll be able to get deeper understanding of the technique, and that he hears a voice, which scares him, then voice then tells him to, calm down and focus only on the voice of his heart. Jaka exclaims, who is it? The Jewitan spirit that was with him during his ten years of being locked up in that storage house, taking Jaka physical appearance, the spirit appears beside him and begins practicing the sword technique with him. Jaka looks at it and remembers it as the little boy in the mirror that thought him both the Nine Heavens art and Heavenly Inquisition technique. Now, the spirit tells Jaka to get ready, and they both practice the sword move together, perfuming different. 
beautiful moves. Jaka says to the spirit, I am moving as if we are originally one single body. The concept that once seemed vague are being pieced together one by one. Outside of Jiaka's mind, Kion and Sobik are lost for words. Jiaka's young energy grows stronger and the young energy forms cherry blossom flowers that float around his head and bloom while still floating round his head, which is all such a beautiful sight to behold. Jiaka is levitated. Young energy covers his entire body and forms flowers that bloom. About done with his training, he opens his eyes and is met with a fascinating glare from the girls. The girls are dumbfounded. The expression on their faces makes Jaka ask them what's wrong and if there's something on his face, and he is told that there was a light around his body just now. They both rush towards him with excitement, telling him that he's so amazing and asks him if they'll also be able to do that if they continue training. Jaka stares in shock and puts them aside as he tells them to stop making a big deal out of this and says to them, You are to recite these words in the morning and at night while practicing your breathing from now on, is that clear? And they both excitedly shout yes, training is over for the day and they all head back while the girls couldn't stop talking. As they arrive the stronghold, Kiyun sees the chief standing outside, notices that he's the only one there. So she says, we're back, is the pavilion's construction complete? But the chief seems worried about something and didn't say a word. Jiaka calls him, but he still gave no response. Jiaka then asks him where everyone went, and now he finally responds and says, Jiaka, what should we do? He looks so scared and says to Jaka that Sage Chun Jai is coming to attack the Five Peak Stronghold. Inside the stronghold, there are a few bandits left, and one of them asks if everyone else has run away. Jiaka stands all by himself, lost in his thoughts, while Chief Pung announces to all present that the Mansu Merchant Union has gotten Sage Chun Jai involved, and that they are on their way to attack, so he asks them all what to do. Fourth Brother Imdao tells the chief that the Merchant Union and Sage Chun Jai will arrive by morning and asks if it wouldn't be best to take this time and escape somewhere else. The chief pauses, and shamefully gathers courage to ask Shim Yongak to let everyone know if he has any good idea, because Shim is so full of himself. But Shim asks them if they think such tricks would work on someone like Sage Chun Jai. So Tak shouts at him asking him what they're supposed to do if that's the case. Shim calmly asks Tak if he truly do not understand the situation, and say that the Five Peak Stronghold is done for. He explains to them that Sage Chun Jai is an elder of the Wuding sect and he's the strongest of the Wuding sect, and was even the strongest in Hubei at one point in time, and adds that each and every one of Sage Chun Jai's disciples is also incredibly powerful, so he asks them if they really want to go up against such a monster, and tells them to just pray to at least come out with their neck intact if they decide to fight. Someone amongst them asks, what should we do now? Shim replies, saying that there is nothing else that can be done and we should all run. Another person asks, where to? And Shim responds that it doesn't matter and everyone should just go wherever they can. Chief Pung angrily bangs the armrest of his chair and shouts for everyone to be quiet, and asks Jaka what he thinks. Everyone stares anxiously waiting for his response. Jaka takes a deep breath, and finally says that he don't know. They are all shocked to hear this. Shim uses this opportunity to shout that if they all stayed there, that they'll all die helplessly. He starts walking away and says that he's going, because he don't plan on waiting for his death here. So many others contemplate for a while and decide that it's best to also leave. As they hurry out, they murmur, I don't want to die here, Sage Chun Jai is coming, we should escape right now. The ninth brother notices that Chulson isn't coming along with him, so he pauses and asks Chulson why he isn't coming with the rest of them. Chulson pauses, takes a deep breath, and turns back to look at Kion and Sobik. They both seem worried and scared, and Sobik was about crying but Kion comforts her, and tells her that it's okay and she shouldn't worry. Chulson finally tells the ninth brother that he's not going. The ninth brother yells at him saying, Are you kidding me? Have you gone mad? Do you want to die for a woman? Chulson tells him that he's sorry and no matter what he says, he's staying. So the ninth brother vexfully says to Chulson that there is no point in talking to him and leaves. And now, what's left of the stronghold? Are the original seven sworn brothers, Chulson, and the girls. Chief Poong then thanks his sworn brothers and the rest for staying behind. He ponders for a while because he thinks it's logical for all of them to have also run with the rest, and remembers that they have a new pavilion, a newly constructed house, and there are also people who would return to the Five Peak Stronghold. Angered, he clenches his fist and bangs the arm rest again, which brought everyone's attention to him. A calm gust of wind blows in through a window in the building, carrying some leaves around, which catches Jaka's attention. He holds one in his palm, and remembers something vital, so he squeezes his palm and walks forward towards the chief and calls the chief in, asks the chief if the sword master sage Chun Jai can cut a person with a leaf. Few hours later, it's night already, and Chief Poong is standing outside alone, in front of a fence he just finished fixing. He is all sweaty and takes a deep breath. We are taken back to hours before, 
where Jaka asked Hyunam if Sage Chun Jai can cut a person with a leaf. Hyunam thinks on it because he thinks there's no way a human can do that, and tells Jaka that he doesn't think Sage Chun Jai is that strong. Then Jaka says that if Sage is not that strong, wouldn't it be possible to fight him? Everyone turns to look at Jaka after that bold statement, and Chief Hyunam asked him if he's serious. The chief thinks this might work, because if it Jaka that fights, he might be able to hold Sage in position for a moment and then they can all attack together in that moment, but instantly gets reminded of Shim's talk that they will all die and this is the end for the Five Peak Stronghold, and he tries to imagine a fight between Jaka and Sage. But in his imagination, Sage is way too strong for Jaka and Jaka is easily defeated. Sad, he tries to think of something, and asks himself if the only way to protect the stronghold is to put those children in a life or death situation and thinks deeper if that really is the only way. Chief Poon continues to battle with his mind what to actually do, and says to himself, It's been five years since we came here. This is going to be the hardest decision the chief has ever made in his life. He ponders on everything that has happened so far, especially this year. We got a lot more new members and even built the luxurious Harmony Pavilion. There were a lot of good things that happened, and says to everyone that this much is good enough. They all seem surprised at his statement and asked him to not say things like that because they are sure Jaka can resolve the situation in no time and tells him not to worry much about it. But he responds saying, no, but they can't always rely on Jaka. And this person that they are thinking to let Jaka fight is an elder from the Ten Great Sect, and he is probably way stronger than any one of them can imagine. He proceeds to say that he can't risk a gamble that will put them in a life or death situation, and that he believes everything Shim Yongak said to be correct. We don't have any chances at all. The moment to finally make his decision has come and he says, as of this moment, the Five Peak Stronghold will be disbanded. We are taking back to hours after, where he stands in front of the fence and reflects on his decision. He looks at his blistered palm and wonders to why he's unable to leave, even though he knows it's the only wise thing to do. Still lost in his thoughts, the fence he just put up starts to fall apart. When he notices, the log was already about to crush him and so he shouts. And someone emits the dust, calls him chief, and says, Are you unable to do a thing since you're used to always asking others to do the work? The chief is surprised that someone still stayed behind, and holding on to the log of wood that was about to crush him. This person is Tak, second sworn brother, so Tak Go Young asks him with a smirk face if he really think they'd leave. The chief turns to the other parts of the fence and sees Hyangdo, Imdal, Kion, Sanchung, Sabong, Cholson, even Sobik. And, Jiaka are all holding on to the rest of the fence's logs that might have crushed him. Jiaka asks him if he's okay. The chief is as grateful as he's shocked to see that they are all still around. One of them asks him what he's still doing around after telling them that they are disbanded. Vindal adds, didn't we all decide that if we're going to die, we'll die together? Kion is concerned, and asks the chief if he's okay and didn't get hurt. Tak then gives the chief his hand to help him get up and asks him if he has eaten, as the chief smiles and says, All of you seriously, you guys are so disobedient. He takes Tak's hand and get up. Few minutes later, they all work together to fix the fence, and start a fire after the fence has been fixed. Tak is glad that they still had some materials left to put up the second fence, and Imdal is also glad because with this, they should be able to relax a little. The chief then suggests that they all take turns on guard duty, because even though Sage Chun Jai and the Merchant Union are expected to arrive by morning, they might also launch a surprise attack. And they all agreed. Tak Gamyang, who used to live in a temple. Ma Hyundo, who is a thief that escaped from jail. Hyun Dal, who used to be a petty thief. Gok Sanchung and Jang Sabong, who used to be slash and burn farmers. The chief looks at all of them and says to himself, They trusted me even though I'm an insignificant person. This is a family that I'm thankful for. And says out loud that he thinks he's pretty lucky. Tak laughs with him and asks him if he's only just realizing that now. Hyun gets up and calls to the chief, and he asked her what's the matter. So she says, now that we've decided to stick together whether we live or die, how about you stop being petty and make us your sworn family too? The chief didn't think too much about it and asks all three of them, Cholson Sobik and Kion, do you guys want that too? Cholson and Sobik are surprised that he asked, and the both immediately says yes. The chief thinks it's a good idea, and asks him sworn brothers what they think, and they are all okay with it. The chief acknowledges them as new members of the family and gives them new rankings, because the previous ninth member was amongst those who ran away. Chul San still remains number 8. Kion is the new number 9, while Sobik is now number 10. They all happily accept each other, and Chief Poon tells them, He'll be counting on all of you from now on, my family. And Jaka is happy to have new members in the family. If there are any bandits that knew of formalities, it might be from imitating the oath of the three gardens from the three kingdoms. Even so, though they might not be educated, they had lacked nothing. It is morning. At the Mansu Merchant Union, Sage Chun Jai still holds on to his fortune, 
which reads, Great Fortune. Sage Chun Jai leads the Merchant Union leader and its warriors to battle. Let's go. If you're enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. It's morning. At the Five Peaks Stronghold, Jiaka wakes up early and quietly steps outside, breathes in fresh air, with a sword in his hand. He couldn't sleep, even though he didn't show it in front of others. He's actually worried. He concentrates on his breathing and wonders if he'll be able to win against someone like Sage Chun Jai, but cancels his negative thought because he so wants that this newfound family of his can stay together. And at that moment, he notices someone's presence behind him. Jiaka is spooked by an unknown presence behind him and immediately turns with a heavy slash following through. But he's shocked to see that it's the chief, and stops his sword on time. Chief Pung fearfully laughs telling Jaka to calm down that it's just him. Jaka then tells the chief that he scared him and asks the chief if he was going to stand guard. And he tells Jaka that he's correct and that he decided to let the others sleep for a while, but asks Jaka why he isn't sleeping. Jaka tries to play it off and lies that he don't sleep a lot. Hingdom suspects a lie, but Jaka proceeds to tell him that he's okay and don't feel tired at all. While Heenum prepares to give Jaka a surprise attack, he strikes unexpectedly and Jaka was able to block it, and shouts Chief. Then the Chief asks Jaka if he would duel to help loosen up his muscles. Jaka is shocked at first, but happily accepts. They begin sparring, and Heenum seems pleased to be able to help Jaka loosen his muscles. Jaka seems to be having fun. Heenum also gives his best. While they clash swords, Heenum apologizes to Jaka, which make Jaka confused and asks him why he's apologizing. So he responds saying, it feels like I'm relying on you who's the youngest every time. And Jiaka responds, Come on, we are brothers aren't we? And at that moment, the Mansu Merchant Union arrives and announces, Five Peak Stronghold, listen up. With their warriors matching forward, Chief Pung is surprised as to how fast they got here. Sage Chun Jai stares and ready for battle. And standing in front of Sage Chun Jai is the Mansu Merchant Union leader, Sang Muching. Shouting at the Five Peak Stronghold, he asked them to give up the stronghold now and if they don't, then he would have no choice than to spill blood. Chief Pung Yoncho listens in anger. And because he doesn't think he can just let Jaka carry all the burden, he hops forward onto the top of the fence while Jaka tries to call him back. But he smiles down at Jaka and says, The one who stands in front ought to be the chief right. As he turns to look at the Merchant Union, he is wowed by how many of them came but he no longer fears anything. With a cheeky smile on the Mansu Merchant Union leader's face, he asks Poong if he's the chief and tells him not to put up any feudal resistance. Chief Poong confidently laughs and calls Sang's words, fucking bullshit. He begins to mock Sang Muchen, calling him a pathetic fool and says, is it true that you went to the Wuding sect to beg and cry for Sage Chun Jai to come? And asks him if he thinks they would run away because he went and brought some senile old man and calls them all at the merchant group morons, and asks Sage if he thinks of him and his merchant group can trick them. The chief's words is really getting to Sang, and Sang calls the chief a bastard, but the chief still continues talking and tells Sage that even if they went and brought someone stronger than Sage Chun Jai, that it still won't faze them. Jiaka smiles as he listens to Chief Poon talk. Sage Chun Jai tells Sang that he already taught him to not get agitated about what other people say, but Sang tell him that he couldn't let such disrespectful speech sully his good name. Sage at that moment looks at Chief Poon, makes an ultrasonic vibration from his mouth, which Jaka could feel all the way from the other side of the fence. But Chief Poon that is standing on top of the fence didn't feel the vibration and Jaka quickly tries to warn him to get away from there because he knows what's coming. Still ignorant, the ultrasonic wave from Sage Chun Jai hits the fence and shatters it, sending the chief flying. The chief ignorant as to what just happened, falling to his death. Sage Chun Jai immediately jumps to finish him off before he hits the ground, and Chief Poon shouts for his dear life. The moment Poon Yoncho fell into danger, the fear and pressure Yon Jaka felt disappeared like dust. He simply wanted to protect his chief. With a single and powerful slash to the winds, Jaka was able to push Sage Chun Jai back from killing Poon Yoncho. A huge explosion occurs from the clash of Jaka's slash and Sage Chun Jai's ultrasonic sound wave. Sage Chun Jai retreats to a safe distance and commends Jaka's strength, saying, What incredible power! And from amidst the blast, Sage is shocked to see Jaka coming from above to strike him, but he's able to block Jaka's attack on time. Their swords clash with great power from both sides, but Sage adds more strength to his movements, which pushes Jaka away sending him flying. But he lands safely with a nice pose. Sage is baffled, and Jaka uses his sword as support to stand up and wonders what kind of person Sage Chun Jai is because he definitely felt a strong power from that clash their swords had. However, Jiaka thinks that he is definitely stronger than Sage. Shim overheard all Jiaka said to himself and asks, What? Who did you say is stronger than who? 
He commends Jaka for being able to use enhanced sword techniques at his age and says to Jaka that Jaka's conceit knows no bound. But Jaka replies telling him that he has never been conceited and recognizes Sage's face as a familiar one so he asked him if they've met before. Sage remembers their first encounter and tells Jaka that at the time when they met, although he felt that Jaka was really strong, he didn't feel Jaka would be a match for him. He stares in. Jaka tells him that he's glad he's Sage Chun Jai and says, you aren't able to cut people with a leaf, are you? Sage laughs really hard at Jaka and tell him that he's more interesting than he thought and says that he's looked for numerous talents as he roamed around Jianghu but has never met anyone as talented as Jaka, and proceeds to say that all martial arts in Jianghu kneeled before him, then tells Jaka that he's going to give him the chance to prove himself. Now let's see if you are, better than all the talents I've met, and moves into fight. The battle begins in a single clash of their swords, was able to send powerful waves enough to push the members of the merchant union backwards, and the sound from the clash alone was able to wake Pung Yoncho who passed out when he fell, and he asks Tak, who's trying to carry him to safety, what the hell is happening? Tak checks if he's okay and Poon Yoncho asks about Sage Chun Jai. Tak tells him to not be surprised, that right now both Jaka and Sage Chun Jai are fighting on equal footings. The two continues their battle, delivering powerful blows to each other as they both land on the ground. Sage commends Jaka for keeping up so far, and before he uses his special technique, he says let's see you try to dodge this. He performs the technique, and Jaka watches and makes his own move to try to deflect the attack. Sage Chun Jai moves faster than anyone else could see and moves in to deliver the strong attack with his technique. But Jaka didn't make a move. Then Sage tells him that he shouldn't let his guard down and think of his next move. But Jaka responds, I wonder if that's true. A huge explosion follows after Sage's attack. But both Jaka and Sage Chun Jai are still both unharmed. Sage, curious, looks at Jaka and affirms that Jaka was not conceited about his strength and wonders if Jaka is really the heaven-destroying lord's disciple. Age stands up and asks Jaka who his master is, and Jaka responds by, raising his sword up, pointing to the sky. Sage is confused for a second, and laughs, as he takes off his hood, saying that he likes Jaka more and more as he gets to know him, and now he understands why he got to the great fortune divination, and says that if Jaka is the reason, then he thinks Jaka will be able to learn all the advanced techniques of the Wooting sects. Jaka responds telling him that he don't know what that is, but he doesn't need it either. Sage asks, no and with immense bloodlust emanating from his body. He threatens Jaka that he'd have to know it from now on. Jaka picks up on the change of energy flow from Sage Chun Jai. Sage begins to perform the initial movement for this next attack, and the Mansu Merchant Union leader recognizes the movement as the martial arts of the Wuding sect that only elders can learn. The ultimate attack, Teiji Mystic Sword Technique. Jaka stares unfazed, and as Sage completes the movement, he tells Jaka that it's too late for him now, and asks him to start struggling. But Jaka runs straight towards him, and Sage immediately is able to tell where Jaka is going to strike from. Jaka jumps into attack, but is pushed back by some serious energy from Sage. And before he could react, he's cut on his arm by Sage, who tells Jaka to focus. But Jaka lands safely with his head facing downward and calls Sage a fucking old man. And as he raises his head, Sage is no longer standing in front of him, and appears right behind Jaka, about to deliver a heavy attack. And at that moment Jaka realizes that he won't be able to dodge that attack. Pung Yoncho and Tak both scared for they think it's over for Jaka and shouts out his name. Jaka was unable to block nor dodge the attack and takes a direct hit, and is wounded, and angry. Sage shouts for him to get up and says that they are nowhere done yet. He then proceeds to deliver powerful slashes embedded with immense energy flow at a distance to cut Jaka. Jaka manages to deflect all the attacks. Then Sage performs really advanced techniques, which as Jaka sees, gets scared. Sage is about to deliver his most powerful attack, and all members of the Five Peak Stronghold, concerned for Jaka's life, runs towards him, in attempt to help and shouts his name. But heavy gust of wind that's being generated from the attack prevents them from getting too close. Sage with all his might, delivers the attack and the only thing Jaka could say is, bring it on. The attack is so powerful, it creates a very huge blast, sending everyone around it flying. And the light from its energy is so bright no one could look at it. Sage Chun Jai lands on his feet after the blast looking at all the ruckus it created. He says that it's been a long time since he was able to fight without holding back and adds that he wasn't able to control his strength because he was too immersed in the fighting. But at that moment, a bright light of young energy emanates from amidst all the dust and smoke. Sage is seriously bewildered. At the sight of this, Sage is terrified and wonders what on earth is that. Loying eastern side, where young manner, 
It is a gathering of elders and swordsmen who have come to watch and show off their sword skills. Thik Miju, Jiaka's stepmother, and an elder present applauds some swordsmen who just performed. Then, Yong Mubik, Jiaka's older brother, Thik Miju's son, steps forward and greets the elders of the Yong clan, thanking them for gathering, he says to all of them, that he has realized many things after training at the Nangong clan for the past decade, and that he'd like to show them what he has learned at the gathering. Beek Miju explains that Mubik's martial arts has achieved seven stars, although she thinks he's not as strong as his late father, the moon-splitting swordsman. His current skill should be enough for him to be acknowledged as martial master. Yon Mubik begins to perform his skills, and the demonstrations are so swift and beautiful. The elders are wowed and recognizes the technique. Yon Mubik pauses and concentrates, gathers his energy into his sword, and thinks of a humongous dragon and how it uses its claws to split the earth. With dead focus and seriousness in his eyes, he delivers the powerful dragon claw attack, which appears on the ground as three long claws carved deep into the earth. The elders are amazed at what power the single strike pulled, and are all shocked at the sight of Mubik standing in front of what seems to be dragon claws scratches, and they all jump out of their chairs to go take a look. Eek Miju, with her face that looks like someone that's planning something evil, asks everyone to go take a look, and Yon Mubik stands tall and proud as he sheathes his sword. We are taken back to the main fight between Yon Jaka and Sage Chun Jai, where everyone present are all terrified by the mighty dragon formed by Jaka's young energy. Sage can't believe his eyes as he stares at the dragon, and Yon Jaka emerges with immense energy emanating from all over his body. He calls Sage, Oi old man, have you been hiding your true strength from me this whole time? And Jiaka, with a killer face, he says to Sage that he has been underestimated a lot. Jiaka releases massive energy from his body and points his sword at Sage, telling him that from now on, he'll need to fight seriously. The energy from Jiaka is so immense and bright, Sage has to cover his eyes and block from against the strong wind. He excitedly laughs and says to Jiaka that he is incredible and truly great. He fires up himself and tells Jaka that he would need to be that strong for him to fight that seriously. He moves in for the attack with his ultimate Teiji Mystic Sword technique. Jiaka concentrates massive amount of Yang energy into his blade, and with dead focus and concentration in his eyes, he strikes, and Jiaka's attack was able to nullify all of Sage Chun Jai's sword energy attack. This makes Sage Chun Jai wonder how this could be possible. Ever since Jiaka learnt the Nine Heavens art in the advanced move, Heavenly Sword Inquisition technique, this is the first time he has ever fought using the Nine Heavens art. Dragon Claw Technique Sage is dumbstruck with just a single strike from Jiaka. It was able to nullify his advanced Teiji Mystic Sword Technique. That took him decades to master and gave him the Martial Master title. He looks back at Jiaka as he notes that this technique is not that of a bandit. While lost in his thoughts, Jiaka appears in front of him and tells him to not get distracted now. Sage stands unprepared as Jiaka plunges forward to attack. Sage is worried and bleeding from the previous attack. He thinks he's fucked because he doesn't have much internal energy left. And this will be his last attack and he'll give it all he's got. They both attack and only one person is hit. They both land after that last attack and Sage Chun Jai has no more fight in him. So he says to Jaka, would you please tell me your name again? Yon Jaka replies saying, the name is Yon Jaka. And adds that, Jok means crimson and Ha means sun. With a proud smile on Jaka's face, he says, it means crimson sunset. Sage bleeding badly, laughs proud like someone who finally understands something. Sage Chun Jai passes out while standing and starts loosing the grip on his sword. It falls from his hand, and the moment it drops, Sang Muching, the leader of the Mansu Merchant Union, is seen kneeling before Jaka, begging. It appears Jaka must have given him a punch to the gut, because we see blood out from his mouth. Jaka looks down on him, and walks away. Before Sage Chun Jai fall to the ground, he calls out Yon Jiaka, and collapses face flat to the ground. Everyone in the Mansu Merchant Union are dumbfounded including everyone in the Five Peaks stronghold. None could believe what just happened. Jiaka walks up to Sage Chun Jai's body, and at that moment, he remembers the chief and calls out to him smiling. Chief Pung Yoncho is dumbstruck as he sees that Jaka has actually just won, and everyone in the Five Peaks stronghold begins to celebrate Jiaka, shouting, Jiaka won. He won, and the celebration continues. Unexpected by Jiaka he is lifted up by Pung Yoncho. With Jaka on his shoulder, Pung Yoncho says you're amazing Jiaka and shouts Hore for the Five Peak Mountain Stronghold, while the merchants and their warriors retreat. Hore for the Five Peaks Ten Heroes. Sage Chun Jai is waking up after passing out from the battle with Joka with slight concussion. He asks Sang if he sees that and says that he saw the skies above skies today. Sage Chun Jai is awake, 
and trying to regain full consciousness, he tells Sang that subjugating the Five Peak Stronghold would be impossible, and the only way to subjugate the Five Peak Stronghold would be if the Sword Emperor himself raises an army, and tells Sang to not even think of taking on Jiaka. Rumors spread about the defeat of Sage Chun Jai, and someone seems angry about this and says that it's ridiculous. Henan Province, Southern Region, some men are seen discussing, and one of them says to the other that there's no way a sect leader would have been defeated by a mere bandit. But the other tell him that it's true, M, and says that the bandit that's good with swords is not just any normal monster, and proceeds to tell the other guy that he must have heard that Sage Chun Jai went to the Five Peak Stronghold to subjugate it. The other confirms that he's heard, but says that no one has actually seen Sage Chun Jai in person. He laughs and says that people are probably just spreading false rumors. The other laughs and agrees that it does make sense. But someone else who overheard all their discussions tells them that it's not totally possible that what they heard is false and says that regarding that brat, he thinks he's able to defeat even a wooting sect elder. They seem shocked to be hearing this and asks this strange man who he is. The strange man didn't reply at first and takes a sip off his tea and tells them that they could say he's someone who has faced the sword of that young bandit. This strange man is Heavenly Swords Man Li Muryong, the leader of the Nanyang Merchant Union. He is reminded of his defeat, and says that those were really impressive moves and he wonders if anyone is capable of facing Jaka. A man seems to be standing at a distance, listening in on the conversation. Other merchant in the restaurant gathers Li Muryong and they all share their experience on how they were defeated. One of them says that him and his merchant group were defeated by just one strike from Jiaka. And the other tells Li Muryong that he heard that he was able to last several rounds against Jiaka. The Mansu Merchant Union was unable to subjugate the Five Peak Stronghold, and with that, it was known throughout Henan Province that nobody is capable of subjugating the Five Peak Stronghold for the sake of the Mansu Merchant Union and Wuding sect reputation. The Mansu Merchant Union leader did his best to keep people from spreading that news. However, the news of their defeat had already spread through southern Henan, and the Five Peak Stronghold went from totally unheard of to the strongest group. The information on Sage Chun Jai that was spread was said to be inaccurate. At the same time, rumors of the Five Peaks' ten heroes that protected the Five Peak Stronghold started to spread as well. Amongst them, there was one name that was the most famous. At the restaurant, where the men are discussing, the man listening from a distance rushes back to pass on the information he heard to his superiors. He kneels before them and tells them that the Five Peak Stronghold has an exceptional martial artist known as Yon Jaka and based on rumors. Only ten of them battled with the hundred-plus merchant union warriors, with support from the Wuding sect, and the ten are known as the Five Peaks' ten heroes. Mountain Debbie Hideout Vice Chief, Poisoned Eyed Blood Blade thinks for a while and remembers that he's the one who gave that name. He also remembers that the Five Peak Mountain Stronghold were just a bunch of ragtags few months ago, and he did promise to give them a name if they could gather enough people. He laughs and says that he actually thought they'd disappear because there were big merchant unions surrounding them, and says that it looks like they got lucky and recruited someone strong. A bandit from inside a room laughs, and says that when the master told them to increase the Green Forest stronghold by twice its size, he twelve demon generals including himself had all opposed the idea. The man talking is one of the twelve demon generals of the heaven-destroying demon lord. He then proceeds to say that, if they had only increased the number, then Green Forest's name would have been sullied, and that's why he refused any and all requests asking to join the Green Forest stronghold from that area, and hoped that those nobodies would all disappear before the Green Forest summit. He then asked both Vice Chief present if the Green Forest Summit would still be held at Mansipion. As they have initially told him, they confirms that it's correct and that the summit is only a month away. The general then says that if that's the case then he'll have to go take a look, because he needs to see if the people partaking in the summit are qualified to be a part of Green Forest. We see a messenger hawk flying with a message tied to its leg. Five Peak Stronghold, Harmony Pavilion. A guy is seen begging the chief to please forgive him for he has nowhere else to go but here. The guy begs, as the chief stares furiously at him. The guy continues begging and promises the chief to never abandon the stronghold and run away ever again. The chief gives a deadly look, and asks him to get up. The guy stands up and thinks that he's definitely going to get hit. The chief raises his hand in a manner as if he wants to hit the man. With a furious face, the guy closes his eyes and braces himself ready for the hit, but is shocked that the chief didn't hit him and only hung his arm around his shoulder. The chief laughs and pats his back, asking the guy why he got so serious, calling the guy a rascal, and thanks him for trusting in him and coming back. The guy gets emotional and starts to cry, thanking the chief for his kindness and runs off to get started with work. Tak appears behind the chief and asks him if he doesn't think he let that guy off easily, and tells the chief that if he simply just take those returning in, the stronghold will look weak. 
Tak Gamyung isn't happy about this and tells the chief that they only need to take back people that will stay with them no matter what. The chief calls his name and tells him that as he experienced the incident this time around, it made him angry because he realized that the green forests still don't acknowledge them as part of them. The chief explains to Tak that as the green forest expanded, they had tens of new strongholds, and that the existing green forest strongholds thinks of new strongholds like them as ragtags, bandits, and still don't acknowledge them as green forest. Tak then realizes that what the chief just said is true, because no one from green forest came to help us like they've forgotten we belong to the green forest. The chief that's correct and he thought the name green forest would protect them but it was just a name and says that that's why he doesn't want to put a great burden on Jiaka like in the recent incident. With determination, he tells Tak that they need to be acknowledged as Green Forest, but Tak asks him how they would be able to do that. Chief Poon then tells Tak that the Green Forest Summit is taking place soon, and that they would have to use the opportunity to show them at the summit that they aren't nobodies, and adds that if they are acknowledged, then they would be able to join forces with other strongholds, and in order to do that, they would need people who would stay back and protect the stronghold while they are gone. Tak smiles, because he finally understands, and tells the chief that since they now have more mouths to feed, they'll need to work harder. The chief affirms that and tells Tak that he'll need him to help out a lot on that, and asks Tak where Jaka might have gone to again. Tak tells him that Jaka said he was going to look for that old man, and the chief says, it looks like he's very busy. Both Tak and Poong discuss as the walk towards the Harmony Pavilion. Poong asks Tak what the rumors are on the Five Peak Mountain and Tak says that people are crazy about them and making huge fuss. Sage receives the messenger bird, takes out the message tied to its leg, and as he reads its contents, he doesn't seem concerned about it, throws it away and continues his meditation. The content of the letter reads, I've heard that you're still staying on the Five Peak Mountain. If a sect elder is absent from his position for too long, that'll show bad examples to the young ones. I hope you'll come back to the Wooting sect immediately. Jaka finally finds Sage. Sage sitting on the rock has been expecting Jaka and welcomes him as. Jaka doesn't seem pleased with him still being around, and calls him Mr. asking him if he isn't going back. Sage Chun Jai gives Jaka a suspicious smile. Jaka still persistent, asks him if he isn't going back. But he asks Jaka why he would want to do that, and tells Jaka that it's been a while since he had a break, and he's thinking of enjoying his time here before going back. Jaka still does not like why Sage Chun Jai choosing to rest at the Fiv E Peak stronghold, and tells him that he could go to the Mansu Merchant Union if he wants to take a break. Sage Chun Jai realizes that Jaka won't stop asking him to leave until he gives him a proper response. Jaka then asks him if he's still talking about taking him in as his disciple, and says that if that's the case, his answer is still no because he already told him that he's not interested. Sage Chun Jai pulls himself together, before stating his true intentions. He begins by telling Jiaka that it's actually the opposite, and explains to Jiaka that he have been called the strongest disciple in the waiting sect, and was able to accumulate internal energy faster than anyone else, and also understood the advanced technique of the Wuting sect, and this year makes it 30 years since he started to train in the Taiji Mystic Sword technique. However, no matter how hard he trained, he wasn't able to break past the limit of the three ultimates. Jaka looks confused and asks him what the three ultimates are. Sage Chun Jai takes a deep breath and tells Jaka, simply put, I want to learn from you. If you, Sage Chun Jai, simply put, I wish to learn from you. Jaka still pissed that Sage won't leave, pauses and thinks for a while, realizes that this is why Sage Chun Jai won't leave. He finally speaks, he speaks with so much pride. Yelling at Sage Chun Jai, saying that he can't teach Sage Chun Jai the demon slaying blade technique, because it's a technique that was specifically thought only to them by second brother Tak. Sage Chun Jai stops Jaka from talking and tells him that he does not need to learn the demon slaying technique, even though he wishes to learn it. In summary, what he's asking is to learn from Jaka as an observer. Jaka asks him if that is all he wants. Sage Chun Jai replies saying, isn't that what infinite flow as one means? And still says, yes, that will be enough. Infinite flow. All flows combine into one big flow. And, out of the blue, he rushes towards Jiaka. With a clenched fist as if he wants to land a powerful punch to Jiaka, he says, this will be a pretty proposal for you too. But Jiaka is unfazed and he didn't move an inch from where he is standing. Sage stops before his fist could hit Jiaka which creates a blast wave around Jiaka. Jiaka then noticed that some of the bamboo trees behind him have been shattered due to the wave from Sage Chun Jai's fist. Jiaka turns to look at the trees properly and asks Sage Chun Jai how he did it. And Sage Chun Jai asks him if he's curious, and says to Jiaka that he could teach him how. But he has a condition and this will be like a kind of deal. Jiaka asks what kind of deal would it be? Sage then tells Jiaka that if Jiaka gives him a piece of advice, he'll also tell him where he's lacking. Jiaka looks confused after hearing this and asks Sage what he means when he says he's lacking. 
Sage tells Jaka that he heard him correctly and proceeds to tell him that although he's already very strong, that he's still not able to make use of his full power. And that is probably because Jaka still don't understand the basic theories of martial art yet. And when he have mastered the basics, his martial art will grow to a deeper level as well. So Sage offers Jaka his hand and asks him if he's willing to take the offer, which is for them to learn from each other. A few minutes later we see both of them training, first with swords, next they meditate under a heavy waterfall, the next is physical combat, and they train for months. One day, Sage and Jaka were done with training for the day, and as they head back, some children playing around almost run into Sage. Sage and Jaka had to wait for the kids to run along, but as they stood there, Sage notices a child hiding by the corner, so he asks the boy what's wrong. The boy then gifts him a flower, which Sage happily accepts and he tells the boy that he'll cherish it while the boy also asks him to find time to play some other time. As the boy runs off, Jaka tells Sage that he seems to be pretty close with the boy and Sage giggles and says that children are such cheerful and bright creatures. But Jaka disagrees and says that he hates kids the most. But Sage isn't pleased to hear that, so he asks Jaka why he hates such young and innocent children. And Jaka tells him that he has no idea of what he's talking about. He remembers his past and tells Sage that younger ones are the worst and people like them would laugh, play pranks, and bully people. Sage just stays there and observes Jaka's facial expressions change. So Jaka adds that he thinks all the people in the Five Peaks stronghold are all kind regardless of their age. Sage Chun Jai looks around and says that he didn't imagine that this is how a stronghold of the Green Forest would look like. Jaka then tells him that the stronghold is just another place that people live in and asks Sage what difference was he expecting. Sage smiles and tells Jaka that he finally realizes that he's had great misunderstanding about them all this time. It is dusk already, and we see Keon gathering logs of wood. As she stands in front of it and wonders if the wood will be enough, someone has been standing behind Keon which she hadn't noticed. She is ready to go as she put the wood on her shoulder. The person behind her stretches his head to tap her, and as she turns back she sees that it's Master Sage Chun Jai, who is offering to help her with some of the wood. She refuses his help because it doesn't sit well with her that an elder of a sect would keep trying to do things like that, so she tells him that it is making her uncomfortable. But Sage Chun Jai tells her that he can't help it since he has tons of time on his hands, and asks that they get going. As they walk, Kion tells Sage that he's so weird and also says that she thought all elders thinks that they are refined people who wouldn't do things like that. Sage laughs and says that it's true because himself also has certain biases towards mountain bandits, and Kion asks what made him change his mind. But Sage Chun Jai says he doesn't know and he wonders himself, and proceeds to say that he at least thinks a place like the Five Peak Stronghold is a good place. This makes Kion smile as she agrees with him and tells him that he's very correct and that the Five Peak Stronghold is not like other strongholds. She then proceeds to explain to Sage that most of the people in other strongholds are bandit union. Used to be robbers. But most of the people at Five Peaks Stronghold are just people who ran away because it was hard to make a living. She also adds that she joined the stronghold because she almost got sold to a brothel. And since the chief takes on the trouble of accepting people who need help, and Jaka protects everyone like a guardian god, the Five Peaks Stronghold is able to become as peaceful as it is right now. Sage Chun Jai then asks her if she can tell him how Jaka joined the stronghold, but she doesn't seem to know and tell him that she's not sure and that she doesn't remember the details of Jaka's past. But she still tells Sage that she can only remember that the chief said something about saving Jaka when he was about to die. Sage becomes interested and because he is now starting to understand how important the chief and the stronghold is to Jaka. And it's no wonder Jaka risks his life to protect the stronghold, because the chief is someone who saved Jaka's life. Tion smiles because she also thinks that could be the reason, and says that there could be another reason which is probably because Jaka thinks of everyone as his family. Sage thinks on this for a while, and now things are starting to make more sense to him. So he asks Kion that they start heading back now. At a different province, we see a man being choked to death, and his life force is being drained out, till he dies. Standing in numbers are masked men with someone who seems to be their leader in front. The man drops the dead body, as, as he commends someone on reaching the level of Grand Demon General. This hidden person appreciates him and say that the time has finally come. This person proceeds to say that the anger that she experienced 20 years ago is something she has never forgotten even for a single day. This person walks towards the chair as she says that she was too impatient back then, however that's no longer the case. She adds that, the Sword Emperor, the Moon Splitting Swordsman, and all the other sects in Jianghu will all bow down under her fit, the feet of she the Lunar Fairy. The demonic head of the Henan province, the one called the Second Henan Evil because it is said to be difficult to preserve your head if you encounter him. The title given to him because he is said to have a sword hidden behind his malicious smile. Sweet-tongued hidden sword Shim Yong Gak. Upon his life, a desperately dangerous situation came. 
Haga village, outside a restaurant. Shimyong Gak and his disciples just arrived while one is tired and trying to catch his breath. The other one orders for food and the last one complains of thirst. The discussion starts, and one of the disciples asks everyone present at the table if they think the rumors floating around are true. The unbelievable rumor that the Mansu Merchant Union and the Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai, were defeated at the Five Peak Stronghold. Because everywhere you go, there is ruckus with people praising the Five Peak Stronghold. Shimyong Gak responds saying that it can't be true, because if the Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai, had personally come forth, then the Five Peak Stronghold would have been obliterated. Shim is still in so much disbelief, so he wonders if the talks about the Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai, making an attack on the Five Peak Stronghold was a lie. Shim really don't want to believe that it is possible that Sage Chun Jai would have been defeated at the Five Peak Stronghold because if it were true, then he should have completely destroyed the Five Peak Stronghold, killed the Sworn Brothers and Jiaka whom he despises so much, and if that had happened, then the hideout would have been completely empty and left with only the Bandit Union name, and with the hideout empty without a leader, he would have appeared like a hero, and become the hideout leader of the Five Peak Stronghold. This is what Shim had expected to happen, because that was his grand plan from the very night that he encouraged everyone to flee. But now, all his plans would have been completely tarnished. Shim's attention is shifted to someone sitting behind him, who's gossiping with another. And this person says, Oi, you, ever heard of the Ten Wufeng elites? The person that he's talking to responds, Of course I have. Is there anyone who doesn't know of them? They are apparently monstrously strong. And apparently the Mansu Merchant Union leader, Sang Much and an elder of the Wuding sect, Sage Chun Jai weren't able to do a single thing and were defeated. This makes the other guy question the rumor because for a rumor like that to be floating around, then how strong could they actually be? After listening in on the strangers, Shim realizes that the fame of the Ten Sworn Brothers have become more impressive than he initially thought and people now even call them the Ten Elites. As they are being served food, Shim overhears those men saying that the Five Peak Stronghold are also accepting people who had left them previously. And the other guy also says that it's true and those bandits are quite the generous bunch. Shim is shocked to hear this. And one of the gossipers also adds that there are apparently plenty of people in the mountain hideout already. And plenty of people from around that come to visit them after hearing the rumors. One of Shim's disciple who's also listening in on the gossipers. After hearing what the gossipers said, quickly asks Shim what they'll have to do now because it is becoming obvious that the Five Peak Stronghold bandits actually survived somehow. Shim curses the Mansu Merchant Union because he now thinks that the talk of them bringing the Heaven Earth Supreme must have been a bluff, and he should have known that an elder of a sect wouldn't go off to subjugate some mere bandits. The disciples still ask him what should be done because he had initially told them that they would all start from a high ranking on a completely empty mountain Wufeng hideout, but Shim shouts at them for daring to fault him. The disciple then calmly tells him that that's not the case, and it's just because they had an option to go with Beak Jio to the Chaifeng hideout. But they all refused and chose to follow him because they believed in his words, that they would be treated with contempt at Chifeng Hideout, for being those that had once abandoned the mountain hideout, and if they are going to follow him to the end, then there is something they need to believe in. Shim bangs the table and calls them fools, and tells them that if what those gossipers said just now isn't false, they should have also heard when the gossipers also said that Mountain Wufeng Hideout are reaccepting the people who return. One of the disciples smiles because another to maintain a mountain hideout of the bandit union. It would be best to have lots of members. Shim affirms his words and also says that this means there's no problem if they were to return. The disciples get excited and agrees with Shim because it would be much better than going to Chifeng Hideout, and that he has also heard that the Chifeng Hideout leader is very cruel. One of the disciples that has been eating all this while without paying any attention or contributing to the discussion tries to ask a question, and they all look at him like they are about to beat the shit out of him. Shim and his disciples arrive at the Mountain Wufeng hideout also known under the Bandit Union as the Five Peak Stronghold, and the people around are disgusted by their presence, asking Shim what sort of brazen face does he need to be returning. More people are starting to notice their arrival, and asking each other if it's the same bastards who paved the way towards abandoning the mountain hideout. The people also admits that they themselves are shameless, but they think these group must really be thick-skinned. One of Shim's disciples looks worried and asks Shim if he notices that the atmosphere is a bit unusual as it seems that no one is welcoming them. Shim tells him not to worry about it that they just need to meet the hideout leader and tell him that they didn't abandon the mountain hideout. The disciple is still worried so he asks Shim if the hideout leader would actually believe their words, because everyone seems to see them as the culprits who made them leave the mountain hideout. For the second time, Shim is telling him not to worry about it, and that all the people talking are the sort who wouldn't dare say a word in front of him. As Shim gets closer to the hideout fence, he notices something. It's Jiaka's dragon claw marks on the ground. 
So he asked what that is, and his disciple who is very ignorant of what it is, says that it looks like some fool tried to cultivate a farm in front of the mountain hideout and got chased out. But Shim knows that cannot be the workings of a farmer. He walks closer to it and he isn't surprised that his disciple doesn't know that this mark is created by martial art. And he also knows that there is only one person in the mountain hideout who is able to pull off a ridiculous act like this. After Shim's realization, fear came upon him. But he tries to calm himself because he thinks that no matter how monstrous Yon Jaka may be, this isn't the trace that can be created from the exorcism sword technique. While Shim and his disciple are still staring at the mark, someone appears behind him and asks if he's Yon Gak, and says that they must be very shameless to have come crawling back. Shim furiously turns to see this person while shouting, which bastard dares to refer me as that? The man puts on a smirk face and says, Who dares huh? And shouts, It's me you idiot. Shim calms down and tries to recall the man's name, Li Chol San. Shim after remembering the guy's name, gets really furious and shouts at Chol San asking him if he has gone mad. And Chol San responds, telling him that he doesn't think he's the one who has gone mad, which surprises Shim's disciples. Shim is really furious at this point and shouting that he only momentarily left the place and it now looks like the hierarchy has become a complete mess. Chol San drops the axe he was carrying and mocks Shim's words, telling him that if he thinks the hierarchy is a mess then he should be the first to fix it and start by greeting the elder brother standing in front of him. At the Harmony Pavilion, one of the bandits rushes to give the chief the news. He exclaims that at the moment, there's a report that the five people including Shim Yongak and his disciples have returned to the hideout. The chief isn't surprised to hear this, but second brother Tak is unhappy after hearing this and says that that geezer's mug sure is thick skin. So he asks the chief that he hopes he's not actually thinking of accepting Shim again, and also states that he has never liked that wicked geezer from the very beginning. He also tells the chief that no matter what reason he might be thinking to accept Shim, he should also remember that Shim is the one who instigated the abandonment of the mountain hideout before anyone else. The chief agrees with second brother Tak but also tells him that the hideout definitely needs the support of Shim, because Shim is the one known as demon head of the Henan province. Tak disagrees with him. He believes that they do not need Shim's support because the hideout have gotten stronger after Jaka thought them few things. He proceeds to tell the chief that they probably already have few members who can now stand up against Shim Yong Gak or Beak Jaya. The chief wonders, because it might be true, and says to Tak that both Beak and Shim got obliterated by Jaka. However, he still thinks Shim might have some usefulness, because his martial art was exceptional. Shim Yong Gak and Lee Cholson are about to face off in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Cholson calls Shim an old man, and tells him that he is going to show him that he's not the same Lee Cholson as before. Shim gets offended by what Cholson said and tells him that it seems like he has really set his mind on dying. They both ready their fists and rush towards each other. Shim lands the first blow, but Cholson blocked it. Shim is surprised to see that Cholson was able to block his attack. Cholson laughs and says to Shim that he can now see his movements, and he's not all that strong. And aside from blocking Shim's attack, Cholson is able to push Shim back with his brute strength. And this is shocking to everyone present, including Shim's disciples. He wonders how that could be possible because he had always known that Cholson is strong but wasn't skilled enough to stand a chance against Shim. Which is because, in all of Henan province, there aren't many people who can give Shim a hard time. And this makes him wonder how Cholson got this strong to be able to stand against Shim. Cholson didn't waste any time and rushes to strike Shim, with his clenched fist aiming at Shim. He mocks Shim, telling him that he is no longer threat because his training with Yon Jaka has been very effective. Shim now understands why Cholson is able to stand him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He acknowledges the fact that Cholson has gotten exponentially strong after his training with Jaka whom he calls Yon Family Brat. However, Shim does not still see Cholson as a threat and easily catches him off guard and yelling, saying that Cholson still has a long way to go before he can overpower him. Before smashing his head face front into the ground, Cholson feels so embarrassed and gets really angry as he tries to free himself and get back up. But Shim advises him to remain down unless he just want to keep hurting himself. Cholson refuses, laughs at Shim, and tells Shim that the fight has just began. Cholson manages to release himself from Shim's grip, yelling that he can never lose to someone who chickens out when things gets tough. And with his brute strength, he throws a heavy punch to Shim, and is able to dodge it at the last second. Shim gets angry because someone like Cholson who he considers a bastard, is really trying to get a win on him. The whole thing has really gotten to Shim and now he's really pissed, so he unleashes a ferocious killing art, while telling Cholson that he's the one who pushed him and that he shouldn't resist too much. But before he could hit Cholson with his ferocious attack, someone appeared out of nowhere and negated his attack with just a single finger. This man is Sage Chun Jai, who then tells both Shim and Cholson that the fight is over. Shim is dumbstruck, as he still can't believe nor understand what just happened. 
Sage then tells Shim that he doesn't know who he is but, using a killing art is a little excessive. Shim still wonders what just happened, is trying to make sense of how someone could negate his attack with a single finger, which also makes him wonder if there's another monster around besides Yon Jiaka. Cholson still on the ground, starts telling Sage that he shouldn't stop Shim because he was going to give Shim some payback. Sage is shocked to hear this, so he tells Cholson that recognizing difference in strength is also a skill, and that Shim is a few times stronger. But Cholson refuses to admit and says that himself have not also used his full strength either and that it's okay for the Heaven Earth Supreme to stay out of it. And this comes as a shocking revelation to Shim that Sage Chun Jai removes his finger from Shim's head and Shim is still in disbelief that the man standing in front of him is who Cholson just called him, Wuding Sect Elder, the Heaven Earth Supreme. Sage Chun Jai affirms, telling Shim that Cholson is correct, and introduces himself as the elder of the Wuding Sect, the Heaven Earth Supreme. But Shim and his disciples still refuse to believe. Even still in disbelief, Shim decides to think for a while before talking, and proceeds to ask Sage what an elder of the Wuding sect would be doing at a mountain hideout of the Bandit Uni. But they are interrupted by someone who speaks from a distance asking what someone who doesn't belong to the mountain hideout would do with that information. Shim looks to see who it is that spoke, and the person steps forward. This person is Yon Jaka. Yon Jaka then calls Shim old man and tells him that for him to have come back, after making such a big scene back then, then he hopes that he must have come prepared. Mountain Wufeng Highest Peak Shim can be seen walking up the mountains while he mommers in pain and frustration. He says that he, who ruled over the whole region of Henan province, he who even made the tears of crying children cease, why must he who has done all this, undergo this type of shame? He calls Jaka the Yon clan bastard and promises that he will never forget what happened today. Few hours ago, we can see Shim's disciples scared to death and one of them pray. While Shim is being brutally beaten up by Jaka and Shim wonders if he's going to die and if Jaka is really trying to kill him. Jaka continues his assault on Shim as Shim thinks of him as a demon bastard and concludes in his mind that Jaka is really a demon. We are back with Shim, who walks through the forest of the mountains all bruised up, mumbling on how he will exact his revenge on Yon Jaka someday. And at that moment, he starts to feel some immense energy emanating from from a close distance, and he wonders what this incredible energy is, because the weight and pressure he feels from this energy surpasses that of Yon Jaka who he constantly calls Yon Clan Bastard. Sage Chun Jai create a ball of aura and prepares to attack, while Shim hides behind a tree watching the whole thing. With dead focus and seriousness in Sage's eyes, he stares at Yon Jaka who plunges to attack. Jaka commends Sage's spirit as Sage releases massive Kai, and Shim is surprised to see that Jaka is also present. Sage begins to perform his martial arts skills while Jaka asks him if he has succeeded in linking with the three poles or whatever. Jaka gets excited as he plunges into the air to strike Sage and says that this fight is going to be fun. Sage smiles, because he doesn't plan to go easy on Jaka. He quickly unsheathes his sword, and yells Jaka's name, telling him that he is sorry, and that he might have surpassed Jaka. Jaka smiles and tells Sage to get serious because he don't think Sage has actually surpassed him. Their fight goes on and heavy gust of wind blows from each strike, reaching as far as where Shim hides. Shim is really shocked to see that Sage and Jaka are sparring, but he still can't believe that an elder of the Wooting sect is training in martial art with a mare bandit because if other sects bastards find out about it, they will foam at their mouths. The two keep on fighting and Jaka smiles and asks Sage what's wrong because it doesn't feel like there is much difference in power. Sage also laughs and tells Jaka that it's too early to come to a conclusion. He proceeds to tighten the grip on his sword and realizes massive aura from his entire body, showing the successfully linked three poles of his teching. Jaka is stunned by this amazing display of martial art. Sage then sends a very powerful stab with massive aura in it at Jaka, and Jaka is unable to dodge it so he blocks the attack using the exorcism technique, and this collision of the stab in Jaka's blade causes a massive explosion that leave very big scar on the ground as if a meteorite had crashed there and Sage can be seen standing in front of the scared earth and dusts. Shim is once again surprised at this ridiculous power, because it's unreal for a simple stab to have such power in it, so he finally concludes that Sage Chun Jai is truly a monster. Shim looks at all the dust and ruckus caused by just that one stab, and thinks that it's over for Yon Jaka no matter how strong he might be, there is no way that would have left him unscathed. But at that moment, the dust begins to clear up and Jaka is seen standing. Sage Chun Jai don't seem too surprised about this. Jiaka raises his sword, out of excitement, and says that Sage's move just now was really dangerous. And now he realizes that he won't be able to block Sage's attacks with the exorcism sword technique alone. Jiaka jumps up and shouts, Ajisi, I'll go all in with my power as well. 
Shim is surprised once more because he finds it difficult to understand how Jiaka is completely fine after all that, because he thinks Jiaka should have died right there. So he wonders what Jiaka is made out of. Sage seems happy to hear this, so he prepares himself to receive Jiaka's attack, and shouts, telling Jiaka to show him all he have got and adds that he haven't even begun demonstrating his martial art yet. Jiaka locks his focus on Sage, raises his sword high into the heavens, displays a technique he has never used before. The Nine Heavens Art, Second Phase. And for a split second we could see fear in Sage's eyes. Jiaka sends a powerful attack, above the heavens splendid dragon. And the explosion caused from Jiaka's attack is way too massive. And the wave from it alone was able to push back Shim that's standing far away from the fight. Jiaka's, above the heavens splendid dragon attack, split the sky. And leaves Sage Chun Jai running. Shim looks up at the split sky, and is again dumbfounded, wondering how on earth was Jiaka able to split the sky. Jiaka seems excited because his attack went better than he expected, so he tells Sage that he seems to have improved himself thanks to him, and asks Sage what he thinks. Sage responds telling Jiaka that if he had taken that hit directly, not even his bones would have remained on his body, and asks Jiaka how much more he plans on surprising him. But Jaka don't seem impressed and tells Sage to stop pretending to be weak because he knows Sage haven't shown his true strength yet. But Sage still stands on his point and tells Jaka that even if himself had put all his strength on display, it wouldn't have changed anything, and adds that he don't want to lose the confidence that he has finally gained either. He offers Jaka his hand, thanking him for he has learned a lot from training with him, and adds that, that would be all. But Jaka don't want it to end just yet because it was just starting to get fun, and he tells Sage that he's being mean. Sage apologizes and tells Jaka that if he were to take direct hits from him, then he might have to stay a few more months to heal and recover. So he asks Jaka if he doesn't want him to go back to his position as the wooting sex elder. And Jaka tells him that he is surprised to hear this because he thought Sage wanted to become a bandit since Sage wouldn't leave before, even after he was asked several times to leave. So Jaka says, so you have plans on returning after all. Sage says that's right and that it was a great experience that broadened his world, and that he'll make sure to return this favor someday. They shake hands in agreement. The months-long training left the two masters with a lot. The Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai felt content about being able to witness Yon Jaka's growth, more so than reaching greater heights than he'd hoped to achieve. He quietly left the hideout before summer came, waiting for the day the young man would show up in the central plains of Murim. Shim Yongak is left speechless as he watches them walk away. And at this point, he has totally given up on revenge. And somehow, the hideout formed a stronger unity. One month later, a man is seen walking alone and he wonders if he is at Mountain Wufang. The view is not too bad, he said, but a huge bear blocks his path, so he wonders if the beasts in the mountain do not know any fear, and how dare it bear its fangs at him. But he pauses and thinks that perhaps, the bear could be the mother of the three young bear that he had just murdered, so he says that they simply received punishment for blocking his way. He turns his focus back to the mama bear, as she roars at him and about to strike him with her claws. The strange man didn't move an inch, and proceeds to pull out his hidden metallic claws and beheads Mama Bear, slicing her into multiple pieces, stating that it was foolish of her to have attacked him because, him, Yin Gale Felling Lord, is not that merciful. Head hideout leader of the Bandit Union, Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, Sok Muhi, following his appearance in the martial world. He was hailed as one of the strongest since he has never once been defeated, but in the past he used to be a laborer at the Shailin Temple and was there to learn martial arts, but he didn't want to be bald. His innate strength and skills were enough to grasp the attention of everyone there. However, his path in life was too far away from the principles of Buddhism. But one day, after discovering a worn-out statue of Buddha in an abandoned storehouse at the Shailin Temple, his fate began to change. Sok Muhi began cleaning the statue thoroughly, as he believed he might be taught martial art if he cleaned it well. But he ended up breaking it. This ended up being a fortunate thing for him. Inside the statue of Buddha was an ancient martial tome called Dark Heaven Asura Scriptures. Following that path, the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord left the Shailin Temple and began wandering around the country. Not long after he rose to the seat of Bandit Union head hideout leader and stirred up the martial world. After taking the twelve best bandits under him as his disciples, he passed down the teachings of the Dark Heaven Asura Scriptures to them. And their power intimidated even the elders of the seven sects and two schools, and just like that, the bandit union's twelve demon kings also known as the Grim Reapers were formed. Mountain Woofing Hideout A sleeping cat wakes up to the loud shout of a man shouting, Is the hideout leader of Mountain Woofing Hideout here? I'm an envoy from the bandit union, and I'm also the shattering heaven demon lord's direct disciple. The chief, Tak, and the others all rush out to meet him but are surprised to see a drunk man saying that he is the Yin Gale Feline Lord of the Twelve Demon Kings, and asked that they come out quick and give him a proper welcome. 
12 Demonic Lord Yingale Feline Lord None of the members of the bandit union seems to be impressed, and they all just stare at him like a drunk man that lost his way. Demonic Lord Yingale is being treated as he should, so he asks if the people present is the complete number of them, because he thought it was the 10 Wufeng elites, so he asks why they are only 9. And the chief responds telling him that their 7th brother is currently in closed training and that's why they cannot contact him. He wonders what kind of closed training that could be. He sips his tea and cleans his mouth, before saying that they didn't contact the 7th brother for such tribal reason even though he is present. While one of the ten brothers tries to whisper to Tak that Jaka is sleeping in his room, but Tak shuts him up, telling him to keep quiet. That Jaka does not even show respect for the elder of the Wuding sect. And does he think it'll be any different for the head hideout leader disciple? And that he should just think on what would happen if this man needlessly gets on Jaka's nerves. He imagines a scenario and says that things would be really bad. And finally says that they should just hope that demonic lord Yingale doesn't insist on them contacting Jaka. And the other brother agrees. Demonic Lord Yin Gao slams his cup and says that it's quite arrogant of Jiaka but it's also admirable. So he says that they must have all survived all the attacks from the merchant unions around them due to such hard work. And that if bandits only indulged in debauchery, the merchant group, the five clans, and the seven sects and two schools would all catch up to them. And tells them that they would have to continue to hold on to that mindset and make sure not to disgrace the name of the bandit union. Chief Poon responds saying, yes, I'll bear that in mind, then tells Lord Yingale that he must be tired after the long journey. But Yingale interrupts him and says that before that, he gives a stupid look on his face and asks Chief Poon to introduce Kion and Sobik to him. The chief looks shocked because he can already tell where this is leading, so he tries to play it off, brightens up his face and casually introduce Kion as the ninth and Sobik as the tenth. He quickly tries to change the topic and tries to offer food but he is cut shut by Yingale and told to stay still. Demonic Lord Yingale then proceeds to tell the chief that he has two beauties, as he cleans his drooling mouth and say that the rumors are true after all. And Chul Sen comes from nowhere, trying to draw Yingale's attention away from the girls. He waves his hands sporadically, shouting, yes, yes thank you. The chief also tries, telling Demonic Lord Yingale that he doesn't feel good leaving him like this and that he should eat something first. But the Demonic Lord Yingale tells the chief that he's not done yet. Kion raises her hand and calls the attention of the Demonic Feline Lord Yingale. Kion is also trying to get his attention away from herself and Sobi. So with her still shaking up, she asks him what brings him to this unholy place and if he has some important work to do here. Yin Gale shouts out of excitement, your pretty face suits the way you speak so nicely. He starts to blush and tells her that he's here for her. He corrects himself and says he's there for work. And he is finally back to his senses, and remembers that the reason he is here is to test if they deserve the right to bear the bandit union flag, and that if they weren't qualified, he planned on executing everyone here. He adds that the Ten Wufeng elite are quite prestigious in the Henan province. Staring lustfully, he commend them, telling them that they did a great job in raising the prestige of the bandit union, and that it'd be a pity to get rid of them, since there are some talented ones. Finally, he puts his hand in his pocket about to pull out something, he says. Therefore, I officially acknowledge the Mountain Wufeng hideout as part of the bandit union. He pulls out a scroll and invites them to the bandit union tournament that will be held in October in Gangna and the chief stretches both his hands to receive the scroll. After receiving the scroll, he immediately opens it to read its content which states, The bandit union is scattered all about, so it hasn't received any respect as it hasn't yet had the chance to display its strength. Thus with this tournament, we hope to unite the bandit union as one. If we unite, everyone, including the seven sect and two schools of the order sect, will all fall under our feet. After reading the scroll, the chief is happy that their mountain hideout has finally been acknowledged, and now they will officially become members of the bandit union. Yin Gale goes back to staring at the girls, and says, now work is over. He asks for a drink from the mountain Wufeng Ten elites, and complains that he had to ask first. The chief, still excited from the good news, tells him that he'll take good care of him today and calls Tak Go Mayam to come because they both have to give a proper welcome to Yin Gale. They direct him towards the exit and his eyes away from the girls, telling him that the pallor down at Haga village is something else, but he tries to stop them from taking him away and tells them that they really don't have to do all this. And as they take him out, the chief whispers behind his back, asking Tak Gamyung where Jaka is, and Tak uses hand signs to tell him that Jaka is still sleeping. The chief then whispers that, that's good and they should quickly get Yin Gale out of the hideout. Yin Gale suspects something but Chief Poon tries to act cool and puts up a fake smile. He looks back and hope that they are able to get Yin Gale out of the hideout, before Jiaka wakes up, sleeping peacefully as Yon Jaka. At the Palor in Haga village, Chief Pung and Tak Gamyang treats demonic Lord Yin Gale to a feast, 
and still tries to keep his attention on the food. The chief says, oh my, just the sight of it makes my appetite grow. And Tak says, Q, the food here is spectacular. And they both make silly faces and ask him what he thinks of the food and if it suits his taste. He and Gail responds, telling them that he's not sure, and he don't think it's bad but. He closes his eyes as he sips his drink, and begins to imagine Keon and Sobi call to him in a sexual manner. He opens his eyes, and looks at the girls that he has been presented with. But he doesn't find them attractive and slams his cup on the table, and angrily says that this is exactly as he thought. This won't do. He immediately asks that the two girls from the mountain hideout be brought to him. The chief thinks of what to say and Tak whispers to him that he thinks they've failed. Yingale suspects the two of them so he asks them what they are whispering over there and why aren't they hurrying to bring the girls. Chief Poon starts to sweat as he thinks of the best excuse to stop Yingale from asking about the girls, and finally tells Yingale that the kids won't come to a drinking area even if he calls for them. Yingale is angered by this so he slams the table and yells that the girls should obediently come if he call for them. So he asks Chief Poon what he means by the kids won't come. He get up, walks in a hurry, telling Tak and Poong that he's going back to the mountain hideout, and that they should bring the girls before him once he's there, and threatens that if they fail to do so, then they, the mountain Wufang hideout, should get ready to face elimination from today on. And Poong tries to calm him, begging him not to do this. Back at the hideout, the girls are sleeping peacefully, until they hear a voice, asking them to get out of the room and come out this instant. Kion is still trying to wake up. And they both head outside. Unaware of the current situation, Kion calls Yingale, Hyunnam, and asks that he lowers his voice a little. Yingale gets mad and asks her if she's really trying to order him, one of the twelve demon kings. And Poon tries to explain and Kion wonders why Poon and Tak are trying to hold down Yingale because she's unaware of anything. Yingale then yells, ordering the girls to come to him this instant, and asks them to bring over the drinks as well, and that they be quick about it. They are still confused and didn't move so he yells once more, asking them what they are doing and orders that they get right on it, stating that if they refuse, then they should prepare to die. Chief Poon tries to make him calm and holds his hand, begging him. Tak also tries and tells him that he knows of another parlor with prettier girls so he asks that they please go there. Yingale gets furious because Chief Poon dare touch his body. If you're enjoying this video, please like share and subscribe. So he furiously says that they are all really trying to test his patience. He reaches for his pocket and brings out his claws, puts them on and Chief Poong scared for his life begs Yingale, telling him that there's no way they would try to get on his nerves. He starts crying and begging him, telling Yingale that he's actually doing all this for his sake. Yingale gets confused and asks Chief Poong what he means. Poong tells him that it's true and that it's all for his own sake and not himself. Both Tak and Poong continues crying and telling him that they swear. Yingale gets even more angry and yells, asking them if it's because everything at the mountain hideout belongs to the hideout leader that they are refusing to hand the girls over. They continue crying and Poon tells him that he's told him already that. That's not the case and begs him to please lower his voice a little, that something bad might happen if this continues. At this point, Yingale has lost all patience and he is about to go cut them down so he shouts, asking them if they really have a death wish. A distant voice is heard, saying, Fuck, who is it, which crazy bastard is making such a ruckus at night and not letting anyone sleep? And the chief cries even more. Yingale pauses his attack, and he looks back to see who it is that spoke so arrogant. He stares at all the other bandits, and furiously asks who it is, which one of them dares to. But he's interrupted again by the same voice, saying, If you're drunk, you should just go to sleep. Even the girls wonder who it is that's talking. And the person talks again, asking, Why are you doing this shit after crawling into other people's mountain hideout? Kion stares at Sobik, suspecting her of being the one talking. Sobik also stares at Kion, and Yingale stares at both of them. Sobik realizes that they think she's the one so she starts to try and clear herself, stating that she's not the one who said any of those things. Yingale is not having it right now as he thinks that these bastards are trying to play games on him. With so much bloodlust, he asks whoever it is to come out so that he can send them to hell today. So Jiaka stands up from amongst the crowd, behind the girls that are surprised to see that he has been the one talking all these while. Jaka steps forward and with a straight face. He says, I am here, how are you going to send me to hell? Yingale is confused as he asks what is wrong with Jaka, whom he calls a young brat. Jaka yawns heavily, and Yingale wonders if Jaka is a madman because he thinks that there's no way Jaka would mess with him if he weren't a madman. But he looks around and wonders why no one is dragging Jaka away, and why no one is even trying to stop him. Jaka is done yawning so he calls Yingale. Achesi, which means middle-aged man or mister, and asks him what he's doing and says that he asked him how he's planning on taking himself to hell. Yingale looks at Jaka and concludes that Jaka is probably totally mad, and that killing a mad person will just dirty his hands. He considers his position in the Murim and the Bandit Union, 
and decides that it's best to not get involved, because it's pretty common for a mountain hideout to have an idiot or two. As he turns his attention away from Jaka and asks them all to forget it and just bring the drinks, Jaka finally speaks and asks him what this is. Jaka asks him where he's going in the middle of their conversation and asks if it wouldn't happen to be that he is scared. Ingale gets really mad after hearing the word scared, so he emanates serious bloodlust and puts enough energy into his claws and aims it at Jaka, sending shockwaves at him, but Jaka doesn't move, and the girls worry for him. While Poong and Tak don't seem surprised that things turned out this way at the end even after all they did to avoid it, Chief Poong cries in a funny way and did not even bother to stop Jaka, but tells Jaka that he only has one request, which is, please, don't kill him at least. Jaka stands still with a cocky smile on his face, as Yingale's attack is about to hit him. Jaka deflects it with just one hand without moving the rest of his body, which makes Yingale stare in shock. Jaka mocks him saying, Come on, what do you mean by hell? It wasn't anything special though. Yingale looks like he would explode out of anger as he tells Jaka that he thought he was just a lunatic but he can see that. Jaka has quite the skills. He locks his focus on Jaka, and as he generates massive aura, he focuses it all into his fingers and replies Jaka saying that it was certainly not great a while ago but from here onwards, he'll face him properly. But Jaka looks like someone who doesn't give a shit about what's happening. And as he stands there, he feels the wind shift and lots of wind energy heads his way, which he can feel, but he doesn't move. Yingale strikes from a distance, yelling that Jaka will come to know why he is called Yingale Feline Lord. His attack comes to Jaka as a form of purple mist that surrounds his neck, and instead of the girls to worry for Jaka, they both worry for Yingale. And Tak tells Chief Poong that they need to stop those two, but Chief Poong asks him how they are going to do that though. Yingale doesn't move from where he is, he clenches fist, and the attack hit Jaka multiple times like he's being hit by a real fist, even while being hit. There's no reaction from Jaka as he just stares like he's trying to figure something out. Yingale still on his attack, continues ranting and shouting that looping off Jaka's head is as simple as breathing to him. However, he unclenches his fist and stops his attack, and tells Jaka that he won't kill him this easily until he sees him grovel and beg for him to spare his life. So he says that he will make Jaka arrive at his death very slowly until he realizes how greatly he have sinned and understand by writhing in pain. After blabbing, he continues his attack again. But Jaka doesn't seem impressed at all, and tells him to come on, and that he only went along with him for just a bit, and proceeds to destroy the purple mist surrounding his neck and tells Yingale that he just doesn't know when to stop, and asks him to stop playing around with this stupid thing. Yingale is left speechless. Jaka is about to take things seriously, so he tells Yingale to try again properly. Yingale is still in shock as Jaka easily removes this hold he put on Jaka's neck, and the only thing that he could say is, huh. And Jaka responds, asking him, what? Yingale then replies telling Jaka that, that is not something that can be broken off that easily. But Jaka asks him what he means, and asks him if he didn't see it come off easily just now. Yingale begins to doubt himself, but he is certain that his technique was applied properly because it's the same technique that has instantly neutralized most of the nine sect bastards. Jaka watches him wallow in his thoughts and asks him what he's doing, telling him to do it properly and stop playing around. Yingale still does nothing but wonder what kind of person Jaka is because even considering the fact that he's a bit drunk, it's impossible that the technique was defeated this easily. Yingale starts to reason everything, as he knows that the levels of the hideout chief and vice chief are ordinary, which made him wonder how they were able to conquer a region in the Henan province. So he wonders if the fame of the ten Wufeng elites all derive from this one lad. And if that's the case, then it is not that the chief and vice chief didn't stop them from fighting. Rather, it's just that they couldn't. So he thinks that this is all amusing. He proceeds to tell Jaka that he seems to be a fine opponent for him to use his full power after all this while, and says, I Yingale, feline lord shall now. But his talk is interrupted by Jaka trying to hold his laugh. Jaka couldn't hold his laugh in anymore so he laughs out loud. He laughs and laughs and laughs. Jaka then mocks Yingale Feline Lord, telling him that he's got a really funny name, and that he acts like those dogs in heat, so he asks him if that's why his name is Obscene Gale Feline Lord, so he laughs once more. Yingale is provoked so he asks Jaka if he doesn't think it will be wise for him to choose his words wisely, since those words could be Jaka's last dying wish, and he moves in for the kill. With ferocious agility and bloodlust, he plunges to attack. Jaka looks at him without a single bother nor fear in his eyes and asks Yingale if the only living thing he has is his mouth, telling him that he's way too slow. This angers Yingale even more so he attacks, calling Jaka an impudent brat, so he shouts die. Poison style technique. Yingale skeleton frame. Jaka can see all his moves, so he raises just two of his fingers, and easily deflect the whole technique with just his bare two fingers, sending all Yingale's energy backwards, and causing heavy gust of wind to blow everywhere. 
That's enough to push everyone backwards. And Yingale Feline Lord is aghast by this. He finds it hard to believe that Jaka stopped his attack with just two fingers. He gets even more furious and refuses to lose so he uses an art that he was taught by his master, the Destroying Heaven Demon Lord. Even though his master have told him not to use it as much as possible, he has no choice. Dark Heaven's Ashes Scriptures The extraordinary martial arts he learned from the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, which he went through brutal training to acquire, even times when he thought he would die. He didn't give up and went through all those tough times, and ever since he learned it, he haven't lost a single battle. It's a power which easily allowed him to overpower the elders of sects. He never imagined that he'd have to use it against such a young brat. He screams from the deepest part of his lungs, shouting, You're the one who made me do this, so don't resent me too much for it, and delivers his final blow. We are all confused at this point, because all we can see is that Yingale's fingers have been broken and are facing backwards. It turns out that Jaka didn't have to do much but just put his fingers in between Yingales, deflecting the whole attack, breaks them and made them face backwards. Jaka laughs and tells him that he just keeps forming cool winds and also shifting different colors, mocks him and says that he's such an amusing old man. Jaka rubs Yingale's finger and removes his fingers from Yingale's, saying to Yingale, Hello, I'm Yon Jaka. Nice to meet you. Demonic feline Lord Yingale looks at his damaged fingers and thinks, Damn it, fuck. He thinks Yon Jaka is fucking crazy. Jaka comes from his side ready to deliver a very powerful punch and calls Yingale, Ajasi, mocking him, asking him who's in heat, and tells him to listen carefully. So Jaka tells Yingale that his siblings are not his toys. And Chief Poong thinks no, because he thinks that if Jaka beats up a Grim Reaper of the Bandit Union, then the Bandit Union tournament will be out of the question for them at the Mountain Wufeng hideout. So he shouts, begging Jaka to hold it all in. Back to Jaka, about to land his direct punch. The pressure from his fist rises, generating enough wind power to push Tak and Poong backwards. And Yingale is dumbstruck by the sight of a bright light, which appears to be a mighty dragon created from just the pressure from Jaka's fist. Yingale is scared to his pants as he wonders what that dragon could be and if this could mean that he loses the fight. The punch comes as a humongous dragon that's about to devour him whole. And at that moment, Yingil sees himself in the afterlife as he sees death face to face, and he wonders if perhaps he just died. But death tells him, no. Yingil begs for his life, telling death that he doesn't want to die yet and that he still wants to live before he could beg further. He comes back to reality and sees that Jaka's fist is just inches away from his face, and behind him is a massive wind wave that would have been the end of him if that punch had touched him. A heavy gust of wind blows and he stands there, looking like someone that just resurrected from the grave. The wave from the punch had already blown away all the surface of the ground behind him. Jaka's heated fist. Jaka looking unsatisfied and furious. Yingel thinking that this can't be, falls to the ground and wonders what kind of monster Jaka is. Yingel says that it's such a shame for him. Jaka comes before Yingel and tells him that if it weren't for his big brother, he would have really sent him to hell, and tells him to consider himself lucky. Yingel's hands start to shake. Yingel feline lord didn't even reveal the full extent of his power. He couldn't help but lose the will to fight. It's because he had felt from the young boy the same pressure as the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord. He begs Jaka that they should stop the fight here and apologize, saying that he made a mistake due to his own drunkenness. Jaka looks down on him and says, So you're aware that you made a mistake? And tells him to be more careful next time. The chief and vice chief are relieved to see that Jaka did the right thing and not beat up Yingale. Jaka then tells Yingale to get going after greeting his elder brothers. But Yingale asks him if he really needs to greet them before going, because there's bandit union ranking to consider here. But Jaka tells him that he is really sleepy right now and asks Yingale if he is going to greet his elder brothers or he is going to keep on irritating him like this. Yingale didn't think twice about it and immediately rushes to greet them, saying, To the Ten Wufeng brothers, I shall be off, let's meet again in Wanan County. He runs off, and the chief and vice chief are surprised that demonic feline Lord Yingale just called them brothers. Being called a brother by one of the twelve demonic kings was a shocking event. Since a brotherly relationship was formed between the executive and the underlings of the organization, the fame of the Ten Wufeng elites was increased thanks to Yon. But the people of the Mountain Wufeng hideout weren't particularly happy about that. But they laugh and smile with Jaka even stating that the speed at which feline Lord Yingale ran away is quite extraordinary. And it must be because he is one of the twelve demonic kings. Since they had thought that Yon Jaka was stronger than the twelve demonic kings, Kion tells Sobik that Jaka is really cool and asks if she should hit on him. Chulson standing at a close distance overhears their conversation and gets jealous. The yearning, respect, and trust for Jaka was at its peak. Chief Poon asks Vice Chief Tak Gamyong if he thinks they'll be fine in Wenin County, and Tak tells him that he thinks it'll go somewhat fine since Jaka is with them. Chief Poon feels reassured. 
and as Jiaka rushes towards them in excitement, Chief Poong feels confident that everything will turn out fine. As demonic feline Lord Yingale runs back, he thinks about the embarrassment he just received, and an image of Jiaka appears in his head. While he wonders how a monster like Jiaka is hiding in Mountain Wufeng, he thinks that if Jiaka participates in the Bandit Union tournament, it will bring utter chaos to the hierarchy of the Bandit Union, so he must report this to the Bandit Union leader at once. On the road is a group of merchants traveling, but their path is blocked by someone, so the merchant yell, asking who it is, asking who dares block the way of the Suwal merchant group, asking if the person has a death wish. The merchant union leader tells whoever it is to identify himself. The person gives a deadly stare, and tells the merchants that the sun is about to set and that they must have it hard going through the mountains. He proceeds to say that he just have to check something and that he hopes the merchant group leader would just agree and cooperate peacefully. The merchant leader tells the strange man to cut the nonsense talk and asks him what give him the right to interfere in their affairs. The dangerous-looking man tells the merchant group leader that it's just a simple inspection, and begs that they do not feel too bad about it and cooperate in peace. But this angers the merchant group leader so he yells at the strange man, calling him an insolent bastard, telling the man that he must be truly arrogant to be asking them to cooperate with such a threatening tone. The man apologizes and says that if his request came as a threat then the merchant group leader could have just obediently went along with it. The man starts getting upset and asks the representative why they keep making such a huge deal out of it, asking the representative if he doesn't want to protect his daughter. The representative yells once more, saying, You bastard, how dare you? You know no fear. Do you think you can fight against all of us by yourself? And adds that he'll give the man one last chance to move and if he doesn't, the representative promises to strike him. But the man thinks it's such a shame because now he has no other choice but to search for it after killing everyone. The merchant group leader orders his warriors to bring him the head of the strange man, and as the warriors rush in to kill the man and obey the order, the man standing unfazed and with disappointment in his eyes says that it leaves bitter taste in his mouth, because twenty years ago, these warriors would have run away just from seeing his black Taoist garment. The man starts to perform a technique to create multiple clone versions of himself, leaving the warriors in shock and fear. The man and his clones begins attacking cutting down all the warriors that tried to come at him, in an instant, leaving the remaining warriors in fear but they are willing to protect their representative, so they refuse to back down, and rush into attack, but are cut down in an instant. After killing some of the warriors, the strange man looks to where the merchant group leader was seated, but sees that the merchant group leader and his daughter are both gone, and as he wonders when the merchant escaped, more warriors rush in to kill him, so he takes his killer stance and rushes, and as swiftly kills them all. Facing the remaining warriors, who are scared for their lives, the man is getting really frustrated, as he wonders if he was too careless or the fact that he wasn't expecting the representative to sacrifice his subordinates this easily. So he says that it looks like the representative only just realized who he is. But it doesn't matter to him because it looks like, the thing, that person, the person who sent him, is looking for is with the representative. So all he has to do now is find the representative. He drops his knives, and takes off his mask, revealing his ugly face. He says that in that case, then it should be fine even if he kills all the remaining warriors, which scares them even more. The representative, his daughter and some warriors are still trying to get away when one of the warriors says that he and his men will go back to support the warriors that they left behind. But the representative tells him that he can't and that this matter needs to be dealt with immediately and nothing can be done now because he must go. They keep on running as the representative feels for those he left behind so he promises to follow in their wake after he finished the task at hand in hopes that they understand that he cannot die just yet. A flashback from twenty years ago, when the lunar fairy attacked, the representative was handed a box by an elderly man, a box which he must look after and protect with his life. That's the box that he's trying to secure, because he must make sure it doesn't fall into their hands. Never. It's night already. The representative, his daughter, and his remaining warriors are still running, as he continues to tell them not to stop running and run as if their lives depends on it until they escape from the mountains. His daughter gets tired and stops, telling her father that she cannot go any further, but he insists that she must not stop. She tells him that they have already traveled quite the distance and she thinks it would be best if they stop and rest for the day. He looks back at her and asks her not to say such foolish things, asking how she is still able to say such a thing after having witnessed that bastard's martial arts. He proceeds to tell his daughter that if that bastard's martial prowess is at that level, then his lightened body technique must be excellent as well. So it is far too early to be at ease just yet. As they advance, one of his warriors alerts him that there are some suspicious people ahead, so he wonders in fear. He then starts to think of the worst, like them already being surrounded. So he orders his warriors to prepare for battle. They keep moving forward, 
And the representative wonders how he got himself here, because he thought he knew that he would lose all of the merchant group members. He ran away to protect the eight bead bell. He reminds himself that he can't let himself be caught this easily. He remembers the past and what is in the box that he has to protect. Now he must report the revival of the dark spectral sect to the nine sects, because he refuses to let the nightmare of twenty years ago repeat itself, and he must survive no matter the cost. His warriors unsheathe their swords and ready themselves for combat because they think the people ahead them are with the bastard that came after them earlier. So they yell, we will pierce through your defenses, even if you were to unfurl the heaven net. So attack us this instant. We shall demonstrate the power of the Suwal merchant group. A guy that's eating a very nice looking meat complains that they surprised him and that he almost got an upset stomach while eating. The person ahead is Chief Poong alongside Jiaka and some others. The merchant group leader looks and wonders, and notices that the clothes that the people ahead are putting on are not the black Taoist garment. The man ahead, still haven't turned to look at the people behind him, asks who the merchants are. With no response from them, Jaka gets up ready to beat the shit out of some people, saying that his Hunam just said that he almost got a stomach upset. The merchant group leader still haven't said a word, as he continues to wonder who these people might be, so he hopes that they are from the other sect. And if that's the case, perhaps God hasn't forsaken him and his people. Three days ago at Mountain Wufeng hideout, someone is complaining about wearing a cloth. But the person pauses and asks if there's any need to go far, because he thinks the cloth will draw more attention to them instead. Shim replies, telling him that if there's many people moving all at once, there will be someone curious about it. He adds that they need to visit many towns and other to get to Wanan County. Among those, there is also the Hefei where the Nangong clan had put down roots. Also adding that nothing good will come from creating issues with the nine clans before the Bandit Union Tournament. And the Sword Emperor, Nangong Byok, one of the ten greatest masters, is someone they must never make an enemy of. He proceeds to tell this complaining person that, however, since those sex bastards will foam at the mouth and barrel towards him at the slightest mention of the demonic or chaos sect, then there will definitely be conflict with them if they moved around in bandit attires. Chief Poong is the complaining person, and he doesn't seem happy about this. So he says, then you dressed up like this because you're afraid of those Nangong clan bastards. So he asks Shim if he has forgotten that they are the Mountain Wufeng hideout. That even made the elder of the Wuding sect kneel. Even though he thinks the cloths looks cool, Tak also adds that they have been officially acknowledged as Bandit Union and on their way to Wanan County, so there would be no need to hide their tails from the likes of the Nine Sects. Shim looks at them as people who have become donkeys in a lion's skin, because they seem to have lost all fear, all thanks to Jiaka, who he calls Young Clan Bastard. He responds to Tak, telling him that the Sword Emperor, Nangong Byok, is one of the ten greatest experts, and that he's incomparable to the opponents they've faced till now. Chief Poong is not buying Shim's talk this time around because he recalls that Shim said the same thing when the Heaven Supreme, Sage Chun Jai, came around. Leaving Shim speechless, Chief Poong adds that all he's trying to say is that the Ten Wufeng elites are nothing to underestimate as well. This frustrates Shim, because the chief and his remaining brothers haven't even done anything. The girls come out and are excited to wear the cloths. Kion tells the Chief Poong and Vice Chief Tak that she don't see any problem in wearing these clothes. She agrees with Shim's opinion adding that they might not get another opportunity to wear stuffs like this. The men are all stunned at how good the girls look as Kion adds that it's not a bad idea to go there without any issues. And it's not like only the other sex gets to wear clothes like this either. The chief is wowed by how pretty the girls look and compliments them, saying that he had always known his siblings were pretty but to think that they were this pretty, and says that the clothes are quite exquisite aren't they? Sobik interrupts, asking if the clothes doesn't suit her well, and if she looks like a child of a famous clan. But the chief laughs, saying that she looks far better than that, and tells her that she looks like those celestial maidens. Yon Jiaka finally steps out, asking his brothers and sisters if he wore the cloth properly. As it's his first time wearing such complicated clothes, he's not sure if he's wearing it correctly, so he asks if it looks okay. The girls are wowed by how good Jaka looks and begins to blush, telling him that he looks very handsome. They rush to him and tell him that it's so different from Brother Cholson, praising his handsomeness. Cholson cries in a funny way wondering why they would compare Jiaka to him. And Jiaka asks, really? And Kion tells him that it's true, and that he looks like someone belonging to those prestigious clans. She rephrases, saying that he looks like royalty. As they depart, the chief entrusts the hideout to the remaining bandits and asks them to make sure they don't get looked down on because him and the rest are gone. And the response saying, yes. The chief proceeds to add that he'll bring some fine liquor on his way back from Wan and Count. Tak also adds that himself and the chief will make sure they ace the Bandit Union tournament for all of them. The person that they are entrusting the hideout to is our one and only H. Wang Yomayang. 
Shim's disciple, who reassures the chief that they can go without any worries, saying that he will protect the mountain hideout without sparing his body. They advance. The chief asks Vice Chief Tak if he thinks things will be okay after they are gone. And Tak responds saying that the merchants have been quite cooperative these days so there shouldn't be any problems. Shim overhears their conversation and tells them that H. Wang's martial art is really good, but they can't be too relaxed. Shim adds that he didn't disguise himself just to avoid any backlash from the Nangong clan, and that the reason why the merchants' groups of the Henan province are being cooperative is all due to the Ten Wufang elites. To be exact, it's because of that one kid from the Yong clan. Therefore, the merchants will certainly use this opportunity of them leaving for a few months and attack Mountain Wufeng hideout. The chief thinks about it for it is true, because they are quite known in these parts after all, so anyone could recognize them as they leave. The vice chief Tak comes up with a solution which is to make sure they avoid getting involved with any merchant group at all costs because the chance of them being recognized by those merchant group's bastards is pretty high. The chief thinks that if that's the case then there is no problem, since they've worn the same clothes as the other sex guys exactly as Elder Shim told them to. He proceeds to add that they look like ordinary people, even to himself, and no one will probably recognize them like this, and says that he even likes the clothes. Shim then asks him how he would reply when someone asks them what they do. The chief wasn't expecting that question, so he froze. Back to the present. After being by the Suwal merchant group leader who asked who they are, Chief Pung stutters and says that they are disciples of the Soaring Dragon School. To confirm, the representative asks, you're from the Soaring Dragon School of Henan province. So he introduces himself as the representative of the Suwal merchant group, Jang Han Young, and asks if he would be allowed to travel alongside the chief and his people. But, because they are from a merchant group, the chief refuses to travel with them and says that he's sorry and it looks like they are heading in different directions. Then the representative jokingly says that he haven't even told the chief where he is headed. At this point it looks like Chief Pung has been backed up in a corner, so he stutters and asks where the representative and his people are headed. But Shim walks up and blatantly tells the representative that, even if they are traveling the same way, there is no reason for them to travel alongside each other. And adds saying, on top of that, their luggage looks far too shabby for a merchant group. There seems to be a story behind that but you're not telling us why adding that they also have an appointment that they have to reach on time, so there's no reason for them to take risks for unknown reasons, and asks the representative if there is any reason for them to take such risks. One of the representative's warriors whispers in his ear, asking that they just leave, but the representative orders him not to move. He thinks further into the name of the school that Chief Pung told him, because he has never heard of that name before. However, as he looks at them, he notices that the Kai emanating from Chief Pung and his people isn't fake. Especially Yon Jaka, he can sense an unprecedented aura. He also notices that dawn is breaking and it won't be long before that bastard killer catches up to them. And the warriors of the merchant group are already exhausted. And they'll have a hard time if they have to battle again. So he finally concludes that him and the merchant group definitely need help from Chief Poon and his people. He reaches for his pocket and brings out a heavy bag of gold. Offers it to the chief and apologizes for not being able to explain his problem in detail. Stating that he knows it's a sudden request. But if they can help, he promises to reward them greatly. Few hours later, the bandits are discussing, and Shim asks the chief why he refused the offer, and the chief seems confused and asks Shim if he isn't the same Shim who asked them to not get involved with any merchant union. Shim says it's exactly what he said, but it's a waste of opportunity, because if the merchant was willing to offer that much, then it was definitely worth considering. The chief responds saying that, that's precisely his reason for rejecting. Their offer is too good and nothing is free in the world stating that the merchant unions are places that will never do anything that will cause any losses. So he asks Shim if he doesn't think it's strange that the merchants are offering that much gold. Besides, they are also asking them to take care of some strange item, and adds that his gut's feeling have never been wrong, saying that it was right to reject their offer. But Shim tells them that with that much gold, they could have traveled the mountains for two months only. Kion says that she also think that was too good of an opportunity to pass up. She looks at Jaka from the side and says that since they are headed the same direction, Offering some protection won't be that hard for them. Vice Chief Tak finally speaks, telling everyone that it's enough talk already, because the decision has been made already, also adding that it was definitely a good opportunity. But, it's not like they are lacking funds at the moment, so it's good that they do not get themselves in unnecessary trouble just for some bodyguard work. Plus, if they work as merchant union bodyguards, there's higher chance they'll clash with Green Forest. He proceeds to say that he understands that they might want to act like heroes of the Jong but urges them all to focus on the Green Forest Grand Summit first. Kion has been figured out, so she tries to deny that that's not her reason for wanting to help the merchants. Since the discussion is over, one of the ten brothers says that it would be best if they get moving already, and another says that it's true, 
also stating that it looks like those merchant union guys were attacked, and since they've passed by this place, the people after them should be arriving soon. Shim agrees with them and says that the merchant's pursuers might think that they are in the same groups as them, stating that it's still a little dark but it would be best if they get moving quickly. The chief orders that they all get their stuffs and meet back around the fire. And they reply, yes chief. Shulson stares at Kion as she walks forward, asking Sobeek where she put her stuff, and Sobeek tells her that it's under a tree further ahead. And as she approaches the back, she tells Sobeek to please look around to make sure they don't leave anything behind. Cholson keeps on staring, and suddenly start to blush. He leaves where he was stationed and rushes to go help Kion. Upon getting there, he tells her to leave the heavy stuffs to him and this makes her blush, calling out his name softly. Cholson blushes again and gets lost in the clouds, but at that moment, he notices someone up in the trees, charging from above Kion, to attack. The ninja thinks he's found what he's looking for. And Kion, still trying to get her belongings is still unaware that she's about to be cut down by this ninja. As the ninja unsheathes his sword, he says that he has nothing against them but he will need all of them to die here. The ninja is about to cut Kion, but Chulson runs towards her, calling out her name loudly. He blocks the ninja's attack, and that's when she looks up and sees the ninja, who says that Chulson's attempt is futile because they will all be dying anyway. The ninja is shocked, as he's met with an unexpected heavy kick from Kion which damages his face, and sends him flying, crashing into the ground. Shulson falls to the ground in so much pain because he was cut by the ninja and Kion feels sorry for him, asking him why he was dumb enough to block the ninja's attack because she thinks she would have dodged it somehow. Shulson still in so much pain and about to pass out, apologizes, saying that he's sorry it seems he did something unnecessary. The chief rushes over to meet him and both the chief and Kion calls out his name loudly. The chief is confused on what to do, because the wounds are deep. He lifts Cholson up and asks Shim Yongak where the nearest village is. He says that he'll back Cholson and asks that everyone gets their stuffs and get out of this place, which they all reply, yes chief. They get their stuffs and are about to leave, but Jaka stays behind and Tak calls him, asking him to get his stuff so they can run away before they get swept further into whatever this is. But at that moment he notices that the ninjas are more and have surrounded the whole place, but Jaka stands tall facing all of them. Shim thinks this is so fucked up because they have now gotten themselves into a lot of trouble because of those merchant union guys. Chief Poong then orders Shim and Tak to stay behind and help Jaka while him and the rest head to the nearest village. But Jaka refuses and asks that everyone go ahead because he'll be more than enough to handle the ninjas. They all leave running. Kion asks how long it would take to get to the nearest village. And Shim replies saying that they'll reach Hefei village if they keep going for about two more hours. But asks if there'll be any doctor willing to check Cholson at this hour. And the chief replies, saying that they will get the doctor to do it no matter. Tak turns back with Jaka in his mind. He asks if Jaka will be alright. And the chief tells him that they would have to believe that he will be fine, since they all know just how strong Jaka is. And apologizes that they constantly have to rely on Jaka but they don't have any other method at the moment. They keep running and Shim says that they do not know how many of those black cloth guys are there. And that it would be a lot more troublesome if the black cloth guys were to catch up to them. He remembers the recent incident and states that, although it was a surprise attack, but to subdue Cholson in a single strike, it means they are not easy opponents. And Jaka probably also thought they wouldn't be easy opponents. And that's why he asked all of them to go ahead. Back with Jaka. The ninjas all come attacking Jaka at the same time. But Jaka is easily dodging the attacks and asks them who they are. The one directly in front of Jaka wouldn't talk and tries to attack again. So Jaka casually pulls him by the head and asks one last time, who the hell are you? before landing a very devastating blow to the guy's head, which sends him flying far far into the forest leaving the rest in shock. And as they turn back to face Gyaka, he's already in front of them with a killer look in his eyes. He takes them out one after the other, making them fear as they now realize that they are fucked. Gyaka takes them out one after the other, taking them out with his bare hands and foot alone. More ninjas outside the forest sees the fight. One of them calls Jaka a brat that might have lost his mind and is about to rush in unprepared, but is stopped by their leader, who tells them that Jaka is not an ordinary brat, so he orders everyone to get into formation. Jaka picks up the sword of a ninja he just killed and asks the ninjas if they are deaf, because he asked who they are but no one is replying. He looks mad and asks if he needs to keep beating them up for them to reply, but the ninjas thinks Jaka is such an insolent brat, so they rush to attack in formation. Back in the forest, Bandits from Mountain Wufeng Hideout continues on their path to Hefei Village, and the chief asks if they are on the right direction. Shim affirms that they are on the right direction. Cholson is about to pass out, and the chief thinks this is a fucked up situation asking Cholson to hang in there for a while longer, that they will be at the village soon. Cholson apologizes and falls asleep, 
Kion expresses her feelings, saying that she's afraid that they might be too late, but the chief tells her not to worry, that Chulson would be fine since they were able to stop the bleeding quickly. As they go further, Shim perceive the scent of blood. He pauses, and also asks everyone to halt, and keep quiet. The chief then asks him what the matter is because they are running out of time. Shim replies saying that he can sense a large number of people ahead, and that it seems the ninjas caught up with the merchant union guys that had left before them. They all go to a safe distance to observe the situation. And Shim says that they would have to cross the area if they want to get to Hefei village, but this is such a headache. The representative calls the ninjas and their leader wicked bastards. Blood drips down his nose, as he asks them why they must kill so many people, just to get one item. The leader of the ninjas stares and says it's not just an item, for there are people that would travel miles just to get that item, and adds that the item is far more important than the lives of all the merchants combined. So he asks that the representative hands the item over while they are still asking nicely. He places his blade on the representative's daughter's neck and asks the representative if he wouldn't at least save his daughter's life, as she calls to him in fear, father. But the representative refuses to hand over the item, stating that he already knows that the ninjas do not plan to spare any of their lives, so he won't fall for their hoax. The ninja then says that it looks like the merchant is not easy to deal with, and asks the merchant if it means that he wants him to kill even more people before he tells him where the item is. The representative shouts, calls the ninja a bastard, as the merchant group warriors shiver in fear of their lives. The leader of the ninjas orders his ninja to hold the girl properly so she won't run away and he walks towards the representative. He tells the representative that he knows he won't try to escape while they have his daughter hostage. And now he's about to kick things up a notch. But at that moment, a scary looking man appears from the shadows, asking the leader of the ninjas what they are doing. And the ninja seems to be scared of this new presence, so he asks the man why he have come personally. The man replies, telling the ninja that if he had done his job well, then he wouldn't have had to come, asking the ninja if he has lost his mind just because it's been 20 years since he has tasted blood. At this point the man gets serious and the amount of bloodlust emanating from him is just too intense. So he asks the ninja why he is yet to bring him the item, revealing his full presence. With fear in all of the ninja's eyes, all the ninja present stands at attention, and salute the man, saying, We pay our greeting to you, Grand Demon General. Divine Illusion Demon, Wung Yigui, Shim observing from above, fearfully wonders who those guys are. He states that the guys who ambushed them are already pretty strong, but these ones with strange weapons are exuding an extremely dangerous vibe, and also wonders how strong the weird-looking guy is for the rest of them to be paying respects to him. Tak tries to interrupt Shim by asking how long they would have to wait, but Shim shush him, asking him to be quiet. Tak proceeds to ask Shim if those guys are so dangerous that he is so scared to even talk. Shim then says that if he's right, those people could be more dangerous than anyone they have ever faced before, and adds that even though himself is pretty strong among the unorthodox factions, those guys have otherworldly energy that he has never felt before and states that their organization seems to be quite big and powerful, saying that he wanted to join up with the Merchant Union group and defeat them, but if they make the wrong move, they will all get killed, so he suggests that they do not make any move until Jock arrives, and until they find out what exactly those strange-looking people are capable of. The Merchant Union warriors take the opportunity of the ninja's salute to kill some of them and free themselves. The warriors then tell the representative that they will give their lives to save the young miss, and rush to attack. Shim still observing, tells Tak that they just need to observe the situation from afar. Divine Illusion Demon, Wung Yigui, sees the approaching warriors and he thinks it's cute. So he pulls out one of his stuff that looks like a dynamite, lights it on fire. And as he throws it at the warriors, a bright light emanates from it, as it finally hit the ground. Wherever this thing touches, melts and turns to a sticky quicksand that sinks the warriors into the ground without any way of escaping. The warriors scream in pain and torment as they sink slowly and beg for help but no one comes to their aid. Standing in front of the sticky quicksand is Wung Yigui. He looks so fulfilled and unhinged. The representative stares in anger and sorrow, while Shim and Tak still observing from a distance, wonder in shock at what kind of power that was. Shim looks worried and in shock because he has never heard or seen anything like that before. Divine Illusion Demon, Wung Yigui, pulls out another one of his bombs, points it at the representative, asking him for where the item is. Back to Jiaka. He stands still and the ninjas attack him one after the other. The first one jumps, and attacks by throwing both his axes at Jiaka, which Jiaka swiftly dodges and moves so fast, appearing in front of the ninja, and, before he has time to make any further move, Jiaka slashes him. Immediately, Jiaka notices that another ninja is about to attack him. So, he quickly takes his stance and ready himself to attack. Jiaka closes in on the ninja unexpectedly, and cuts him deep, killing him before he could even land his attack. The leader of the ninjas is frustrated, and asks his comrade what they are doing. 
then proceeds to command that they all attack at once. Jiaka is also angry at the ninjas. He closes in on them without their notice, and tells him that if it frustrates him so much, then why don't he do it himself? As they turn back to Jiaka, they are shocked to see that he's already right in front of them, and they wonder when he got so close. Jiaka uses his martial art technique, shocking the leader. So Jiaka strikes them all at once, killing them in an instant, using the Nine Heavens art, first form, Soaring Dragon, which creates a very bright light, and causes a massive explosion. As Jiaka land after his attack, he swings his sword from a striking position, to a stabbing position, and stabs the ground with force. He pants for a moment and wonders who those ninjas are because he'd still like to know. But there's no time to figure that out now, because he has to catch up with his brothers. He states that they were all pretty strong as they were able to injure him, and if more of them are out there, then those who went before him might be in danger. As he walk away from the scene, he adds that he'd need to hurry. He jumps off the ground and zooms off with extreme speed. Still wondering who the ninjas are, he states that he doesn't even care anymore, and if they dare mess with his family, regardless of who they are, he promises that he'll erase them from the face of the earth. Back with Chulson, Keon applies pressure to his wounds and tells the chief that the bleeding has slowed down a lot compared to before, but the wound is too deep, and Chief Poon thinks this is all really bad, but yells, asking what the heck Shim and Tak have been watching for so long. Keon tells him that they said that they'd observe the situation for a bit, since there's a lot more than expected, but the chief gets angry and says that Chulson is dying here, so what more is there to see? One of the brothers who went scouting comes back telling the chief that he's scouted the area but there's no other path, so the chief asks if that actually means that this is the only way, and the brother says that there's actually another way, but they would have to go a long way around the other path, and they could also get separated from Jaka if they take the other way. The chief doesn't want to just sit around and wait, so he says that he'll go have a look for himself. He walks up behind Tak and Shim unnoticed, so he asks them what they are doing which startles them both. Tak is grateful that it's not what he expected as he tells Chief Poon that he startled him, so the chief asks if those ninjas are that dangerous for them to be taking so long. Shim replies, telling Chief Poon that the ninjas are using a strange martial art technique that he has never seen before, and that it's absurdly powerful and it seems like avoiding them and going through a different path is the best choice. The chief thinks of what to do, and asks Shim if it's really that bad for him to have said that. Divine Illusion Demon, Wung Yigui, tells the representative that he's giving him the last chance to hand over the item. But the representative tells Wung Yigui to just kill him because he will never hand over the item. Wung Yigui thinks it's strange for a mere merchant group to give up their lives to protect something that he don't think they know the value of. So he asks the representative if he perhaps know how to use the item. Because the sex squad should have killed off anyone who knows. And with no response from the representative, he concludes that the representative must have been lucky and got out alive, which all seems interesting to him. But he also wonders how long the representative's stubbornness will last as he stares at the representative's daughter. He then proceeds to say that starting now, he's going to order his subordinate to have their way with her. This infuriates the representative so he shouts, asking Wung Yigui to just kill him, calling him a bastard. Wung Yigui proceeds to tell the representative that it's exactly 25 men, so he's going to see if he keeps up with that stubbornness. So he orders his subordinates to begin. They rough handle her till she is out on the ground and she begs them to please stop, shouting, stop, please stop it, please don't do this, and she calls out to her father. So the representative shouts, stop, very loudly. And Wu Yigui mockingly asks him what's wrong and says that it hasn't even begun yet and asks him if he has changed his mind already. The representative responds saying that he is right and says that he'll give them the item, asking Wu Yigui to order his subordinates to stop and Wu Yigui tells him that he made the right choice. The representative orders one of his warriors to go fetch the item, which was buried not too far from where they are. So the warrior brings it back shortly after. The warrior presents it to the representative and the representative considers his options for the last time. He cannot sit and watch his daughter go through the nonsense that Wung Yigui has ordered his men to do, so, he will have to make the hard choice. But if he allows the eight-bead bell fall into their hands, those dreadful evil spirits will get much stronger, and the nightmare from twenty years ago might reappear. However, he sees no other way to save his daughter, so he hands over the eight-bead bell to Wung Yigui. Wung Yigui holds it in his palm for the first time staring and says that he can indeed feel the energy of the divine artifact, stating that it was tough and they would have had a hard time getting it if they had killed everyone. Now, he intends to make the representative pay for making it so difficult for them to obtain. Wung Yigui proceeds to order his men to carry on having fun with the representative's daughter, but tells them that however, they have to make sure to end it properly, because she has to pay the price for having such a horrible father. The girl begs and cry her eyes out. 
and the representative fumes in anger, calling them all bastards, saying that he already gave them what they wanted, and ask Wung Yigui how he can call himself a human, questioning if he's not afraid of the wrath of God. Wung Yigui turned to the representative with a horrifying look, telling him that he is the god, and adds that the representative's daughter would die anyway, stating that it would feel better if she enjoys herself at the very least while she lays on the ground trying so hard to resist, begging and pleading for them to stop, hoping for a savior. She screams at the top of her voice, begging for anyone to please help, she begs and begs. She even starts to curse, shouting, fucking help as she calls the ninjas, lowly animals. Wung Yigui feels an unwanted presence, so does every other ninja present and a voice asks them if they do not have any morals as martial artists. The representative turns to see who it is, and this person tells the ninjas to stop right where they are and unsheathes his sword, saying that family is off limits. This person is none other than Chief Poong of the Mountain Wufeng Hideout. Both Tak and Shim, still observing from above, are shocked to death because they didn't know when the chief decided to go down there. The chief introduces himself as the Ten Wufeng Elites. Strongest in all of Henan province, he rephrased, saying, I Pung Yoncho of the Soaring Dragon School will crush you. Still observing from the safe distance above, Tak asks Shim what they would have to do now, Shim replies, asking Tak why he's asking him, as he wonders how Chief Pung Yoncho is still able to remember the rubbish name, Soaring Dragon School after all they've been through this night alone. Wung Yigri turns and as he looks at the chief, he says that it looks like a rat was hiding, so he orders his subordinates to kill Chief Pung Yoncho. Three of the ninjas advance together to strike the chief, but he stands his ground and prepares for battle. As he asks them if they think they can, he tightens his grip on his sword and prepares for battle. He kills the first ninja with a single strike, and the other tells his subordinate to make sure he doesn't let Chief Pung escape. The ninja plunge into the air in an attempt to cut down Chief Pung, but the chief doesn't flutter. He slashes the ninja before he could launch his attack, and tells the rest that he's not someone who will lose to trash like them. The ninja dies from the single blow and their leader looks pretty impressed. Many more ninjas move in to attack the chief and tells each other to not drag out the fight because their demonic king is watching. As they move in to strike, they say that it's just one guy so they need to move quickly and end him, but is stopped by an arrow from above. Kion angrily asks the chief what they are supposed to do now that the one who went to resolve an issue only just made it bigger instead. Tak agrees with her, saying that they cannot just stand by and watch while their chief heads out alone. One of the brothers responds saying that it doesn't matter, because there's no other way because Chulson is dying and they must find a way to have a village. Tak orders Sobik to look after Chulson, while the rest of them head out, to join the chief in battle. The chief apologizes to all of them, for dragging them into a messy situation as this one, but begs with confidence that they all fight alongside him, and they all plunge in their attacking formations. While in battle, fourth brother and Dal raises a concern to Brother Tak, stating that the ninjas have quite the numbers compared to them, and Tak asks him what he's going to do if it won't be, telling him to not overthink it, because either way, they've chosen to follow. The decision of their Hyun and Poon Yoncho. The battle goes on and on, and none of the ten Wufeng elites back down, and continues to give their best, struggling but still manages to hold off the ninjas and kill some. Tak says to the ninjas that this is perfect timing, as he might as well avenge Chulson. He engages in a fierce battle with one of them who thinks that Tak do not value his life. They both try to cut down each other but Tak and the ninja seems to be evenly matched. Tak worries that this might be too difficult, because it seems like the ninja is overpowering him. As Tak and the ninja are about to clash swords again, Shim Yongak swoops in and is about to kick the ninja. He asks Tak if he scouted without him. Shim thinks the ninjas are quite tough, although they are nothing to him. He tells Tak to put his full power behind his attack so that he can be sure of picking them off one by one. So he lands a very heavy kick to the ninja that Tak was facing difficulty with. And Tak is excited, as that is what he would expect from old man Shim, and tells Shim that he's the reliable sort for times like this. Shim lands on the ground and tells Tak that this isn't a time to act casually, as this is a fight that they have no chance of winning. He's not even sure if they can hold out for 15 minutes. He proceeds to say that he doesn't know what Hyun and Poong was thinking when he charged in, but at this rate, everyone will die. The fight goes on and one of the ten brothers who uses arrows, is able to injure the ninjas with his arrows, which provoke them so they decide that they would have to take care of him first. The brother feels confident in his arrows and is happy that he is able to land perfect hits, stating that the ninjas thought it would be easy to take them out, and all this plenty talk made him not aware of his surroundings, as a ninja sneaks in to land a clean hit, but he is saved by Kion, who yells that she will never let any of her brothers get injured ever again. Kion kills the ninja and her brother is saved, but he is shocked because he would have been a dead meat just now. So Kion tells him that if he becomes careless, he'll be done for. He lets her know that he understands, and asks that Kion makes room for him while he keeps on attacking. 
Hyung complains that there's no end to these ninjas because they just keep coming but agrees to make room for her brother to keep attacking. Back with the representative, one of the ninjas focuses on the representative as he states that he would also need to die, stating that it would be troublesome if the representative got away as things get hectic around here. But upon getting to the representative, Chief Poon swoops in, blocking the ninja's path. He asks the representative if he's the representative of the merchant group, and the representative hesitantly replies, saying yes. Chief Poon kills the ninja coming for the chief in an instant, with a single strike, which leaves the representative in shock. But the chief don't have time to waste, so he asks the representative to speak up, asking the representative if there is anyone amongst his survivors who knows how to perform medical techniques. As the fight goes on, we can see Brother Imdao struggling with his opponent, and the ninja overpowering him, about to kill him, which makes him fear for his life but he's lucky the ninja wasn't with a sword and only hit him with his fist, sending him flying and falling next to Vice Chief Tak, who gets worried and notes that the whole thing is a dilemma because every one of his brothers are already getting exhausted but there are still a whole lot of the ninjas, stating that even more underling bastards, each and every one of them uses irregular martial arts, which makes fighting against them really tiring. More of them keep popping out and tack things this is all just so fucked up because where the fuck do they just keep popping out? So he calls out the chief's name and asks what he thinks they should do at this point. Remembering the way the chief rushed in and caused trouble, he wonders why the chief did something like that because that's so unlike the chief, stating that the chief always prioritized the life of his brothers. So he wonder why exactly did the chief cause this trouble, because he has never done anything like it before. Finally stating that if they all end up in hell because of this reckless decision by the chief, he'll never let this go. The ninjas notice that Brother Tak and Imdal are tired and worn out, so they advance immediately to attack and kill them immediately. The ninjas are stopped in their tracks by a sword thrown in front of them, and the one in front says, what is this now? He sees the chief coming from above to attack, asking what the ninja means by, what's this now? As the chief gets closer to fight them, he says, it is I, Pung Yoncho, who has come to kill off worthless punk like you. The ninja also readies his fist to counter the chief's attack, telling the chief an old adage which is, they say a newborn dog doesn't fear a tiger, also letting the chief know that it looks like he's itching to die. Both fists collide with massive force from both ends, but the impact is mostly on the ninja's fist, which causes brass knuckle to shatter, leaving the ninja in shock and confusion. And as he's about to say what the fuck, the chief's punch comes smashing his face, shattering his jaw, and sending him flying across the battlefield. Brother Imdal is impressed because that was expected of the chief, and Tak is grateful but asks the chief where he has been, telling him that he came late, and Shim is really amazed by the chief's strength. As the chief pulls his sword out of the ground, Shim states that at this level of strength, you can't help but acknowledge the fact that he has innate talent, which must have been awoken by the teachings of that young clan's brat, also stating that if the chief had learned any martial art earlier, he would have been quite formidable. The chief is thankful that there was a doctor among the merchant group survivors, a flashback of when he asked one of the brothers, Sabong, to take Chulson to the doctor, so he tells everyone that Chulson must be getting treated by now, so they don't need to worry about him for now. He apologizes to all of them. He tells them that he tried his best to forget all about it, but he couldn't help but think of it. A flashback of his wife and children whom he left behind in his hometown. He says that as a father, he couldn't turn a blind eye to what the ninjas were about to do to the representative's daughter. He apologizes further, saying that he should have never dragged them all into danger, and that he has lost all rights to be their hideout leader and their eldest brother as well. However, he couldn't stand to watch those scum bastards get away with such atrocities. He says that he knows that he is asking too much of them, as he begs them to please put their lives on the line for him. Tak smiles as he jokingly tells the chief that they all feel betrayed right now, and says that he has always wondered why the chief never spoke about his hometown. They all agree with Tak with a smile on their faces, and tell the chief that he never told them that he was married, while the other brother tells the chief that he would need to tell them everything once they deal with the ninjas. As they prepare for battle, they remind him that they are all brothers who have sworn to be together even in death, and Tak also reminds him that he doesn't need to ask for favors. Kion steps in from nowhere, asking them why they would need to die, reminding them that if they can just hold out for a little while longer, their guardian god will soon be there. Yon Jiaka. The chief looks back at her in realization. He smiles, saying that she is right. So he asks everyone to just hang on for a bit and ready himself for battle, telling them that they will win if they can just hold out. As the fight continues, Wung Yigui and the head of the ninja gets frustrated. Wung Yigui angrily asks the squad leader of the ninjas if he wants him to personally handle hoodlums like those brothers, which scares the ninja's leader. So he says to Wung Yigui that he dares not let his boss interfere in such little matters, and adds that his body is itching to kill, with a killer look on his face.
He can't wait to kill the hope on the faces of the bandit brothers. He further states that the whole thing and the thought of crushing their hopes is getting him excited. The fight goes on and the brothers are being overpowered by the ninjas. As one of the brothers is about to be killed by a ninja, he is saved by Shim, who says that he does not know how things got to be such a mess, adding that he absolutely hate dangerous jobs. As he kills the ninja, some of the ninjas in front turn and see their comrade killed by Shim. One of them gets frustrated and say that facing Shim with the scouting team alone would be difficult, so he asks one of his other ninjas when the combat squad will arrive. The ninja responds, saying that according to the reports from the person who went to check on the situation a while ago, all the ninja in the combat squad have been eliminated by someone the ninja can't believe what he's hearing so he wonder how that could have happened, thinking if it could be the work of the chief Poon and his accomplices, but also states that they don't seem to be that strong to defeat the combat squad because the combat squad were the elite cultivated to defeat the nine sects. The ninja then adds that if these bandits are that strong to have killed everyone in the combat squad, then they don't have a chance at victory. While still in his thoughts, their leader gets annoyed and tells the ninjas that they are all pathetic fools who bring shame to the name of the dark squad. He starts to emanate immense bloodlust and the ninja knew it wasn't a good sign so he tries to explain. But the squad leader doesn't listen and proceeds to say that since they have humiliated him enough and before the hundred head demon king, they all deserve to die. So he proceeds to kill the ninjas in front of him in an instant. With a scary smile on his face he says to the bandits, Shall we play? Vice Chief Tak and Chief Poong are surprised to see this while Tak say that the guy is a completely insane bastard. Chief Poong gets really furious, yelling at the ninja leader, calling him an irredeemable bastard. So he instantly plunged to attack, asking him what he thinks a person's life is worth. The ninja who doesn't have a care in the world, just stares at Chief Poong and say that defeat the strongest person right off the bat would be boring. So he casually dodges the chief's attack. While at it, he notices that an arrow was heading his way, and dodges it as well, telling the chief that he was smart to have not faced him alone. Hyun comes out of nowhere swinging her sword, saying that the chief definitely didn't come fighting alone, and asks the ninja if he thinks that they would stand by and watch him point his sword at their boss's neck from the get-go, telling him that they will defeat him this time with their numbers. The ninja smiles and tells her that it's good that she thinks that way because it keeps it interesting that way and they both clash swords. Kion is shocked that her sword is shattered just from one hit. The ninja laughs mocking her, telling her that she's very useless indeed and laughs even more. He throws his sword away, stating that it's be a shame to kill her right away, and lands a powerful punch to her gut. One of the brothers who uses an arrow worried for Kion, yells out her name as he's about to fire an arrow at the ninja. But the ninja is way too fast and tells the brother that he have been a pain from the start so the same goes for him and throws his sword at the brother. The sword cuts the brother before he could react, causing serious injury, and hit the tree. The chief gets really furious once more, calling the ninja a son of a bitch as he attack. But the ninja once more dodges his attack with ease, and tells the chief that his sluggish movement won't do. As he prepares his own attack, he tells the chief that he wonders what the look on the other's faces would be, if the head of the strongest bastard falls before anyone else. As he's about to swiftly cut the chief's head off, Vice Chief Tak swoops in and blocks the attack before it could land on the chief, leaving the chief shocked and grateful. Tak tells the ninja that he's just mumbling to himself like a fool, as him and others proceed to attack the ninja simultaneously. He tells the ninja that he wants to see how long he'll be able to keep up that composed farce of his. The ninja easily doges Tak's attacks and tells him that he is going to stay composed till they reach the very end, and lands a heavy kick to Tak's jaw, which makes him almost pass out and as he falls he calls out the chief's name. The ninja gives a devilish smile and proceeds to badly injure the rest of them, who came attacking with Vice Chief Tak. The ninja laughs at the defeat of the bandits. He thinks that they are from other faction, and says, Eriously, this other faction bastards, all act mighty, thinking they are heroes of some sort even though their skills are pathetic, and walks to pick up his sword. The chief yells out the names of his comrades with fear in his eyes that they might have been killed, and as the ninja picks up his sword, he asks the chief if it's time to finally bring this to an end, stating that he'll save the strongest guy for last. But Shim steps in, throws his sword away and says that it's been bothering him for a while now. This confuses the ninja, so Shim continues and asks the ninja who he has been calling the strongest one here. Shim displays his deadly killing martial art technique, and tells the ninja that unless his eyes have gone cross, he should look straight at him. Stating that the strongest one is him, Shim Yongak, the sweet-tongued hidden sword, he quickly jumps off the ground, and attacks the ninja with his deadly technique, but the ninja dodges it, and they begin to battle with Shim throwing in some deadly attacks and the ninja dodging every single attack. This infuriates Shim so he calls the ninja a bastard, asking him if he's going to keep dodging forever. The ninja replies, telling Shim that there's no way he is going to keep dodging, 
and that he is only testing to see if he is truly the strongest one here. So he states that it seems that Shim truly is the strongest one amongst the bandits, so he unleashes a powerful attack, which Shim tries to dodge and block, but he's sent flying and slammed against a tree. From the sheer force of the attack alone, the ninja walks up to Shim and sees that he's still alive, so he says that it's a little surprise and that his pride is hurt just a little bit, because he was planning on splitting him clean down the middle, yet he's still stuck together whole. He asks Shim what he's going to do now, looking at every other person as they have all either been badly injured and cannot even stand up, or have completely lost the will to fight, telling Shim that his Yoram a while ago is nowhere to be seen now. So he asks Shim if he regrets now. Shim laughs instead, saying, regret my ass, and this leaves the ninja lost as to why Shim is laughing. So he asks Shim if he hurt his head somewhere from the fall. Shim responds, telling the ninja that the smirking mouth of his was annoying him, but finally he doesn't have to see it anymore. Shim's words confuses the ninja because he's still standing and clearly has the upper hand so he calls Shim's words bullshit, but at that instant he senses something. He senses a powerful energy around him, so he wonders what kind of energy is that and where it could be coming from. Shim smile at him and says to him that he's going to promise him one thing, which is that all bastards of them are dead now. Yonjaka standing on the branch of the tree above Shim, staring down at the ninja with serious bloodlust. The ninja looks up at Jaka and asks Shim who that brat is, and asks Shim if he was acting up cause Jaka whom he calls a punk, was coming. The injured Kion and Tak sees Jaka and they both shout, Brother Yon, you're finally here. Every other person sees him and are happy, stating that they held out this long, now it's their victory. Stating that the ninjas whom he calls bastards are all dead now. Tak seems relieved that Jaka is here but he still wonders if Jaka will be able to take down the ninjas all by himself. Demonic Lord So Wung Yigui also notices that the air about the bandits who he calls fools have changed, which means that even in those moments of desperation, they all trust in that little brat, which makes him to believe that Yon Jaka must have quite the useful martial arts. The squad leader of the ninjas laughs and tells Shim that the head of the dark spectral set is going to weep at this, asking Shim if he thinks that brat will be able to defeat him. One of the ten head demon soldiers, the dark spirit demon slayer, Sadu Young. As Jaka jumps down from the tree, Sadu Young stands unfazed and unbothered. Jaka speaks, asking Sadu Young if it's him. With a deadly look on Jaka's face, he asks Sadu Young one more time if he is the bastard who hurt his brothers. Sadu Young looks so disgusted by Jaka's arrogance and calls him an imbecile. He gets angry and readies his sword to cut Jaka, so he says that how dare Jaka act so arrogantly before him. He instantly uses his technique and attacks Jaka, saying to Jaka that it seems that he needs some educating. But Jaka easily dodges his attack and deflects the whole technique by hitting Sadu Young's arm with the side of his palm. And with that, the bone in Sadu Young's arm is broken. And before he could react, Jaka follows up the attack with a powerful right hook to the jaw, which damaged his face and sends him flying, with blood gushing out of his mouth and nose. As he falls, he wonders what just happened. Instead of worrying for his life, he thinks of how bad he looks in front of his master, that he cannot allow this farcical display to be seen by the hundred-head demonic king, demonic lord So Wung Yigui, who gives him a deadly look, which make him immediately try to regain control of his body, and land perfectly on the ground facing Jaka, with his broken teeth and jaw. He says that he was careless before and that he's going to eliminate Jaka immediately. But before he goes back to fight Jiaka, his master, demonic lord So Wung Yigui, tells him not to underestimate Jiaka. He responds saying that he understands, and rushes in with anger to fight Jiaka. As he rushes forward, Jiaka readies himself, lifts his sword up with his left hand, and angrily says to Sa Doyang that he hopes he's ready for what's coming, since he hurt his brothers. And as they both plung for each other, Sa Doyang tells Jaka that after raising to be a ten-head demon soldier, he have seen that even the elders of the seven sect and two schools are inferior to him. So he asks Jaka what makes him think he stands a chance against him. He unleashes his technique and sends his attack. But Jaka didn't dodge it, but instead, deflects it with his sword, faster than Sa Doyang could realize what just happened. And Jaka before landing his attack, says to Sa Doyang that those who are about to die, always seem to have a lot to say. So he unleashes his technique and is about to deliver a powerful blow. But demonic lord So Wung Yigui quickly rushes in and pulls Sa Doyang away from Jiaka's attack, telling Sa Doyang that Jiaka doesn't seem to be his opponent, and immediately blocks Jiaka's attack. But Jiaka doesn't seem impressed and asks him what's up with him now, as he continues to fight him. Demonic lord So Wung Yigui is surprised to see that in a battle of strength, he is being pushed back, and the battle continues with powerful attacks coming from both ends causing serious explosions, enough to push the bandits back, and they block their eyes because of the excess light from the explosion. 
Shim while trying to stay still and cover his eyes, states that the fight is really intense and the two are releasing such unbelievable amount of force. Although this was expected, because the guy using that strange technique is strong, and none of them would have survived if he had joined the fight before Yon Jiaka arrived. Demonic Lord Wung Yigui looks down and realizes that he has been pushed back a lot, which shocks him as he questions himself if he's losing right now. Jiaka doesn't stop his ferocious attacks as he come from above to attack. He calls So Wung Yigui, Ajasi, and asks him if he's going to stand there and take the attack head on. Demonic Lord So Wung Yigui looks at Jiaka and tell him that he is impressive and acknowledges his strength. But he jumps away, dodging the attack just right on time before Jiaka Blade could touch him, and immediately pull out two of his weird-looking dynamite, and tells Jaka that he deserves to experience his shadow-sealing soul-snatching demonic art. Jaka looks curious, and demonic lord So Wung Yigui throws them at a distance from Jaka, which makes Jaka confused as he asks demonic lord So Wung Yigui if he can't even aim. But Jaka still keeps his guard up as he watched the grenade closely. But Shim looks terrified because he have seen the technique before and knows what it can do. So he warns Jiaka, shouting that he quickly dodges the grenade, telling him to quickly get out of there. But Jiaka still looks oblivious and doesn't move. Demonic Lord Wung Yigui laughs and says that it's too late now, and that there's nothing Jiaka can do now. Jiaka begins to feel the air about him change, but still doesn't know what's happening. While So Doying laughs, stating that after acting so high and mighty, Jiaka ended up where he is now, and adds that no human has ever returned alive after getting hit by that technique and finally says that it's over for Jiaka, as we see the technique looks a bit different this time. Jiaka asks Demonic Lord So Wung Yigui what this is, and almost instantly after, he finds himself floating as if in a container filled with water and no space for oxygen. Jiaka can't breathe while trapped in there, and even when he tries to cut through, his body feels so heavy so he continues to wonder what this is. With multiple failed attempts of trying to slice his way out, he realizes that he cannot use his full strength while trapped in there, which also makes him wonder if the stuff might also be poison. Hundred Head Demonic King Wun Yigui The technique that found no opposition when he traversed the central plains in the past. The Shadow Sealing Soul Snatching Demonic Art This technique sealed one's shadow and snatched one's soul, and it was already dubbed invincible by the time he had joined the ranks of the sex Ten Head Demon Soldiers. Now he is a Hundred Head Demon King who is far stronger than before. He thought that there would never be someone who would be able to withstand the shadow sealing soul snatching demonic art. It was that powerful of a technique. Even Yon Jaka couldn't help but be flustered by it. Yon Jaka could see nothing as he fell into the hell of darkness, and he thought for the first time that he might die. In this situation where he couldn't even tell up from down and left from right, he couldn't think of a way to escape this situation no matter how he went through it in his mind. So he wondered what exactly is he supposed to do as his strength slowly drains out. And as he closes his eyes thinking of a way out, he remembers Sage Chun Jai during the time they spent training together, telling him that in the central plane, there are those who utilize strange and bizarre techniques. And Sage proceed to tell him that it's also the reason why one cannot survive there with the power of their martial arts alone. So he asks that Jaka keeps that in mind, and make sure he accumulates various knowledge as well. But Jaka brushes it off, saying that studying is boring. Sage doesn't argue and tells him that most of those tricks wouldn't work on someone as strong as him anyway but proceeds to tell him that since he's not experienced, he should beware of shamans. And Jaka asks if he actually means shamans, and Sage affirms, telling him that once he falls for their techniques, it will be difficult to deal with them. So Jaka asks what he's going to do when he encounters them, asking how he's going to defeat them. And Sage tells him that it differs from case to case, and says to Jaka, but normally most of them require preparations and other to cast their incantations. So either you don't enable them to prepare it in the first place, or even if you've become affected by their incantations, as long as you can destroy the parts that were prepared then you will be able to defeat those techniques. Jaka is getting weaker by the second as all his strength is being drained from him, so he opens his eyes and wonders if those things are the incantations that the Heaven Earth Supreme Sage Chin Jai told him about during their training. He also recalls that there are four of those things planted into the ground around him, and realizes that there must be a reason why the weird-looking guy threw those strange chopsticks into seemingly random places. He also recalls that there was strange smoke that emitted by those strange things, so he wonder if those could be the foundation of this incantation. So he decides that if those strange-looking chopsticks stuck into the ground are the problem, then he just have to turn up the ground around him. He finally decides to try out his theory. Since he doesn't know where the ground is, he unleashes one of his Nine Heavens art moves, Nine Heavens World Technique, Seventh Phase, Blessed Dragon Splitting Claws, which is a move that will allow him to send his attack in every direction, outside the ball. 
Hyeon and Tak looks worried for Jiaka as they fear that he might not survive, wondering what kind of technique is that. While worried, Chief Poon call out for Jiaka and asks Demonic King Wang Yigui what kind of bizarre technique that is. Wang Yigui smiles with so much pride showing in his face and says that he didn't think that he would use the technique the moment he stepped foot into the martial world, stating that the martial world is as interesting as he thought. So Doyang apologizes to the Demonic King for making him act, and tells him that he doesn't think he'll be able to use his right hand for a while and that the damages they encountered were much more extensive than expected. So he begs Wang Yigui, asking him to please allow him deliver the finishing blow to Jiaka, promising that he'll make Jiaka beg for him to end his life. As he accepts and is about to say something further, he suddenly feels sudden tremors. So he quickly turns back and sees that his strange-looking chopsticks are shanking off the ground. So he wonders if Jiaka could be the cause of these tremors. As he stares so lost, we see that Jiaka's technique is cutting through the ball from all and every angle and direction. And everyone just pauses and stares at the ball being destroyed from the inside. It's finally destroyed, causing an explosion, which leaves So Doyang in disbelief. And Shim no longer has any limits as to what is expected from Jiaka, because he have finally concluded that Jiaka is an overpowered monster. Jiaka's sword piercing through the smoke and ruckus, slicing through, and finding his way out. Alive but annoyed and states that the technique really pisses him off. Sa Doyang looks like he's seeing a ghost as he thinks that it's impossible for someone who was trapped in the shadow ceiling soul-snatching demonic art to be able to break free with his powers alone. So he wonders if Jiaka is really human. He looks at his master and says that however his technique has only been destroyed just this once, this must have provoked him greatly. And with this, he hopes that he'd be able to witness the true power of his master the great Wang Yigui, the true power of the hundred-head demonic king who possesses the power to scorch everything within the martial world. But at that instant, the great demonic king Wang Yigui screams like a girl with fear in his voice, which leaves So Doyang speechless as he realizes that they might be fucked. Doyang and his ninjas are all aghast by the fact that Jaka was able to break free from the Grand Demon General's technique, and Doyang wonders how a monster like Jaka exists, while Wang Yigui stands speechless. Jaka calls him, saying, Weird old man, you're a sorcerer, huh? Thanks to you, I just went through something disgusting. Now it's my turn to pay you back for angering me. Terrified Wang Yigui thinks that Jaka is fucking ridiculous, and he doesn't even look 20 years of age. So he gets even more confused as to how Jaka managed to break out of his technique all by himself. Jaka begins to warm up ready to attack. His body starts to emanate some serious kai, so he tells all of them to better brace themselves for what's coming. Wang Yigui is terrified so he calls on the ninjas, Black Shadow Core, asking them if they are all just going to stand by and look, so he orders them to stop Jaka immediately. And Doyang who is the leader of the Black Shadow Corps, is too scared to even try and go near Jiaka. He calls his master a fucker because he wonders how on earth will they be able to stop Jaka if even the master can't do it. At this point, he concludes that his life sucks, so he also passes the order down to his underlings, telling them to listen up as he orders them to make sure they kill Jiaka immediately. And they can't believe that he's actually sending them to face that monster. They obey the order and go to fight Jiaka. Jiaka sees that they are coming at him in numbers again like they did before and was able to injure him. And it pisses him off, so he immediately takes care of them. Wang Yigui watches Jiaka as he fights and wonders if Jiaka is a real monster, stating that Jiaka is so strong that even if he fought with all his might, his victory wouldn't be guaranteed. Also adding that he knows that the Jianghu is a vast place but a martial master such as Jiaka doesn't appear that easily, stating that it would be best to eliminate whatever comes in the way of the order as he reaches for his pocket. He pulls out the eight-bead bell saying that transporting it is top priority at the moment and murmurs to himself that it's not because he's scared. He wants to run away and leave his disciples to fight Jaka alone, but pauses and realizes that it would be bad if people found out about the existence of their cult though, and things have gotten so complicated right now. However, he thinks it's a must to at least kill the merchant union's envoy chief because he's sure that the representative definitely knows about their cult. Even though this is his last resort, he'll have to use it. As he makes his escape, he tells Doyoung that he'll be transporting the 8-bead bell right now, but Sa Doyoung shouts out of surprise, telling him that without his help, it will be hard for him and his subordinates to deal with that guy. And Wang Yigui yells back at him, calling him a bastard and telling him that transporting the 8-bead bell is top priority. So he throws his remaining strange chopsticks looking thing, telling Doyoung that that is the last kind of help that he'll provide. The thing was thrown straight at the representative, who is too weak and slow to react or to even move away, but stand in shock and confusion, until it hit him and blood splashed out, with the representative falling to the ground and his daughter rushing towards him and calling to him, Father, Father, Father. As the representative falls, he thinks damn it, so this is what it comes down to. 
Jiaka looks at the representative, his daughter, and the remaining warrior, and calls all members of the Black Shadow Corps pieces of trash. He turns his sight back to the Black Shadow Corps and focuses on Wang Yigui that's trying to escape and tells him that they can all give up on trying to return safely. Yigui gets scared again and asks his ninjas what they are all doing, ordering them to go stop Jaka at once. Jaka increased his speed and plung in for the kill, and Sa Doing decides to stand his ground, ordering all his soldiers to fight to their death, stating that anyone who tries to escape will die by his own hands, and they all rush in to attack Jaka at once. Jaka doesn't budge and still goes forward, with dead focus in his eyes. He unleashes a very powerful form of his Nine Heavens art technique, Nine Heavens Arts, Nine Dragon Twister, which comes as a mighty dragon devouring everyone in his path. On that day, the ultimate technique of the Nine Heavens sword technique that was thought to have been completely lost had appeared even more powerful in the skies than it did 20 years ago, and shone down as nine beams of sword energy. The powerful martial prowess of Yon Jiaka. Yumyung Cult's Black Shadow Corps was an assassin group raised to destroy the nine sects, but they have all been defeated helpless, even the Black Shadow Corps captain. Wang Yigui and one of the twelve demonic warriors Sa Doyang had run away, looking all battered as Sa Doyang, who justifies his reason for running away because his captain had also run away. The black assassins had disappeared in all direction like a locust of grasshoppers. The grand demon general who was known as the strongest in the cult, he who thought no one could rival him in the Zhang who had left the place in great shock. Moreover, the person who humiliated him wasn't even one of the world's strongest martial masters, but a young brat. Yon Jaka swallowed down his anger, even though he wanted to chase after the black assassins who hurt his family. His family had suffered injuries worse than he thought, and he decided that taking care of the five peak ten heroes was of high priority. The chief comes to console Jiaka, telling him that he's really glad that he's with them, but Jiaka is still not happy with himself and apologizes for not coming sooner. But the chief tells him that it's alright and apologizes instead, saying that they all almost got killed because of his own stubbornness, so he thanks Jaka. Jaka still blamed himself for not arriving quicker. He never received love from his family ever since he was young. He had received threats and abuse so much it was tough to even keep his eyes open. For he who endured all of that, the Five Peaks Ten Heroes, were more precious than anyone because they stood by his side. At the thought of being unable to completely protect them for the first time, he began to yearn to protect his own people no matter what happens. Father, 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 the representative's daughter shouts with tears in her eyes, so he responds, telling her to help him get up, because he'd like to thank those heroes who saved them. But she refuses, and tells him that other than that, they need to get him treated first. But he refuses, and says that when he left the merchant union's warriors behind and ran away, he was ready to throw his life away when needed. So he tells her that he is alright and urges that she please call the heroes for him. He starts by saying that he doesn't know how he should express his thanks, which leaves Chief Poon confused. He continues, adding that thanks to all of them, his merchant union and his daughter were able to get out of danger, adding that he knows this is a debt not even a thousand gold could suffice. But he promises that the Suol merchant union will reward them with the best they can give, although they've already been aided greatly by the heroes. He has one more favor to ask, which is for them to please protect his people until they arrive at their destination safely. The representative had passed away after he received the attack of the Grand Demon General. The five peak ten heroes decided to fulfill his last request. While it was because the Merchant Union destination was similar to their own, it was also because the five peak ten heroes had suffered all sorts of injuries and needed to get treatment. However, there was another reason that no one could dare to speak of. That is why they started to travel together. As they travel, Shim whispers to the chief, telling him that if they keep on traveling on the path they are on, they would be in the Palgong Mountain, the Crimson Death Stronghold's territory. Chief Poong realizes that Shim is right so he asks Shim if they have any other option. Shim tells him that it would be best if they avoid running into the Crimson Death Stronghold because they are an acknowledged strong under the Bandit Union also known as Green Forest, stating that it would be really bad if they ran into them before the Grand Summit. Chief Poong then asks Shim if he'd like for them to tell the Merchant Union guys that they can't cross the area because they are a part of the Green Forest adding that the Grand Summit location is definitely just right beyond the mountain in front of them. As Shim is about to say what he thinks, he is interrupted by Chief Poong again who tells him to think about it, asking him if he thinks the Crimson Death Stronghold would come after a merchant union that doesn't even have a horse carriage, ending it all by telling Shim that he worry too much. Far away, in an unknown location, demonic Lord Wang Yigui can be seen standing in front of a rock. He places his hand on a secret lock that opens up a pathway. A woman says to him that he came later than expected, and it happens soon after he became a hundred-head demon king, so she asks him if he doesn't think he's being rude. Wang Yigui quickly apologizes, stating that he encountered some unexpected troublesome things, so the lady tells him to be more careful next time. 
stating that it's not an everyday occurrence for the hundred head demonic kings of the sect to gather in this place, and tells him that she hopes he learns some courtesy so as to not trouble them. And he responds saying that he understands. The lady then asks him if he has safely brought the eight bead bell, which he replies her saying that he has brought it, but he had somewhat of a rough time getting it, but he has brought it safely without damaging it. He places it amongst the others that are on the table, saying that with this, they have secured seven right bead bells now. The lady that have been speaking is the lunar fairy, who congratulates Wang Yigui, stating that thanks to his efforts, the sect will be able to gain far stronger forces. She adds that since everyone seated at the table has approved, the leader of the star stem set, as the next candidate for the next hundred head demon king, now there will be seven hundred head demon kings in the sect. But one of the men seated at the table disapproves of them adding another hundred head demon king, stating that they are fine with just six, and they seem to be just fine with just six of them. And another person among the six says that she gave her approval before but after having thought about the sex leader spirit calling ritual of the thousand head demon lord. She feels like it's a bit of a waste to use up one of the eight bead bells like this, adding that given that they seven of the eight beads bells needed to find three more. If they use up one, they will have to go back to searching out four of them again. The star stem sect leader seems to be a bit confused and asks them what the problem is since they have all given their approval before now. The Luna Fairy interferes and tells him not to worry about it because they are all just jesting, stating that it is the decision of their grand sect leader to create 700 head demonic kings, adding that because the whereabouts of their leader is still unknown, there is no need for them to rush the spirit-calling ritual of the thousand head demonic lord, and once 700 head demonic kings are created, they shall have to use the remaining eight bead bells to create more ten head demon soldiers, and finally, they the dark spectral sects will reveal themselves to the martial world once again. She proceeds to add that they have chosen this opportune time, foretold by their sect leader, so that they will be able to conquer the martial world once the 700 head demon king gather. But Wang Yigui says that there is no telling if it will be as simple as that, telling them all that he lost half of the dark squad in his mission to acquire the eight bead bell. A flashback of his recent encounter with Jiaka, Wang Yigui adds that's what more is that their opponent was a mystery brat, and even the dark squad leader himself a ten head demon soldier couldn't survive a single clash against him. Adding that although he calls himself a shaman, he was confident that he would win against whoever he would fight. But that bastard was a monster strong enough to break through the shadow ceiling soul-snatching demonic art with his strength alone. The Luna Fairy interrupts him, asking what kind of preposterous claim is that, and says that unless he was one of the strongest experts, there's no way a hundred-head demonic king would have been defeated by him. Mung Yigui doesn't stop there, so he adds that although he quickly left the area because of the importance of the mission to secure the relic, Truthfully, he doesn't think that he would have been able to defeat the young brat if he had stayed and fought him to the end, adding that it was his first time seeing a martial art of that kind. Describing the technique Yon Jiaka used, he says that Jiaka flipped his body nine times midair, and the sword Kai poured down from the sky like the pearls of thunder, so he tells the Luna Fairy that she wouldn't believe even if he told her all of it. Fear came upon the Luna Fairy as she hears of the technique, so she says to Wang Yigui that if it is the Nine Sword Kai then, she wonders if it could be, a uh, only one person comes to mind. Mountain Bagging. A man shouts, you insolent bastard. You dare try to sneak across Mountain Bagging like a pack of rats. Your heart's just bloated with courage. Leader of the Red Sand Hideout Piercing Heaven's Blood Axe Hayek Leonhu. Hayek arrogantly tells the Five Peak Ten Elites and the merchants that they couldn't possibly be unaware that the ruler of the Mountain Bagging is the Red Sand Hideout of the Bandit Union. He further adds to them that if they want to stay alive while crossing this path, they they better pay 200 liang per person. Chief Pung is surprised to hear the amount because he thinks that it's too expensive, and they only took 20 liang per person. While Shim sighs, telling the chief that he figured that it was bullshit that they wouldn't mess with a merchant group that's without a carriage and tells the chief that he told him that Red Sand Hideout were infamous with their mountain pathways, and finally adds that he doesn't understand why the chief decided to help the merchant group for no good reason, adding that the Bandits' Union tournament is just ahead and they are completely screwed. So he asks the chief if he doesn't think that they look like they are escorting the merchant group. The representative's daughter begs the leader of the Red Sand Hideout, saying that they cannot pay such a high toll, and explains to him that as he can see, they have already been raided so they don't have much left. He agrees with her, saying that does seem to be the case and they don't have any carriage either. The representative's daughter replies telling him that it's true so she begs that if the heroes of the Red Sand Hideout would be so kind-hearted as to allow them cross. Hayek interrupts her, telling her that it's unfortunate because he's in quite the pinch as well. He tells her that there is a big event that's going to be held in the Bandit Union, so he needs some emergency funds. So he tells her that they would have to give up anything that may cost something and go on their way. But the representative's daughter still pleads with him 
once more stating that they have been pillaged so they have nothing amongst their possessions. Hayek replies her saying that, then he can just earn the price for meat by butchering them, and his subordinate asks if he shall go see if they have any valuables or not. With a cocky smile, he says that every punch brings you closer to profit or so they say. Red Sand Hideout Vice Leader, No Yongjin. Chief Poong and Shim have a little discussion about what to do. Chief Poong asks Shim if it is not true that the merchant group are penniless since they gave them all they had. And Shim asks what about it. So Chief Poong tells Shim that it seems like they might have to give the Red Sand Bandit Union some money. But Shim reminds him that they are also robbing from the Bandit Union as they are not actually from the Soaring Dragon School as they claim to be. This leaves the chief confused and he asks Shim what he thinks would be the best course of action. Because if those bandits approach them to search their things, their faces will be seen. And if a fight breaks out, they would have to deal with a big problem right before the Bandit Union tournament. Sobik whispers a joke to Yon Jaka, telling him that those people next to the man with the axe, asking him if he doesn't think they look like dumplings hollowed out by rats. And Jaka responds saying not really, mildly dumplings. Sobik laughs, as well as the others in front. While Chief Poon and Shim Yonggak discuss, and the chief finally decide that they pay the toll fee before things get worse, Shim agrees but still thinks it's such a waste. The chief tells Shim that he also agrees that it's such a waste but asks him to think of what could happen if those bandit angered Jaka somehow, and Shim tells him that he knows, and that he is pulling out the money already. The vice chief of the Red Sand Bandit Union looks at them laughing, so he wonders if that Jaka is crazy, asking how they have the composure to laugh in this situation. He gets pissed as he thinks that he must seem laughable to them. So he says that it seems that they need some beating. He cites the bag of gold that Shim pulled out and shouts at them, telling that they must think his sight is so narrow focus, asking them what's with the gold coin over there, and asks if they just dared to lie in front of the red sand hideout. But the representative's daughter tries to explain to him, saying that the gold coin no longer belonged to them, so that's why they cannot give it to the red sand hideout. The vice chief of the Red Sand Hideout gets angry and calls them all bastards as he readies his sword asking them if they are trying to mock him, and tells her that it's such a shame that they cannot comprehend the situation at all, stating that now, they are all done for and adds that they cannot even pass even if they give up all that they have. He calls out Jaka and Sobik, saying, and that brat and the girl who are still wet behind the ears, what's so funny that you can't stop laughing like that, huh, you bastards? So he shouts, saying, aren't you still just dunces with no control over when you pee and shit? You must have some luck since your heads are still attached to your necks. He increases his voice in anger and continues to rant, shouting that now that they have met him, they shouldn't even pray for such luck, adding that even their parents who loved and cared for children like them. Before he could finish his rants, the gold coins are scattered in the air, and the vice chief of the Red Sand hideout is seen passed out and falling from being hit by a coin that Jaka threw at his forehead. Shim looks into the bag and couldn't find the coins that were in the bag just now. Even the Red Sand hideout leader is confused as to what just happened. In his confusion, he states that he couldn't even sense them attacking, so he realizes that there's a martial master amongst them. Chief Poon gives a tired expression because after everything, things still ended up this way and Shim feels the same way, saying that it's totally doomed. Jaka catches some of the falling coins and says that the moldy dumpling Ajisi really has no manners and that he doesn't care about the rest of what they have said, but they shouldn't have brought up talk of family, so he sends some of the coins flying which goes directly to hit the forehead of the Red Sand Chief, and his subordinates received one on each of their forehead as well. So the chief asks them to quickly cover their faces and hope that the Red Sand Bandit lose consciousness and forget their faces, but Shim doesn't cover his face as he thinks that it's too late now, and Sobik asks how the Red Sand Bandit are not going to remember, because elder brother Yon Jiaka has gotten involved so balantly, adding that the tournament is in a day or two. Mountain bagging Red Sand Hideout in other to impress the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord before the Bandit Union. They were going on traversing difficult mountain terrains and looting people, hence they were earning a great amount. However they just happened to meet Yon Jaka and get on his nerves, causing their main members to collapse and become incapable of battling right before the Bandit Union tournament. Back with the Luna Fairy, she says that there's no way a young brat would have been able to defeat a hundred-head demonic king unless he's one of the ten strongest experts. Meng Yigui also adds that although he quickly left the area because of the importance of the mission, which is to secure the relic, truthfully he doesn't think that he would have been able to defeat the young brat if he had stayed and fought him to the end, stating that it was his first time seeing a martial art of that kind. Describing the technique Yon Jiaka used, he says that Jiaka flipped his body nine times midair, and the sword Kai poured down from the sky like the pearls of thunder, so he tells the Luna Fairy that she wouldn't believe even if he told her all of it. Immediately she hears about the technique she gets scared and asks Wang Yigui if he's very sure of what he just said, because if it's the Nine Sword Kai, 
Then could it be? She wonders as only one person comes to her mind. So she says that there's one bastard that comes to her mind but she heard that he died. And yet, not many people are able to use a technique of that level. That being said, she asks him what he means when he said that it was a young brat. Because if the person she has in mind is still around, then he should have been in his 50s by now. Wang Yigui responds, saying that the boy looks maybe in his 20s. He corrects himself and say no that the boy looked to be about 15 years old. And his defining feature is his red hair and he seems to be a part of the other sect. Luna Fairy tries to make sense of the features and says that it's highly likely that he may be that person's son. So she tells her story from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a time when we had built a temple in Jiangnan according to the sect leader's orders. At the time, the bastard who came along with the Nangong clan's young master used that exact martial art. That impudent brat later obtained the title of Moon Slashing Swordsman apparently. And she adds that it still infuriates her till this day, whenever she thinks about it. Though she was merely a ten-head demon soldier back then. Now that she has obtained the powers of the hundred-head demonic king, she promises that the moment their sex step out into the martial world, she will avenge the humiliation she faced that day. And she adds that once that day comes, the name of the Nangong clan and the Crouching Dragon estate will never be found in the history of the Murim. Chief Poon looks like he's so tired of the troubles they keep getting into, and tells Jaka that he told him not to mess with the Bandit Union hideouts, which Jaka replies, saying that the bastard started it, and Shim is not having any of it right now. Sobik runs toward them, hailing Jaka, saying that he was amazing and that he's the best. When in county, nearby town, the town residents who were living a peaceful life experience a shocking event. Once the Bandit Union tournament approached its launch, bandits of countless mountain hideouts began to fill up the town. Though the members of the Bandit Union were aware and vigilant against each other, there weren't any big commotions, fortunately. A strange guy is seen talking to an old geezer, telling him that it feels like all the mountain hideout of the Central Plains have gathered here and asks the old man if he doesn't find the greatness of the bandit union to be amazing. And the old man replies, saying that this bandit union has been dubbed unprecedented in the Murim history, so this is only natural. Another strange guy listening in on the conversation between the old man and his subordinate, someone who seems to be the subordinate of this strange guy, calls the guy Hyundam, and tells him that it seems that the rumors of the increase of mountain hideout are true. Stating that those guys over there look completely clueless and the Hunam doesn't say a word at first. Eventually he speaks, and is disgusted, saying that he wonders just how were those people and everyone else were accepted into the bandit union. Adds that maybe they were accepted into the bandit union because their faces don't look half bad. He focuses on the mountain where Feng hideout members and tells his subordinate to look at them. Telling him to look at them saying that the way they are imitating a merchant group, it's obvious that they are some nameless mountain hideout. Asking his subordinate if he doesn't think that it's going to be easy as pie if they were matched up against those guys in the bandit union tournament. He calls the mountain where Feng hideout bandits a nameless hideout and also thinks that they are some weaklings. Sobik tells Jaka that she feels more comfortable now that they've all changed and back into their bandit union outfit. His subordinate replies saying that those guys look like they are just there to fill up the headcount, and he wonders if they are going to withstand a single punch. But the strange guy laughs at his subordinate, telling him that it looks like he have long ways to go, and at this rate he's not going to live a long life. So he tells him that if he wants to live a long life, then it would be best if he doesn't fight against the redhead. As they move forward, the guy asks his Hunam if he means what he said just now, and the Hunam replies telling him that he's correct, and calls the guy an idiot and tells him to not look down on the begged sect because if he does and eventually gets targeted by them, then he is going to live an eternal life worse than hell. And the guy doesn't even question his Hunam, and tells him that he completely understands. It's night already, in Wen and County. Everyone have completely set up their tent. And as they settle in, some people are have their mini talks. Someone asks the other if he doesn't think that the magnitude of the bandit union is incredible now that all the mountain hideout are gathered here. Stating that even with just the executives, their number are this much, and if all the members of the mountain hideouts gathered, he'd believe if they were said to be strong as an army. Chief Poon tells his brothers to stop with the nonsense and start unpacking, and tells Vice Chief Tak Gam Young that he's going to have to follow him somewhere, which leaves Tak Kirio so he asks where they are going, and the chief tells him that they have come all the way here, so they will have to go greet the brothers at Mountain Deby Hideout. Vice Chief Tak doesn't buy the idea, and he tells the chief that they will all meet eventually so there will be no need to do that. The chief agrees but states that it's proper manners to go and greet them first since they were the ones who picked them up and took them under their care. Yon Jaka lying alone under the bright full moon. And suddenly Sobik arrives saying that she finally found him and asks him what he's doing out there and tells him that she have been looking everywhere for him. So she asks him how he can just slack off here while everyone is unpacking the luggage and setting them up. He gives her a temporary glare and tells her that he had a lot to think about so he was just gathering his thoughts. 
and says to her, By the way, you used to stick close to Kion all the time. I don't see you together these days, did you fight or something? She's shocked to hear this assumption by Jiaka, so she immediately tells him that that's not the case, and that she and Kion would never fight, stating that it's just that Kion always sticks to Cholson nowadays, and she feels like she's bothering them somehow whenever she's with them. She blushes as she looks at Jiaka and he tells her that so long as they are not fighting, then it's fine. So he asks if she also want to slack off with him. She blushes so much and tells him of course, saying to herself that she wants to stay together with him. That aside she tells him that she's really surprised because she thought he wouldn't have anything to worry about, meaning that he's so strong, and why would someone like him have any problems? Jiaka replies, saying, Hmm, that's so. I don't think I have any problems now. Ben Sobik asks if that means that he had problems before. And thinking about it, she tells him that she have never heard anything about his past. So she asks that he please tell her about it. He tells her that it's not something really worth sharing. But tells her that he was actually thinking about his parents before. But he couldn't remember their faces at all. And Sobik asks him why it's so. So he tell her that his mother died when giving birth to him. And his father. He had never seen his face properly until he turned six. So it's not that strange that he doesn't remember him but adds that he can vividly picture the person he resents the most. Sobik is shocked to hear this and asks him who that is. And the thought of this person makes him instantly angry, so he tells her that it was someone who tried to kill him. Sobik couldn't believe what she just heard, so she asks him if he isn't still talking about when he was six years old, because what could possibly be the reason his life was threatened at such a young age, and asks him if he perhaps is royalty. But he tells her that he is not royalty, so she asks him if the person is still alive and he tells her that the person could probably still be alive. Then she tells him that they should go find the person and take revenge right away. Still on that, she changes her mind, saying that, that won't do, and the reason why it won't be okay is because they would die if he just lifts a finger, and it would be too simple of a revenge for the person. And as sadness covered Gianca's face he tell her that the person is his elder mother. This leaves Sobik in so much shock as it sounds unbelievable to her. As Yon Jaka began telling Sobik about the Crouching Dragon estate, she couldn't find any words and remained speechless. She expected that Yon Jaka might have had problems in the past. Everyone has a sad story to tell after all. However the young boy who looked younger than herself could overcome any danger and difficulties. So she simply thought he mustn't have experienced any major hardships. So she simply thought he mustn't have experienced any major hardships. This was Yon Jaka, the one whom she envied all this time. He looks at her and tells her that it's not fun right but is shocked to see that she's crying. So he quickly asked her why she's crying. She apologizes, and tells him that she didn't even know that he had to go through something like that. Clueless Jiaka interrupts her, asking her if he said something useless, but she apologizes once more. But Jiaka doesn't accept her apology and tell her that he's the one who's sorry. The bright full moon, someone presenting a report, says that the rules of the bandit union states that you aren't allowed to interrupt the mountain travels of another mountain hideout. This person is leader of the Red Sand Hideout, piercing heaven's blood axe, Hayek Leonhu. He says that however the bastards who attacked their Red Sand hideout helped the merchant group, and he has seen them in the camps, stating that it was the members of the bandit union, the Mountain Wufeng hideout, telling the person that he's reporting to him that the Mountain Wufeng hideout members disguised themselves as the escort of the merchant group at this time when the great bandit union tournament is starting. He believes it'd be wrong to let the mountain hideout off like that after they broke the rules, which is why he requested a meet with the person he's reporting to. This person is irritated by the report he just heard, so he says to Hayek Leonhu that if it's the Mountain Wufeng hideout, then it hasn't been that long since it was formed, right? So he asks Hayek Leonhu what he wants to inform him of. This person is none other than Bandit Union head hideout leader, Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord. With an intimidating look in his eyes, he asks Hayek Leonhu if he actually wasted his time just to boast about the incompetence of the Red Sand hideout, or he's trying to mock the strength of Mountain Wufeng hideout, venue of the Bandit Union, Wanan County. Bandit Union head hideout leader is disgusted by the report from Hayek Leonhu and says to him that if it's the Mountain Wufeng hideout then it hasn't been long since they were formed, asking Hayek if he's correct. And his twelve disciples stare at Hayek Leonhu with an intimidating glare. Hayek raises his head slightly with fear in his eyes, but doesn't reply the question that the Bandit Union head hideout leader asked him. So the Bandit Union head hideout leader asks him if he's saying that the Red Sand hideout was defeated and by the just created Mountain Wufeng hideout. He looks disgusted and asks Hayek Leonhu what he really wanted to inform him of. Bandit Union Head Hideout Leader, Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord. Hayek is shocked at the Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord's reaction to his complaint, and asks him what he means by that question. The Bandit Union Head Hideout Leader then responds by asking him if he's boasting about the incompetence of the Red Sand Hideout, or he's mocking the strength of the Mountain Wufeng Hideout. 
Now that Hayek thinks about it, he actually has nothing to say. Ying Gale who is among the twelve disciples, looks worried because he thinks that if it's Mountain Wufeng hideout, then it must be that bastard. Twelve Demonic Lord Ying Gale Feline Lord. He starts to get super worried, stating that Yon Jaka completely disregards the position of the rank within the bandit uni. Remembering his experience with Jaka, Ying Gale remembers that the young bandit bastard foregoes any shred of respect towards his seniors. So he remembers when Jaka told him his name, Yon Jaka. As he stands there reflecting on his thoughts, the fear and hatred he has for Yon Jaka consumes him. But he doesn't realize that his fear and hatred for Jaka is making him emanate bloodlust from just thinking about Jaka alone. The bandit union head hideout leader notices him and doesn't say anything at first, but proceeds to dismiss the red sand hideout leader, who get up and leave without any further complaints. As he leaves he wonder what the bandit union head hideout leader has in mind. Continuing on, he asks his disciples if that brat is the sword-wielding bandit of Mountain Wufing hideout, adding that he recalls that the boy they call, that bastard is a young boy. And Yingale responds, telling him that he is correct and that the boy looked like he hadn't even hit the age of 20 and for someone who hasn't even reached his maturity. He was completely audacious. The bandit union head hideout leader sighs and asks Yingale, if he's saying that the disciple of the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord was defeated by someone who wasn't even 20. And while being in a drunken stupor at that, Yingale stutters as he tries to respond and the rest of the disciples stare at him angrily. So the demonic demon lord finally makes his decision, slamming his clenched fist hard against his chair. Yingale and the rest shuts up and awaits his decision. So he says that if the brat from Mountain Wufeng hideout is going to appear in this bandit union tournament, adding that if he steps up, then Yingale would be the one to confront him. Yingale questions his hearing, but the bandit union head hideout leader tells him that he said himself that he made a mistake while he was drunk. So what's the big deal? He gets serious and proceeds to say that himself, the Shattering Heaven's demonic lord, shouldn't have a disciple, who lost to a brat who's not yet turned even 20, it is the biggest disgrace. So he warns Yingale that if he loses in that tournament again, he will have to forfeit the position of 12 demonic king and undergo training for 10 years all over again. After hearing this, Yingale recalls his previous 10 years training with his master the bandit union head hideout leader, which was really brutal and almost killed him. With fear in his eyes he questions himself if his master is really asking him to go through that hell again. The bandit union head hideout leader gets really mad at Yingale and yells at him, asking him why he's overwhelmed with fear of that brat. Fear that's enough for him to refute his words. And of course Yingale denies his fear for the brat and says that he can never refute his master's words. He quickly kneels and bought to beg for mercy, telling his master that, he, Yingale Feline Lord, have accepted his master's orders. Yingale realizes that this is the worst, because he knows that if he fight against that formidable brat in 100 battles, he'll face 100 losses. So he tries to think of another way. At the tent of the Mountain Wufeng hideout, Chief Pung is really excited to see Yingale, so he showers him with praises, calling him the pride of the bandit union, the Yingale Feline Lord, Hyungnam. So he asks him what brings him to their tent. Jiaka and the rest of the brothers are eating when one of them recognizes Yingale and asks Brother Tak if that's not the guy that was beaten to a pulp by Yon Jiaka. Yingale responds to Chief Poon's question and tells him that he heard that the Mountain Wufeng hideout had arrived, but he couldn't come to see them. He doesn't understand why Chief Poon is calling him Hyungdam. Chief Poon invites him in, telling him that they all would have come running if he had called. He calls him Hyungdam once more and says that it's been a while, asking him how he have been since they last saw each other while others go to greet Yingale Feline Lord. Jaka sits unconcerned and enjoys his food. Yingale fumes from the inside because he doesn't like how casual Chief Pung is being with him so he says that if not for his mistake at Mountain Wufeng hideout, all of them in the tent would be bastards who couldn't even meet face to face with him. So Beak notices him, and so does Kion. So they put up a bright smile and calmly asks him what brings him to their tent. And Kion also compliments his physique, telling him that it has gotten much better since the last time they saw him. Yingale's face almost burst from blushing too much and he makes a mistake by asking brother but corrects himself and asks blush. The girl flirt with him, saying that of course, adding that he became the Hyundam of the Ten Wufang elites that night, so now he has become their big brother. Yingale, staring lustfully at the girls, Chief Poon tells him that it's true that he's their Hyundam now, because they all remember the events of the night perfectly. Yingale agrees, saying that the brother term sounds pretty good. He goes back to why he came to their tent telling them that it is to make sure that the event that will finally start today and carry on for days, the Bandit Union Tournament, goes smoothly without a hitch. They are all confused as to why he's telling them this, but he continues, telling them that the one who will participate first from the Mountain Wufeng hideout must tell him after getting the schedule. Yingale know that truthfully that's all up for them to decide. Even though he was the one who said all that, it still sounds ridiculous to him. 
But Chief Poon smiles with confidence, telling him that he doesn't need to ask that, since he already know of their situation. So he says that as for their end, they obviously are. They all pause to stare at Jiaka. And Jaka turns back to look at them and asks them what they are doing that's making no one eat. Asking just how important could this guest be? Yingale look at Jaka and says to himself that it's exactly as he had thought, stating that these simpleton never fail to meet his expectation, adding that Jaka's rudeness is still the same. So he thinks of what to do since he can't win against Jaka. He wonders if there's a way that he can just make it so that Jaka cannot participate in the Bandit Union tournament to begin with. Bandit Union head hideout leader, shattering heaven's demon lord. Without using any microphones or speakers, he makes an announcement, addressing the entire member of the Green Forest present in Wanan County. He announces that the Green Forest will no longer be a group of bandits. His voice was loud enough for everyone at the bandit in Wanan County to hear him loud and clear. So he announces that it is time they surpass the Nine Great Sect and become the world's strongest sect, and finally says to all of them at Green Forest that it is time to prepare for the thousand-year-old reign. He sits back on his chair as the general manager, Wu Jim Yoon, announced that the Green Forest Summit will now begin, and all the members of the Green Forest chant and roars causing lots of noise. And so, with the secretive competition amongst greatest bandits, and in order to decide ten total guards and patrols, the first day of the Green Forest Summit began. A fight breaks out between two bandits. The man on the right, all charged up, asks the other what he's doing by pushing him and the other asks him if he wants him to peel the skin off his face. Chief Poon looks at them and wonders what kind of arrogant bastard they are to be fighting on someone else's mouth. So Tak whispers to him, telling him that he thinks that they should compete in at least one of the categories of the Green Forest Grand Summit, asking him if he thinks it's okay for them to be doing nothing as they are. And the chief replies, telling him that he doesn't actually know. In the ring, the general manager U Jim Yoon asks the crowd if any one of them wished to compete in the first category of the Green Forest Grand Summit, the Secret Arts. Before the general manager could add more to what he said, one bandit rushes into the ring in style, giving his perfect epic entrance with a cocky smile on his face. And most of the audience are wowed by his beautiful entrance. He introduces himself as Lim Yong Ru, the chief of the Yongma Mountain, and still with that cocky smile on his face. He asks if anyone here is willing to teach him a lesson. Immediately after, someone else jumps into the ring, which makes him curious. This new person introduces himself as Mac Jio, the chief of Bibong Mountain, and tells Lim Yong Ru that he will certainly teach him a lesson. Lim Yong giggles and asks Mac Jio why he's going around with a wanted poster around his neck. I don't know how, but suddenly a wanted poster appears around Mark's neck. This infuriates Mac, so he yells at Lim Yong, saying that he has never met anyone so arrogant. And as he pulls off the wanted poster around his neck, the bandit union hideout leader laughs, excited that they are starting off with some funny guys. Mac angrily goes in to attack Lim, calling him a bastard, and saying that he'll make Lim Yong regret mocking him in front of the commander chief. He jumps and attacks from above, and Lim Yong counters Mac's attack, using his own attack, flying dragon pants, to defeat Mac, tying his neck with his weapon, until he passes out. Another bandit enters the ring and tells Lim that he would also like a lesson from him. He introduces himself as Slaughter Mill, so he begins a fist fight with Lim. He uses two techniques, Madman Slaughtering Fist and Countering with the Nine Dodge Kick. One of the twelve disciples of the Bandit Union leader watches as Myung gets easily defeated, so he says that he knows that they are allowing anyone to participate in order to expand their forces. But the fight is beginning to look like a dog fight in the streets. One of the Green Forest Twelve Demonic Generals, Ghost Monarch, pouring himself a cup of drink is Demonic Feline Lord Yingale. One of the twelve demonic generals of the Green Forest, sitting next to Yingale is Ghost Monarch, who says to Yingale that this is the reason why he's looking forward to seeing the rematch between the Yin Win Sovereign and that brat from the Five Peaks Stronghold, also telling Yingale that, considering how much he's drinking right now, he must have learned some sort of secret technique overnight. Yingale smiles, feeling proud and confident. He tells the Ghost Monarch that he guess he could call it that. He cites the Five Peaks Stronghold and says to himself that he has already dealt a massive blow. That is a direct secret technique, and most fatal to those arrogant simpletons from the Five Peak. Last night, Yingale at the tent of the Five Peak tells Jaka that he would have to participate in the Green Forest Grand Summit, and Jaka asks him if he's referring to him, which Chief Pung excitedly tells Jaka that it's actually a good idea, stating that if he competes, then it is as good as guaranteed victory for the Mountain Wufang hideout. But Yingale tells him to wait, saying to Jaka that if it's about skills, then he knows for sure that he'll win any tournament. However, he tells them a secret, which is that this isn't just any competition, and that it's a place where they will be selecting the important personnel for the Green Forest, adding that if Jaka were to show up in this competition, he guarantees that he would be able to secure a position as a guard. 
but he clears his throat and says that the problem is what comes next, which is that the position requires him to patrol all of the stronghold across the nation. So Jiaka gets curious and asks if it means that when the competition is over, he won't be able to return to the five peaks and with a stupid look on his face, he tells Jaka that he is correct, also asking him if he thinks that a position in the green forest would be easy. He proceeds to tell Jaka that he sure will come across many difficulties in his travels as well, and who knows if it will take a year or several years. Not only that, without the five peak ten heroes, how long does he think he'll be able to live in peace, and that all of his brothers will have to return to their place except him who has an obligation to fulfill? So Jaka asks if it means he will have to be alone without his family. The information Yingale have just put down pisses off everyone as they realize that this must have been Yingale's reason for coming to them in the first place stating that he is such a cunning human. Yingale is so happy to see the frustration in all of their faces. The chief gets really pissed off, and so does Shim. But Shim knows that out of everything that Yingale has said, nothing he said isn't true. Jaka stops eating and calls his big brother. He bows his head and tells big brother Poong that if it is his decision, he will gladly leap into fire, but states that however, he finally have a real family to take care of. And if he were to become a guard they would have to be separated. The faces on his family members change as they all look gloomy. The chief notices the look on all their faces and asks them what the hell. Yelling at all of them. That Jaka hasn't become a guard yet. Jaka looks at big brother Poong and Tak realizes that it's true, so he smiles. So brother Poong asks them all since when were they, the country bumpkins from the five peak, interested in becoming the patrols and guard. So he tells them all not to get all hang up on the technicalities and get a grand tour while they are here. This brightens up Jaka, so he responds saying, yes big brother. He smiles back at Jaka and gives him a thumbs up, but in his mind he tells Jaka that he really feels regretful. Just like that, Yingale's secret technique pierced through their hearts. Back to the present, Yingale is feeling really relaxed and compliments his drink, saying that it is really sweet, which makes his colleague question if he is drunk already. The head hideout leader notices Yingale's excitement, so he wonders, looking at the five peak and Yon Jaka specifically. The Green Forest Grand Summit continues. Someone unleashes his technique, Iron-Headed Art, which enables him to be able to headbutt his opponent with brute force and incapacitate them with a single hit. Chief Poon questions the Iron-Headed Art, questioning if that's not just headbutting. Jiaka is bored and yawns loudly, which makes his brothers all look at him He responds, telling the chief that he was going to stay right where he is and watch the matches, but he just can't hold his p in any longer, so he leaps off the arena and rushes into the forest. But Big Brother Poon wonders why he is taking his sword to go take a piss, and says, seriously, that guy is just as weird. Shim looks back at Big Brother Poon and says, p, yeah right, and tells Chief Poon that Jaka must be planning on beating down some innocent trees in the forest and asks Chief Poon what they can do, stating that a monster like Jaka who already defeated the legendary Heaven Earth Supreme, was patient while watching this child's play, and adds that, that's already good enough reason for him to get bored. And from nowhere, Sobi questions Shim, asking him why Jaka would be a monster, but no one pays much attention to her. Big Brother Poon thinks about what Shim said, and says, no wonder, I guess the tournament wasn't entertaining to him. A fire dragon descending from the heavens, explosions from all directions. He has already witnessed fights like that, so it's given that he'd be bored. Sobik scolds both Shim and Poon, telling them that they are too mean and that her big brother Jaka is no monster, which comes as a shock to the entire Five Peak brothers. But Tak immediately changes the atmosphere, asking the brothers who they are going to bet on this time around, and one of them says that he'll be betting on Blockhead Min. Sobik loses hope on ever changing their mind but gets worried, because as her brother Jaka continues to be called a monstrous master and the like, she wonders if she'll ever be able to walk beside him on equal terms because the anxiety in her keeps building up. And so, right after Jaka exited the arena of the Bandit Union tournament, as if they have been waiting for the perfect moment, a big event was starting to take place. The pressure from the two facing each other builds up. Lifting up his curved blade is the second in line of the twelve demonic kings under the shattering heaven's demonic lord. As they both take on their fighting stance, there is dead silence in the whole arena as everyone gets tense, and the air pressure around them changes. The mountain Davy hideout leader goes for the first attack, which is blocked by his opponent. They both look each other dead in the eye, and the real battle begins. The fight goes on, and they both struggle to overpower each other. But eventually, mountain Davy hideout leader gets the upper hand and people amongst the crowd are surprised to see this, while his subordinates shout in praises, and his vice hideout leader, Poison-Eyed, praises him the more. 
Chief Poon, clueless of who the fighter's opponent is, says that it's as expected of the Hyunnams at Mountain Davy Hideout, and adds that the match was actually kinda watchable. But Shim standing behind the chief asks him if he just said kinda, asking him what he meant by kinda, and proceed to tell the chief that the way the fight is going is greatly unexpected. But Chief Poon asks him how possible is that, asking Shim what he means, stating to Shim that it's obvious that one side would end up losing. This annoys Shim as he thought that Poon and the brothers were actually upping their standards, stating that even if they were cut off in the countryside, he wonders how they could be this clueless. So he tells the chief that what he means is that the one losing is none other than the disciple directly under the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, one of the twelve demonic kings, the Red-Eyed Group Lord. The Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord looks at that man and asks if he say he was the hideout leader of Mountain Davy, Lee Mu Jin, stating that looks are deceiving, adding that he is quite good and to think that red eyes would suffer so much. This worries him as he continues to repeatedly tap his finger on the handle of his chair. His disciples notices the worry in his face, and stare without being obvious. Ghost Mornak, sweating and shaking, tells his master not to worry, that their second in line takes a while to get himself warmed up, and that's why it looks like he's being pushed back, stating that the real bandit union tournament has only just begun, so he should relax and enjoy the matches. Looking down at the fight he prays that the red-eyed group lord not forget, what the Bandit Union Tournament and the participation of the Twelve Demonic Kings really means. Red-Eyed Group Lord sighs and tells the Mountain Davy Hideout Leader that he was a great opponent to warm up against, which leaves the Mountain Hideout Leader confused. With a killer look on Red-Eyed Group Lord's face, he tells his opponent that he is slowly getting tired of following his lead and that it is time to end this match. In one hit, Mountain Davy Hideout Leader Lee Mugen takes his fighting stance and looks unfazed and Red-Eyed Group Lord unleashes his killer technique, Sanguine Rift of the Myriad Serpent, which appears around him as a huge serpent with multiple heads sticking out of his blade, which he sends as an attack straight towards the Mountain Davy hideout leader, leaving Poong and Tak in shock, as Poong shouts, snakes, and countless numbers of them too. Mountain Davy hideout leader readies himself to block this powerful attack, but his vice chief shouts, asking him to get out of there. Shim doesn't look surprised at all and says that that's as far as it goes, even for that Davy hideout leader. The attack comes cutting Lee Mugen, which makes the other members of the Twelve Disciples smile, as this is something that they would like to see. The attack comes from multiple directions slashing Lee Mugen with no room for escape. Shim looks as he thinks that the mountain Davy hideout leader is really impressive in his own right too. The leader of some remote mountain hideout was able to fight in equal terms against the disciple of the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, and was able to drag out his secret technique as well. And if it's that level of skill, even if it's not as much as the young clan bastard of their mountain hideout, his name should have definitely been known somewhere. Red Eye's group leader jumps, in for the final blow against his opponent. As he unleashes final attack, he shouts for the head hideout leader of Mountain Davy to be silenced, and the attack causes an explosion. Young Jaka out in the woods hears the sound from the explosion, and think that it's a thunder clap. So he says that he only came out to warm up a bit after a long while but wonders if it's going to rain, asking what's with the sky. He walks further into the woods not wanting to mind whatever that is. Upon getting to a tree, he says that he might as well try this for today, which is to cut down a tree. He flips his sword and grips it tight with both his hands, taking a stance to cut down the tree. He focuses on it and thinks that since there are too many people around, he shouldn't make too much of a ruckus, so he plans to cut down the tree with minimum kai and speed. As Jaka swing his sword, someone sitting behind the tree casually says that he hopes he's not trying to slice him in half as well. Jaka hears this, and immediately holds back his attack, which had already hit the tree, but stops before making any deep cut. The guy from behind the tree gets up and asks Jaka if he's supposed to thank him for sparing his life, or if he's supposed to beat the shit out of him or something. Jaka is surprised to see this person because he didn't feel any presence. So he tells this person that judging by the way he look, he's also a bandit, and asks him what he's doing behind the tree and not in the sparing ground. So the guy says, what else, saying that he's just like Jaka, a young hideout leader. He stretch and yawn, and Jaka wonders what's with this guy. The guy then tells Jaka that he got tired of this bandit union or forest union, so he was planning on taking a good nap in the middle of the forest but he woke up right before his death. Jaka says, young hideout leader, and tells the guy that he is not anything like that though and walks away. The guy looks confused, so he runs after Jaka asking him if he is saying that there are stronger people than himself within his mountain hideout, calling Jaka good sir, and telling him that the way he was cutting down that tree was far from ordinary, asking him if he know that, and Jaka replies, asking why he is calling him good sir, so he says that his big hyunnam does have something special that can't be expressed with martial arts alone. 
And the guy asks Jaka what he means by something special that can't be expressed by just martial arts. Jaka stops and turns to the guy, asking him why he's continuing to follow him, and tells him that he doesn't want to get chased by a guy. The guy smiles and asks Jaka if he thinks that he has some ulterior motive or something, and tells Jaka that he's just suggesting that they just build up their friendship as young bandits, amongst these bandit groups filled with all those geezers. But Gio refuses, gets closer to the guy and tells him that following him for his own whims is not a way to build friendship, and asks the guy if he got drunk in the middle of the day. The guy calls Giaka good sir once more and tells him that he's so clueless, stating that another to build friendship between men. What else is there? And catches a falling leaf. He shoots it at Yon Giaka unaware, which comes to Yon as if an arrow was fired, and Giaka is shocked by this. So Yon Giaka quickly dodges it, and steps backwards with a flip, landing with a fighting stance ready and tells the guy that if this is the type of friendship building that he's talking about, then he's always up for it, with excitement on his face. And the guy smiles at Giaka. Giaka tells the guy that if it's this sort of friendship building, he is up for it as well, but says that it's a bit of a shame. At the very least, looking at the leaf that was fired at him, there are two pins which the guy disguised under the leaf. Giaka then says to him that it's such a shame, because he had hoped the guy had the ability to cut people with a leaf. The guy asks Jaka what he means with a leaf, saying that he is the one who took a nap but it looks like Jaka is the one who is talking in his sleep. The guy readies to fight, blows up multiple leaves, and tells Jaka that for something like that, he should be asking masters who are at the level of the five order sects to do that kind of feat, so he jumps above Jaka to attack, and with a cocky smile on his face, he displays his technique. Black Lotus Blossom As Jaka watches him, he feels disappointed and tells the guy that he already met someone like that, and jumps right into the attack, rotating his blade so fast, the guy can't even see the move. The guy is shocked to see Giaka jump right into his attack, so he wonders what's wrong with Giaka because he just dove right into his flowers of hidden weapons. This is because the guy couldn't see that Giaka was rotating his sword so fast, one can barely see his blade. After spoiling the guy's attack, Giaka goes in for the final strike, and tells the guy that even the master he met didn't have an answer for him. The guy notes that not only is Jaka fast, he was also able to break through his hidden weapon formation in one motion, and adds that this weapon formation was never able to be broken that easily, even by the twelve demonic kings, with the expectation of his father. The Green Forest Grand Summit continues, and most people among the crowd hail the red-eyed group lord, saying that it's as expected of the twelve demonic king, and says that their skills are comparable even to the disciples of the five order sects. Disciple Red Eyes turns facing his master and apologizes for meaninglessly dragging out time. His master gives him a dissatisfied look. But at that moment, Ghost Monarch notices that the Mountain Deby hideout leader is still standing, so he immediately shouts out to Red Eyes, telling him to focus that the sparring is yet to be over. Red Eyes turns and sees the Mountain Deby hideout leader emanating lots of dark kai. The Mountain Deby hideout leader unleashes his secret technique and tells Red Eyes that this must be such a dilemma for him, because he wasn't able to finish him off in the one attack he so bragged about. Pung and Tak are shocked to see that he withstood the previous attack, and his vice chief praises him. He plunges in with his secret attack, venomous insect striking technique, and tells Red Eyes that he is going to get hurt if he turns his eyes away. Red Eyes also plunge into the sky, asking the Mountain Deby hideout leader if he thinks anything will change just because he holds out a little longer. He sends his killing attack, and the Mountain Deby hideout leader gives a devilish smile, countering it with his own killing art, which leaves shock on Red Eye's face. So Deby hideout leader jumps into the air and unleashes his killing art to deliver his final blow. And before he strikes, he thanks Red Eyes for his teachings. The move is so fast that Red Eyes couldn't dodge it, so he takes a direct hit but tries to block it. The attack comes like multiple powerful stings of a giant insect, which sends him flying as he passes out cold hitting the ground lifeless. Mountain Deby hideout leader sheathes his sword as a sign of victory. He stands in front of the lifeless Red Eyes group lord and gives his formal greeting to the head hideout leader of the bandit union. Heaven-shattering demonic lord looks surprised and wonders because that guy just now, he suspects something from that guy's flow of Kai. So the pride in all remaining disciples are crushed in an instant. Poom looks confused as usual and asks what on earth is going on. And how, how could the disciple of the heavens demon lord lose to a mere unnamed hideout leader? And asks if Red Eyes is actually still alive. Shim stretches his neck to see for himself, and says that thankfully, he missed all the vital parts so there's no need to worry about that. However, that man, Lee Mugen, used a Kai accumulation technique that he has never witnessed before. Which also begs the question, just what on earth is going on? In this bandit union tournament, a man in the shadows, with a smile on his face, which goes from a suspicious smile, to an evil glare. 
After the fight, the head hideout leader of the bandit union conjures up his kai into his palm in attempt to help Red Eyes and places it at the back of Red Eyes in other to help him with the flow of his own kai. His other disciples feels ashamed and useless as they watch their master perform Red Eyes' treatment. Few seconds later, Red Eyes tells his master that his body has become much better now. But this disgraceful disciple of his, Red Eyes, have no words to say to his master. One of the disciple calls to his master and ask him why he is personally proceeding with the Kai circulation instead of leaving it to them. He responds asking them what else could he do and say to them that all of them are lacking the Kai to spar properly so they are just all frail and more. There's no choice for this old vigorous master but to share his Kai. However, he asks them if they think that's the only reason he has and tells them that he had something to confirm for himself through the damaged Kai of Red Eyes. Red Eyes turns to look at him and asks if he means the identity of Mountain Deby Hideout Leader. This confuses Ghost Monarch. Red Eyes proceeds to say that he knows that it's embarrassing for him to say it. But soul pursuing Sanguine Blade, Lee Mugen, the Kai art that he had demonstrated in the spar, not only was it mystical, it was something quite frightening. Someone else adds that furthermore, it's the Mountain Deby Hideout, and it's been years since they have joined forces with the main hideout, which means that they wouldn't be clueless as to what meaning this tournament holds for the main hideout. And despite that, the way they stepped up themselves and defeated Red Eyes as if they had something to show everyone. This isn't a problem that should be overlooked so easily. So Ghost Monarch asks if the guy is trying to say that unless Lee Mugen has gone mad, he is purposefully trying to obstruct the Great Will of the Bandit Union. And Yingale adds that, if that's the case then it must mean that the Order of the Five Sects are scheming behind those bastards. And they must have started their own ploy to oppose them, the Bandit Union. But the guy says that it can't be the Order of the Five Sect, because to them, their justification is the highest priority, and that they wouldn't pick a fight with the Bandit Union through this dirty tactic. And the Bandit Union leader tells them that it's enough, saying to them that there is no need for further dispute. He's finally done with correcting Red Eyes Kai, and shows to his disciples the disruptive Kai that was hiding in Red Eyes. And they all marvel in fear. Yingale adds that, that's a venomous insect, asking if it's not a venomous spider. The Bandit Union leader says that these vermins that are oozing of insidious Kai can only come from one faction in the Mirim that controls those sorts of things, the Demonic Sect, and says that it seems that the Dark Spectral Sect haven't given up on their foolish dreams. Back in an unknown mountain, the Hundred-Head Demonic Leader, Luna Fairy Seeds as she awaits a report, and the Ten-Headed Demonic King, leader of the Masked Sect, reports to her that, according to the report, the Mixed Blood properly defeated Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord's Disciple. She smiles and asks about the remaining ten-headed demonic soldiers. So he proceeds to tell her that the remaining four of the ten-headed demonic soldiers will be participating as well. Nightfall at the Bandit Union Camp. Mountain Sando Hideout. Chilling Face Sword Master. Violent Gale Hideout Leader. He steps forth, and his subordinate asks him if he had just arrived. He stands in front of them with a giant boar in his hand. Actually, it's two giant boars in his hands. His name, Evil Spirit Butcher. East Lake Hideout. The leader can be seen chewing from the raw skin of the boars he had killed. His name, life-taking bloody palms. Yangtze River Hideout. The leader, his name, Yangtze Abomination. Those are the remaining four ten-headed demonic soldiers. Ten-headed master of the masked sect continues his report, asking the Luna Fairy if she doesn't think it's a giving that the soldiers took up the position of patrolling and guarding out of the ten available spots. The Luna Fairy gets excited as she says that it's already so fun just thinking about it, enough to make her want to see it in person. The ten-headed demonic soldiers, stomping on the twelve demonic kings. Back at the Bandit Union main hideout, Yingale, thinks the Dark Spectral Sect is trying to use the Bandit Union tournament to attack the Murim. Yingale says to his master that even killing these bastards is mercy, and asks him if they shouldn't do something immediately. He doesn't reply Yingale, but immediately remembers someone, Ryosi. He calls Ryosi and asks why he can't see Ryosi. And he is told that the young clan leader disappeared earlier during the tournament, so they don't know much. So he asks, what? What are you standing there for? Why don't you start looking for him? And they all rush out in search of him, just when the demonic sect are confirmed to be plotting something. Where did Ryosi go? At the Five Peak Tent, upon getting back, Chief Poon asks Tak if their hideout's position was this great in the bandit union, because they keep getting guests. It's the strange guy from earlier. Jiaka is shocked as well and asks the boy why the heck did he follow them all the way to their camp the tent, and Jiaka looks around, seeing lots of wine barrels. The guy tells Jiaka that he wouldn't be surprised if someone was poisoned to death. He smiles at Jiaka and asks him what else, and proceeds to say that after a fight between men, there are only two things that await them. The first one is, to keep fighting until one or both of them die. 
and he stops. But Chief Poon asks him what the second thing is, asking him why he made them curious and then stop. Still no reply from him. Chief Poon then tells Jaka that he thinks the guy is waiting for him to ask the question, and asks Jaka why he's just staring at the guy without saying anything, and tells Jaka that he looks scary. P.S. N.B. She's a woman but they all probably mistook her for a man because of her male dress up. Jaka sighs, and finally asks what the second thing is. She comes closer to Jaka, poking his chest, she says, so you're curious huh? Jaka answers her saying, yeah sure, even though he thinks she's annoying. She slapped the drink and say that would be the second thing. Out of nowhere, she picks up the big barrel and starts drinking directly from it, shocking Jaka and everyone else. She completes her sentence, saying that the second thing would be to share their stories over wine and become brothers. Jaka asks, become brothers? So he says that he does admit that out of the people he have recently met, she seems to be the most interesting one so far. But still, asking to become brothers is a little bit too much. Tak agrees, and says that something like that, as expected, they as big brother will need to settle this for him. Tak shouts at her, saying that despite this being their first meeting, she have been so direct about what she wants, and Poon adds that of course they too. He jumps out of excitement, saying that they too will welcome her with open arms, him and others holding on to barrel of wine. He says that it's been so long since they had a drink. And Imdal also says that it's so nice to see these drinks. Jaka goes crazy staring at them. So Chief Poon turns to Jaka and says to him, Jaka what are you standing around for? He's your guest. You ought to drink with him. The girl starts staggering so Kion helps her to a chair to sit down and feel comfortable. Jaka goes on with a smile. After being seated, she says, So you go by the name Jaka, huh? And asks for the names of her new brothers and sisters of the Green Forest. But Sobik is not having it right now. Kion turns to Sobik and asks her to get snacks for their guest, which she kindly obliged but suspects something about the guy. Drinks go round. The men cheers, and Poong says that the wine is really so damn fragrant, and with a suspicious look on Shim's face, he adds that the aftertaste has a rich and fragrant flavor. To put it in simple terms, he jumps out of excitement stating that this is a fucking awesome wine. The girl raises her drink and says that there's a ton of wine waiting, so let's drink through the night. Though Shim still worries, thinking, who on earth is he? He looks younger than 20 years old, and how is he able to bring so much expensive wine? But, he pours himself a drink. And as he drinks, he can't help but acknowledge how awesome the wine tastes. The men decide to pour out all the drinks, for it's not like they have any duels tomorrow. So they drink up. Meanwhile, at the same time, the twelve disciples are still searching for their young master, shouting master as they go. Out of nowhere, the bandit union leader appears in front of them, gives a killer look, and asks them if they still don't know Ryoshi's whereabouts. They apologize to the master and tell him that they are still looking. But there are lots of strongholds that are participating in this summit, and it will take a while to search through every single one of them. Yingale and one other run coming, shouting, Master, Master, I've found Ryoshi. Ghost Monarch asks if he's certain. Yingale replies, and says that the guy here, says that he followed her to the storage and gave her Hawagok wine. The master asks, Hawagok wine, and asks where she took it to. The guy then says that about that, it seems she's with the Five Peak Stronghold. The master looks and wonders, why the Five Peak Stronghold? So he says that he wonders why he have been hearing that name so often since he came here. Ghost Monarch doesn't know how to tell his master, but says it anyway, telling the master that if a spy of the demonic cult has infiltrated the green forest, wouldn't it be none other than the Five Peak Stronghold? The master fumes in anger as he thinks of the name. The Five Peak Stronghold. Ghost Monarch says to the master that if it is true that there exists a fraction of the demonic sect, the dark spectral sect, within the bandit union, then couldn't one of them be none other than those bastards at the mountain Wufeng hideout, and the master fumes, emanating some immense kai. So he says, so you're telling me that my only daughter is in the den of those demonic sect members. They look worried, and the ghost monarch tells him not to be too concerned, that since all the leaders of the bandit union have gathered in Wenan County here, the demonic sect can't be too rash in making their move. So the master asks him what he is trying to say. One of the disciple then says to him that even if it may be frustrating, he has to believe in the young clan leader and observe a bit more, adding that if word spread in the bandit union tournament that the master or one of the twelve demonic kings have laid their hands on one of the hideouts, then the main purpose of the bandit union tournament, which is held to uphold the status of the bandit union and secure its position, would be set completely off course. The master agrees, and says that it could be what the demonic sects are aiming for. But Yingale looks around and asks himself what's going on here because he knows that there's no way those fools. A flashback of Jiaka and people in Mountain Wufeng hideout, and of how ridiculous they are. He states that there's no way those fools could be spies of the Dark Spectral sect, and say to himself that it can't be possible, 
adding that the energies that they were letting out were closer to that of the Order faction instead. So he realizes that his senior, Ghost Shadow, must have hastily come to the wrong conclusion, since he didn't meet those idiots for himself. However, he thinks that if the senior were to misunderstand in that way, his thought is interrupted when the master calls him and asks him what his thoughts are as someone who has personally encountered them. Ingale sees this as a golden opportunity, so he tells his master that he too thinks that the first disciple brother's opinion are very reasonable. Ingale sees this as an opportunity to get rid of those pesky mountain Wufang hideout bastard without even lifting a finger. The master asks him why he thinks the first disciple brother opinion is reasonable. So he say that he has forgotten but there was something he remembered after hearing the words of his senior brother Red Eye. He says that it was a chilling energy beyond being mystical, and that even though he may have been drunk that day, he can still clearly remember the energy that bastard called Yon Jaka released. So Ghost Shadow says that if Yingale's words are true, then it would be best if they arrest those bastard right this instant. The master remains quiet as he thinks on what to do. And the first disciple says that Ghost Shadow is right, stating that if the Mountain Wufang hideout are confirmed as spies, then they must rescue the young clan leader right away. But Ghost Shadow tells them all to calm down for a bit. The disciple refuses and proceeds to ask Ghost Shadow what he means by calm down, stating that there could also be a possibility that they approached her whilst knowing her identity. Yingale looks at them arguing and says that the story is turning more and more ridiculous as it goes on. Wouldn't that be a huge problem? However, at that moment, the small doubt that the Ghost Shadow Lord had raised had ignited something in the Master, something that should not have been touched, not of the shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, Siok Muhi, but of the Father, Siok Muhi, his wrath. In terms of toughness of the spirit alone, he was said to be unmatched in the world, as the shattering Heaven's Demon Lord. But he too was an eternally benevolent father to his one and only daughter. To him, the safety of his daughter, Siok Ryoshi. To put it simply, her safety was reason enough to stir up conflict not only in the bandit union, but to call for an intensely bloody war in the whole Mirim. Sobik stands behind Ryoshi and say that this brother is really weak to alcohol, so she tries to wake her up, saying to the sleeping Ryoshi that she needs to know why her face makes her so mad, and asks her to wake up so that they can drink some more. Jiaka doesn't pay attention to them, because he senses something outside, so he goes to check, and there he sees a very bright purple light, from a distance, which appears to be the Kai emanating from the shattering heaven's demon lord. He just looks at it and sips his wine. The shattering heaven's demonic lord, Siok Mui tries to hold his anger in, and Ghost Monarch asks him if he wants him to go and bring the young kids right away, and tells him to just give the order and he'll bring her, even if he has to beat up those guys to do so. But Siok Mui calls him a foolish bastard, and asks him if he's telling him to play right into their hands. Ghost Shadow apologizes to his master, saying that he wasn't thinking that far, so his master asks him to just check if his daughter is safe and that he would be heading back now. But Ghost Monarch still insists on asking if it's okay to leave the young clan leader. The master thinks on it, and remembers that if they haven't done anything to Ryoshi, it'll just seem like they attacked the bandit union members simply out of suspicion. So he turns to Ghost Monarch and asks him if he doesn't get it, stating that no matter which hideout the demonic sect have infiltrated in whatever they are plotting, their target is this stage of the bandit union tournament. He adds that those bastards will probably move more aggressively now. They will be using demonic arts and bearing their fangs, and if they defeat the twelve demon kings with that strength, the bandit union name will be tarnished immensely. On top of that, if word gets out that they attacked any bandit union without any proper reason, no mountain hideout will trust in them, and the unity and authority of the bandit union would fall to rock bottom, and asks him if he doesn't get what the most important thing to do right now is. So, he tells them that the most important thing to do right now is to do things that will help increase the prestige of the bandit union which means he's saying that he won't forgive any more loss, and they must all win. Using whatever means possible, they have to win. And so he heads back. The disciples discuss amongst themselves, and one say that he's still worried about one thing, which is, what are they going to do if Mountain Wufeng does not participate in the match? And Ghost Monarch asks him what he means. Yingale thinks about it and he realizes that they might actually not participate because of what he told them. And the disciple says to the first disciple, Ghost Monarch, that it might just be a guy feeling. But he remembers that those guys from Wufeng hideout were acting like they had come sightseeing, regardless of who won and who lost. He adds that the suspects must have been aiming for the position of guardian when they participated in the match. However, those bastards from Mountain Wufeng haven't even participated yet, and yet somehow they got into contact with the little clan leader who wasn't even at the tournament stage at first. So one other disciple asks him if he's saying that they might have an alternative motive. He replies, saying that he is not sure, but he knows one thing is sure, which is that if Mountain Wufang Hideout does not participate in the match, it will be hard to collect evidence that they are using demonic arts. After hearing this, Yingdale thinks on it, 
and states that it's true even if they participate. There's no way they'd use demonic art. Now he realizes that he didn't think this through. Because if they don't use demonic art, his lie will be revealed for what it is. Ghost Monarch shouts angrily that if the most suspicious ones won't participate, then what other way is there? Yingale thinks this whole thing is fucked up now, because he thought he'd be able to reap the reward without working for it. But now things just got more complicated. Meanwhile, at the camping site, Drunk Pung sings, How sweet the alcohol is. Tasty alcohol that goes down smoothly. Pung is so happily drunk saying that the alcohol tasted exquisite, so even its effects are luxurious and he's glad that he got to taste such precious liquor, adding that truly, the Bandit Union tournament is great, but begins to wonder which mountain hideout could that guy be from, to bring so much of this precious liquor, and says that he's so jealous. Some guys hiding in the bush, watches Pung as he sings and dance alone, so they say that he changed his cloth but they are sure he was the guy from before and they get excited that he just happens to be drunk. It's the Red Sand Hideout Leader. He says things just got a lot easier since no one else seems to be around, so he orders his guys to begin. They move in understanding their assignment. So, as they run towards Poom, he looks at them, but doesn't understand why some strange guys are running towards him. As they get closer to him, they pour sand in his eyes, and both goes forward to attack drunk Pung. Pung Yoncho who asks, Who are you bastards? Jaka still drinking inside, says that he thinks he just heard the Hunam's voice but isn't sure. And Ryoshi suddenly wakes up shouting, Who are you calling drunk? I can still drink more. And as Jaka sips his wine he hopes all is fine with his Hyunam. Meanwhile outside, the assault against Poong continues, and he's too drunk to react so he gets hit by those bandits. As Poong falls to the ground, they say to themselves that this is a piece of cake, but the Red Sand hideout leader tells them not to let their guard down, and tells them that it will be bad if the young bandit pops out because of their noise. One of them say to him that the young bandit must also be drunk, so he says that they should just beat them up as they come out one by one. But Red Sand hideout leader Hayek tells him that he won't be saying such nonsense if he had been on the receiving end of the young bandit's fist, and says that for now, they just need to take Poong somewhere quiet, and knocks Poong out. Jiaka finally steps out. They take Pong Yoncho into the mountains, by a little stream, and says that the spot will be fine. Then one of the guys almost drowned Poong, but Hayek tells him that it wouldn't be any fun if Poong dies before they get started, asking him to bring him out. So he oblige, and pulls Poong head out of the water. Hayek laughs and the guy that almost drowned Poong, calls Hayek Hyunim, and say to him that Poong looks like a rat that survived after helplessly drowning in the water. Poong also laugh and says that he was wondering who was kind enough to sober him by washing his face and even pressing his meridian. He looks at them and says, so it was our brothers from the Red Sand hideout. The guy gets pissed and is about to smash Poong's head to the ground. He asks Poong if he dares call them brothers after humiliating their big brother like that. Poong takes a deep breath and says, oh well, and immediately gets up, readies his fist, and moves so fast, delivering a powerful punch to the guy's face, before the guy could even land his kick, which sends him flying and rolling on the ground, leaving Hayuk and the other in shock, as the guy fall, so Poong tells them that he is all sobered up now thanks to them, so he calls to the Red Sand hideout leader and asks him if he's doing this because he got hit few times by his brother, Hayuk angrily asks him if he still don't get it, so he tells Poong that there's a hierarchy even within the Bandit Union, and proceeds to tell him that Mountain Wufeng Hideout is a newly added member of the Bandit Union, and ask him if he doesn't know that he is the lowest among the lowest Mountain Hideout, and being the lowest, he dared do such a thing to their Red Sand Hideout. Poong tells him that he didn't know that, but adds that it was such a long explanation, so he tells them to go and call upon the one who did it if they want to serve some punishment, asking why they are doing this to him instead, when he had nothing to do with it. Hayek angrily stutters, saying that the hideout leader is also responsible. Poong smiles, and asks them if they came for him because they are scared of Jiaka, thinking that he would be an easy target. But this infuriates Hayek even more so he shouts at Poong, asking him if he has lost all fear, and asks him if he also thinks he has made something of himself by standing behind his skilled brother. Poong responds, and says, So basically, it's true that you think I'm an easy target for you. Hayek gets confused and wonders what's wrong with Poong. He thought Poong was just a bumbling fool because he just kept smiling. But now he see that Poong got quite the spirit, and Poong tells them that he is going to change their minds now. The Red Sand hideout leader subordinate moves backwards and tells his Hunam that he doesn't have a good feeling about this, but Hayek tells him not to be scared because he thinks Poong is just bluffing. So Poong shouts, asking them if they won't come at him. Hayek also gets fired up, charges in and calls Poong an insolent brat, asking him who he thinks he is bluffing to. He jumps up to attack, and Poong gets pissed that the guy still thinks he is bluffing, but states that he can't use his sword techniques without a weapon after all. However, his leg hits a big rock, 
so he decides to attack with the rock. He lifts up the huge rock and says to Hayek that he is not so weak that he'll loose against the like of bastards like him. The thing Yon Jiaka talked about before, things besides martial arts that Peng Yoncho possesses. Among those things, one is probably strength granted by the heavens. Yoncho lunches the rock, using a technique called, Divine Spirits. The massive rock goes straight for Hayek's subordinate, crushing him to the ground. Now Peng Yoncho says that it's only one person left out of the initial three. Hayek thinks, fuck this is bad. So Peng Yoncho asks Hayek if he still thinks he is an easy opponent or he wants him to go a little more crazy. Hayek immediately hides his axe and begs Peng Yoncho, saying, No, no way, I think there's been a misunderstanding. And wonders why there are so many monsters in that damn mountain Wufeng hideout, stating that he threw that big rock as if it were a tiny stone. He is about to tell Peng Yoncho a false reason for bringing him out here. Peng pays attention. But they are interrupted by someone who has been watching from above. This person says, Oh my, I somehow got to witness such a fun scene. He adds that he should be reprimanding them for having a fight somewhere besides the tournament ground. But since he got to see the mountain Wufeng leader great skills, he says that he will generously overlook this. Peng Yoncho is confused because he doesn't know who that is, and Hayek asks the guy why he is in a place like this. The direct disciple of the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, one of the twelve demonic kings, the Ghost Shadow Lord. So he asks Peng Yoncho how he managed to gain such impressive divine spirit, and Peng Yoncho casually tells him that it's nothing like that and that he was just born with a sturdier and healthier body than most. Ghost Shadow Lord laughs at Peng, telling him that his excuse is much worse than he was expecting. So he fumes and tells Peng Yoncho that he can't overlook the fact that he is sensing such wicked energy though. Peng Yoncho gets scared, and asks, pardon? And before anything else could happen, he attacks Peng Yoncho, and all we can see are rocks covered with blood going down the stream. The next day, it's raining, and the last day of the Bandit Union Tournament. The manager of the tournament says that since it's such a special occasion, he asks which of them from the mountain hideouts will be the heroes who will showcase the dignity of the bandit union here. The first two, and then the other two of the demonic sect spy, who are all hideout leaders if different mountain hideouts, jump into the ring, and people from the crowd are shocked that four mountain hideout leaders jump in at once. Even the manager and the twelve disciples are shocked. The first guy introduces himself as Mountain Sando Hideout Leader Chilling Face Sword Master and says that he would like to say something if they don't mind. With a hideous smile on his face, he says that no matter how hard they try, unknown hideouts like them could never become the dignity of the bandit union. With that stupid smile on his face, he and the others smile. And finally, he asks the bandit union leader if him and his guys could become the dignity of the bandit union here in the Murim. So the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord asks them if they are saying that they are the ones who knows how to spread the dignity of this bandit union tournament. And Chilling Face Swordmaster responds, saying, Yes, of course. So he asks the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord what he thinks about letting his great twelve disciples, the twelve demonic kings, use their art of the Dark Heaven Asura scriptures against the four of them. Ghost Shadow Lord looks pissed as he realizes that it was these guys. This is the dirty group from the demonic sect that infiltrated their bandit union and realizes that this was their intention for coming to this tournament. Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord, Sok Mugi, says to them, What a roundabout way of saying you want to make a challenge. At the same time, in the mountains, the Five Peak goes in search of their chief, Peng Yoncho. All of them search, shouting, Where are you? Tak is really worried as he states that Chief Peng never misses breakfast, no matter what happens. But it's already afternoon now, so he wonders where Peng Yoncho could be. Jiaka also shouts at the top of his voice calling to his human and says to himself that he should have gone out to look for him even if it was early dawn. So he gets angry at himself, and blames himself for being too relaxed thinking nothing would happen since their hideout wasn't participating in the tournament. And as they keep searching, Ryoshi notices someone behind a tree. So she shouts, who's there? Which draws the attention of Jiaka and the rest. It's Hayek, the leader of Red Sand Mountain Hideout, who tries to wake his comrades, shouting, you bastards wake up already. Tak and the rest immediately runs to get them. So Hayek leaves his passed out subordinate and tries to flee on his own. But Jaka isn't having any of it. So he jumps and sends a slashing attack infused with Kai in front of Hayek. Cutting through a tree beside Hayek which makes him fall to the ground and the rest of them rush to grab him. As they get close to him, they realize that he is the Red Sand hideout leader. He fakes a laugh, telling them that he ran away thinking that it was a tiger. And lie that he is happy to see that it's the Mountain Wufeng hideout guys. His passes out comrades. Shim asks him what he is doing near their camp and ask him if he hurt their hideout leader. Shim ask him one more time if he tried taking his anger out on their hideout leader, thinking he'd be an easy target since he couldn't stand a chance against the one who defeated him. Jaka gets furious and tries to cut Hayek for daring to lay his hands on their human. Hayek immediately shouts, lay hands on what? 
We are the ones who almost died at his hand. But Jaka doesn't want to hear anything and tries to cut him down. Scared for his life, he moves away from the attack shouting blood, saying to all of them that their chief must have lost a lot of blood by now. So he tells them that their chief's life could be in danger, telling them to hurry up and go find him. So they all rush to find him under the rain. They notice blood down the stream, tracing the blood. They locate him and rush towards him, with all of them angry. We see Chief Peng Yuncho passed out, floating. They quickly surround him, shouting his name in attempt to wake him up, but with no response from him. They check his pulse and notes that he's still breathing, although it's quite faint, they decide to move him quickly. We can all see Jiaka behind, filled with rage, so he tells them that he'll leave the chief to them. But as for right now, a flashback of when Red Sand Hideout leader told them who did this to their leader, which is none other than Hayek before telling them who did it, gets a flashback of how it happened that night. Also when Ghost Shadow told him that if any one of Peng Yoncho hideout members asks who did it, he should tell them that it was him, Ghost Shadow Lord, one of the twelve demonic kings of the Great Bandit Union, and that he'll be waiting at the tournament stage tomorrow. So Jiaka tells them that for now, he has someone that he needs to meet. Last night, the eldest of the twelve demonic king, the Ghost Shadow Lord, was worried after finding out that the demonic sex men had infiltrated far into the ranks of the Bandit Union, so he wonders just how much could they have learned. But if things went wrong, all the trust and unity that the bandit union has built up could be destroyed. Thus he was very wary of doubting the Mountain Wufeng hideout, despite the other twelve demon kings suspecting them. However, as he coincidentally came across the fight between the Red Sand hideout and Peng Yoncho, he became certain. He remember Yingale telling him that the Mountain Wufeng hideout skills were worthless when they first accepted them into the bandit union, even though it feels wrong to say they thought that the hideout would disappear soon. But when he met them again, they seemed like completely different people. That he couldn't believe that their aura changed so much in such a short span of time. And as he watched Peng Yoncho fight, compared to what Yingale told him, it has only been just one year. So he states that even if they were taught the Dark Heaven Asura scripture, it should be difficult to achieve this much in that short frame. For a guy who used the skill like the Heaven Earth Blade technique to get this strong, there's only one way. So he goes straight for the kill. The Ghost Shadow Lord couldn't have realized that the Ten Wufeng elites learned a rare martial art called the Nine Heavens World Technique from Yon Jiaka. It was understandable for him to be suspicious of the situation. However, that small misunderstanding became the root cause that could call for the destruction of the Bandit Union. Under the rainy clouds, Ryoshi runs back to the arena and wonders why Lord Ghost Shadow would attack the Mountain Wufeng hideout, asking herself if he misunderstood the situation because she went to Mountain Wufeng hideout without saying anything. And if that's the case she hopes to be able to resolve it, but still wonders why someone as meticulous as him choose to use such an extreme method at such an important time during the Bandit Union tournament. The moment Ryoshi entered the tournament arena, she could somewhat understand the reason. The twelve disciples of the Shattering Heaven's Demonic King were being completely annihilated by the demonic sect soldiers. Sense of danger is a technique one of them uses to pound one of the twelve disciple. This thing doesn't simply end at the loss of the disciples of the twelve demonic kings but also shook the foothold of the bandit union itself. These guys are using their demonic art to crush the twelve disciples of the Shattering Heaven's demonic lord. Even their speed were unmatched, as they are able to unleash attacks with ease, attacks that the demonic kings could not predict nor deflect. The battle goes on, and the twelve demonic kings are loosing badly. One of the demonic sect, and one of the disciple, both clash in battle, but the disciple is overpowered, and sent flying, smashed into the wall. Also, one of the big shots of the Murin, the Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord, members of the Bandit Union whose masters are winning the tournament, cluelessly praise their master, with some shouting, you're the best, and others shouting, you're the true protagonist of this Bandit Union tournament. The remaining disciples who haven't participated in the fight gets really pissed, saying that those bastards are acting so full of themselves. It was a great disaster. Ryoshi watches the defeated disciple as he tries to get back up on his feet, but falls back to the ground. However, she wonders what this situation have to do with the Mountain Wufeng hideout. Ghost Shadow Lord questions if the skills of the Dark Spectral Sect was this great. As Jaka steps in, he asks what all the cheering is for, and says that being so fucking loud makes him want to kill everyone, and Ryoshi could feel the, the pressure from Jaka's bloodlust. She quickly turns and is surprised to see that Jaka really came, so she asks to calm down, because they haven't even confirmed if the Red Sand hideout leader was telling the truth. But Jaka tells her that if she doesn't stop getting in his way, she'll be the first one he gets rid of. So she immediately excuses him and stare as he walk past her. As he climbs onto the arena, the four demonic sect soldiers also stare and wonder what a young brat like him is doing here. Even the clueless bandit members of the hideouts complain. 
asking what's with Jiaka, saying that it's time for their hideout leader to shine, and asking who he thinks he is for interfering like that. So they throw little rocks at him, asking him to get lost. He doesn't pay any attention to them at first, but this infuriates him, because they are just making more noise in his ears. So in an attempt to block the rocks from hitting him, he swings his sword with some Kai energy infused in it, and this was more than enough to defeat all four of the demonic sect soldiers, which sends them all flying, crashing into each other, and heavily onto the walls of the arena. Jaka stands angry with immense aura covering his entire body. This leaves Ryoshi dumbfounded as she can't believe this is how strong Jaka is. Even the twelve disciples could not believe what they just witnessed. The four demonic sex soldiers are concussed and in severe pain, because of the force at which they hit the ground. So their subordinate rushed to attend to them. We can see a massive hole in the wall of the arena caused from the crash of the four demonic sect soldiers. And Jaka still doesn't look in that direction. So he asks shouting, Who is the ghost shadow lord? With no reply from anyone. And for the second time, he shouts, asking, Which of you bastards is it? Come out right now. Ghost shadow lord gets furious and slams the chair, saying that Jaka must be crazy for making such a scene in an important place as this. So he announces that the spies of the demonic sects that were hiding themselves throughout the Bandit Union tournament have finally showed up. Ryoshi questions what he just said, because she couldn't sense any demonic energy from the Mountain Wufeng hideout. So she questions what Sir Ghost Shadow is talking about. Ghost Shadow Lord speaks with pride, telling Jaka that he is the one who invited him, and says to him that he will have him pay for interrupting the Bandit Union tournament held by Master with his life. Jaka doesn't waste a second and jumps in for the kill, moving way too fast. And Ghost Shadow gets scared as Jaka is about to strike him, but he dodges the attack which makes Jaka hit the ground instead. Ghost Shadow unsheathes his sword and leaps backward because Jaka doesn't stop attacking. Jiaka's strength scares him and he thinks that for someone to attain this level of strength at such a young age, then it must be exactly as he had suspected, which is that they are probably affiliated with the demonic sect. Siakmuhi begins to watch the fight closely and has something in mind. Jiaka continues to destroy the grounds of the arena because Ghost Shadow Lord continues to dodge all of his attacks, but Jiaka doesn't stop and continues his aggressive attacks because he doesn't care how many times Ghost Shadow dodges his attack. Ghost Shadow dodges Jaka's attack once more, and says that even if Jaka is affiliated with the demonic spectral sect, even so, he says that Jaka can jump around all he wants, because he has received the teachings of the Dark Heavens Asura scriptures passed down by his master. So he dodges Jaka's attack once more, and jumps high above the arena, and prepares to use his Dark Heavens Asura scripture teaching to annihilate Jaka at once, and says to Jaka that he is no more than a little kid swinging around his sword to him. He sends his most powerful attack to Jaka, using his Ghost Shadow Soul Separating Sword technique. He aims to end the fight with one single hit, and people from the crowd are excited to see this, for it is the Heavenly Sword. And the other disciples are also shocked to see that first brother Ghost Shadow would use his Heavenly Sword, and Yingale states that it's one of the strongest ultimate techniques in all of the Murin, adding that no one has ever survived a direct hit of that attack. So he says that it's over for that arrogant brat now. And Jaka takes a direct hit even though he tries to block the attack. Jaka is having troubles blocking the attack and gets really pissed. With a cocky smile on Ghost Shadow Lord face, he asks Jaka if he is already having trouble over something like this. So he increased the pressure of the attack to its max, which sends Jaka falling back down onto the ground. Jaka is hit really hard and falls down to the ground with a heavy bang. The force from the bang was so loud it was able to send people to close flying backwards. Yoshi shouts. Asking Lord Ghost Shadow to please stop now. But he responds, I can't do that now, young clan leader. And continues to send the powerful attack in an attempt to finish off Jiaka. After his attack he land at a safe distance from the big bang caused from his attack. And watch closely. As the smoke clears out from the arena, he begins to shout. Asking Jaka to reveal his identity and his mountain hideout. And he's about to tell Jaka that if he does so, he'll spare his life. But he is interrupted by Jaka, who stands there asking Ghost Shadow Lord if that's all. He takes his battle stance and asks Lord Ghost Shadow if that shit is all he wanted to do. And Ryoshi is filled with so much shock to see that Jaka blocked Lord Ghost Shadow's attack with just a single sword. The Shattering Heaven's Demonic King says that although the martial art of Lord Ghost Shadow isn't at his level, he is still considered to be among the top two strongest members in the Bandit Union tournament, and that there shouldn't be anyone capable of blocking that technique besides one of the ten greatest strongest in the Murim like himself. Ryoshi wonders, Yon Jaka and the Mountain Wufeng hideout. Just who are they? Jaka says to Ghost Shadow that he was talking big about this heavenly sword or whatever, so he was wondering how strong it could be. And finally ask if this is the pathetic skill that he used to hurt their human. With fear in Lord Ghost Shadow eyes, he wonders what this unbelievable Kai flow from Jaka is. On top of that, 
rather than the aura of the demonic sect. This is, and as he stands there thinking and wondering what Jaka is, Jiaka appears before him, about to cut him down with his sword, and tells him that so he's got time to get distracted. He delivers the attack, but Ghost Shadow barely manages to dodge it once more. Now, Jaka calms down, because he realizes that if he keeps rushing and out of anger, Ghost Shadow will keep dodging. So he says to him, Oi, Ajasi, you are going to have to prepare yourself. With a killer look on Jaka's face, he says to Ghost Shadow that he is going to make sure that he pays the price for hurting their big human, which makes Lord Ghost Shadow fear for what's about to come. The arena, smoking from all of the fights up till now, Ghost Shadow shouts at asking him to reveal his identity and that of his mountain hideout, telling him that if he does, he's about to say that he'll spare life. But he gets speechless and dumbfounded, because, as the smoke clear, Giaka stands unharmed and asks, Is that all? And asks once more, saying, I asked if that shit is what you wanted to do. Yoshi can't believe her eyes, because Jaka just blocked Lord Ghost Shadow's heavenly sword with just a single sword. From the fight in the forest alone, she could already tell that Jaka would be quite strong, but still, she wonder how possible it is for a mere mountain hideout member to block Sir Ghost Shadow heavenly sword. It makes no sense, adding that this isn't just a small issue limited to the bandit union. If this gets out to the hole of the Murim, it will cause a huge problem. Jiaka begins his attack, Nine Heavens World Technique, fourth phase, rotating his blade so fast, it creates a vortex that's trying to suck Lord Ghost Shadow. Even Ghost Shadow's heavenly sword energy is being sucked by this vortex. This worries Yingale because it's also pulling everyone close. Jiaka releases a powerful strike or fire, followed by a strike of disaster, and disastrous strike, which Lord Ghost Shadow finds difficult to block. The fight continues and the immense energy from the fight goes towards the crowd and the director have to shout for everyone to try and avoid being hit by the Kai. It hit the crowd and some try to avoid it but it still hit them. One of the four demonic soldiers looks very displeased about this, because they are supposed to be the protagonist of the finale, but it's ruined all because of Jaka. Looking at the fight go on, he still questions what kind of monstrous strength Jaka has. Lord Ghost Shadow is caught by Jaka's Kai flow and he can't move. As he stands hooked by Jaka's Kai, he gets scared. Jaka poses for a powerful single attack and sends a single and swift slash, injuring Lord Ghost Shadow badly, causing him severe pain, and sending him flying across the arena. Lord Ghost Shadow passes out as he hits the walls of the arena, but is instantly woken up from internal bleeding. As he cough, he wonder what is happening to him right now, and Jaka comes for the kill, but Lord Ghost Shadow manages to get away in the nick of time. But before he lands, he is met by Jaka midair, who asks him if he thinks that's all. So Jaka lands another powerful attack, and Lord Ghost Shadow manages to dodge it, fearing for his life. Still trying to get away from Jaka's attacking range, Jaka appears behind him with a powerful kick, smashing his skull to the ground, causing Lord Ghost Shadow to bleed out and pass out again, while Jaka stands furious behind him. Jaka then asks him to get up. Lord Ghost Shadow wakes up and Jaka says to him that he guessed that's all the strength he had, huh, Anjasi, telling Lord Ghost Shadow that it's looking a lot different from when he boldly picked a fight with him. Lord Ghost Shadow then tells Jaka to hurry up and kill him if that's what he wants, and pridefully tells Jaka to not expect him to beg for his life to be spared, and he shouldn't expect an apology either. Jaka gracefully tells him that he will be doing just that. He raises his sword to deliver the final blow, and tells Lord Ghost Shadow that he will be doing just that even without him asking. Ryoshi begs Jaka, asking him to please stop, but at that moment, an attack is sent towards Jaka from outside the ring. This single attack is powerful enough to cut deep through the ground goes to hit Jaka, which he sees and readies himself to block, and easily deflects the attack without even trying, and gives a fierce look to the person that sent it. It's the shattering heaven-destroying demon lord. Meanwhile, near the tournament stage, Chief Poong who is still coughing blood, asks if they are still not there. Vice Chief Tak tells him that they are on their way, and asks him to stop talking. One of the ten brothers tell Tak that they need to look for a doctor first, even if Big Hunam asked them to do this, asking Tak if it's really okay to go to the tournament stage. But Keon replies, telling him that whether it's the doctors or anyone else, everyone should be at the tournament stage right now. So she asks that they do as the chief has said and hurry. Shim doesn't say anything because he knows why the chief asks them to bring him to the tournament stage. Upon getting there, Shim wonder, what the heck, and says, damn it, looks like something big has already happened. An attack is sent towards Jaka from outside the ring, and goes to hit Jaka. But Jaka easily blocks it, and gives a furious look to the person that sent the attack. It's the shattering heavens destroying demon lord. People in the crowd are shocked to see him get involved, and Ryoshi thinks this is so fucked up if her father gets involved. The director then announces that it's the shattering heavens demon lord, 
The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord has taken the stage. One of the twelve disciples of the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord asks Yingale if their master is about to face that young punk himself. That's right, until that point, Yonjaka had been nothing but a bandit who could wield the sword well. But one of the great's experts, the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, showed up at the tournament stage to face off against someone like him. Small misunderstandings and wrong assumptions pulled up, just like the small flapping wings of a butterfly that bring about hurricane. This problem got way too big. Yonjaka and the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, the scene of their fight, went on to be remembered as a legend in the Bandit Union's history in the future, with many stories spun from its web. Still raining, the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord calls Yonjaka and asks him if he got the name right, and says, I don't know what your reason is for doing this, but I think that's enough, so why don't you stop right about here? Telling Jaka that the relationship between a teacher and disciple is not too far from that of a parent and child, Balord Ghost Shadow cowardly sits up and calls, Master. So the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord tells Jaka that if he insists on taking Ghost Shadow's life, he'll have no choice but to get involved. Jaka thinks this is funny, and says to him, The loyalty between teacher and disciple, is that what this is? And says that they were saying the bandit union is all part of one big family. So in the end, the ones closer to you are more important. So he asks the shattering heavens demon lord, if he knows that. The ones who laid hands on his family first, was his member. With a furious look, shattering heavens demon lord calls Jaka a brat, and tells him that no matter how young and ignorant he may be, he is quite insolent, not even showing him respect. So he asks Jaka if he knows who he's talking to, and tells Jaka that he is one of the greatest experts, the head hideout leader of the bandit union and the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord. But Jaka doesn't give a shit, and tells Shattering Heavens Demon Lord that he doesn't need to know all that, and that he better move out of the way, because he's planning on cutting down anyone who stands in his way. Shattering Heavens Demon Lord is disappointed because in the end, all their talk was useless. He proceeds to unsheathe his sword, and stands ready to do battle. Jaka jumps in to attack. Using the Nine Heavens World Technique second phase, Splendid Dragon above the heavens, Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, stands unfazed and tells Jaka that he'll gladly take him on. He stamps his foot on the ground, and, immediately uses his own technique, Dark Heaven Asura True Spirit, and also goes straight to attack. They both clash swords, and they both give each other a fierce glare. The fight continues, and they seem to be fighting on equal grounds. They move so fast and strike each other with so much force, the arena gets damaged with each strike and the shockwaves from their strikes reaches as far as where Yingale and the other disciples stay. Ryoshi who's closer to the stage can barely stand on her feet. Jiaka realizes that his opponent is strong, and a few times stronger than the Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai. The Shattering Heaven's Demon Lord smiles, and furiously asks Jaka if he's already struggling with just that. He increases the strength of his attacks, and blasts Jaka away, sending him flying, which makes Ryoshi call out to Jaka for she worries he might have been hurt. The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord's attack sends Jaka flying and crashing into the walls of the arena. Jaka sits there still holding onto his sword, smoking out. Shattering Heavens Demon Lord stares at Jaka from the distance. He notes that he already figured just from Jaka's fight with Ghost Shadow that Jaka's aura doesn't belong to the demonic sect. However, it's still strange to call it one from the seven sects and two schools, which leaves him with a question of just what was that aura, a strength never before witnessed even by him. So he says that Jaka's Kai is worth working on. Yingale and the rest get excited, and Yingale says, That's right, the likes of him could never stand a chance against Master. Jaka breathes heavily as he gets back on his feet, jumps back into the stage. Realizing that his opponent is strong, he states that he might not be able to defeat him. However, he's going to keep going. He readies his feet on the ground and goes in for a ferocious attack. The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord sees a bright light from Jaka, which makes him wonder. Jaka uses the Nine Heavens World technique. 8 Phase, 9 Dragon Body Reversal. Everyone seeing this gets scared. Jiaka goes in with this monstrous attack, shouting with might as he goes, ah. As the attack comes near the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, he dodges it by jumping away. The attack causes a massive explosion. Still, he jumps once more from the attack and explosions, soaring high in the sky, wondering what kind of power this is. But, Jiaka doesn't stop. He sees that the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord has dodged to a higher ground. Still so furious, he asks the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord where he thinks he is going. So he sends the attack with an even more powerful force to meet the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord up in the sky, with no place to run or dodge anymore. Yingale and the Disciple fear for their master, even people in the crowd. The director gets worried and shouts, head hideout leader. Yoshi also worry for her dad and shouts, father. 
The shattering heavens demon lord smiles and says, To not even show an ounce of fear against the leader of the bandit union, gotta say, I do like that bravery of yours. And finally says, Then, I will follow your lead, and put my all into this fight. He shouts back as he releases massive amount of aura, and, he uses his ultimate technique, Dark Heaven Asura, Great Being. Yoshi recognizes the technique. It is the bandit union's secret technique, True Spirit. With all his might, he shouts, going with his own powerful attack, the Dark Heaven Asura, Great Being. And the Nine Heavens World Technique, Nine Dragon Body Reversal. With all of Jaka's might, he shouts really loud, going with his full might to fight. The Flame Dragon and Great Being do battle up in the sky, which comes as an unbelievable event to the bandits, leaving them terrified yet amazed. The fight continues above ground, with the mighty clashes of swords, sending shock waves across the arena. Among all the opponents Yon Jaka have faced, since he mastered martial arts, has there ever been anyone as strong as the Shattering Demon Lord? He wonder, because this is his toughest battle ever. The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord gets excited fighting and tells Yon Jaka that he's impressive, very very impressive. Hearing this, Jaka gets offended, but wonder how the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord is still fine after that attack. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lords continues, telling Jaka that if it was anyone else here but himself, it would be near impossible to withstand that attack. However he says, as he smiles to Yon Jaka in preparation to unleash an attack, there's always bound to be someone at a higher ground than you. A sense of doubt hits Jaka, and he is struck by the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, which he barely blocked at the last second. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord tells him that, that indiscriminate confidence and the strength to uphold it, reminds him of his younger self. Their swords clash in. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord closes the distance between himself and Yon Jaka and tells Jaka to his face that, that's why, he's really starting to like him. This infuriates Jaka, Sasha shouts, asking the Shattering Demonic Lord what all this bullshit is, and tells him to just hand over the bastard who attacked his big human. But the Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord smile, and says, alright, and hits Jaka by the shoulder, telling him that he doesn't think that there's any need in duking this out any further, and says, however, we should still finish our talk. At an immense speed, he drags himself and Yon Jaka back to the ground, since they've been fighting above ground. Speed so fast, the bandits can barely see them fall. They can only see a very bright light with the color of the Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord aura as it descends from the sky at super speed and hit the arena with immense force, causing a huge explosion. And the waves from that explosion forces bandits in the audience off their seats, and they try to block away from the blinding light. Light so bright and waves so powerful. It spreads far far into the forest surrounding the arena, scaring the earth, and leaving massive clouds of dust and smoke behind. Despite all that, both swords still remains against each other. As it appears, both fighters landed on their feet and still in battle stance, with Yon Jaka still really mad, and shattering Heaven's Demon Lord excited. Jaka still really pissed, goes for the first strike, calling the shattering Heaven's Demon Lord a bastard. But the shattering Heaven's Demon Lord blocks Jaka's attack and is about to engage in battle, but, suddenly, Shim jumps into the arena with Chief Pung on his back, who shouts, Stop now! And Jaka wonders who that could be. Shim carefully lands on the ground because of the wounded Pung on his back, so Chief Pung tells Jaka that he thinks Jaka has done enough, and tries really hard to put up a smile for Jaka, calls his name. Jaka, filled with joy, almost bursting into tears, calls the chief, hewing him. The chief then tells Jaka to look and see that he's fine, so asks Jaka to stop fighting already. Shim interrupts, shouting at the remaining brothers, asking them if there's really no one around that it must be him to carry Pung. But they all hype him, saying, You're the best old man Shim, I knew you could do it. Jaka still can't believe his eyes, calls out, Chief. Then the Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord hits Jaka's sword away and asks him what he's waiting for. Jaka looks confused and doesn't understand, so the Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord smiles and tells Jaka to get going already. Jaka stares at him for a while and takes off without saying a word. Rushing towards his Hyungnam, he shouts, Chief. And Chief Poon gets down from Shim's back and tries to stand on his own. Jaka gets to him and asks him if he's okay telling him that the slash wound is pretty deep and that he shouldn't be moving. But the chief smiles and tells Jaka not to worry and asks him if he has forgotten who he is. So he says to Jaka that he is the great Poon Yoncho and adds that this kind of wound is just superficial for him. He tells Jaka that his slash wound is totally fine and that he didn't know what Lord Shadow was thinking, but he didn't strike his vital points. Lord Shadow, who is already up, gives a confusing look. Suddenly, Jaka furiously turns towards Lord Shadow, shouting, I knew it, I must kill that bastard. But Pung Yuncho holds him down, calling out his name, and telling him that it wouldn't be right for them to create any more commotion at the Green Forest Grand Summit. So he asks that they think about what to do after hearing their side of the story. 
and says that he's sure they have their reasons. Jaka still mad angry, furiously asks Chief Poon what there is to talk about, telling Chief Poon that he almost died because of Lord Shadow. He continues, and stutters as he tells the chief that he thought he might not make it, but the chief immediately calms Jaka by laying his hand on Jaka's head. He playfully calls Jaka a rascal, and says, I thought you were already all grown up, but I guess you're still just a kid. With a warm voice, he tells Jaka that he's really okay. Tears start to drop from Jaka's eyes. The chief tells Jaka to calm down and go back. Things get emotional, with Sobi tearing up, Kion calling the chief calmly and Tak giving a smirk look. The shattering heaven's demonic lords then calls to the director of the tournament. Instantly the guy knows what to do. So he announces that with this, the Green Forest Summit has ended, but most of the bandits in the arena have already passed out from the waves and explosion caused from all the fights. The arena is already totally destroyed, as if the summit could carry on. Even if they tried, it wouldn't be possible. Yoshi feels relieved as she holds her chest. She says, Ah, oh, my heart? Seriously. Yoshi's thoughts. We got lucky since father interfered halfway and settled the situation somehow, but Jockey. To think you were able to fight on par with father's dark heaven Asura arts, you're no ordinary man for sure. She blushed really hard as she adds that. She has never seen anyone like him that she feels so much respect and excitement for. She is caught blushing by her father who calls her name, Ryoshi, which startles her. So she tries to play it off by smiling awkwardly and immediately turns to run away. Her father looks suspicious of her. So he stares at happy Jaka escorting his human. He thinks for a sec and says, It, it can't be what I'm thinking, right? Chief Pung stumbles as he's being escorted, which causes Jaka to worry and shout, Chief. The shattering heavens demonic lord sees this and shouts at Yingale, asking him what he's still standing around here, and tells him to quickly go and get the physician here to take a look at the five peak strongholds chief. With immediate effect, Yingale responds, saying yes sir, and immediately rushes to go get the physician, saying, I'll go dig up physician Huatep's grave and bring him here right away. He deeply still hates the outcome of this battle, as he thinks, Damn it, Yonjaka, you managed to survive again this time around. As the crowd leave, the talk amongst themselves, saying, Wow, did you see that fire dragon of that brat from the Five Peak Stronghold? That was really amazing. And someone else say, Fire dragon my ass, the heaven-destroying demonic lord went easy on him because he didn't want to beat up a kid. The shattering heaven demonic lord shouts, announcing to them all that, also, they all turn to look at him. So he says, since the situation is a mess right now, with a killer intent, he says, we will be looking for the victors of this summit and giving them their rewards. So he tells them to stop talking about what happened today and just wait for that. The demonic sect four soldiers amongst the crowd. In their minds, I'll be waiting. They all give a hideous smile and say that they'll be waiting. Later that evening, Five Peak Stronghold Tent. Someone shouts, what did you just say? You thought we were with the Yumyung cult? It's Chief Poon Yoncho. He says that he's seriously so speechless, and asks how they even came to that misunderstanding. The physician tightens the bandage, and calls the chief to shut up. It hasn't been long since the bleeding stopped, so he wonders how Chief Poon Yoncho is able to move with such vigor, questioning if he's really human. Ghost Shadow humbly says that in regards to his recklessness, there's no excuse he can give for it. So he bows and shakes as he says, I know this might sound like an excuse but I wasn't expecting the Crimson Death Stronghold to help with your wounds, though I thought they'd tell you about the actual situation before I did. But all members of the Five Peak Stronghold give him a furious look, thinking in their mind as if they'd do that for us. But Chief Poon Yon Cho tells Ghost Shadow that in any case, he also almost got killed by Yon Jaka as well, and they do not want to complicate the situation any further, so he suggests that they just call it even with that. This statement comes as a shock to Ghost Shadow, and even to the Stronghold, who question him as to why he would call it even just like that. Even Kion tells him that he should remember that he almost died, but he shushed them with his hand sign, and tells Ghost Shadow that in return, they have to make one thing clear, which is that with this incident, Ghost Shadow owes him his life. And immediately, with remorse, Ghost Shadow says, I Ghost Monarch, swear as one of the twelve demonic generals that I will not forget my debt to your life and says that he's simply thankful for a magnanimous person like Chief Poon who has such a magnanimous heart. But Chief Poon says to him, Come on no need to make it so grand. Looks like our misunderstanding has been resolved, so let's go eat something together, and says that he's starving to death. He skipped breakfast. Ghost Monarch replies, Shall we do that then? As they take their leave, Chief Poon Yonch asks the Ghost Monarch why the heaven-destroying demon call for Jaka, but Ghost Monarch tells him that he's not sure about that e Tak suspects Poon and questions if it's not that Poon wants to go finish the fight that they couldn't finish earlier. And one of the brothers reply, telling him that that can't be the case. That same night in a tent, is Jaka and the Shattering Heaven Demonic Lord. Jaka looking confused, asks the Shattering Heaven's Demonic Lord to repeat what he just said he wants him to do. 
He gets his reply. Green Forest Main Patrol. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord tells Jaka that he has already decided that Jaka will become a part of it, so he asks that Jaka do not make him repeat himself again. Jaka confused, asks the Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord what he just said he wants him to do. He gets his reply, Bandit Union's head guard. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord tells Jaka that has made up his mind about making him the head guard, so he asks that Jaka does not ask twice. Jaka looks down at the table, staring at a badge. He tells the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord. That he doesn't want it, because he heard it's a tedious job that will prevent him from going back to his mountain hideout for years. So he pushed the badge back towards the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord. But, the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, stops the badge from getting to himself, and asks him who said all that nonsense. As Jaka gobble up his noodles, he tells the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, that it's one of his disciples, Yingale Feline Lord. The Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord laughs and tells Jaka that it looks like Yingale made a mistake while he was drunk again questioning what nonsense that alcoholic pig was spewing, stating that first, Ghost Shadow suspects a perfectly fine mountain hideout to be connect to the demonic sect, and now this, these disciples of his are also useless. Jaka gives a smug look and tell the Shattering Heavens demonic lord that even if it weren't for that, calling him Ajesi. He tells him that he doesn't trust his mountain hideout at all, and says that head guard, head mountain bandit, whatever it is, he doesn't want to become one of him, but the Shattering Heavens Demonic Lord calls him a rascal and tell him that it's the Bandit Union head guard, not the head mountain bandit, also telling him that he's not some old man, that he's the head hideout leader of the Bandit Union, one of the ten greatest masters, Shattering Heavens Demon Lord, both of them passing the badge around. The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord asks Jaka who his master is, but Jaka gives a silly look and asks him what he means by master, telling him that he doesn't have a pet project like that. This gets the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord fired up. So he calls Jaka an impudent rascal, telling him that he doesn't show even a hint of respect towards those above him, and asks Jaka if he should use this chance to fix that arrogance of his. Jaka also gets fired up and tell him that it looks like he has regained his energy from just eating a few chunks of meat, calls him an old man and tell him that things could turn out ugly if he overexert himself. All this conversation was still happening while they pushed the badge around, and it suddenly flies off the table, but is caught by someone. This person asks both of them what this is, and asks them if the tournament stage was not enough, and if they are going to destroy this tent now. Jaka turns to look at this person, wondering who that is. The person continues talking and furiously say that it's because there's no drinks set out to accompany a meal amongst men. The Shattering Heaven Demon Lord asks her if she's talking about alcohol again, and asks her what type of girl doesn't go a day without. His statement is interrupted by the girl slamming her hand on their table and calling Jaka, Brother Yone which confuses Jaka as he wonder why this girl just called him brother. She asks him why he's kicking a token as good as this, telling him that other mountain bandits are dying to get their hands on one. But Jaka stares clueless and asks who she is, asking her if they know each other. The shattering heaven demon lord pours himself a drink and tells Jaka that him and the girl drank together all night, so he asks Jaka why he is acting like he doesn't know her, confusing Jaka even more, so he thinks back to last night. Seeing the similarity in both of her expressions, the Shattering Heavens Demon Lord tells Jaka that she's his daughter, and the young clan leader of the Bandit Union head hideout, Black Palm Sage, Sakuryoshi. Jaka, finally understanding what's going on, says, so that's how it is, staring at her. He says that it's no wonder he did think that she was a whole lot more physically weak than she should be with that Kai. So he asks that she also pour him some drink that he's thirsty, but she furiously gets up and asks him if that's all he really has to say. Shouting Thetman though the fact that she's such a beauty was revealed so dramatically. Back at the Five Peak Stronghold tent, they are shocked to hear that Ryoshi is a girl and not a guy and is a total babe as well. On top of that, she's the daughter of the Shattering Heaven Demon Lord. Shim doesn't find it too surprising because it's as he thought, because he found it strange from the beginning. Jaka tells them that he doesn't know if she's a beauty, but what he does know is that she's definitely a girl. So Tak asks Jaka why Ryoshi was going around dressed like a man. And one of the brother responds, saying that she probably had some good reason for it, maybe like a secret behind her birth. And Sobik say, no, but brother, what does that have to do with? That thing that's on your waist. Staring closely at the token, she fearfully remind him that he said he didn't want to be a guard because they have to leave the mountain hideout. He turns to her and sighs, telling her that he still feel the same way, but, remembering when Ryoshi told him that the head guard have to go to the mountain hideouts that have problems and solve them, so the job might be a little annoying. That being said, she asks him what would happen if they were attacked on their way back by someone who tries to take advantage of their weakness since their hideout leader is badly hurt. Then what? Jaka gives a fierce look without having a reply, so Ryoshi tells him that no matter how outstanding his martial prowess is, 
She asks if he thinks his family will be able to get back to Mountain Wufeng safe and sound without suffering any loss along the way. Back with Sobeek. She's speechless, so she bends her head feeling bad. And Vice Chief Tak agrees with what Ryoshi told Jiaka. Shim Yonggak gives a serious look and asks what the point is in stating the obvious, and says that if their opponent just used their brains a little, then their way back to Mountain Wufeng will be a tough journey. Jiaka tells him that he thinks so as well, and that's why he have decided to accept their offer for now, and that no matter what anyone says, so long as he have this token. Remembering when Ryoshi told him that so long as he have the token, then he should forget about being attacked, that any mountain bandit will be dying to serve him. Someone begins to clap. It's Chief Poom. He continues clapping and says, anyways that means. They all look to him and Tak calls him Big Hyunnam. With tears of joy in his eyes, he says. That means that a head guard, said to be one of the highest rank in the bandit union has come out of our mountain Wufeng hideout too. He claps more and says that this is the best thing ever. They all think on it for a while. Although Sobeek is still feeling odd behind, Vice Chief Tak says, that come to think of it. One of the brothers then scream in jubilation. That's right. And shouts, our Jaka has become the bandit union's head guard. Making everyone aware of this, Jiaka blushes and turns away to leave, telling them to stop and just leave. But they still jubilate in replies, yes, sir head guard. A female from behind shouts, oi, head guard Yon Jiaka, calling to him. The brother turned to see who it is that called, while Jiaka pauses in shock. It's Ryoshi. She shouts over here, waving her hand so that Jiaka can see her. So she shouts, telling Jiaka that they should drink for three days and night straight when they meet again. Jiaka also turns to her with a smug smile on and asks her if she's really talking about alcohol right up till the end, but says right, let's meet again, and him and his brothers be on their way, leaving the bandit union cap. Ryoshi then says that just seeing them leave has already got her feeling bored and that Jaka was really an interesting guy. She looks back and says, now then. She asks her father who was standing behind her the whole time, when he will give Jaka his first task as the head guard, smiling to him, and say, you chose that boy to be the sword to cut down the unforgivable ones who infiltrated the bandit union tournament right. He smiles back at her and tell her that he thought she just drank when she went out, but it looks like she's still quick to catch on to that stuff as the bandit union's young clan leader. Yoshi then lean on her dad and say, of course, I'm your daughter after all. He then clear his throat and say, acting coy when you're all grown up. Jiaka smiling out of excitement as they head home. He says, we are finally going back to Mountain Wufang. At night in a different city, a man can be seen riding a horse really fast. He's riding to the Nangong clan. Inside the building, a lady is shown. It's Nangong Yon from the Nangong clan, the lady who promised to protect Jaka when he was younger. Just like that, the bandit union tournament which led to many big and small happenings came to an end. However, to Yon Jaka who has now taken a huge position of bandit union head guard, it simply was the starting point of all the other big events he will soon face in the Murim. Hyun staring at the map says that it would be hard to take the carriage that their big Hyunnam is on. To the top of the hills staring at the map, she says that the next place they'll have to go through is Hefei. At night in Hefei village, a man can be seen riding a horse really fast. He's riding to the Nangong clan. Inside the building, a man is drinking. The person on the other end of the table tells the man to drink slowly, or he's going to choke. So the man stops drinking, and slams his cup on the table and cleans his mouth. He pay his respect by greeting, and tells the person in front of him that he quickly rushed here since he was in a hurry and couldn't afford to waste time. So he asks that the person in front of him pardon his discourtesy, and calls the person, Honorable Sir Nangong. Sir Nangong laughs and tells this person not to worry and feel free to tell him what brought him. The person then say that he knows he's being shameless, but he'd like to make a request, so he asks if he could at least get some help from Miss Nangong Yon. Sir Nangong is stunned to hear this request. The man then tells him that he have heard people say that Miss Nangong has the gift of seeing through people's hearts along with a beautiful flower-like appearance, hence the call her the lovely mind reader. He apologizes for making such an abrupt rude visit, but said that he did that, hoping to borrow the supernatural strength of Miss for the Ascension School. But Sir Nangong tries to laugh off what this person said, so he smiles and say, lovely mind reader you say, you're being too kind. He then tells the man that it's just that Nangong Yon's simple assumptions ends up being true out of luck, that his daughter is an ordinary child. Calmly dropping his cup he says, However, setting aside my daughter, the Ascension school head came to the Nangong clan personally. Isn't it my duty to listen to the problems of order faction member? So he asks that the man speak comfortably. The leader of the Ascension school thanks him and tells him that what happened was, they have a student at their Ascension school called Solitary Crane Sword, Dung Cho who has been making name for himself in the martial world recently. The leader of the Ascension School tells Sir Nangong that the student left home for Ascension School four days ago, but he just disappeared into thin air. 
Sir Nangong then asks this leader of the Ascension School what he means by disappeared, and tells him that it's normal for a young boy like that to leave home for a few days. So he asks the leader of the Ascension School if it isn't a stretch to say he went missing. The leader of the Ascension School then tell him that that's true but the reason why he's worried is because, not long after Dyung Cho disappeared, a strange rumor began to spread in the streets. Soaring Dragon School. He says that he has never heard of them before but is coming to help the Ascension School. The Sword Emperor, Sir Nangong, suspects something and asks, Soaring Dragon School, and say that he haven't heard of the name either. The Ascension School leader furiously bangs the table and tells the Sword Emperor that the Ascension School never requested help from this Soaring Dragon School and that their disciple disappeared the same time as they appeared. So he asks how strange this is. The Sword Emperor tell him that he does agree that the rumor of the Soaring Dragon School sounds suspicious. However, he says that he doesn't think his daughter could be of any help in this situation. But the Ascension School leader begs him, telling him that if he helps their Ascension School, this time, he'll never forget this debt. The Sword Emperor sighs, but accepts, and tells the man to please wait a little. So the man thanks him. Outside a room, Yung Ha Yoon walks towards the door. He is about to knock, but instantly hears his sister say, It's okay, you can enter brother. He isn't surprised so he smile and sighs. Entering her room, he tells her that he was trying to surprise her, so he asks her how she knew it was him. But she sits still and doesn't respond. So he smile and tells her that he seriously cannot fool her. She then turned to him. It's Nangong Yeon, the daughter of the Sword Emperor. As they walk through the corridor, Yung Ha Yoon already explained to Yeon why he came to call her. So he tell her that he thinks their father called her to help out the Ascension School for those reasons. He sighs and tell her that she might need to hear the man out in detail to know more, and that she should cut the man off right away if she smell anything fishy, that it doesn't matter even if it looks harsh, telling her that her safety is more important to her brother. But as he open his eyes, he is shocked to see that Nangong Yeon has already opened the door to where the man sits waiting, so he composes himself. The man notices them and says, Oh, you're here. Looking at the lady, he is stunned and shouts, Miss Nangong. He then thanks her very much for sparing her precious time for their disciple. But Nangong Yung tells him to calm down, that he must have been exhausted from coming so far. So Nangong takes her seat. Nangong Yung then tell the man to please explain more in detail so that Yon can solve their problem. And the man gracefully accepts. The man explains everything that he has said from the beginning for them. Yung Ha Yun then say, Hum, I see. And the man says, yes. The sword emperor then asks the man if the other union has said anything about this matter. The man thinks on it for a second and say, that the other union said that the soaring dragon school could be a new sect or a fake name being used to pretend they are from the order faction. Therefore, he wants to know who is behind this and if they are really coming to help the ascension school, and that if finding out their identity is difficult, he hopes that he could at least know if Dune Cho is fine. Staring at the sword emperor who puts up a fierce look, the man trembles. Suddenly, Yeon gets up shocking her brother who asks where she's going. As usual, she doesn't respond and keeps walking, shocking everyone present. So Yung Ha Yoon gets up, calling her and asking her to wait a minute. But she doesn't stop and shuts the door behind her. The leader of the Ascension School is totally confused, while Yung Ha Yoon and the Sword Emperor aren't surprised. The Sword Emperor then tries to play it off. So he tell the man that Yeon must have wanted to hurry and prepare to leave for the Ascension School as soon as possible after hearing him out. Yung Ha Yoon also adds that as the man can see, Yoon is the quiet type, and that, although she doesn't speak much, she'll definitely solve his problem. So he and his father laugh out really loud, confusing the Ascension School leader even more, who then think to himself, stating that he came here simply trusting the name of the lovely mind reader. But after everything, he wonder if she isn't just a quack. I beg of you, someone shouts. It's a lady crying, and begging Yoon and her brother to please find her son. He tell the lady that they'll try their best, so he asks that she please tell them if she remembers anything useful. Yeon just stand behind him with a straight face on, thinking on all that has happened. Four days ago, a disciple of the Ascension School, the solitary crane sword, Dyung Cho, suddenly disappeared without a trace. He was a young warrior whose title of solidarity crane sword suited him best. The fact that someone like him had been gone for days without prior notice definitely meant that he must have gotten himself in danger after being dragged into some problem. The woman cry and wipe her tears, turning back to look at the woman. Young Ha Yoon says that it looks like the issue is becoming much bigger than they expected. Nangong doesn't say anything neither does she reply. Young Ha Yoon then tell her that according to the missing boy's mother, the boy skipped breakfast and hurriedly left for the Ascension School to investigate a missing monk's case. And that this, and the missing monk case as well. They have no clue how things are going around here. Finally Nangong Yoon speaks and tells her brother that they should first go to the inn in the nearby village. But this statement catches Yung Ha Yun off guard as he asks her what she's talking about all of a sudden, but realizes something and calms down. He laughs it off and says, Okay, 
How could I know what's going on in your mind? At the inn in the nearby village, the master of the inn welcomes them. Young Ha Yoon then walks up to the master and tell him that he'd like to ask a few questions. The man thinks on it first but accepts. Nang Gong Yeon looks carefully at the man as her brother asks the man if, around four days ago, a man in his twenties going by the name of Solitary Crane Sword stopped by here. With a straight face on, she stares at the man, watching his every move. Young Ha Yoon tries to be casual with the question, so he tells the man that well of course he could have trouble remembering a customer from four days ago, but says that he just wanted to ask just in case. The man then shouts that of course he remembers him. Young Ha Yoon looking at the man, wonder why he's looking at Yoon while answering. Even though he was the one who asked the question, the man starts to talk, not hiding anything. He says, don't even get me started on that day. He tells them that a huge dispute happened and the end became a mess. This catches Nang Gong Jin's interest, as well as Yeon. Yeon looks around as the man narrate how the day went, picturing it all as it happened. A man breaks a table. She turns to where that must have happened. It's as if she can replay it all in her head. The shattered table pieces fall on Doong Cho's body, which makes him shout, asking the person who broke the table what he thinks he's doing. Mountain Face Sword, A Chuang Yeom Dong. This is the person who smashed the table. A Chuang Yeom Dong gives a furious look and asks Doong Cho how he, a punk from the Ascension School, come here. And Doong Cho shouts through the ruckus, telling A Chuang Yeom Dong that he simply came to this village to investigate the missing monk case, and that he doesn't want to argue with their Heavenly Sword School. A Chuang Tu Song replies, asking if that's so but says that it's such a shame. He unsheathes his sword and say that it's such a shame that he can't control his anger whenever he sees bastards from the Ascension School. Dung Cho also unsheathes his sword and tell the guy that he wanted to handle this peacefully. However, if that's what he insists, then he won't back down like a scared mud either. A Chuang Yeomdong puts up a cocky smile and calls Dung Cho a punk, telling him to stop bluffing. They begin their battle with Dung Cho on the first attack. As the battle drags out, A Chuang Yeomdong seems to be enjoying it. While Jing Cho tells him that if he's also from the Order faction, then his sect should also be cooperating in the investigation to find the missing monk. So he tells A Chuang to at least not be a hindrance if he's not going to help. A Chuang laughs Jing Cho off and asks him if that isn't the Ascension School's job, and also asks him who cares if a monk's missing, and that it got nothing to do with him. This provokes Jing Cho so he goes for a killer move, but A Chuang Yeomdong dodges, and immediately counter, with an upper kick to the jaw sending Jing Cho flying. But A Chuang Yeomdong doesn't stop there, he follows Doong Cho as he falls, and completes the attack with another powerful kick, sending Doong Cho flying, and crashing heavily onto the ground of the inn. A Chuang Yeomdong drops down softly, with satisfaction in his eyes, he says, right, what's all the fuss about some missing monk? He continues his attack, shouts asking Doong Cho why he's throwing his own life away for something like that. The 5 Peak Elite 10 happens to be at the same inn. Jiaka say seriously, they're fighting so much for such a small issue. Shim also adds that it looks like the bald head might win, but questions if the fighters can't do it in moderation, and says that that's why those young ones are hopeless. Chief Pung Yoncho bites down on his food and say that if that's what old man Shim thinks, then he'll bet this chicken leg that the bald head wins. Shim calls him Hyundam and says that, still, wagering away a half-eaten one is. Jiaka doesn't let him finish his statement, by flipping a coin, throwing it straight at a Chuang Yeondal, which luckily hits his sword, and bounces off to hit a pillar in the inn. A Chuang Yeomdong's entire body vibrates just from the shock caused by the coin Jaka toss that hit his sword. This interrupts their fight as the guy shouts, asking who that is. Looking at the gold coin still stuck in the pillar of the inn, Yeon goes and plucks it out, then calmly asks the inn owner if someone stopped the fight. He affirms that, telling her that the person was quite young, and now notices that the wager was stuck there all these while. He then continues telling Yeon what happened. Jaka flicks the coin towards the fighters, and tells them that he can't eat because they are too noisy. The inn owner tries to remember the name of their sect. It hits him and he says, Ah, right. It certainly was. The Soaring Dragon School. He tells her that the person who stopped the fight and his group said they were from the Soaring Dragon School. This name rings a bell for young Ha Yoon as he remembered that Soaring Dragon School is the one that the Ascension School leader had mentioned. It also rings a bell for Yoon as she remembered that it's that mysterious school, Soaring Dragon School. That's the suspicious school that the Ascension sect leader told her about. Young Hian wonder if the disappearance of Dung Cho could really be related to the Soaring Dragon School. Yeon then asks the inn owner if the Soaring Dragon sect looked like they were traveling together with Dung Cho. He tells her that he's not sure in that. That doesn't seem to be the case. But, remembers when H. Wang walked up to Jiaka's table and called Jiaka a brat, and asks him how he dares stick his nose in the affairs of another sect, asking him if he doesn't know his place at all. But Jiaka just sits still without a single word. Instead, he proceeds to bang the table, which send three coins flying towards H. Wang Yeomdong's direction. 
which he sees, but is unable to dodge nor block. So all three coins hit him, directly, causing him some serious pain, and caused him to fall to his knees. Looking at Jaka, he notes that this is fucked. Even though that kid might look young, he's extremely skilled. Jaka gives him a fierce look, and asks him if he wants to keep going. A Chuang Yomdong gets up furious, calls Jaka an arrogant brat, and tell him to consider himself lucky. Yet, he just turn and walks away angry. The Yin owner, then tell Yon that, Ding Cho and the Soaring Dragon School, didn't seem to be traveling together and that the fight ended way too quietly. And they went their own ways, so he can't really tell what happened afterwards. Looking at the coin and thinking, Yon wonder just how skilled the person who interfered is, for them to easily subdue two martial artists of an orthodox faction. However, what's more important is that H. Wang Yeondong attacked Ying Cho with the intent to kill. She thinks, wondering why he would do that. She understands that the relationship between the two sects is strained, but he should be aware that if things escalate, it'd become very complicated if the Muram Alliance steps in. She turns, thinking that that H. Wang Yeondong guy is probably. She doesn't complete what she's thinking and just turns to walk away, which surprises Young Ha Yoon, so he called to her, and chase after her. He asks her where she's going without saying anything, so he asked that she wait for him. The inn owner then say to them that the next time they come, they should at least buy a cup of tea. As they walk through the town and Yung Ha Yoon tries to catch up, Yoon thinks to herself. She states that that H. Wang Yong Dong person probably has a grudge against the Ascension School sect, and since they saw the faces of the Soaring Dragon sect, they must be certain that they weren't traveling with Dung Cho. Looking at H. Wang Yong Dong, she say that, in that case, someone near the inn, one of them would have been waiting for Dung Cho. She pictures exactly what happened on the night. On a lonely road in the mountains, Ding Cho, walking alone that night. Then, from nowhere, a guy comes from behind to strike down Ding Cho. He turns to look at the person, unaware that he's about to be killed. Yon who is picturing it all in her head, says, So that's how he was mercilessly killed. Blood everywhere as, it appears the guy's head has been chopped off. She says, So that's how he was mercilessly killed without making any sound. Nor resist, ha, huh, picturing it all on the road where this event might have happened. She then points to where she thinks Ding Cho was killed. Looking towards where she points, there's blood on the grass. Young Ha Yoon shouts in disbelief, questioning if those are blood stains. He immediately rush over to the grass and tells Yoon to stay right there. Upon clearing up the grass, Young Ha Yoon is stunned by what he see after finding Dung Cho. He sees Dung Cho's sword on the ground, and Dung Cho's lifeless body laying next to it. He then picks up a plaque, and says that seeing how his plaque and money is still here, this definitely wasn't caused by robbers or bandits. So he questions if this could really be the doing of H. Wang Yeom Dong. Yeon replies, telling him that if the truth that H. Wang Yeondong killed Ding Cho is exposed, a fight between the Heavenly Sword School and the Ascension School will most certainly take place. She states that the Heavenly Sword School isn't strong enough to go against the Orthodox Alliance, so the fact that they still dared to do something like this means there's someone backing them up, more so Ding Cho's head is missing, and that this is way too similar to that incident that took place 20 years ago. So she adds that there's something ominous about this. At a gathering in the demonic sect, H. Wang Yeomdong stands before the Hundred Heads Generals. They all smile as he tell them that as they've asked, he has brought back the head of the offering. As promised. So he asks if they will now allow him to join the demonic sect, Yum Young Cult. The Luna Fairy replies, telling him that she didn't set her expectations high but says that she guessed that he's pretty useful. And tells him that with those kind of guts, he has earned the right to become one of the twelve demonic soldiers. She then tell him that she'll keep her promise, so he shouldn't worry about that. A Chuang then rejoice with Dung Cho's head in his hand, saying, Thank you. The Luna Fairy then tell him that the Murim is a place where the weak gets devoured and the strong survives. A world where the strong preys on the weak. She then puts on a grin smile and say, And so, in the near future, the Yumyung cult will be at the center of turning the world upside down. At the same time elsewhere. The Five Peaks Ten Heroes pass by Hefei as they were returning to their stronghold. Chief Pung Yoncho sighs, sounding frustrated. He says that now that his body is slightly recovered, he thought that he could get a refreshing drink in and after a long while. And yet, dust was flying everywhere as a fight went on during their meal. Shim responds, saying, Yeah. He says, There's no greater joy than getting to our stronghold quickly, so we can lie down peacefully and have drinks. But he's interrupted by one of the Ten Heroes asking him what he means by our stronghold. Shocking him. Vice Chief Tak puts on a funny smile and remind him that when Sage Chun Jai previously charged into their stronghold, he ran away the quickest, and says, Now you're calling the stronghold ours. Tak, Jiaka, and the rest laugh at him, with nothing to say at first. He then shout, What? Can't I miss the Five Peak stronghold as well? Telling them that he even went to the Bandit Union Grand Summit as part of the Five Peak stronghold with all of them. So he asks them if he can't call the stronghold our stronghold. Suddenly, two swords appear in front of Shim. 
two swords men hold Shim, saying, Got you, one of Henan's three great sword, Gimel Northern, Shim Yongak. The five peak ten heroes are in shock. Even Shim seems to have been caught off guard. So the men shout, telling Shim Yongak that today is the day he die. Jiaka then gives them all a fierce look and asks what this is again. The men hold Shim Yongak in a lock with a sword to the neck. Shim, unable to make a move, thinks this is a fucked situation. And they both call his name and tell him that today is the day he die. Jiaka gets pissed and asks what was it again. Tak looking surprised asks the men who they are. And they tell him that they are from the Storm Squad, in the Orthodox Alliance. They then apologize to the five peak ten heroes but tells them that it's been five years since they lost this criminal and that now, they've finally found him by coincidence. So this isn't the time for them to talk about manners. Chief Pung also interferes. He tells them that it would be best if they introduce themselves first. So he say to them that they are from the Soaring Dragon School, from Henan, and that that man that they are holding onto right now is not the criminal Shim Yonggek. He tells them that that man is just an old man known as Bang Tong, and that he helps with errands in their sect. So he calls Shim and asks if he isn't right. Shim also plays along and say that it's true, that he is Bang Tong, the Soaring Dragon School. The warrior thinks, and notes that he have never heard of them before. However, staring at them, he can feel the energy of the orthodox martial artists, from the rest of them, looking at Jiaka. But he then looks at Shim and, say not this old man, while Shim tries to act like a foolish old man. The other guy then speaks out, shouting, Bang Tong my ass. This old man is definitely one of the three great criminals of the Henan, Shim Yonggak. He tells them that although he doesn't know why Shim Yonggak has hidden his identity and infiltrated the ranks of the orthodox sect, he says, I, Lee Sangman, can't possible confuse this damn starved weasel face of his. Shim Yonggak is offended by Lee Sangman calling him a starved weasel, but the name makes the five peak ten heroes almost burst out with laugh. Lee Sangman then asks them if they say they are from the Soaring Dragon School and tells them that while he doesn't know how Shim Yonggak deceived them, he tells them that this old man isn't Bang Tong, but the Gumul Northern Sword, a criminal known as Shim Yonggak. They then make a very shallow cut on Shim's neck, leaving Jaka furious. Chief Pung interferes again, putting on a short laugh. He tells the Storm Squad that although the old man does look like a weasel, he does think there's a great misunderstanding here, and asks them how an old man who runs errand in their sect be a criminal. Tak also join, saying that that's not possible saying that the old man is only capable of using rags or brooms at most. Kion also joins, with a fake laugh as well. She tells them that the old man is really good at making food for dogs, and that in doing those menial errands, he's definitely one of the top ten in the world. Shim Yonggek thinks of them as punks, but joins in the lie as well, telling the Storm Squad that what his sect leader said is right. So he asks them if they would like for him to make some food for their dog if they have one. He then gently starts to remove the swords from his neck, but as he removes it, a scar on his wrist shows. Lee Sangman see the scar and thinks, then shouts, Bastard, that wound on your wrist, that's obviously the wound that was caused by my sword from five years ago. So he asks Shim if he still dare lie. Shim has been found out, with no way out of it this time. He thinks, shit, even the five peak ten heroes are surprised with nothing more to say. Lee Sangman tells Shim to not think of weaseling out anymore and say to the Soaring Dragon School that if they keep trying to cover for this criminal, Shim Yonggak, he'll assume that they are his accomplices and submit them to the judge of the Orthodox Alliance. People start to gather around. After hearing, a criminal, they start to question what they are talking about, and someone says that seeing how they are talking about getting the Orthodox Alliance involved, then he guessed something did happen here. Shim thinks that he really is unlucky, to think that he would meet these Orthodox Alliance guy in this place of all places. He then looks towards Jaka because he knows that in order to resolve this situation, he needs Yon Jaka to do something. But he thinks there's no way Jaka could do something for him that could bring harm to the Five Peak Stronghold. But Jaka then sighs seriously. Looking at the guys from the Storm Squad, he tells them that they do talk a lot. He then say to them that they've been telling them that that old man is Bang Tong, an errand man for their sect. Shim is seriously surprised at Jaka helping him. Lee Sangman then furiously shouts at Jaka, asking him if he's not aware that they have no choice than to suspect them as well if they keep insisting on that, and that now that they've caught Shim, there's no way they can be deceived. Jaka gets pissed at the guy saying that he suspect them. Every one of the Five Peaks stronghold instantly gets worried, with Chief Poong and Vice Chief Tak sweating. Vice Chief Tak then asks Jaka if he does know that they are from the Orthodox Alliance, right? Jiaka doesn't respond, but envelops himself in some kind of intimidating aura, telling Lee Sangman that even though they've repeatedly told them that they are mistaken, he increases the pressure of the aura and say to Lee Sangman that if he insists on suspecting them, then he asks if that wouldn't put both their groups in a bind. Furious, Jaka uses his aura energy to create himself going for an attack with a sword. He gives a fierce look, 
and his aura envelops the entire place. The energy Jaka created roars at the storm squad holding Shin, making them all tremble in fear. But Jaka main aura energy goes as if to cut down Lee sang -Lin. He fears for his life, thinking if this is not the rumored aura execution, he alone can see Jaka aura about to cut him down. He then immediately drop his sword. As the sword hits the ground, Jiaka aura execution still pauses with a blade to Lee Sanglin's face. In fear and shock, he tells himself that that's supposed to be only possible for the top 10 strongest martial masters of the world. So he wonder what kind of boy he is for him to be using such a high-level technique. Shim looks at Lee Sangman sweating from fear, wondering what's got him like that. Lee Sangman wonder how such a young boy is able to use that. Jaka still standing where he is with his fierce look, asks Lee Sangman if he still does not believe what they have told him. The other guy then calls Jaka an arrogant brat, asking him how he dares speak so arrogantly in front of his. Lee Sangman interrupts him before he could finish his statement and gives up, saying, No, I believe you, of course I do. The guy and even Shim looks confused as they turn to Lee Sangman. So the guy asks, pardon? Jaka's aura execution still holds his sword in front of Lee Sangman, as Lee Sangman say that on the second hand, this old man looks nothing like Shim Yonggek. So he tells Jaka that he guessed they made a mistake because they were tired after a long journey. So he politely and calmly asks that Jaka please keep his sword. Tak then play along, saying, My my, it seems we are finally on the same page. In such a dangerous world, we ought to live while putting faith in others, shouldn't we? Even Poon plays along with a silly smile on his face. He waves his hand, saying, Old man Bang come over here quickly. Shim also plays along and joyfully say that that sounds good. He clears his throat and say that he'll take his leave now, pushing away the guy's sword from his neck. The guy then furious shouts Captain, what are you suddenly saying? You saw that wound on his wrist too didn't you? The captain then gives him a sign with his head, in a way, asking him to look down. The guy realizes and thinks this is as expected of their captain. He thinks that after confusing their enemy, the captain is giving him an eye signal to cut down all of them. He then say to himself that he'll quickly figure out what his captain is trying to say and proceed to take them down. Watching Sangman make some signs with his feet. The sign says, just shut up, we are leaving. The look of utter disappointment in his eyes. Lee Sangman. The captain immediately drags his subordinate and sprint away, apologizing for troubling them as he run. While the guy shouts captain, captain. Shim is totally confused. Not just Shim, even the five peak stronghold are as confused as they could get. Shim finally feels relieved, and say that he really thought he was done for. Chief Poong also say to Shim that that scared him, but he's glad it turned out alright, and that he's getting too old for this. Attack then say that he wonder what brought them here, that it's so rare for the orthodox sect to send people to such a countryside. The meeting of the Five Peaks Ten Heroes and those two men on the route leading to Hefei was much more impactful than anyone expected. That meeting is when people began to notice that the Orthodox Alliance, the organization that maintains order within the Miram Orthodox faction, had started to make their move. Young Ha Yoon and Yoon returns the body of Dyung Cho to his mother. The mother cry and cry, questioning why this has had to happen to her son. People from the Ascension School take up their sword against the Heavenly Sword sect. One of them say, You Heavenly Sword sex bastards, do you think you can get away with killing one of our people? So they ask that the Heavenly Sword sect hand over H. Wang Yeon Dong's head right now. While H. Wang Yeomdong stands carefree amidst his comrades and put on a proud smile, then one of the Heavenly Sword sect tell the Ascension School that they are not making any sense, that the only reason Dung Cho died is because he dared to act in their territory. So they ask the Ascension School sect how they dare make a ridiculous demand like asking for H. Wang Yeomdong's head. The clashing of the two sect, the Ascension School sect, and the Heavenly Sword sect, some people suddenly steps in, and everyone pause and turn to see who it is, in order to mediate the situation between them. The Orthodox Alliance which is in charge of the order in the Orthodox Miram, got involved. H. Wang Yeomdong claims that the killing happened during a duel, so it wasn't murder but an accident. In the end, the Orthodox Alliance, which was afraid that this matter would spiral out of hand, asked the Heavenly Sword sect to provide an appropriate compensation to the Ascension School sect. And in the Orthodox faction, the word of the Orthodox Alliance is the ironclad law. Even if it's a decision that's hard to accept, they have no choice but to follow that decision. The one who played the biggest role in bringing a conclusion to this series of event was the lovely mind reader, Nang Gong Yeon, still observing the situation and thinking to herself, she looks at Mountain Destruction Swordsman, H. Wang Yeom Dong. She says that she's certain now that she's seeing him in person and that he doesn't even bother hiding that gloomy and disgusting energy of the demonic cult. Now she's certain that the demonic cult have gotten into the orthodox faction. She calls to her brother Yeon Ha Yoon and he responds, asking her what's wrong. She then tell him that she thinks the demonic cult might show its face in the murm soon, shocking Young Ha Yoon, so he asks her what she just said, and asks her if she discovered something. 
but says, if what you said is true, shouldn't we tell the members of the Orthodox Alliance that are present right now? But Yon refuses his suggestion, and tells him that not only will it be meaningless to tell them anything right now, it will also worsen the atmosphere here, and that they need more concrete evidence that the demonic cult have infiltrated the Orthodox faction. So she tell him that they need to first return to Hafi. Note, Hafi is the town where they live. She then tells her brother that the person who knows the demonic cult better than anyone is their father, after all. The Sword Emperor. The Sword Emperor, practicing his sword technique. Boundless Heaven Technique, Fifth Form, Crescent Moon Strike. After releasing that destructive technique, the Sword Emperor gives a very satisfied smile as he watched the wood shatter to pieces. The Five Peaks Ten Heroes Traveling with Shim Yonggak. One of them making fun of Shim, say, Wow, Bang Tong, looking at the reaction of those Orthodox Alliance guys just now. I guess you messed around quite a bit in your prime, huh? This gets Shim spiked, but he tries to hold it in, and says, Bang Tong. He asks them how long they are going to keep calling him that, but they tell him that the name is starting to stick, and say to him that he has always been boasting about being one of the three great criminals of Hen. So he tells Shim that he guessed that wasn't a bluff, huh? Shim then gives a really proud grin smile and say that while he's living a quiet life because the Orthodox Alliance is after him right now, they'd be considered a goner if they even dared to stare at him in the past. So Kion butts in and say to him that if such an amazing person decided to become a mountain bandit, then she guessed that the Orthodox Alliance would be more scarier. With a funny look, he replies, telling her that he'd be lying if he said they weren't scary, and tells her that it's because it felt like being a mountain bandit suited him more after giving it a try and that he plans to stay in the Five Peaks stronghold until he dies of old age. Thinking to himself, he says that it's got clean air, plus he don't have to worry about starving. Kion doesn't like the happy look on Shim's face, thinking that that old man just had to win every argument. Shim also notices and say to himself that they are too young to win against him in an argument, so he grins. Kak then say, well, remembering the past, he say, that their stronghold used to be powerless and they didn't even know martial arts, and it was a little hard to make a living. But now, they've got a nice-looking Harmony Pavilion, and that since Jaka became a part of the Green Forest main patrol, they became better off than most strongholds. So Tak excitedly wraps his hand around Jaka's neck and say that it's true that every dog has its day. He then say that he guess all that's left is to strut along with everyday routine and lead the easy life. But Jaka refuses and tell Vice Chief Tak that he's actually planning to use the plaque to do even more bandit work. Chief Pung then turned to them and asks that they stop chit-chatting and prepare to set up camp for the night because it's about to get dark. For some unknown reason, Jaka feels so sad. Later that night after they've set up camp, Jaka sits outside alone, thinking. Suddenly, Chief Pung appears from nowhere and say to Jaka that he looks like he's thinking a lot but Jaka is surprised to see him. So Jaka asks where the rest are. The chief then tell him that he guessed they are all exhausted even though they didn't show it. They are all sleeping like dead dogs. Jaka then say, I see. Well, we did climb several mountains. I'm sure everyone's tired. They both look into the sky, observing the beautiful moon. Jaka speaks, calling the chief. He says, Do you remember what you said to me when you took me in? Chief Pung actually gets confused and asks Jaka if he's talking about when he first joined the Five Peaks stronghold. Jaka says, Yes, and repeats the chief words. It's better to take from others than to let others take from you. Remembering the scene, Jaka tells the chief that what he said to him back then, he still remember it. So he tell the chief that back then, he no longer wanted to lose anything, and wanted to live with all of them, and says that that's why he fought again and again for that. So the chief asks him what he's trying to say, asking him if something is different now. Giaka's response, I'm not just fighting and taking other people's stuff, I'm even using this plaque of the green forest to do even more bandit work. He gets a flashback of when he was being locked up, and says, I'd be like. He also remembers the grin on the face of his stepmom. Recalling her face even clearer, he say that he'd be like the absolute tyranny of someone who has power. He then questions how different his current self is from those people that he hated so much. Chief Pung stares at him without any words to say but feels bad. So Jaka continues saying that occasionally, even though he appreciate this time that he have with all of them who helped me escape from that place, he thinks of whether he's really walking the right path for himself. At the same time, at where young manner. Thanks to the fantastic acumen Beak Miju has, she has been able to acquire various investments from various merchantries and started to build a martial family, which is led by Yon Mubik. Plus, with the income that come from escorting the merchantries, she grew that force. Now, in order to spread the name of the Waryung Manor into the world even more, she needed a green forest stronghold that had become the sacrifice for it. The place they've set their sights on is none other than the Five Peaks strongholds that has been on everyone's mind recently. Someone comes before a Yon brother and calls him Captain Yon. The person then tell him that the Five Peaks stronghold 
one of the green forest stronghold in Henan is said to have a bandit who is pretty skilled with swords. So he asks if they shall go past that area this time around. This Yon brother then say, Five Peak Stronghold, a bandit who's skilled with swords? Upon getting up, he asks how skilled could a mere bandit be to get such a nickname. So the guy asks if he means. The captain doesn't let him finish his question as he says, Yeah, let's see who these bandits are. It's time to show those arrogant green forest bastards the power of the wary young manor. This person is none other than the wary young manners, Yon Mudu. At Mountain Wufeng, one Mountain Wufeng bandit speak, telling someone to hurry up now, that this is Mountain Wufeng. The person gets scared seeing who those are. He doesn't get the chance to finish his sentence. The bandits from before then tell the merchants that they should pray for safe travels as they are on their way to do business, and pay up a toll fee to help out a neighbor in need. The person then stutter as he speak, and with very low audibility. The bandit could not hear him, so, the bandit asks him what he's saying, asking him what a salesman is supposed to do with such a voice. Someone from amongst the merchant then laugh, tapping the shoulder of the merchant, he say, seriously. With a grin smile, he say to the bandits that he did hear rumor about how mountain Wufang bandits were causing trouble recently, but says that he didn't think they would have gotten so fearless. The bandit then make a funny look and try to mock the merchants for traveling with a bodyguard, saying, seriously, looks like you're traveling with bodyguards cause you're still a merchant group, and tell the bodyguard that that bodyguard title of his would be snatched away from him in an instant, so he asks that the merchants just pay up and get lost while they are still playing it nice. But the warriors stand without a single word and a furious look. Meanwhile at the crouching dragon estate, someone says, Mother what do you mean? It's Yon Mubik. He quarries his mother on why she sent off the recent clan recruit, the merchant group's bodyguards, without even discussing it with him. That those kids are all still far too unskilled to be sent in as guards. She responds, telling him that he's speaking without any substance again and asks him if they must keep waiting like this until they develop their skills. She then tell him that regardless of when they joined, they are all fully fledged member of the Crouching Dragon Estate, and they are going to have to pay for all the food and lodging that the Crouching Dragon Estate provided. Mubik tries to argue but she just waves him off, telling him to forget it that it's already decided and he shouldn't bring up the matter again, that she knew it would come to this with him. She then tell him that she also sent his cousin, Mudu, on the escort mission. She tell him that although Mudu doesn't compare to him, the escort shouldn't run into any problems with someone as skilled as Mudu by their side. Still, Mibik is worried, so he tells his mom that even so, if words gets out that they sent untrained members out on guard duty for the sake of clan revival, there will be rumors that they are exploiting their clan members. And on top of that, their opponent is the bandit union. So he asks her if she doesn't think there's a reason why even the other unions. The authority who manages the order factions of the Murim is also leaving them be. Once again, she dismisses his talk, she sighs, and say, reason my foot. She tell him that no matter how strong they are, they don't amount to anything more than lowly mountain bandits, and that the other unions must be overestimating their abilities since they've got the shattering heaven demon lord's name backing them. She add that it's even a good thing that the bandit union's strength is being exaggerated. She say that it's true they have it rough, yes, but asks him if he doesn't think now is a good chance to deal with the bandits. Finally, she tell him that if they end this successfully, They'll soon easily enter the seven sects and two schools, and they'll be able to spread the name of the Crouching Dragon Estate all over the world just like 20 years ago. The clan that defeated the Bandit Union Mountain Hideout. Meanwhile at Mountain Wufang, Yon Mudu and the representative of the merchant discuss amongst themselves. While they talk, the bandit wonder what they are up to. Mudu and the representative then turn to the bandits and jokingly apologizes for making them wait too long. With a stupid look on Mudu's face, he continues the fake apology, saying, But what do we do? We had a few problems on our way up, so we can only pay half the fee. The bandit gets provoked, and calls the merchants brazen bastards. But Mudu smiles and say that he's got a different mindset on all this. He then say, Not just half the fee. I don't want to give you punks a single penny. The bandits gets a hint, calling the merchants bastards. He asks if they are from the Crouching Dragon Estate, the one that has been randomly picking fights with Bandit Union Hideout recently. Mudu then puts up a cocky smile and respond, telling the bandits that he doesn't know about, random, but says that the bandit is right about them being from the Crouching Dragon Estate. So the bandits gets in their defensive stance and says that although it's true that the ten Wufang elites aren't here, he asks how they dare attack Mountain Wufang hideout with them around. Mudu responds by asking the bandit what he means by, how dare we? and asks the bandit what there is to fear about some rats that extort money from merchant groups. The bandit gets ready to attack, shouting that all Mudu has got is his yapping mouth with a greasy face, so he gives the order for his guys to attack. The merchants also get ready to fight back, but Mudu stops them. He then turns to them and asks that they do not concern themselves with these useless people and just prepare to get going. He await them as they plunge into attack, without unsheathing his sword. 
He takes out a couple of them with his bare hands and his sheathed sword. He then unsheathes his sword and uses his Nine Heaven World technique. First phase, Soaring Dragon Heavenly Ascension. The last bandit standing gets really terrified, and from nowhere, Mudu appears before him and tell him that it's too early to be surprised. While landing his attack, the bandit's sword is knocked off his hand, and as it fall to hit the ground, the bandit also fall to his knees. So Mubik points his sword at him and asks, So, with a cocky smile, Am asks if they can just go now, calling the mountain Wufeng bandits rats, some of them injured and some of them passed out. The bandit in front of Mudu grinds his teeth in anger and frustration, but still say to Mudu that he'll let them off without taking any passage fee on this one. But tell Mudu that there won't be a next time so he asks that Mudu keeps that in mind. Mudu then casually turns to walk away with the representative from the merchant excitedly say that the bandit should have acted that way from the start. That it's a win-win situation for all when things are ended nicely. But guys like them always make you use up your energy. But turns to Mudu and say, he heard that the mountain Wufeng hideout was making quite the name for itself recently. But says that it looks like all of that were just made rumors, that these guys aren't noteworthy at all. Mudu laughs at the fact that these clumsy bastards were making fame, and say, then again, they say empty bottles makes the most noise. He then say that you can understand 10 things about something after learning one. He then say, I can tell. I can see what the level of these trashy bastards called the bandit union or whatever is too. The bandit still conscious then say to Mudu that, that's fair enough, and that he is simply passing through now, but that it will be different when they're humans, the 10 Wufeng elites are back. And say, we'll see you then, you evil bastards. Mudu gives a short laugh and asks the bandit who he's calling evil. He then tell the bandit that he was just going to leave nicely but his yapping is quite annoying. With a disdain look, he says, right, keep yapping you losers. He then tell him that out of all the bastards who have told him to watch his back, he have never seen a single one of them, not one come to get their revenge. Somewhere else, under a rainy cloud, the mountain with Feng Ten elites are running, trying to get shelter from the rain while Kiyun complains about why it suddenly started raining. But Shim tells her to stop talking and enter the abandoned shrine. The others also complain about how infuriating it is for they are almost at Mountain Wufeng hideout and it just suddenly started raining. After entering the shrine, Tak say that it's still a relief that there's a shrine here. And the other brother adds that he doesn't even have extra clothes to change into. And they almost got soaking wet. Chief Pung then turn to them and say that since it has come to this, they should just sleep here for today and leave early tomorrow morning. And they agree. But Kion and Sobi get scared. Kion question if this place doesn't feel a bit too eerie, that it looks like a ghost could appear any second. Shim makes fun of her, asking her what ghosts, and tell her to wait till she's 60, and she'll be more scared of humans. He tell her that she wouldn't even hear someone dying when it rains this hard. Out of frustration Kion slaps him on the back and tell him that she was already getting goosebumps. So how could he go and say things like that? Shim kick in pain, but turns to face her and they start arguing. He tells her that he's not wrong, and that it's a great weather to kill someone since the blood also gets washed away by the rain. Kion then tell him that he must be so proud of that, that the other union is dying to catch him all because he lived like that. They continue arguing while Jaka gives them the side eye. By the way, I wonder if our hideout is doing okay with this much rain. Chief Poon questions, and Tak tell him that there's no way it's that big of a deal. It keeps on raining non-stop with thunder and lightning striking in the clouds. Some masked men somewhere else in the forest are moving together with a sack on their shoulders. At that moment, Jaka's senses are alerted. He then immediately whispered to everyone to be quiet that someone is coming this way, stunning them all. So they immediately take up their sword and ready for battle. One of the men from outside kicks the door open, and they all immediately rush in. Upon getting inside, they notice the mountain Wufeng Ten elite standing in front of them. Still staring at each other, the bag one of the masked men carry makes a slight shake. Jiaka notices this movement and is shocked, thinking to himself. He Upon entering the building, they all stand facing each other, while Jiaka pays close attention to them. One of the assassins shouts, calling them bastards, and asks them who they are. Tak responds, saying, That's what we are supposed to say, and tells them that they were resting here first, okay? And says, how bold of you to come barging in and start spewing all this crap. He tells them that judging by those sacks, they are definitely burglars. Also calling them bastards, he asks them who they work for. Lightning strike outside due to the weather. And one of the sack, the assassins carry shake. Giaka noticed the sack move and question if it means. Tak also noticed this and call them fuckers, so he furiously asks them if they are kidnappers. Then, all the assassins get on alert. Immediately they drop the sacks, they start unsheathing their swords. Seeing this, Chief Poon gives his brothers a sign, and they all immediately get into formation. The assassin sees this and states that their movements are incredibly synchronized, 
so he realized that they are no ordinary guys, and also states that that red-haired boy, his aura is no joke. So he calls him, you there, he asks, what is your name? And Giaka asks him why, and asks him if he's going to put up a memorial tablet for him in this shrine after learning his name. So he tells the assassin to forget it and just end it quickly and come at them. The assassin gets provoked and calls Giaka a young brat who's still wet behind the ears. As they rush in to attack, they ask how dare he act so impudent without any fear for his life. But before they could get to Giaka, his brothers come before him and stand right in front of Giaka, ready to defend him. They clash swords with the assassins and are able to hold their own against them. One assassin in particular doesn't flutter and is ready to take on all three brothers, but finds it difficult as he sees them coming with some serious speed. All three swords are about to cut him down, but he manages to block it all but struggles as he thinks, shit, who would have known that they were such monsters, that we're resting in the shrine we came in to take cover from the rain, He's still thinking and struggling with the three, Chief Poong comes from behind. The guy sees Chief Poong Yoncho, but Poong Yoncho has already closed the distance. Chief Poong Yoncho then cuts him in an upward slash with enough force, to force him to fall back almost falling to the ground. But he controls himself to land properly on both feet, holding his wound. Shim Yongak sees this and is surprised, calling them bastards. He also states that the energy they are giving off is, similar to the ones they met on the way to the Bandit Union Tournament, the ones who used that strange martial arts. They also showed off all sorts of martial arts. But that strangely and off-putting energy and the weird sword techniques that he's never seen before, it's definitely similar to those bastards. Poong Yoncho standing beside Shim Yongak complains and questions if it's because he hasn't fully recovered yet that he can't even deal with those shabby bastards. Shim giving him the side eye states that back then they all certainly had a hard time fighting those bastards hard enough for their lives to be in danger. But here is Poon complaining and asking if it's because he didn't eat enough. Tak rushes towards Poon Yoncho, telling him to just rest. Shim looking at him wonder if they have become that much stronger in such a short time. And as Tak approaches the assassins, he calls them insolent bastards, telling them that they are dead meat. Shim, forgetting that he's in the midst of battle, is carried away by his thoughts, thinking, at this rate, won't those young brats catch up to me? I Shim Yongak the sweet tongue hidden sword who used to have a strong grip over the Henan province. While lost in thoughts, he's almost cut down by one of the assassin's sword. But he manages to block the sword right in time, and the assassin shout that he'll send this old geezer off first. The assassin dashes in straight for an immediate follow-up attack. But even though Shim is still surprised from the attack, he manages dodge, getting posed at himself for letting his guard down. The assassin sees this opening and uses it to land a hit on Shim Yongak. It was unexpected, shit is hit, and he coughs out blood. Everyone is shocked, seeing as Shim just got easily taken down. They pause and are looking surprised. Then suddenly come Jiaka with a heavy stomp of his feet to the ground. The stomp causes the whole area from his feet to the front to crack open, making the assassin lose balance and falls to the ground. Jiaka then stand in front of the mess he just made, emitting strong internal energy from his body. The assassins looking at him get scared and wonder what that ridiculous martial art is, and they think, just who the heck is that guy? Giaka all furious says, abducting people wasn't enough for you, you even dared to touch my family? At that instant, he plunges straight ahead, calls them punks and tell them to better prepare themselves, because he'll show them what it means to be beaten up enough for dust to fly around on a rainy day. Seeing that Jiaka stood up for him, Shim Yongak smile, asking Jiaka if he considers him as a part of his family. Jiaka doesn't respond and just goes straight to dealing with the assassins, one by one with only his fists, and heads straight for the guy that seems to be the leader of the assassins. Upon getting closer, the door behind the assassin is shattered, making the assassin shout. And as he's about to fall, he notices something. Looking terrified, he thinks, this fucking brat. He realizes that Jiaka didn't even punch him and everything else got shattered to pieces. Now he knows that this guy is really out of their league. Poong Yoncho feeling displeased says that he thought he finally get to loosen his body a little, but it looks like this whole situation is over. Tak then laughs saying, what a pity that he had prepared his killing move already. The assassin is now frustrated so he shouts saying that they might be retreating now but that they'll meet again soon enough so he tells them to just wait and see. That then, he'll rip them all limb from limb. 
As they flee, they talk in a foreign language, which makes Poon Yoncho ask what the hell they are talking about. That he can't even hear it clearly because they are so far away. Tak puts up a funny look to mock them saying that their mobility technique are top-notch, so he questions if that's the only thing they trained. Chief Poon Yoncho sighs and question why there are still people kidnapping others in this day and age, that people these days are just so problematic. While he talk, the bag shake. So he goes to untie it. Joking about how beautiful the people would be that the assassins would go to the extent of kidnapping them. But as he opens the bag, an old man pops out really fast, trying to catch his breath. And everyone is shocked. First because it's an old man and second because of how he came out so fast. And straight up, the old man begins to pray, Amitabha, with the other that were kidnapped with him. Looking all confuses, Chief Poon Yoncho asks what's with this monk and Taoist. A little time pass and the monk thank them for the rescue. The Taoists then tell them that there have been consecutive disappearance of monks recently, and so he came out to look for them out of concern. To think that he almost ended up like them. The monk then say that it's all thanks to the benevolence of Buddha that they were able to encounter them. So Poon Yoncho then asked them what the assassins were going to do with just the two of them who are just an old man and a Taoist. The Taoists tell him that they do not know the reason for their kidnapping. In any case, the monk thanks them once more for rescuing him and the Taoist. But Kiyon gets up, saying that those guys, that don't they think they give off similar vibes to the ones they fought recently. One of the brother also jumps in, saying that he doesn't just think they are similar, that he thinks they are definitely the same people. Saying that he had thought this when he met them previously. That although he doesn't know who they are, he's sure that they are definitely up to something shady. The monk is shocked to hear that they've met the same group of people previously. So he says that if that's true, then this is no small matter. The Taoists then say that they would need to tell the Orthodox Alliance what happened right away. Vice Chief Tak looks at Shim Yong Gak getting scared of hearing the Orthodox Alliance, so he laughs. Also the monk adds that he would like to tell the whole Jang Hu of their names since they saved his life, so he asks that they tell him their names if they are okay with it. But out of fear for the Orthodox Alliance, Shim immediately responds, telling the monk that there would be no need for that, that one never know when they'll meet again. And that it would be good if he prayed for peace to be in their lives. The Taoist guy then say to Shim Yonggak that even those who practiced asceticism their whole lives have a hard time ignoring fame. Yet, they all are able to do so. The monk is wowed, so he say to them that they must all be very close to Buddhahood for them to refuse fame that easily. The Taoist then pray for them, saying that it's an honor to meet such distinguished people. And the monk tell them that if that's the case, whenever they meet again, they should share names. And that they'll take their leave now, and he prays for their safe journey to their next destination. Shim Yonggak then sighs heavily as he watch them walk away. On their way, Chief Pung Yoncho and Tak watches them go. And Chief Pung Yoncho also remembers that incident at Hefei and says that it feels like something bad is happening in the world. Which brings him to say this, I'd like to ask our discerning Mr. Shim Yonggak if he has any inkling to what could be going on. Shim feeling more comfortable now says that he does have some suspicions, but he stops at, but. So Pung Yoncho asks him what he means by, but. He then say what? and asks them what good it would do for bandits to worry about those things. That they would have a hard time in their late years like him if they get involved in the affairs of the Jonghu. That they should just worry about how they can get back to their stronghold quickly and continue on with their lives. Thinking about it, the chief say that Shim is not wrong, that mountain bandits are not in a place to worry about other people. Tak swinging his sword then say that once they get back to their stronghold, they can live a much easier bandit life. That after all the training with Jiaka on their way to the Green Forest Grand Summit, he can feel himself having become stronger. And so Bika affirms it, telling him that he was really impressive just now. One of the brothers giggles asking if that's so. So he asks her if it feels like he has become stronger. But the chief interrupts them, telling them not to get too full of themselves saying that while they are indeed able to have easier time fighting those guys this time around, they do not know how it would have ended if Jiaka didn't step in to help. While Jiaka looks like he has so much going on, the others bend their heads because they know that what the chief said is true. Suddenly, the chief calls him. 
and asks him if he could teach them a little more about the forms that come after the first form of the Nine Heavens Arts. Vice Chief Tack also joins in the request, saying that now that he has seen himself becoming stronger after training, he is starting to want to learn more martial arts. Kion then say, us too. Jiaka then sighs and says, well, well. Facing them with an excited expression, he say, it looks like you all have no intention of sleeping tonight, huh? They all also get ready by raising their swords. Then Jiaka starts with the stance and they all follow his moves. The scene goes straight from Jiaka training with his sworn brothers to a scene where Mubik is training the same move that same night somewhere else. Mubik trains alone through the night while he trains. Someone comes from behind and says, Brother, you're already so skilled, why are you still training so hard? Mubik turns to look at him and sees that it's Yon Seungbik. So he says, Oh, it's you Seungbik. So he tell him that training never ends, that one must constantly improve their body and mind. He also tells Seungbik that he is still lacking when it comes to internal energy and that his skills are not even nearly enough to fight the elders of the nine great sects. He plunges upward. Releasing his internal energy, he tells Seungbik that if they keep doing as their mother wishes and mess with the green forest. With a heavy slash, he say that there will come a time when they'll definitely have to face them. Seungbik is stunned as Mubik swings his sword in front of him. So he tenses up and tell Mubik to come on, that they are just mountain bandits though. So he asks him what he's so worried about. With a fierce gaze Mubik tells Seungbik that they should never underestimate the green forest. That there's a reason why people talk about them as if they are on equal footing with the orthodox Muram. So he tells Seungbik to go bring his sword and come back here. Looking for a way out, Seungbik asks him if that's what he wanted to say from the start. He has no choice but to join in. As they train, he asks Mubik if they could please just go to sleep. Back with the five peak mountain bandits, they keep training under Jiaka's guidance. While Mubik and Seungbik also train, Mubik thinks the five peak mountain bandit that's good with sword defeated an elder of the Wudang sect. He thinks, if that rumor is true, then it'd be difficult for me to fight them at my level of skills right now. That's why I must become even stronger than I am right now. The journey to the Green Forest Grand Summit, which had countless happenings and tales of heroism, came to an end. As they arrive their stronghold, the members of the stronghold happily announce their arrival and welcome them well. Finally, the Five Peak Ten Heroes and Yonjiaka had returned to the Five Peak Stronghold. As they are being welcomed, one of the stronghold members asks the chief if he's feeling all right because he heard that he got injured. The chief smile back at him and asks him if he can't tell. That he has long recovered from such a small injury. That he could go out there and rub some people right now. They laugh about it and say that now that he has come back in one piece, they'll be having a much easier life as bandits from now on. The chief thinks on what they said for a while. Then he says I guess so. While they all look at him and give a suspicious expression on their face. Two months after they returned, Cholson is standing in front of an opponent. He speaks saying, a ranking battle out of the blue, must we do that? So he tell his opponent that he won't take responsibility if he gets hurt. The opponent feeling confident in his skills say, me get hurt? Speak for yourself, better steal yourself for what's coming next. He also say to Cholson that while he was away for the Green Forest Grand Summit, they have been receiving training from Yumyung. So as he plunge in to attack, he shout that once he defeats Cholson in this ranking battle, He'll be able to join the ranks of the five peak ten heroes and make his name known throughout the world. So he shouts, take this, using his Hellblade first technique. With all of his talking and shouting, Cholson doesn't even budge, but just looks at him pitifully. Cholson then raises his blade high with one hand, and immediately deflects his opponent's attack. And after the clash, they can all see that Cholson clearly cut through his opponent's blade, leaving his opponent completely confused and as he tries to move his blade, the part where Cholson cut shatters. The opponent then starts crying, shouting, No, my Hellblade, do you know how expensive this was? Cholson then mocks him, saying, Heal my ass, so he tell him to just go and train somewhere. Kiyon and every other person watching laughs at Cholson's opponent. Looking at Cholson blush over Kiyon, the opponent tries to figure out what just happened, stating that Cholson's level of skills weren't that much different before they joined here, though. Thinking all to himself, I guessed it when I sensed that the vibe he gave after the Green Forest Grand Summit were different.
but he's become so ridiculously strong. And he's been training for every single day ever since he came back. He then think that Chulson could even be stronger than Yamyung. He also notices that Chulson and Kion look so close. This realization makes him think, fuck. Then he say that he feels so alone. Meanwhile, Yamyung is somewhere else shouting, this is really not right. He shouts at Shim Yonggak, calling him sir, and asking if Shim is really listening to him. But Shim doesn't seem to be bothered about whatever he's saying and casually tells him that he's quite noisy. So Shim asks him what he's making so much noise about. He then furiously asks Shim if he doesn't see it that all of them came back from the Green Forest Grand Summit. No one has gone to do any pillaging, not even the chief of the Five Peak Ten Heroes. That all of them were just trying every single day that the stronghold isn't functioning properly. So Shim asks him if that isn't why he has been doing all those loot runs by himself, and asks him what the problem is. He gets speechless looking at him and thinking. Yumyung then asks Shim if he didn't hear about how the Waryong Manor, people that came from Loing beat them completely while they were gone. So Shim turn and tell him that he did hear about that roughly, but he asks, well. He asks him if he turned to the chief and ask him to seek revenge. And he shouts that of course he did recalling when he went to the chief and what he said. Chief, shouldn't we wait for those arrogant Waryong Manor bastards to go back to Loying and show them how the Five Peak Stronghold is? That they'll get back twice the toll fee from them while kicking them around, and also make an example out of that arrogant and cheeky bastard. But the chief cuts him short from his revenge speech, telling him to forget it and just let it go. He gets confused and asks, what? The chief then tell him that it's not like they'll have any trouble making a living by letting a few guys like them off. Vice chief also agrees and says that it's just like the chief said, that he should just let them go instead of making this a big deal. Then they both get up and start discussing something else immediately, talking about how they can smoothly use internal energy. Yomiyong watching them act this way gets really confused and just thinks to himself. Back at the present, he complains to Shim that Pung Yoncho is the chief of a stronghold, so he asks what kind of reaction that is. That there are so many mouths to feed in the Five Peak stronghold, and at this rate, everyone will starve to death. So he says, this all this brings him to say this, Sir, how about you suggest a ranking battle? Shim quickly turns to him shouting, What? With who, that young kid? And Yam Young replies saying, Yes, that, that'll be a start and says, back then when you didn't want to fight that Yon kid personally, I assumed it was because you wanted to err on the side of caution. So he tells Shim that if he fought him this time around. While the guy talks Shim looks at him with so much fear in his eyes, and also start recalling the people that Jiaka has fought, the elder of the Wudang sect. Not only did he defeat Sage Chun Jai, he's also a monster that fought on par with the heaven-destroying demon lord, one of the top ten martial masters. Looking at the idiot in front of him, he thinks, he wants me to fight a ranking battle with that monster again. So he tell him that he see the amount of trust he has in him. Yamyung then smile and say, yes, if we get serious and make plans then. He keeps talking and suddenly a kick come flying towards his face. Shim enraged, kicks his face to the ground and shouts at him, calls him an idiot and tells him that they'd all just die together. Shim beat him then kick him out of his room and asks him if he's trying to drive him to his death. Huh. So Shim tell him that if he's got time to speak such nonsense, then he should go do another loot run. Yamyung is confused so he asks Shim to wait and asks him why he's taking the side of that young kid and the chief. Asking if none of them care about how the Five Peak Stronghold will become anymore. His talks annoys Shim the more, so Shim just calls him an idiot and walks away without minding him. While the guy sobs and shouts that he hates them all, Shim thinks, well, Yomyung has never seen just how strong Jiaka is after the ranking battle. That's the only reason why he would even dare to suggest a ranking battle with Jiaka. Looking into the distance he thinks, besides, the five peak ten heroes that were taught martial arts by a monster like him, are also growing way faster than anyone can imagine. Within the short time that he has watched them train, he has gradually seen how much stronger they become each day and the fire in their eyes. Yes, watching them being trained by Jiaka. After returning to the Five Peak Stronghold, all of them were determined to learn and improve within a short time frame. All of them have grown exponentially in their martial arts. 
he then honestly say that he wouldn't be able to win if he fought the chief now. Feeling left behind, he questions what a hard life he has. After their training, they gather to rest and eat. So Imdal calls the chief and tells him that they heard that he wants to just let those Waryong Manor guys who came by off. And the other joins in, saying that he really don't think that's the way to do things, that they need to teach them a good lesson on their way to Loying. The chief then say okay, but asks if they all agree with those two. Everywhere gets quiet for a while, and as no one spoke up, the guys are shocked and asks them what they are all doing. They say, don't tell me you intend to just let it go after getting humiliated like that. So Beak then speaks up, she says, I don't know if I should be saying this, but actually I don't want to do loot runs anymore. The guy then asks her what she's saying, a bandit who doesn't want to go on loot runs. Kion also speaks up, saying that just like Sobik said, both she and Cholson also don't really want to continue doing loot runs. But these two can't believe what they're hearing, so them still confused, asks the rest how else they would survive in an arduous world like this. That they would only suffer even more if they leave the stronghold. Vice Chief Tak then say, well it can't be helped, that three of their personalities were never quite suited for a bandit's life and he guessed they've become clear of that now. The other guy then asked Tak what he means by become clear of that, asking him what they realize. Kion then answer, saying that she thinks they've realized that they prefer to help others more than to take things away from others. She say that even though they were just acting as the orthodox faction, she started to think a lot after they helped out a lot on their journey to the Green Forest Grand Summit. She adds that she of the past only joined the stronghold because she was too weak to protect herself. But now that she has become capable of that, she doesn't think it's correct for her to continue being abandoned. Tak smile, and he thinks that that's not surprising. That once they've understood who they really are, they won't be able to go back to being who they aren't. Looking to the side where the chief is, he thinks that means? The chief finally breaks his silence, and says, In that case, number three and number four, do you want to continue being a bandit? He asks. Number three says yes, that they've been doing similar things for a living before they joined the stronghold. Number four also says that since they've been doing similar things before, they don't feel bad about doing loot runs, and that he actually thinks it's the perfect job for him. But he says to the chief that no matter what, it's his decision and that they'll follow his orders. Chief Poon Yoncho, looking at them all, thinks for a while and say, okay. He then declare that from today onwards, number three and number four will take over the stronghold. These guys are shocked, so they shout, what? But they calm and asks the chief if it couldn't mean. Before the guy could ask his question, Tak smile thinking that he already knew it. The chief then proceeds and say that as of today, he'll step down as the chief of the Five Peak Stronghold. Everyone is taken aback by what he just said. In shock, they call him chief, but he stay quiet. Kiyon then speak, asking him what the hell he's talking about by saying that he's stepping down. He looks at her and says, What do you mean what I'm talking about? It's just as I've said. Did I not tell you this before? I have a wife and a child that I had to leave without a choice because I was wrongly accused of something. Sobeek, with a pitiful look, then asks him if he's going back to his family now then. She asks him if he has already decided on this. Well, he says that he's not sure yet that he had thought he was protecting his family back then by leaving them. And that is why he started to be a bandit since he had no other choices. So he doesn't know if he should go back to them now after having left for so many years. Tak then smile at him and say, Chief, I guess you had your own set of problems like Giaka, huh? Number four then say to him that it must have been painful to force himself to go on loot runs this whole time then. The chief quickly waves it off saying, not really, it wasn't painful, and that he doesn't regret his time spent with the stronghold at all. So he say to them that to be able to meet all of them and overcome all those countless hurdles together and even being acknowledged as a green forest stronghold, that that was certainly one of the most brilliant moments of his life that he wouldn't exchange for anything. Number four and number three smile and are happy to hear him say the things he said. Vice Chief Tak and the others smile as well. And same goes for Kion and Cholson who smile while blushing at each other. However, the chief says that as the situation of the stronghold stabilized and he could sense it as he felt himself growing stronger. Imdal completes his statement for him saying, you're probably reminded more and more of your family that you left behind. And the chief says yes, that that's right. 
that just like Indal said, he's reminded of the family that he left behind. Number four then say to him that well, if that's what he wants, they have no choice but to accept it, but he asks why the chief is putting him and Imdal in charge. That Tak Gomyung is here too, and he's number two after the chief. Tak says, Hami? Then gets composed and say, Well as you all know, I'm an orphan, I had all sorts of troubles in the past, and with no family to go back to. Somehow, I got way too involved with the chief and ended up being a lot closer than I planned. The chief then raise his hand and say, yes, that Tak has decided to come with him. One of the brothers then shout that how could he have decided on that without even talking to them first, so he asks Tak if they are not family. Sobik also covers her mouth and say that she's so disappointed. The other brother also asks him how the two of them could just decide on all of these by themselves. The chief then apologizes to them all, saying that he's sorry that he was going to tell them about this earlier, but he wasn't able to bring himself to say it. Tak even trying to laugh it off says that they are a lot more agitated than he had imagined. And the chief adds that it'll be hard to bring everyone with them. Tak now tell them to not be so upset. That the truth is that the chief was just merely the first person to speak of leaving. And say, but all of you also thought about it as well, didn't you? Starting with Sobik, he asks her if it isn't true that she wanted to start her own tea house, and she says that it's true. Kion, he say that she wants to run her own in, she smile as she nods. The chief then looks to Cholson and say that it's obvious that he'll be helping Kion in, and Cholson playfully says that he'll love that, but says that he doesn't really feel anything bad towards being a bandit, however. He's cut short by Mdao and number four who try to complete his statement for him, saying, However, what? You want to stay with all of us. Cholson, you really enjoyed going on loot runs with us, didn't you? But Cholson just laughs off their words and say that it's actually his desire to train and grow even stronger. He says it's stronger than wanting to go on loot runs, and that if he trains a little harder, he's sure he can make something out of it. He imagines a scenario, he blush and say that if he could do that, he's sure he'll become the strongest waiter in the history of Miram and protect a certain someone's in no matter what storms comes by. Right? He asks. And Kion blush really hard as she feels embarrassed and say, Oh Cholson. Suddenly the chief stabs his blade to the ground and say that he also agree with Cholson on wanting to train more than going on loot runs. He says that he's not going to leave the stronghold right away, that he just wants to step down as chief and focus on training his martial arts more. But Sobik looking so sad say that if that's the case, they'll all eventually go their own ways, that she doesn't want that. She looks so sad, thinking that if everyone in the five peak ten heroes go their separate ways, that she'd need to be apart from Jiaka too. The chief then tell her that he doesn't want that too, but they all have their own goals in life, and that he believes that they all now have the courage to challenge themselves. Everyone gives a courageous look as they all agree to what the chief just said. Tak then smile as he looks up and say, Damn, I can't believe that the day would come when we would think about things like that. Come to think of it, we've all changed so much after Jiaka appeared in our lives. Number 4 snorts as he cleans his eyes and say, Yeah, I thought we'd all go on loot runs together until the day we died. So Imdal tries to console him, telling him that he'll fulfill that dream of his for him. Lastly, the chiefs say to them that even after they go on their separate ways, he wants them all to remember one thing and that is that they are a family no matter where they go. And so he asks that if any one of them runs into trouble, they would all throw away everything they are doing and put their lives on the line to help that person. So they respond, Yes, chief, yes, chief. Imdal say that they swear it. Suddenly, someone comes running and shouting. As he gets closer, he shouts, Big trouble. So Tak asks him what, that what happened. He tries to catch his breath and say, Sir Shim. He shouts as he begs that they please stop Sir Shim Yongak. Number four asks Shim. He asks who that is and who on earth does he want them to stop, wondering if the guy ate something bad. Tak also asks him what on earth he's talking about. Meanwhile, at the same time, Shim comes standing behind Jiaka. Jiaka then turn to him and call him old man, asking him why he has come here. And Shim stutter as he says, about that. Oh lunch, I was wondering if you had your lunch. Jiaka just turns away from him as he tell him that lunch was already a few hours ago and that he had his fill of lunch with the chief, so he asks that Shim goes back if that's all he has for him. And suddenly Shim shouts Jiaka's name and begs him to teach him martial arts, saying, please teach me martial arts. He stands there shaking and sweating as he waits for a response. 
Jiaka then asked, learn martial arts at that age of yours. He just tell him that they shouldn't make things cumbersome for each other and that Shim should just do as he has been doing so far. Shim then summons up some courage and shouts to Jiaka that all his life. He spent it doing hideous deeds like beating people, taking from others, and even killing people without a single prick in his conscience. He say that he's someone who ended up joining this stronghold, even being chased after by the Orthodox Alliance his whole life. He say that martial arts was a tool for him to suppress the weak, and that was all. Jiaka sits without a word as he thinks of what to do while listening to Shim. Shim continues saying, but after you destroyed that arrogant mindset of mine. I learned something as I watched the rest of our stronghold members use martial arts for the right cause. Martial arts that are used to help people and the strength to do the right things. Above all, doing that would be far more meaningful and beautiful thing. And also, I've started to want to know more about this new world of martial arts. Jiaka then slightly turns his head as he say, Seriously, do people talk like this as they grow old, or is it just you? Shim asks pardon and asks Jiaka what he means. Jiaka looking at him gets pissed and asks him why he's making it so complicated when all he wants is for him to teach him martial arts. With a relieved expression Shim says, yes well I guess you could say that's what I want. But as Jiaka gets up, he tells Shim that the nine heavens arts that he learned is totally different from the demonic arts that he learned. So he says to Shim that he could experience energy deviation if things go wrong. He then asks Shim if he's really alright with that. Shim with a resolved mind tells Jiaka that if that really happens, then he guess it can't be helped. That he's prepared to do it even if he'll lose all of his energy in the process. He looks at Jiaka, waiting for a response. Jiaka looks back at him without a word first. Then says, well, if you're so insistent, then I will teach you. But don't blame me if you end up in the underworld because something went wrong, got it. He also tells him to not appear in his dreams and hunt him for causing him death or whatever. Shim tries to laugh it off saying, even so, I doubt I'd really die, right? So he asks, would I? Jiaka then goes back to sit and tells Shim to forget it, that he should just forget about the training and that he should go and leave his quiet life as he has done so, and calls him old sir. Shim immediately starts begging Jiaka saying, wait, even if I do die, I'd never appear anywhere near you. So he begs Jiaka to please please teach him martial arts. Back with the Five Peak Stronghold Elite 10, Imdal shouts, What? Asking Yomyong if it's really true that old man Shim is training with Jiaka. And he says yes, that that's what he saw before he came here. That they said they were going to train deep in the mountains and were carrying a lot of belongings actually. He tell them that Sir Shim is quite advanced in age, so he's worried that he might injure himself if he pushes himself too much in training. Tak looks confused but says, Old man Shim and Jiaka, I never imagined the two of them would be capable of doing that. Kiyon then say that she's not so surprised about Shim that she's more surprised that Jiaka agreed to training together with Shim. So Beak thinking on it, say that perhaps it could be because Jiaka remembers what old man Shim did. Even though old man Shim grumbled a lot, but he did help them out a lot during their trip to the Green Forest Grand Summit. Well, Tak say that he can't deny that, although he doesn't want to admit it. Chief Pung also adds that Shim did carry him to the arena, which was already in a huge mess, and that he was honestly quite touched by what he did there. But still, he remembers Shim saying that his back was aching. Later that evening, Shim is carrying a bag and climbing up a mountain. His back aches so he complains about it and asks Jiaka how much more they have to climb. Jiaka then tell him that they are not even half there yet and he's already whining. Also Jiaka add that there's something that he needs him to be aware of before he teaches him martial arts. So Jiaka turns to Shim with a fierce gaze and tells him that if he ever catch wind of him using the Nine Heavens art to do anything funny, he'll personally destroy his body and send him to the afterlife himself. Shim doesn't hesitate and tells Jiaka that he knows better than anyone how fearsome he is, so he wouldn't dare do such a thing. He also say in his mind that he'd rather just take his own life than to go against Jiaka. They finally arrive and Jiaka say, well, all right then, let's start the training proper now. He tells Shim that in order to truly master the Nine Heavens art, he must memorize the Jushin Fairy Incantation, and that the Nine Heavens practitioner must empty their emotions. Not doing anything is everything. 
when the heavenly flower bloom when you're seated, then the fish shall become a phoenix. Looking at Shim, Jiaka thinks he's incredible, that it hasn't been that long since they started and Shim has already memorized the 300 words of incantation. That considering how the rest of them couldn't even memorize up to 100 words, Shim can grow at least three times stronger than them. Time pass as Shim memorizes the words of incantation. And it's morning already. Jiaka opens his eyes after his own training and is shocked at what he sees. He then shout, Old man Shim, seeing that Shim has already gone far in the training. He says to him, Don't tell me you did this overnight. Shim laughs, saying, Well, the more I try to memorize the incantation, it feels like my head, which had a lot of complicated thoughts, has cleared up. And that he didn't even realize it's already morning. Suddenly, Shim spits out blood. But he continues talking and Jiaka watch him closely. Shim says, though, why do I feel like? He starts to fall but completes his statement, why do I feel like something is wrong with my body? Jiaka then quickly rushes towards him, shouting, old man Shim. Jiaka tries to block some pressure points on Shim's body. But that doesn't help Shim as he continues to cough up blood. Jiaka, still trying to save Shim, thinks, damn it, that it's just as he thought. The Nine Heavens art isn't compatible with Shim's demonic arts and it's clashing with each other within Shim's body. But he keeps trying and does something to help Shim. Shim then seems stable for a while, but suddenly becomes unstable again, and continues to cough up blood as he falls to the ground. Jiaka is getting frustrated as he questions if energy circulation is useless right now, because shit if they delay helping Shim here, then his life might be in danger. So he picks Shim up and puts him on his back as he tells himself that he can't let that happen, and runs out of the cave. He gets to a dead-end cliff on his way out, but he doesn't stop and jumps off the cliff. Looking at the distance, he feels like he's about to fall off, but he persists and makes a clean landing, and immediately continues running to get off the mountain. He gets to another difficult spot and just lips off the mountain, and onto another unsafe grounds. Still, he doesn't stop. Looking up, he thinks, damn it. Because they climb to the top of the mountain to train, it's taking much longer for them to reach the stronghold. Shim, while on Jiaka's back, says, Wow, that's a pretty impressive way of getting down a mountain. Jiaka immediately turned to him, asking him if he's sober, but still tells him that even if he dies here, he should remember to keep his promise for him. That if he dares haunt him in his dreams, that he'll just leave him here right now. Shim gives a soft laugh and say that he knows and remember that, and says to Jiaka that he's someone who is a man of his word. Jiaka then say that seeing as how he's still alive, then he must be able to hang on for a while longer. So he tells Shim to grab on tight that he'll be going at full speed now. Later that day, in a small building, a doctor is seen with a needle that's used to practice acupuncture. As he removes the needle from Shim's body, he say that they did all they could but not only is his eight extra meridians damaged, he's already well advanced in age, so it'll be probably hard for him to make a complete recovery. Chief Pung Yoncho then furiously shouts at the doctor, asking him what he's talking about, if he's saying that Shim will die. The doctor immediately clears up the misunderstanding, saying, no, that he is referring to Shim's martial arts, but says yes, that it'll still affect his health recovery a little. That as long as he doesn't move around too much, then he should be able to survive. So the chief sighs and tells the doctor to say that earlier, that he scared the shit out of him and that he should say something like that earlier. The doctor then say that he'll first go prepare some medicine that's good for treating his internal injuries. As they talk more, Jiaka quietly walks out of the room. The chief looking pissed says, Goodness, why did you even bother trying to learn martial arts at that age? Jiaka standing outside the building, just stays quiet and thinks to himself, remembering Shim and some of the words he said to him, which is, and also, I've started to want to know more about this new world of martial arts. As Jiaka think, he states that Shim is someone who trained in martial arts his whole life, and now he's going to lose his martial arts. So he says that that's basically death for him already. While Shim still remains unconscious on the sickbed. Time pass, and it's morning up in the mountains. Imdal and number three are training their martial arts while someone sitting on a rock calls Imdal and tell him that his sword technique are pretty sharp now. Huh. Imdal is excited and asks if that's so. It suddenly gets quite around this person, and we get a closer look to see that it's Shim Yongak. Suddenly, while Shim is there alone, Jiaka comes around and takes a sit beside him, while he sits there without moving. 
Suddenly, he asked Giaka if the reason why he has been training here for a whole week is because he was scared that he'll take his own life by biting his own tongue. Giaka doesn't say anything at first. Shim then turned to look at him, tries to laugh, and ask him what he thinks of his current appearance. Giaka looks at him from the side, still with no word, but finally speaks and asks him what else he could think of, that he simply grew older by a week. Shim stays quiet for a while, then say that somehow it feels like this year's spring is pretty cold. And Giaka tell him that that's just because he has gotten old. After that, time pass and some of the five peak stronghold bandits beating up someone. The guy calls Yamyung and asks him if it isn't about time those Waryong Manor guys pass by here. And another asks if it is really okay for them to just let them go. Yamyung jumps forward to finish off this person that they've been beating up. And as he delivers the finishing kick, he asks them what he can do. His opponent falls to the ground and is injured. Yonyoung then say that now that this old man is in this state, how are they supposed to take any revenge? The person they've been beating up is Shim, who is now powerless and defenseless. Yonyoung now bend to look at him and say that Shim is not moving even after taking so many hits from them. That he must have really lost his martial arts. So he asks how the great Shim Yonggak, the Gumil Northern Sword that ruled Henan, land himself into this state. So he readies his fist, saying that there's no longer a place for a useless rice weevil in the stronghold, that he should know his place and leave. Before he could land the hit, Jiaka comes from behind saying, Oi. They see him and are immediately shocked. So Jiaka say that he was wondering who was causing so much dust to fly in the air so early in the morning. And he says, so it's you guys again? He tell them that it looks like they're going around doing idiotic things because they have too much time on your hands. So he asks them if they want him to do some sparring with them personally. All of them in fear instantly refuse, stuttering as they say, no, we'll pass on that. And they come up with the excuse that they are really thankful that he's willing to do it, but that they couldn't possibly trouble him this early in the morning. So they all run away, shouting that they'll take their leave now. Jiaka then turned to Shim and asks him if he's alright. He tries to laugh and says, nope that it hurts like hell, and that it's way more painful than he had expected. He also adds that it's not just his body though, that his heart hurts even more, saying that he didn't realize it when he was just beating up others for no good reason, but now he realized that this is how one feels when you're being beaten helplessly, that it's the time in his life when he have come to such realization. Jiaka just turns away from him and say that he's seriously becoming mature, but at such an old age, so he tell him that it's enough with reflecting on his past, and tells him to come with him that he has got something to tell him. As he tries to get up, he makes some noise of pain and also complains about his joints. Since he can't get up after trying, he begins to beg Jiaka to help him up if they are going somewhere and support him. That he literally just took a beating. At the same time at Waryong Manor, Jiaka's stepmother calls her sons to come and pay their respects quickly. She introduces them to the administrator of the Yang family, Sir Yang Jinwung and Sir Yang Yaisan, the young patriarch of the Yang family, so she makes an opportunity for her sons to introduce themselves. Mubik says, Sir, it's an honor to meet you. I'm Yon Mubik, the current manor master of the Waryong Manor, and his younger brother, Yon Soonbik, introduces himself as well. Yang Jinwung praises Mubik, telling him that he's as handsome as the rumors have mentioned. And Mubik says, You flatter me. You must be exhausted after a long journey here, let's head in quickly. They all head inside, and while they are in, they discuss their reason for coming and everyone seem happy. After that, the Yang family thank Madame Beek for her hospitality and say they hope to meet again soon. She returns the pleasantries saying, Ho ho, we're the ones who are thankful for your visit. We'll soon send a marriage proposal to the Yang family. They get on the back of their horses and hit the road. As they move, the patriarch Yang Jinwong turns to Yang Yaisan and asks him what he thinks of the Waryong swordsman, Yon Mubik. Yaisan tell him that Yon Mubik is perfect as the rumors have mentioned, an excellent and talented young man. Patriarch Yang Jinwong agrees with him and says, indeed, he was able to not just rise to fame by being talented at swordsmanship, yet he also brought the nameless Waryong Manor up into one of the top few martial families into Loyang. Finally, he tell Yaisan that there is no one better than Mubik who's worthy of becoming the lifelong partner of his sister, Yehua. But Yaisan say there's something that he's bothered by. He says, Madam Beek, the current leader of the Waryong Manor, is trying to expand their forces extremely aggressively, and has caused a lot of complaints and unpleasant rumors. He says at least that's what he heard, so he asks Patriarch Yang if that will be okay. 
Patriarch Yang Jinwung then asked Yang Yaisan if that problem wouldn't go away naturally once the marriage with the manor master is a done deal. That once the wife is with him, Madam Beak can't possibly act like the lady of the house for much longer. Yaisan then call him father and say that it seems he has taken quite the liking to Yon Mu Beak. The father then laugh and ask him how he can tell that easily. Back at the manor, Jiaka's stepmother, Mubik's mother, give a smile and tell Mubik that she knew it, that it seems that the Yang family would be extremely pleased with him, and that the daughter of the Yang family is so beautiful that she's earned the nickname, the Beauty of Dingzhu. She also adds that if the Weryong Manor and the Yang family becomes one through their marriage, then they'd easily be on par with the Nine Great Sect. Soon Beek smile as he tees Mubik saying, The Beauty of Dingzhu, as your wife, huh? You sure are blessed brother. But Mubik keeps a straight face and remains quiet the whole time. This upsets his mother so she calls him by name and asks him if he's upset about something. She also proceeds to say that the marriage plans are proceeding smoothly and that the Weryong Manor has stabilized. So she asks him what could be the problem here, asking him why he's making such a face in front of their guests. Mubik then bends his head in sadness and says, that's not it mother, it's just, but she doesn't let him say what he has to say and tells him to just forget it that he must be worrying over useless thoughts again, that he should stop doing that and focus on making his marriage happen. She adds that this matter mustn't be delayed anymore for the sake of the Weryong Manor's future. Mubik thinks for a second, then say that it's not like his opinion ever mattered, and says, let's just do what you want, mother. She then makes the sound of displeasure and tell him that the way he talks is just like his father. So she turns away from him and asks for where the hell Seolju has been lately, that she doesn't see her around these days at all. She say that she has repeatedly told her to be here since important guests are coming. Seung Beek then asks his mother if she still do not know about the chivalrous female warrior of the Chang'an, Yon Seolju. This sparks her interest as she asks if Seolju is a chivalrous female warrior. So she asks what nonsense is that? Seung Beek enthusiastically asks her if she doesn't know about the loying five heroes that have appeared in the streets every single day without fail. He proceeds to say, well, well, how could you expect to earn money with escorting merchant unions when you're so slow in hearing about news like that? Madame Beek furiously bangs the table and asks Seung Beek to stop beating around the bush and tell her everything. She also asks if Seolju is not only a chivalrous female warrior, she's a part of loying five heroes. So Seung Beek say that about that, the green forests have been quite rampant these days and a lot of unsettling incidents have happened. So he guessed because of that, the robbers and thugs have grown really huge and it's creating quite a headache. He adds that Loying's situation is quite similar. Outside at the market, things are being destroyed and someone shouts while the people stand looking around fear. A guy then shout, asking who the owner of this place is, and asks that the owner comes out immediately. A guy then comes out asking why they are doing this and says that they already paid their protection fees last week. He also say that business was bad today, so he doesn't have any money to give them even if he wanted to. The thug then get pissed, asking what that's supposed to mean, that he's only collecting protection fees here. So he asks if he's supposed to be concerned about how their business is doing. He raise his knife, shouting at the man that he doesn't care if he have to sell his wife or daughter, that he should go get them their money now. The man shouts as he thinks he's about to be cut. Because of the recent appearance of the new thugs, people are suffering more and more even the government had removed their hands from the matter. The merchants who have lost their only hope of support have now fallen to despair. This lady that has been hiding amongst the crowd since suddenly speaks and asks everyone if they could step aside. She then dashes in straight for the thug, saying that she think those bastards need to be taught a good lesson. As she unsheathes her sword, she uses the Nine Heavens art, first form, Soaring Dragon. Just at that time, the loying five heroes appeared like a meteor star. Among the five, the female warrior who's known as the fourth flower. The fourth hero of the loying five heroes is Yon Seolju. After cutting down the thug, she seems to be enjoying herself as she says, Geez, such weaklings dare to create such a huge ruckus. The thugs rush to their guy that's fallen, shouting and asking if he's okay. They call him their second in command. They then furiously turn Seolju, calling her a bitch. They ask her if she knows who the fuck he is. Their rage and nonsense doesn't get to Seolju at all. But she just says, goodness, you guys are such a joke. She asks them if they are thinking about being loyal despite their pathetic sight. So she asks them what they are going to do about it. Then she shout that they should come at her as a group for all she care. That she, Yon Seolju of the Loying Five Heroes, will never run away from the likes of them. 
a new set of thugs joins in and asks what is happening there, and they are told that someone took out their second in command. The thug steps forward, calls her a bitch, and asks her if she's the one who did that. And she responds with, huh, and follow up with a laugh, saying, well, there's a little more of you than I had expected, but I'm not one to get scared. A big guy then steps out from the thugs and asks her if she's trying to act like some female hero. So he say to her that, with such a pretty-looking face, she must have lived a suffering-free life, and that today he will teach her that the world is not an easy place. So he charges towards her, wielding his blade on his left hand. But suddenly, someone comes behind Sialju, saying that he was wondering why she's late, and says, You've gotten yourself into more trouble, huh? As he unsheathes his sword, he tell her that she's such a handful. She turns to him and tell him that that's what makes her charming, asking him if he doesn't agree. The thug upon seeing this new guy asks who he is, but he's instantly cut before he could get his answer. His right arm is perfectly diced without a moment for him to react, he shout, and his arm fly towards his subordinates who also scream as it heads their way. This new guy is the first of the loying five heroes, from the eight immortal sect, H. Wang Dongyob. The remaining thugs all rush towards him, calling him a bastard and saying that he's in for a whole lot of trouble, so they attack. But as the charge towards H. Wang Dongyob and Yon Sialju, someone else appears from behind saying, What's this? I can't believe you guys are having fun without us. Suddenly comes another guy who says, See, I told you. If Sialju is late, then it must be because she's gotten into trouble. I got it right, didn't I? The first guy that came, he is the second of the loying five heroes from the Great Nature sect, O Jungsun. And the second guy is the third of loying five heroes, Seven Sons sect, Sun Sangek. Together, they beat up the thugs like it's nothing, while smiling at each other. The battle continues, and they continue to easily take down the thugs, while the remaining thugs watch in shock. But they don't stop and decide to charge in and kill the heroes. Yeon Sialju then say, I can't believe you guys actually found me already, and now her chances of achieving some accomplishment have certainly gone down. Confidently saying that she's more than enough to deal with these trash though. The thugs who hear her speak shout, What bitch? You've forgotten what fear is like, haven't you? She doesn't mind them and continue talking, saying that since the rest of the heroes have already accomplished so much, she can't just sit idly by, so she also charge in to attack. She takes them out in a flash, and smile as she does. Someone say that people have gathered and started to talk among themselves. They say that Sialju's martial arts are fanciful and powerful, that she always takes the lead like a ball of flames which makes people cheer for her. It appears that Seungbeek has been the one telling the story to his mom. He say that that's how she became one of the top heroes of Loying. This whole news infuriates their mother. So she angrily shout, asking Seungbeek what he just said, and say that Seolju ought to be staying away from martial arts and preparing to get married, but he's saying she's a hero. And now she faces Seungbeek, asking him why he knew about this and let her be. But he immediately tries to calm her down, as he tell her to please clam down, and that he has a good reason for not stopping her. So she asks, a reason, what is it? So he tell her that it's actually because of the fifth hero of the Loying Five Heroes. The reason that the Loying Five Heroes started to become the topic of the town is because of her. He says she's from the Heaven Sect, one of the nine great sect, the third daughter of the sect leader. His mother then asks him to wait a minute, that if it's the daughter of the Heaven Sect leader, that means. Seungbeek follows up and say, I knew it. Mother, I knew you'd get it right away. So he says, yes, it's exactly what you're thinking. Li Yujuang, the Heavenly Sword Supreme, one of the ten strongest martial masters. The Loying Fifth Hero is his favorite granddaughter and is also famed for her exceptional swordsmanship. At the scene of the fight, she rushes in style and swiftly takes care of some thugs. The Fifth Hero of the Loying Five Heroes Heaven Sect, Li Samen. The people cheer her on as she defeats the thugs. So back at the manor, Seungbeek tells his mother to think about this when we expand our forces in the near future. Wouldn't having a close relationship with the Heaven Sect be the best thing for us? Mubik looks at his mom from the side, waiting to hear what she says. But she then grinds her teeth and calls Seungbeek a fool, asking him if he does not really know what his sister is like. It's not the response he was expecting so he's shocked and says, What? The mother then shout at him, saying that it's obvious that Sialju will get into trouble with that brashness of hers. That when that happens, not only will it not help them, it could even ruin their relationship with the Heaven Sect. So she asks him if he did not think of that at all. Back at the scene of the fight, Yon Sialju and Lee Salmon. Back at the manor, Mubik finally speaks, saying that even if that does happen, it can't be helped if that's the life that she has chosen. 
He says that unlike him who is the manor master, there's no need for Seolju to live the life she doesn't want to. Seungbeek is surprised to see Mewbeek say such in front of their mother, so he looks back and forth at both his brother and mother. This woman gets so pissed she grinds her teeth as she say, you little, then shouts that he stop talking useless nonsense and go get Seolju back here before she does anything stupid. Seungbeek immediately jumps from his seat as he shouts yes mother, while Mewbeek just sighs. The mother also shout for Mewbeek to stop sighing and go together with Seungbeek, so he responds, yes mother. On the other hand, on the Five Peak Mountain, Jiaka asks old man Shim if he's frustrated over the loss of his martial arts. Shim, looking so tired and old, asks him what's there to be frustrated about, saying that he has lived his whole life in a world where only the strong survive. So it could be said to be natural for the weak to be devoured in the Miram. Jiaka sighs and say to him that he's glad he's not frustrated, and tell him that a lot of people have been beaten to a pulp by him after all. So he tell him to just think of it as punishment for that, and that he shouldn't be too upset. Shim give a subtle laugh and say, Punishment, huh? I guess this could really be punishment. So Jiaka speaking like he doesn't care, asks Shim how circulating energy is working out for him. And he tells Jiaka that he keeps running out of breath, that he can't even regulate his own breathing properly. So Jiaka asks him if he remembers the last part of the incantation. When the heavenly flower blooms while you're seated, then the fish shall become a phoenix. He tells Shim that in the past, Sage Chun Jai told him about this before. He say that Sage Chun Jai asked him what would need to be done in order for a fish to experience a new transformation. So he asks Shim what he thinks. Shim then say to Jiaka that someone like him couldn't possibly know the answer to that. But then it hit him. He thinks it couldn't be. Then he says out loud, body reformation, that that's probably the only way. Jiaka then tell him that the rest of his brothers could only memorize 100 words out of the 900 words of the Jewetan fairy incantation, and that that's probably the most they'd be able to learn. He says, on the other hand, you managed to memorize 300 words in such a short time, and that's why maybe your body screaming in pain could be a natural result of that. So, if you're able to unclog the clogged energies, wouldn't you become at least three times stronger than the rest? Shim thinks of this and in his mind, he's excited that he has a chance to regain his internal energy. A much stronger internal energy than before. So he calls Jiaka by name. But Jiaka just gets up and say, Oh, but if you die of old age before your martial arts come back, then it's all for naught. You know that, right? So he tells Shim to make sure he lives a long life. Shim asks, I doubt I'd die of old age, right? Saying that the heavens have allowed him to learn 300 words out of the incantation. Jiaka looks at him with a smile and asks, The heavens? He says, You're a villain and you believe in the will of the heavens. And finally says, One really has to live long and see all that the world has to offer. Shim giving him the side eye, asks him if he isn't a little too young for him to be saying that. Jiaka just proceeds to train and says that in any case, he's done with what he wants to say. So he tells Shim to head down the mountain otherwise, the chief will start nagging at him for being too harsh on a sickly old man like him as Jiaka train doing his sword moves. Shim watching him thinks, hmm, I wonder if it's because I've seen him training for a long period of time, it feels a little out of place. He thinks more on it and says to himself that no, that's not it. So he realizes that he simply haven't been able to see it clearly because Jiaka is so strong. Looking closer, he notices it even more, that feeling that's out of place. He thinks if he should talk or not and decides to talk. So he calls Jiaka. Jiaka asks him what is it now? and asks him why he called for him. Shim then say, I think your martial arts are meant for swords and not blades. Jiaka pauses and asks, swords, blades? So he asks if there's a difference between the two. Shim responds saying, yes, that it's quite different. But Shim is baffled that Jiaka doesn't know this much. He also recalls that Jiaka learned the basics of martial arts from Sage Chun Jai. So he wonder what exactly did this monster learn? So he guessed it'd be actual fighting and not so much on theory. So he explains to Jiaka that sword and blade techniques are said to be as different as heaven and earth, that the difference is huge. So if you use a sword technique with your current blade, then naturally its power would be halved. Jiaka thinks as he looks at his blade. Then he says to Shim that this blade was given to him by their chief. Smiling as he talk, he says that when he first joined the stronghold, no one used a sword as their weapon that this was a present from their chief, so he could never just throw it away, so he has continued to use it. Shim thinking about it thinks, well he did defeat Sage Chun Jai with that blade, so there's no real need to worry over that. 
Jiaka still contemplating on this new information, asks Shim once more if it's really that different though. And Shim thinks, what if he really exchanges that blade eventually? For a sword, I wonder just how much stronger he'll get. He gazes upon Jiaka as if seeing a different kind of being. Jiaka catch him looking strangely and shouts, Old man Shim, what's with that look in your eyes? Shim just laughs it off and says that it's nothing and tell him to just continue with his training. Jiaka sighs and say, what a boring response. Loying tea house. Someone say that the day they've been waiting for is finally here. He asks them if they've all written and left letters behind. The first of Loying five heroes, A Chuang Dongyob. The second of Loying five heroes, O Jungsen. The third of Loying five heroes, Sun Sangjuk. Both nod their heads in response. The fourth of Loying five heroes, Yon Sialju. The fifth of Loying five heroes, Lee Salmon. Both nod their heads. They are the Loying Five heroes that come from different groups within Loying that have decided to roam the Jianghu together. The group that they belong to would be those who just received the letters. The Eight Immortal Sect received a letter. The Great Nature Sect received a letter and a lady calls a certain sir to please take a look at this letter. The Seven Sun Sect received a letter and the mother of the child asks her husband of what they should do now. The Heaven Sect received a letter and the Patriarch asks that nobody makes a big fuss about this. The Waryong Manor received a letter and the mother starts cursing and shouting, Sialju you brat. She shouts that Sialju wants to roam the Jianghu. So she asks if they still have not found her yet. At the tea house in Loying. Lee Salmon tells Sialju that her mother would be angry though, so she asks if Sialju will be okay. And says that her mother is notorious for her nasty temper. Sialju then casually tell her that of course she'll be okay. That her mother keeps trying to force her into marriage talk these days, so she'll take this chance to show her mother how serious she is. In other to spite, Lee Salmon Seolju sits back with a cocky expression and asks Lee Salmon the same question. She say, will you be okay though? If you, a daughter of the leader of the Heaven Sect, one of the Great Nine Sect, roams the Jianghu so publicly and get caught in some nasty rumor, wouldn't you be in big trouble? Your sect is on a whole different level compared to the Waryong Manor. So, Lee Salmon turns to her and say, Well, I too would hate to marry someone who is a stranger just because my father said so. Since I'm born into a martial arts family, shouldn't I take control of my own life with my own hands? After saying these, she put up a bright smile and Sialju is very unhappy about her calm expression. Sun Sangjuk notices the tension between the ladies, so he tries to calm the situation. He says, Come on, I get just how serious the two of you are, so calm down a little. Then he tell them that it's about time to leave, so they need to get prepared. Oh Jungsen also says the same and say that they should leave soon. That if they don't leave soon, their family might send people after them to hold them here. H. Wang Dangyob sighs, saying that they are all grown-ups already, but yet there's still so much opposition from their family that they are so overprotective. Sialju is fired up as she agrees with him and bangs the table, shouting that even though their parents made a name for themselves roaming through the Jianghu too. And H. Wang Dongyob says, ha ha, yeah. She then call H. Wang Dongyob and asks him where he said they are going first. With a serious look on his face, he tell her that they are going to Pingding Mountain, Crimson Wind Stronghold. He say that they have to notorious bandits there, the Hell Bandit and the Slaughter Bandit. Sialju laughs at the names calling them lame and say that it's like they want the whole world to know that they are bandits. So Jungsen asks if they'll be joining a merchant union that's traveling from Yuzhu to Pingding Mountain. Dongyob say that's correct, that if those bandits knew they were going to their stronghold, they'll get all scared and stay hidden within their stronghold. So the best way to do this is to travel together with a merchant union. All right, then they say, and they join their swords together. And as they walk out, they shout, Loying five heroes. This is our first step into the Jianghu. That was how the Loying five heroes stepped into the Jianghu for the first time to subjugate strongholds of the Green Forest. Beyond their objective, the Crimson Wind Stronghold and further away from the Crimson Wind Stronghold, the place they'll finally arrive at. The person that awaits them is the Five Peak Strongholds bandit that's good with swords. While in Nanjing, the Orthodox Alliance, two men are discussing. One say that in the past year, a merchant group of the Suwal Merchant Union that's in Fying had all been slaughtered by a group of men wearing black clothes, he asks, right? This man is the Orthodox Alliance leader, Stormblade, Jang Gangho and the person in front of him replies, Yes, sir. This person is the chief advisor, divine strategist Yigo Xiongwun. He say that his guess is that those people are the Black Shadow Core of the Yumyung cult. The Orthodox Alliance leader now asks if that demonic cult has shown itself again. 
So the chief advisor turns to his back and says, the person that saved you from the Black Shadow Core. He was asking the question to this girl standing behind him with her head down. She's the daughter of the merchant union leader that Giaka and the five Peak Ten heroes tried to save a while back. She say that the people that saved her and the rest called themselves the Flying Dragon Sect. The chief advisor then say that even if they were a smaller sect, he couldn't find them anywhere. And that based on what the supervisors told them. There was a certain swordsman that was quite young that had completely crushed the Black Shadow Core. The Alliance leader then shout, What? A young boy crushed the Black Shadow Core? How is that possible? Thinking about it, the Black Shadow Core is known to be very skilled and brutal. Anyone who is able to defeat them alone has to be at least on the level of the top 10 strongest martial masters. That means that nameless boy is already as skilled as one of the top 10 strongest martial masters. More than 10 years ago, thanks to the incredible achievement that the moon-splitting swordsman Yon Morion and the sword emperor Nangong Byok accomplished, the Orthodox Alliance was able to come out victorious and put an end to the Yumyeong cult. They had four small group of special elite forces that could easily annihilate a small sect in the blink of an eye. The Demon Extermination Squad, Annihilation Squad, Victory Squad, Dub Squad. These are the four groups. Among them, the Victory Squad that rules over Jiang Hu right before the all-out war started had sent out letters saying, chasing after unknown kidnappers. And then, pile of corpses of the members of the Victory Squad. The last one alive was made to witness the slaughter of his subordinates and was slaughtered at the end. And that's how they disappeared without a trace. The Alliance leader tell the chief executive that while this is unofficial information, the people who completely destroyed the Victory Squad were the Yumyeong Cult's Black Shadow Corps. The chief advisor is shocked, saying that the fact that such a notorious and evil group was completely crushed by some nameless swordsman. The Alliance leader says, yes, that does remind me of him from 20 years ago. The moon-splitting swordsman, Yon Muryong. The chief advisor then say that it would be good if a hero like him has appeared. But he says, what if, making the alliance leader shock. He say, what if, he's another, huge headache, like the heaven-destroying demon lord. He says that he doesn't want to imagine something like that. The alliance leader agrees with him, saying that he's not wrong, but says that since they introduced themselves as an orthodox sect, he thinks they ought to first find out more about the flying dragon sect. So the chief advisor now asks the alliance leader what they should do about the Yumyeong cult then saying that based on what Master Gong Beek said, there are hundreds of monks and nuns that have gone missing in Henan. There are also similar incidents of missing people happening in other regions now. The Alliance leader then say, Don't tell me, the Yumyeong cult is really performing human sacrifices. Someone recalls what an assassin that was captured said. You're asking what we intend to achieve with the human sacrifices? The guy then shout superpower. A superpower that can help them push past the limits of normal martial arts. He say that they can achieve that by using human sacrifices. The interrogators are in shock as they ask what kind of crazy shit is he talking about. The alliance leader then say that 20 years ago, that was what the Yamyung cult bastard said when they surrendered. He had thought that was extremely bizarre, but says that if what they heard was true. That means for the past 20 years until the present, there would be more than a few martial masters in the Yumyung cult that possesses that bizarre superpower. Thinking about it, the chief advisor say that if the Yamyung cult have been offering human sacrifices for such a long time, then what the alliance leader said wouldn't be just some ridiculous nonsense. So he say that the place where headless corpses were found is Yuju. So he summarizes that it means the Yamyung cult would be in that vicinity. Since the Victory Squad is at the Heaven Sect right now, he asks the alliance leader if they shall ask the Victory Squad to look into this. The alliance leader then ask the Victory Squad again, that he doesn't want to lose them a second time. So, the chief advisor say that if asking them to help bothers him, then they should ask the martial group around that vicinity to send reinforcements as well. The alliance leader still thinks if they do not have a choice. He questions if this is an inevitable sacrifice for the greater good, but finally agrees that they should do that and that they need to find where the Yumyeong cult are at as soon as possible. At last, they write the message and send it using a carrier pigeon. The Orthodox Alliance started to move in order to track down the Yumyeong cult from this point in time. And at the Yuna River, in a secretive and remote place, lay the stronghold of one of the seven Grand Demon Generals' stronghold, the Yuna Pavilion. Inside, there are a group of people bowing down to a man. One of the guys raises his head and say, Pavilion Master, something is odd about the light manner offering so many sacred offerings. This guy is the Strength Demon. 
and he says that he's certain that the light manor is after the position of heavenly demon king. The pavilion master who was about to drink gets annoyed and say that hearing that spoils his appetite for alcohol. So he shout that even if the light manor offers 1,000 people as offerings, he can never become the heavenly demon king. The pavilion master is the chaos sword demon Chiak Jinkion. He says that even though everyone one uses the same eight bead bell, the difference between twelve demonic soldiers, grand demonic generals, or the heavenly demon king, is they all use different incantations. Therefore he says that the only one who knows the incantation for the heavenly demon king is the cult leader. So, lunar fairy and illusion demon joining hands, offering up prayers together, and proposing marriage. Their effort will all be for naught. But the strength demon ask him if the cult leader hasn't been missing for twenty years already. That what if the two of them were behind that? This statement just makes the pavilion master, Chiak Jinkyung, laugh really loud as he says, Them? He asks the strength demon if he's implying that the cult leader has been imprisoned by them somewhere in the world. He gets serious now and say that if that were true, don't you think that they could also keep you, a demonic soldier, and myself, a grand demon general, here as well? The strength demon now realizes the weight of what he said and stutters as he shout that that would never be possible. So, Chiak Jinkyung tell him that the cult leader was a grand demon general back then and the two of them were just demonic soldiers. He adds that a grand demon general cannot be defeated even if 100 demonic soldiers ganged up on them. That what he just suggested is just utter nonsense. But someone else speaks, begging the pavilion master to not completely ignore what the strength demon has said. That the lunar fairy is not someone whom he should underestimate. This new person is Dark Demon. The pavilion master agrees with what the Dark Demon said, saying that it's true and there's no harm in being on guard against that bitch. So he calls the Peerless Demon and Shadowless Demon and tells them that he wants the both of them to find out what the Light Manor is up to. They come bowing their heads and saying, Yes, sir. While someone runs inside the pavilion shouting, Pavilion Master. The strength demon furiously turns to this person and asks him why he's making such a ruckus. He then say, Big trouble. The Orthodox Alliance and the martial groups of Loying. They seem to be searching near the rivers of the Yunha Pavilion. The pavilion master then bangs the table saying, In the end they've come to suspect this place, huh? So he says that since it has come to this, there's no longer a need for them to hide. And he asks his subordinate, How many of the Orthodox Alliance and martial group are there? Those dogs of the Orthodox Alliance that walked into their graves unknowingly. Outside is two full red moon. The Orthodox Alliance group that are outside sees this and question what is wrong with the sky. Nangong Yon and her brother Nangong Chen both see the red moons shining bright in the night sky. So Chen asks Yon if that isn't the twin crimson moons that they've only seen in books. Yon focused on the moon thinks, just as he said, the twin crimson moons are supposed to be an omen for when something is about to happen that will determine the faith of a country. A terrible omen when the fire star threatens the heavenly star. Suddenly, the image of their father appears in front of her. She sees this and thinks, father. She then immediately shout, brother, he's shocked. And before anything else, she starts running and telling him that their father might be in danger right now. And instead of following her immediately, he shouts out her name at the Nangong clan. Nangong Byok looks up at the twin crimson moons. Huguang Province Mountains Wudang, a small building on the mountain. Inside is the Heaven Earth Supreme, Sage Chun Jai, looking at some stuffs that he used to read signs and get divination. His expression changes as he looks at what it shows him, so he thinks, this is a sign, a dark omen, isn't it? He then say that he has never seen the divination of a dark omen in the past 20 years, so he questions if there's going to be a natural disaster. Bandit Union Headquarters. Roshi asks her father if the skies have gone crazy. She say that this is the first time she has ever seen something like this, so she asks just what in the world. The Shattering Heavens Demon Lord then tell her that the sky looks like it's anticipating a severe bloodbath just like that day 20 years ago. Ryoshi hears 20 years ago and she asks if by that day he means. She doesn't finish her question. And her father questions if in the end it is really beginning again. Galaxy Riverbank. The situation is dire, as the Yumiung cult has killed almost all the warriors, with very few left standing in this one-sided massacre. But they are still being massacred with no hope of winning or retreating. One of the warriors, who receives a stabbing to buy time for his subordinate to run away, shouts at the subordinate saying, What are you doing? Hurry up and run away. Get out of here, even if you're the only one that survives, we need to inform the Orthodox Alliance about this. And the guy shout, Yes, disciple brother, you need to stay safe. 
As he turns to run away, his disciple brother is killed, and someone from the demonic cult blocks his path and asks him where he's going to. The demonic cult member who blocked his path carries the head of a warrior and says, Although you all crawled into this place on your own while searching for us, you can't just walk out as you please after all these. With a fierce gaze he say that starting now, it's going to get a lot more fun. So he dash forward toward the warrior. And in an instant, he separates the head from the body of the warrior. The warrior's blood is spilled, and this one-sided massacre is come to an end. At Hefe Nangong clan. Nangong Byuk, the sword emperor. Looking up at the skies, he thinks, those red moons, aren't they the twin crimson moons? So he questions how the ominous sign that decides the fate of the country has appeared in the sky. So he wonder what in the world is happening in the Murum. At the same time, a large number of the Black Shadow Corps are seen rushing forth to storm a building. And suddenly, they all gather right in front of the Sword Emperor. The Sword Emperor seeing them, then say that he was trying to calm his upset herd because of the awful sign. But to think that he would be having uninvited guests at such a time. So with an intimidating pressure, he asks them where they think they dared to step foot in. But comes smiling a lady as she says, As expected, what a pressuring force to think that you aren't terrified at all, even after seeing such a large army. However, she asks him if he know that confidence can sometimes lead to ruin. Looking at her he say, Isn't that the old fox Soho, the veiled youth? The Nangong clan and the veiled bright group have no bad blood. So he asks, what is this insolence? And if she has become so senile that she's unable to recognize who she's facing, so he increases the pressure of his aura. His words provoke her as she says, What, that impudent? The lunar fairy standing behind her then say, Well, that courage certainly matches the name of the sword emperor, Nangong Byuk. The sword emperor listens to the voice as he looks ahead. So she comes out of the shadows saying, That that courage certainly matches the name of the sword emperor just like twenty years ago. Seeing her, he says, Lunar Fairy. He's confused as to how she's here. She also releases her pressuring aura with a hideous look. She asks him what he means by how, telling him that she came back from hell in order to pay him back what she owe him. She shouts that she'll thoroughly pay him back for the disgrace he subjected her to twenty years ago. She releases her first attack and tell him that he should better be prepared. But the Sword Emperor remains calm and say to her, All right, come at me and as he plunge in to attack, he shouts that today is the day that he'll end her life at all cost. They both go at each other, swords clashing, and a huge explosion occurs from the force of both their attacks. Starting with the war against the Nangong clan, the Yumyong cult that brought about an intense bloodbath in the Miram twenty years ago appeared in the martial world once again. Meanwhile, the outskirts of Hefei, Yon and Chin are going at full speed to reach their father. Yon says in her mind that there's no doubt, her father, mother, the disciple brothers, and the priest, they might be in great danger. That they need to hurry and get to Hefe as soon as they can. Just like that. The Orthodox Alliance, the Seven Sects and Two School, the sect under them, and even the Bandit Union as well, all began to slowly search for traces of the Yumyeon cult. They were all getting ready for the upcoming war in their very own ways. In the end, you can't avoid the opponent you have to face. The message is spread all over, and the people worry for their lives. At Mountain Bagan, Red Sand Hideout, a merchant union is plying their route, and the bandits block their path, saying, You've come a long way after doing trade, great work. You must be tired after that long journey, so how about you quickly pay the toll fee and get going? But amongst the merchants are the loying five heroes, and you'll always end up meeting the ones. You're bound to like a twist of fate, Mountain Wufeng Hideout. The chief looks up at the red sky and goes, Whoa, I've never seen such a red sky in my life, just what the heck is this? Tak say that he agree, that it looks ominous, so he turns and calls old man Shim, asking him if he's got any idea why the sky is acting this way. Shim says that he's not sure, but says, well, this isn't completely the same, but there was a time when something similar happened. Twenty years ago, the worst war in the history of Murum, which the Order Union barely won with the help of the Moon, Splitting Swordsman, and the Sword Emperor. However, it still left us with more casualties than survivors and almost caused all the sects to disappear. It's similar to the Yumyung cult blood war. They are all surprised to hear this and Tak asks, What? Is that true? The chief asks, The demonic cult? Sobik gets really confused as she asks who the demonic cult is for the brothers to be reacting this way. The chief then tell her that the demonic cult are a highly formidable bunch. That if they hadn't been stopped at that time, the Murum would have probably become hell itself by now. Tak says that he also don't remember much since he was very young back then. But according to the rumors, 
the demonic cult began to use people as their offerings regardless of age or gender in order to amplify the strength of their martial arts. Sobeek is shit scared at the fact that they used living people as offerings. Even Kion gets scared, asking how they could do something so cruel. Shim then add that this might just be his speculation, but the group clad in black clothing that they met on the way to and from the bandit union, and seeing monks who were nearly abducted. He say that he thinks the demonic cult might be emerging once again. It gets quiet for a while. And suddenly, Tak speaks saying, Old man Shim, really? Why are you scaring us like that? The chief also speaks, asking if this is only just old man Shim's assumptions, right? Shim responds saying that that's right, but that the moon-splitting swordsman has died and the sword king is old now. So a bloodbath severe enough to be called a calamity could occur in the Miram. They all turn to look behind them and try to play it off with a fake smile on their faces as Chief Poon Yoncho say, well, even if that happens. Tak completes his statement saying, we still have a place we can rely on so it should be fine, right? With all their gaze upon Yon Jiaka. And suddenly the chief grabs Jiaka with his arm saying, of course we have Jiaka after all and that they won't just be relying on Jiaka. That no matter what happens, if they the Ten Mufeng elite join forces, they'll be able to overcome any obstacles that comes their way. Jiaka then smile and say, that's right. That no matter what happens in the Miram, he'll definitely save his brothers. And he finally says, no one can touch us, whoever it may be. Please like and subscribe for the next part. Also check out other interesting videos on my channel. Thank you for watching.